if you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. And today we are tackling the baffling, enduring mystery that is the disappearance of Johnny Gosh. The Johnny Gosh case is a staple in the true crime community. One of these uh, loss of main, main loss of innocence cases from decades ago that uh, kind of changed the modern world in terms of bringing the possibility that kids could be kidnapped more mainstream. Obviously, kids have been getting kidnapped for a very long time. But to the extent that it's been brought into the sphere of public consciousness, there's not a lot of cases that have done that, but Johnny Gosh's case certainly did. So we will be doing a deep dive in typical mind shock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront in an attempt to decipher what really happened to Johnny Gosh and... There are so many oddities in this case that it is, uh, it's definitely a doozy and, uh, needs a critical and logical examination. As always, if you enjoy the Mind Shock podcast, find it interesting and informative, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, a like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. So let's do a brief rundown. I mean, I don't know how many people haven't heard of this case by now. I mean, at least in passing. This is, again, it was just so, such a famous case, but I'll do the quick rundown from the wiki and then we will get into the details. John David Gosh, born November 12, 1969, disappeared September 5, 1982, was a paper boy in West Des Moines, Iowa, who disappeared without a trace between 6 and 7 a.m. on September 5, 1982. He is presumed to have been kidnapped. As of 2022, there have been no arrests made, and the case is now considered cold, but remains open. His mother, Noreen Gosh, said that Johnny escaped from his captors and visited her with an unidentified man in 1997. She said that her son told her that he had been the victim of a pedophile organization and had been cast aside when he was too old but subsequently feared for his life and lived under an assumed identity, feeling it was not safe to return home. Gosh's father, John, divorced from Noreen since 93, has publicly stated that he is not sure whether or not such a visit actually occurred. Many have also speculated the visit did occur, but it was someone else pretending to be Johnny. Authorities have not located Gosh or confirmed Noreen Gosh's account, and his fate continues to be the subject of speculation, conspiracy theories, and dispute. The case received huge publicity in 2006, when his mother said she had found photographs on her doorstep depicting Gosh in captivity. Some of the photos received were said to be children from a case in Florida, but one boy in the photos was never identified. Noreen Gosh insists... That boy is Johnny. Gosh's picture was among the first to be featured on milk cartons as part of a campaign to find missing children. I mean, there's a lot here, obviously. I mean, there's several layers here. And not to fall for false dichotomies, is it possible the pictures are real? But the visit was either not him or never occurred. I mean, I'm going to get into the specifics of that visit because that's something that I've actually thought about. I mean, it's kind of hard to make heads or tails of that visit because of all the different possibilities. But if it really was him, why did he feel safe to come visit that time? And why? I mean, there, there's just... It doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, regardless of which theory you believe... I mean, it's like you can't make a theory that would adequately explain all the bullet points here. 
disappearance Sunday, September 5th, 82, in the suburb of West Des Moines, Johnny Gosh left home before dawn to begin his paper route. Although it was customary for Johnny to awaken his father to help with the route, the boy took, the on, took only the family's miniature dachshund, Gretchen, with him that morning. Other paper carriers for the Des Moines Register would later report having seen Gosh at the paper drop picking up his newspapers. It was the last sighting of Gosh that can be corroborated by multiple witnesses. Another paper boy named Mike reported that he observed Gosh talking to a stocky man in a blue two-toned car near the paper drop. Another witness, John Rossi, saw the man in the blue car talking to Gosh and thought something was strange. Gosh told Rossi that the man was asking for directions and asked Rossi to help. Rossi took, looked at the license plate but could not recall the plate number. He said, I keep hoping I'll wake up in the middle of the night and see that number on the license plate as distinctly as night and day, but that hasn't happened. Rossi underwent hypnosis and told police some of the numbers and that the plate was from Warren County, Iowa. As Gosh walked a block north where his route started, Mike noticed another man following Gosh. A neighbor heard a door slam and saw a silver Ford Fairmont speed away northwards from where Johnny's wagon was found. So, okay, does that mean there are at least two individuals involved here? John and Noreen Gosh, Johnny's parents, began receiving phone calls from customers along their son's route complaining of undelivered papers. John performed a cursory search of the neighborhood around 6 a.m. He immediately found Johnny's wagon full of newspapers two blocks from their home. The Goshes immediately contacted the West Des Moines Police Department and reported Johnny's disappearance. Noreen, in her public statements and her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, has been critical of what she perceives as a slow reaction time from authorities and of the policy at the time that Gosh could not be classified as a missing person until 72 hours had passed. By her estimation, the police did not arrive to take a report for a full 45 minutes. Initially, the police came to believe that Gosh was a runaway, but later they changed their statement and suggested that Gosh was kidnapped, but they were unable to establish a viable motive. They turned up little evidence and arrested no suspects in connection with the case. Also, obviously, I know police, the, the go-to is runaway for, for teenagers. But this kid was 12 years old. I mean, he's kind of on the young side. to. I mean, what are the stats for the most runaways? I mean, I don't think most runaways were that young. Generally, they'd be more into the teen years. But it's just weird how that seems to be like a go-to in almost in, in a lot of these missing cases. I mean, yeah, maybe they're a runaway, but what's the harm in doing an investigation? I mean, if they're that tied up with all these other definitive cases, maybe, but... A few months after his September 82 disappearance, Noreen Gosh has said her son was spotted in Oklahoma when a boy yelled to a woman for help before being dragged off by two men. Wow. I mean, the amount of coincidences in this case is, is also quite substantial. I mean, we'll get them one at a time here, but let me finish the, the rundown before we start examining all of these points. Over the years, several private investigators have assisted the Goshes with the search for their son. Among them are Jim Rothstein, a retired New York City police detective, and Ted Gunderson, a retired chief of the Los Angeles FBI branch. And Ted Gunderson, of course, is the one, one of the first guys to blow the whistle on so-called widespread human trafficking and satanic connections within political and law enforcement circles, what coincidence theorists pretend doesn't exist, this uh, former FBI had exposed all of this. So, continuing on here, in 1984, Gosh's photograph appeared alongside that of Juanita Lee Estevez on milk cartons across America. They were the second and third abducted children to have their plights publicized this way. The first was Eaton Potts. Another missing paper boy. 
On August 12, 1984, Eugene Martin, another Des Moines area paperboy, disappeared under similar circumstances. He disappeared while delivering newspapers on the south side of Des Moines. Authorities were unable to prove a connection between the three cases, yet Noreen Gosh says that she was personally informed of the abduction a few months in advance by a PI who was searching for her son. She was told the kidnapping would take place the second weekend in August 84, and it would be a paper boy from the south side of Des Moines. Uh, see, th this is why people have doubts regarding Noreen, and uh, yeah, it's... It's tough. It's tough. Fraud by wire case. In 1985, Noreen Gosh received a letter from Robert Herman Meyer II, 19 years old, of Saginaw, Michigan. The letter had been signed Samuel Forbes Dakota, whereupon Meyer, acting as Dakota, stated that he was a guard in a motorcycle club when Gosh's son disappeared in September 82. According to Meyer, Gosh's son was taken as part of a large child slavery ring operated by the club. According to the FBI, Meyer requested from and received $11,000 from the Gosh's. Meyer additionally requested $100,000 more along with a promise to return their son. Meyer was arrested in Buffalo at the Canadian border by FBI agents and was later charged by fraud by wire. The letter Meyer wrote had stated that Gosh's son was sold to a man who Meyer identified as a high-level drug dealer residing in Mexico City. Despite the accusation of fraud, Noreen Gosh reportedly believed Meyer at his word and later criticized the FBI, stating that the arrest warrant against Meyer destroyed her and her husband's John's credibility with anyone who would take the couple's offer to pay ransom for their boy. And there, there are a lot of links here to Mexico, so we will be getting to them. But it is curious that this is, uh, this is the guy that was, that was pinned for this because, or, or fingered for this by, by this, uh, in, by Meyer, because it's not like there's a shortage of uh, so-called uh, elite politicians or upper crime circles within the U.S. or in other countries. It's not like Mexico is the only place where this is happening. So it is a little bit curious that he pointed to Mexico and then all there's a bunch of coincidences that are going to happen uh, regarding Mexico, which we'll get to. Noreen Gosh's account. According to Noreen Gosh's account, she was awakened 2.30 a.m. one morning in March 1997. So wait a second. She doesn't have a date here. That's a little bit problematic. Waiting outside was Johnny Gosh. So 1997, knocking on our apartment door. Waiting outside was Johnny Gosh, now 27, accompanied by an unidentified man. Gosh said she immediately recognized her son, who opened his shirt to reveal a birthmark on his chest. We talked about an hour or an hour and a half. He was with another man, but I have no idea who the person was. Johnny would look over to the other person for approval to speak, says Gosh. He didn't say where he is living or where he was going. In a 2005 interview, Gosh, uh, Noreen Gosh said that the night that he came here, he was wearing jeans and a shirt and had a coat on because it was March. It was cold and his hair was long. It was shoulder length and it was straight and dyed black. After the visit, she had the FBI create a picture she says looked like Johnny. Go uh, Noreen Gosh published, self-published a book in 2000 titled Why Johnny Can't Come Home. The book represents her understanding of what her son went through based on the original research of various PIs and her son's visit. On September 1st, 2006, Gosh reported that she found photographs left at her front door, some of which she posted on her website. One color photo shows three boys bound and gagged. She says that a black and white photo appears to show a 12-year-old Johnny Gosh with his mouth gagged, his hands and feet tied, and an apparent human brand on his shoulder. A third photo shows a man possibly dead who may have had something tied around his neck. 
Mrs. Gosh stated that the man was one of the perpetrators who molested my son. Gosh later said that the first two photos had originated on a website featuring pornography involving minors. On September 13th, an anonymous letter was mailed to Des Moines police. Gentlemen, someone has played a reprehensible joke on a grieving mother. The photo in question is not one of her son, but of three, po three boys in Tampa, Florida, about 1979 to 1980, challenging each other to an escape contest. There was an investigation concerning that picture made by the Hillsborough County, Florida, Sheriff's Office. No charges were filed, and no wrongdoing was established. The lead detective on this case was named Zalva. This allegation should be easy enough to check out. Nelson Zalva, who worked for the Hillsborough County, Florida Sheriff's Office in the 70s, said the details of the letter were true and adds that he also investigated the black and white in 1978 or 1979 before Gosh's disappearance. I interviewed the kids, and they said there was no coercion or touching. I could never prove a crime, Zalva said. When asked for proof that this was indeed the same photo from the investigation nearly three decades prior, Zalva could not provide any. Wait, why would he not be able to provide proof? There's no case files or anything? That's weird. According to the documentary film Who Took Johnny 2014, only three boys in the picture were identified by law enforcement, but not the one thought to be Johnny. Noreen Gosh still believes the pictures to be of her son. Also, I'm just going to add another point here. Has anyone else verified this one detective's investigation? I'm just saying, if there's some high-ranking people involved... And how easy would it be to just tell an officer, tell an officer, yeah, just say you talked to the boys and that there was no coercion or whatever. I mean, can anybody actually verify this? I mean, when you only have one guy's word to take for it, I mean, that's problematic. I don't understand how so-called true crime aficionados can just write something off based on one human's words. I mean, again, I bring this up all the time. It's not rocket science. Humans are fallible, and humans are also known to lie. I mean, this, this should not be that shocking at this point in time. I mean, maybe a hundred years ago, in more proper society, it might be a little bit more shocking that someone in official capacity would lie, but not really today. Should be understood by now. Noreen Gosh still believes the pictures to be of her son. In 1989, 21-year-old Paul A. Bonacci told his attorney, John DeCamp, that he had been abducted into a sex ring with Gosh as a teenager and was forced to participate in Gosh's kidnapping. John DeCamp met with Bonacci and believed he was telling the truth. Noreen later met him and said he told her things he could only know from talking with her son. He said that Johnny had a birthmark on his chest, a scar on his tongue, and a burn scar on his lower leg. Although a description of the birthmark had been widely circulated, information about the scars had not been made public. See, and that's good because now we have, I mean, this seems legitimate then, right? Because if you hold back certain things, you can tell who's telling the truth or not later because that's kind of a random thing. How many people have scars on their tongue? I mean, that seems rare. A burn scar on the lower leg? I mean, if you know which leg, and if you can, you know, state w exactly the size and shape, then, then yes, that would be. But, I mean, obviously, it's a little bit more common than, burn scar than scars on the tongue. Bonacci also described a stammer that Johnny had when he was upset. The FBI and local police do not believe that Bonacci is a credible witness in the case and have not interviewed with him. Uh, have not interviewed him. Wow, is that the most mind shocking? I mean, shouldn't police appro approach all leads like they just assumed he was not credible? So they didn't even bother to interview him instead of interviewing him to determine credibility? The, what does everybody make of this? I mean, is this one of the most botched investigations ever? And the FBI are involved here, too, so it's kind of weird. His siblings told police he was at home when Gosh was abducted. That's curious. So, I mean, here's the thing, though. When you have these traumatized individuals, they could possibly misremember details, right? 
Like, what does he mean by he assisted with the kidnapping? Did he mean right in that minute? Or did he mean later on? Because this is also a relative kid here. So he would have been a teenager at the time. And also, how would his siblings... How would his siblings be able to tell the police he was at home? Like, they were keeping... they were How old were his siblings? And they were keeping their eyes on the minute clock? Wait, what? Like, they, they were... They kept tabs on him every single minute, every second of every day, and they specifically knew the day that Gosh was abducted exactly where he was at which second? I mean, that's kind of weird, too. Does nobody find that weird? I mean, they could have told police that, but how would... Pol I mean, they're just going to take their word, too? Maybe they really believed it, too. Like, they thought he was up in his room or whatever, but he if he wasn't, how would they know? Unless they had eyes on him every second of that day, and how would they even remember that perfectly? But anyway, I mean, if they had eyes on him every single day for, like, that whole week, I mean, that, then yes, then they would be be able to tell that but if they didn't i mean that's weird that's weird i mean we'll get into i mean th this case it's not like we have nothing to go on here i mean there's a lot of moving pieces here there's a lot of testimonies and it seems like these could be credible i mean obviously there's a whole bunch of others that might not be credible but these are the main ones outlined here on the wiki and they seem like theoretically theoretically it's plausible that all of this could be true National interest, the case generated national interest as Noreen Gosh became increasingly vocal about the inadequacy of law enforcement's investigation of missing children's cases. She established the Johnny Gosh Foundation in 82, through which she visited schools and spoke at seminars about modus operandi of sexual predators. She lobbied for the Johnny Gosh Bill, state legislation which would mandate an immediate police response to reports of missing children. The bill became law in Iowa in 84, and similar or identical laws were later passed in Missouri and seven other states. In August 84, Noreen Gosh testified in Senate hearings on organized crime, speaking about organized pedophilia and its presumed role in her son's abduction. She began receiving death threats. Gosh also testified before the U.S. Department of Justice, which provided $10 million to establish the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Gosh was invited to the White House by President Ronald Reagan for the dedication ceremony. Wow. I mean, so she testifies in Senate hearings, and then she gets death threats. Now, see, that's curious, because if the random crazies, they would be giving her death threats at random times. But now, I mean, she's talking about organized crime and the, some, this kind of organized trafficking of sorts, which might involve political circles. Now she's getting death threats. That's, that's weird. That's definitely weird. So that's the basic rundown. I mean, there is a lot to work with here. Now, before we get to the Reddit discussion and more exact points, I do want to read this article from uh, the LA Times, April 5th, 1990. Body is found, lost paperboy case reopened. The mother of Johnny Gosh, the West Des Moines paperboy boy who disappeared seven years ago, said Wednesday she was stunned by the discovery of the body of a young man with a similar name. West Des Moines police thought they had a break in Gosh's baffling disappearance when Mexican authorities on Friday pulled the body of a young man from a drainage ditch in northern Mexico and identified him as John E. Gosh. The name was similar to John D. Gosh, who vanished on, on September 5th, 1982, while delivering Sunday papers in Des Moines. But West Des Moines Police Lieutenant Gary Scott said in Tacoma, Washington, family named Gosh maintains the body is that of their adopted son. Police in Yuma, Arizona, said that John E. Gosh apparently was killed near their city in a drug-related shooting, and the body ended up in Mexico. Yuma authorities said they will send dental records to West Des Moines for comparisons to the missing paperboy. I feel terrible, said Noreen Gosh, the paperboy's mother. This whole coincidence is just unbelievable. It would be such a relief to have it over. I'd rather have the bad news over now instead of later. The coincidences do not stop at the names of the victims. The man found 
in Mexico was born on October 22nd, 1969, two weeks before the missing paper boy's birthday. The Gosh family in Washington told West Des Moines police they adopted a boy in Oklahoma in 1980 and renamed him John. So who's ready for a mind shock now? Noreen Gosh said her son was spotted in Oklahoma a few months after he disappeared. A boy reportedly begged a woman for help before being dragged off by two men. The woman called police, but they could not locate the youth. Okay, so let's recap the coincidence stack thus far. There was a sighting in Oklahoma a few months of Johnny Gosh. Now, a body turns up in Mexico of a kid who was adopted, his birthday within weeks of John D. Gosh. So this John Gosh, the family in Washington, said that they adopted him in Oklahoma. But they said they adopted him in 1980, though. That would have been before this parents. I'm assuming this can all be verified. But, and then also we have that motorcycle gang member who said that John was, uh, John Gosh was sold to some guy in Mexico. Then this John, Go then this other John Gosh shows up dead in Mexico. Is everybody following thus far? Because we're not even done with the Mexico coincidences. Continuing the article here, in another coincidence, Des Moines police traveled to southern Mexico last week to check out a reported sighting of Eugene Martin, who disappeared from his Des Moines paper route two years after John D. Gosh vanished. So let me get this straight. There's also another sighting in Mexico of another Des Moines area paper boy who vanished. I mean... Des Moines is not the only city in the United States. I mean, is it weird? Does anybody else find it weird? The Mexico connections. I mean, this is really making your head spin. Now, John is a, obviously a very popular first name. So, you know, but Gosh is, is not really that popular of a last name. I actually cannot recall any other Gosh that I've seen other than the, than the one in this case. So there's another Gosh family. Apparently they're not related to, to Noreen Gosh. And so they happen to adopt a boy. Now, so what is, see, when you're dealing with statistics, I mean, this is problematic. So there's 50 states. So out of all the possible states, they adopted this John Gosh in Oklahoma, a state where Johnny was supposedly spotted. Now, the problem is here, of course, is the year, because they claim that this John Gosh was adopted in 1980. So I'm assuming this all can be verified. Now, obviously, paperwork can be messed up, but are there photographs of this adoption? I mean, that's kind of a big deal when you adopt someone. You would think they would have photographs with this guy, with this kid, and if, those, if they have photographs, 1980, 1981, all before John D. Gosh's disappearance, then okay. I mean, it's still kind of a weird coincidence, but whatever. You, you could, if it was thoroughly investigated, but it seems a lot of things in this case were not thoroughly investigated. Because un unless you can verify that adoption, I mean, I'm assuming this was verified, dental records, etc., and that it wasn't him. But that's just an assumption on my part. I mean, is there verification of that? All right, let's get to all of the heavy details now. So we're going to be taking a look at the CAVDEF write-up on the Johnny Gosh case. So this is the Coalition Against Voter Disenfranchisement and Election Fraud. <laughs> wow. So for whatever reason, they have a write-up on the Johnny Gosh case. So let's... Uh... Let's get to it. I mean, this is going to be very comprehensive and exhaustive. So, so make sure you have uh, you have some drinks and snacks handy, because this 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 is gonna get into the nitty gritty in typical mind shock fashion here. Now that we have the groundwork laid down, 
we can examine each of the wrinkles in this case and uh, see how much more information there is and what can be derived from it. On the morning of September 5th, 1982, West Des Moines paper boy Johnny Gosh was abducted while on his paper route. With the police and FBI being unhelpful, Johnny's mother, Noreen Gosh, took matters into her own hands, hiring private investigators to pursue the case. Over the next decade, hundreds of leads poured in, as did a couple credible sightings of Johnny indicating that he was still alive. Then, in 1990, the Gosh family got their first major break when the Franklin child sex ring victim, Paul Bonacci, came forward to reveal that he was forced to help kidnap Johnny Gosh. His testimony revealed a sinister, well-protected pedophile underground responsible for victimizing Johnny along with hundreds if not thousands of other children. Bonacci knew so much unreleased information about the Gosh case that both Noreen and her then-husband came to believe Bonacci. But the police dismissed him as a liar, never even interviewing him. Though evidence has continued to accumulate supporting Bonacci's disclosures about a high-level pedophile ring, the Johnny Gosh case remains unsolved. So it was there some kind of stand-down order or something where they knew Bonacci was legit, so they have to pretend he's crazy or insane or not legit because he just knows too much about this ring and uh, possibly upper levels of political involvement or law enforcement involvement in the ring. Not necessarily specifically with Johnny Gosh, but in the ring, so they don't want him getting any kind of publicity or being uh, made credible in any way. Is that what happened regarding Bonacci? So they also have a very extensive write-up here on the Franklin scandal, but I am just going to read their quick write-up here. The Franklin child sex ring was a politically connected child prostitution ring in Omaha, Nebraska during the 80s. Children from all over Omaha, including the Boys Town Orphanage and Nebraska foster care system, were kidnapped to be abused at sex parties. Republican power broker Lawrence E. King operated the ring and hosted these sex parties, which were attended by political and business elites in Omaha. He also flew these children around the country, particularly Washington, D.C., to be abused by other rich and powerful men. The main purpose of King's pedophile ring was blackmailing politicians, government officials, businessmen, and media figures with proof of them having sexually abused children. King carried out this blackmail operation on behalf of the CIA in partnership with Republican lobbyist and CIA asset Craig J. Spence, whose D.C. home he would often fly children to. So what do all the coincidence theorists make of those claims? I mean, it's kind of crazy. The problem is, too, like a lot of these courts, if these federal officials and court officials are involved in the scandal, obviously they're not going to investigate themselves, so they're just going to say that, it's, uh, that these allegations are all unfounded. But, I mean, it's shocking, though. I mean, it, it's, it's really shocking if even a small percentage of it is true. So here they, let's go back to the Johnny Gosh right up here, the timeline, suspicious activity. Photos taken of Johnny by a woman with California plates. So this is sourced from America's Most Wanted. I'm actually gonna, do, I'm actually gonna go through the entire write up on America's Most Wanted here. This is their write-up. The Mysterious Case of Johnny Gosh. More than any other missing child case in U.S. history, the disappearance of 12-year-old Johnny Gosh has spawned a multitude of conspiracy theories that follow the elusive trail of tantalizing clues from a middle-class community in Iowa to an underground pedophile ring in Nebraska to the power brokers of Washington, D.C. Now, 24 years after Johnny's disappearance, it appears a new chapter to this puzzling mystery is beginning to unfold. The disappearance. On Sunday, September 6th, 1982, in the bedroom community of West Des Moines, Iowa, 12-year-old Johnny Gosh is headed out on his newspaper route. He brings with him the family dog and his red wagon to carry the papers. This is the last time Johnny is ever seen again. Johnny's parents, Noreen and John Gosh, launch the initial search for their son because the West Des Moines police were short-staffed due to the Labor Day weekend. 
And we actually didn't even touch upon that. Labor Day weekend, I mean, there's a lot of travel going on at that time. Noreen knew in her heart that her son had not run away from home, as the police suspected, but had been abducted by a stranger. Because both the Goshes were asleep when Johnny left the house that morning, there is conflicting information on what he was wearing that day. Their best guess was either dark sweatpants or a white t-shirt with blue jean cutoffs. Another newspaper boy named Mike tells the police that a stocky man in a 79 or 80 blue two-tone two-door Ford Fairmont with Iowa plates had been driving around that morning asking the newspaper boys for directions. Wow, so this guy was asking multiple boys. Johnny told Mike that the man made him feel uncomfortable when he asked him for directions. So are these kids picking up a certain vibe here? As the boys noticed the Fairmont circling the area again, Johnny said he was heading home. Mike watched Johnny walking down... Wait, why is he heading home? Mike watched Johnny walking down the street and noticed another man he hadn't seen before walking closely behind Johnny as he turned the corner. Another point here, if these guys are not working together, is this really just some guy Labor Day weekend, he really is lost... And maybe he's a creepy guy, whatever, but he, he didn't abduct anybody. He's a red herring. And this other guy who was following him, he's the real perpetrator. Or vice versa. Or, or they're working together. Or neither is involved. Let's, let's keep all the variables on the table here. A police artist creates a composite sketch of the stocky, dark, complected man driving the car. Witnesses describe him in his 30s with a mustache. The sketch is released to the media, but nothing solid comes from the lead. Days turn into weeks, and weeks bleed into months. Noreen becomes obsessed with finding her son. Every night, she leaves her porch light on. She does numerous television interviews, hoping that Johnny will see her and know that help is on the way. Sightings. Usually, when a child is abducted, he's not seen or heard from again. But in the years following Johnny's disappearance, there were sightings, evidence, and bizarre coincidences. And to this very day, many believe Johnny was the victim of a bizarre and insidious plot and is still alive and in hiding. On August 12, 1984, two years after Johnny disappeared, 12-year-old Eugene Martin, another paper boy for the Des Moines Register, disappears while on his newspaper route. The FBI jumps on the case immediately, but like Johnny, it's as though Eugene has disappeared without a trace. On August 16th, President Reagan phones the editor of the Des Moines Register, James Gannon, and asks what, if anything, he can do to help in the disappearance of the two boys. To date, authorities have been unable to positively link these two cases. For the next two years, there are sightings of Johnny all over the U.S., including a dollar bill which shows up in, in Sioux City, Iowa. Written on the front of the currency is, quote, I am alive. Dash Johnny Gosh, end quote. Then on Valentine's Day, 1988, a typed letter arrives at the Gosh home. It's postmark Idaho. The writer says he's Johnny, and he's been kidnapped and forced to do terrible things. He says his kidnappers have dyed his hair and given him a new name. He types at the end of the letter, your son, Johnny Gosh. The note also mentions the incident in Oklahoma where Johnny approached a woman for help. According to Noreen, that tip was never made public, which validates for her that the letter is authentic. Okay, wow. See, th this case has so many of these little wrinkles where those details were not made public, so how would someone know that? But why is Johnny typing? Why would he not write the letter in his handwriting? But, oh... Okay, unless, hmm, I mean, there are some really dark theories, but if there are some MK Ultra connections here, and they're just really messing with the mother, and it's just some some psychotics who uh, who know what happened, they know about the ring, so they can throw in details like that because they have connections in law enforcement, if it's not really Johnny. But I mean, that's uh, that's rough. Johnny Gosh Was Here was painted in red nail polish on the bathroom wall of a restaurant in Denver, Colorado. 
Denver, Denver Airport, of course, uh, a staple of Illuminati conspiracy lore. Continuing on here, a conspiracy theory is born. In 1989, 21-year-old Paul Bonacci, a convicted child molester, surfaces with a tale that is still spinning conspiracy theories today. While serving time in an Omaha, Nebraska prison for molesting a young boy, Bonacci admitted to his psychiatrist he helped abduct Iowa newspaper boy Johnny Gosh. He claimed that there was an organized ring of pedophiles in Omaha that abducts children and forces them into life of pornography and prostitution, and in some cases auctions off these children to clients for sex. Bonacci, who suffers from a multiple personality disorder, had been a key witness in Omaha's Franklin Federal Credit Union bank scandal. He testified that Larry E. King, who was charged and convicted with embezzling $40 million from the bank, had wild sex parties at home, and Bonacci himself had sex with several prominent Omaha citizens who were there. Larry E. King was a major Republican fundraiser based in Omaha and sang the national anthem at both the 84 and 88 Republican conventions. Bonacci claimed that he and others were taken to the Republican convention in Dallas and also made numerous t trips to King's Washington, D.C. apartment on Embassy Row, where they were offered up for sex for pay with prominent Republican politicians. Bonacci claims that the organized ring picked him up at the age of eight and forced him into prostitution. He says he was photographed, blackmailed, and later forced to be a decoy to lure other young boys like Johnny into waiting vehicles. Bonacci admits that he became a molester himself. Bonacci's attorney, John DeCamp, phoned the Goshes with this story, and the Goshes' private investigator, Roy Stevens, spent two years trying to disprove Bonacci's claims. Because Bonacci had been charged with perjury and perpetrating a hoax by the grand jury in the Franklin credit scandal, neither the FBI nor the West Des Moines police would even interview him about the Gosh case. They still feel he is an unreliable witness. But here's the thing. If he is telling the truth, wouldn't he wouldn't he be wouldn't they want to charge him with uh, with perjury and perpetrating a hoax like wouldn't like what would they do to discredit him if if his story is true would they really just allow him to just say all that especially if there are court officials and these high-ranking dc officials involved in the two years roy stevens investigated bonacci he went from skeptic to supporter and some of bonacci's story and the evidence roy stevens uncovered is compelling also, someone who's that severely traumatized, developing a multiple personality disorder, I mean, that's a way of the brain to protect itself from a lot of the trauma. I mean, that's quite common, is it not, for people that have this level of trauma. Okay, so here's his claims. Emilio is the ringleader of the organization who orders the abductions and sells the children to pedophiles. Bonacci claims Emilio was the man in the Ford Fairmont asking Johnny for directions. See, an, an issue I have here, unless the ring, unless this uh, ring is just starting up, why would the ringleader himself put himself in that position where he could be spotted? I mean, that that's an issue, unless this is like the first, unless this is like the early years of the ring where the, there's not a lot of employees. If it's just like two or three guys, then okay. But if this is some top boss, like it's hard to believe that he would be out and about. Okay, continuing on here, Tony is used as the driver. Remarkably, he's been identified in other child abductions across the country, including Mikola Joy Garrett, who disappeared in November 1988 from her home in Hayward, California. The night before Johnny's abduction, Bonacci saw a man bring photos of young boys to Emilio. He says one was Johnny Gosh. Noreen Gosh remembered that a neighbor noticed a woman taking pictures of Johnny three months before his abduction. Even more interesting, where the neighbor saw the picture being taken matches the background described by Bonacci in the photo he saw. Okay, hold on a second. It's time, I mean, even the most skeptical, if that is true. Wow. I mean, that's damning. I mean, that's damning. It's not like we're not, we don't just have some like vague statements here like in all these other cases where you can't make anything of it. I mean, if he's giving this level of specificity, I mean, 
you got to take this guy serious. I mean, not that he's telling the truth, but at least the possibility that he is with this level of specificity. I mean, this is crazy. Also, how creepy is that? I mean, this case is creepy enough by itself, but there's a woman involved in the ring. She's taking photos of these uh, preteen boys in their in their neighborhood, in their around their house. I mean, this is creepy stuff. They're stalking this kid for like three months, and how many other kids are they stalking? So they're. I mean, this is just so dark. I mean, this is really one of the darkest cases ever, just because. From all the information, it's not an isolated incident. I mean, it's just, it's it's really bizarre. Continuing on here, Mike was a boy who Bonacci claims was with him in the back seat of the car that Emilio was driving on the day of the abduction. He said another man pushed Johnny into the car, and Paul used chloroform to knock Johnny out. Bonacci said they were taken to a farmhouse in, C- in Sioux City, Iowa, where he was the first to sexually abuse Johnny, and then photos were taken. Emilio entered the room and told Bonacci and Mike to undress Johnny. Emilio had a buyer who wanted to see photos of the boys doing things to each other. Eventually, the buyer arrived, looked at the pictures, paid $35,000, and took Johnny to Colorado. Charlie ran the farm in Sioux City, Bonacci says. Roy Stevens actually located a Chuck he believes is Charlie and found people who said things about Chuck that were similar to what Bonacci said about Charlie. Wow, this Roy Stevens is a fearless P.I. I mean, wow. The Colonel was the man who Bonacci said ran a ranch in Colorado. Bonacci said the last time he saw Johnny was back in 1986 at that same ranch. Johnny, whose hair was now dyed black and was renamed Mark, had attempted to run away. When they caught up with him, they branded Johnny on his right buttock like a piece of livestock. John DeCamp, legal counsel to the chairman of the state Senate committee that investigated the Federal Credit Union and who later became a state senator, wrote a book on the scandal called The Franklin Cover-Up. At first, he too was skeptical of Bonacci's claims, but now he believes that high-level government officials wanted to keep everything quiet and did everything they could to discredit Paul Bonacci. He wonders why the FBI completely refused to investigate Bonacci's claims regarding Johnny Gosh. It was a forbidden zone. They wouldn't even talk about it, says DeCamp. I mean, that is so damning as well because it's, it's like an order was given from above. Like, it's just, it's weird. DeCamp says Bonacci's multiple personalities, uh, at last count 28, is a result of years of sexual abuse. It's caused by the very things he describes. In 1990, investigator Gary Caridori, who was investigating Paul Bonacci's claims for the Nebraska state legislation, urgently phoned State Senator Lauren Schmidt from Chicago saying he had found the smoking gun. Corridaro told Schmidt he would fly that night from Chicago on his private plane with his son back to Lincoln, Nebraska. The plane exploded over Aurora, Illinois, killing Caridori and his eight-year-old son. According to an eyewitness, just before hearing the explosion, he saw a flash of light. Caridori's briefcase and the rear seat of the plane never were recovered. Okay, how far down the rabbit hole? I mean, is, I mean, this is right in America's Most Wanted as well. We're not talking about some obscure GeoCities blog here. This is all relatively official information here. So... Gary Caridori phoned State Senator Lauren Schmidt. So obviously all their phones must have been tapped. Or if Schmidt is involved, then he he did the tip-off. But this is just crazy. So he says he has a smoking gun. Then he's dead. And all the evidence is gone. Wow. Okay, continuing on here. October 1991, Noreen Gosh met Paul Bonacci in a face-to-face meeting. She said Paul described to her things about Johnny that she had never released to the press. That Johnny had a stutter and that he had taken yoga. And yoga in 1982 is not the same thing as yoga today. 
I mean, that, I don't know how, how many 12 year old boys took yoga in 1982. I mean, that's an interesting detail. Because of those small details, she believes Paul Bonacci's story is true. In a bizarre coincidence, that summer, a friend of the Goshes was in a Denver restaurant and noticed painted on the bathroom wall in bright red nail polish, Johnny Gosh was here. Was this a Mexican restaurant? Roy Stevens showed a series of photos, including the Mexican restaurant, to Bonacci. Without prompting, Bonacci identified the restaurant and recalled how he, Johnny, and Mike went to the bathroom and Johnny painted Johnny Gosh was here on the wall. Bonacci even produced a letter from his friend Mike mentioning how Johnny Gosh wrote on the bathroom walls in a Mexican restaurant in red nail polish. Wow! So this would have been my pick for Unrelated, but again, there's no, keep in mind, there's no widespread internet. So, hmm. I mean, this, this is problematic. This is problematic. Yeah, this is rough. This is really rough. I mean, this case, that yeah, I mean, this is going to be one of the most bizarre cases ever, just all the details here. So Bonacci had a letter from his friend Mike specifically mentioning that Johnny wrote this in red nail polish. It is kind of weird, like, what else? I mean, does the letter just, just mention random things and that's one of them? So I guess if you are if you write a letter every month or whatever, or every week, every couple of days, you're going to mention things that happen. I mean, I don't know, it's kind of weird. But again, like I said, in late 80s, early 90s, the internet is not so widespread that, this, that there's like all these trolls coming out of the woodwork to be writing that. Like, in this day and age, if there's a popular missing persons case, people might write that in bathrooms or whatever, just... I don't know, just because. Back then, it seems like it'd be a little bit more rare, but that was still my, out of all the, out of all of these things, that was my pick to be unrelated, but now I don't know. And, and how bizarre is it? A friend of the goshes. So somebody from Des Moines just happened to be at this Denver restaurant? I don't know. That's weird. I mean, if it wasn't a friend of the family... I mean, that would be, uh, that, that would be slightly less weird, that would be less weird, a lot less weird, actually, but continuing on here, in 1992, America's Most Wanted aired the Johnny Gosh story, and with the help of Paul Bonacci, several composite sketches were drawn of the principals involved in the alleged pedophilia ring. After the show aired, Noreen Gosh received a 14-page letter from a boy named Jimmy, who said the same men who abducted her son had abducted him, and to he told her that Johnny was still alive. Noreen said he knew personal details about her son that had never before been released and that she believes him. America's Most Wanted aired a series of interviews with Jimmy in March 1993 in which Jimmy talked about his friendship with Johnny. He said they had made a blood oath to protect and help each other and to trust each other always. Jimmy said he was with Johnny at the ranch in Colorado. So, so we have multiple people here. This is not just one crazy person. There's another guy here corroborating Bonacci. So, and this guy was with Johnny at the ranch in Colorado for four years, and that when Jimmy was overheard talking about escaping, he too was branded. Jimmy lifted his pant leg and revealed the large brand on his leg similar to the brand Paul Bonacci had seen on Johnny. Jimmy later met with Noreen and John Gosh and gave them a diary he had kept of his life. Included in it were some of Johnny's memories of the time when he was a paper boy. Jimmy wrote that Johnny had 37 customers and how proud he felt when he won the local paper boy competition and won a free airline ticket. Noreen says all of that is true. 37 customers, that's a specific point there. Wait, so how did Jimmy es so how did Jimmy escape? America's most wanted producers took Paul Bonacci to Colorado in an attempt to find the Colonel's ranch where these boys say they were held. Outside of Buena Vista, Bonacci recognized a piece of property. He physically reacted when he walked up to the front door and began to cry uncontrollably. Paul showed America's most wanted the secret underground chamber where he says the children were put in case authorities came by. Paul says some of the boys were placed there blindfolded as a form of punishment. 
is Johnny Gosh alive? In 97, Noreen Gosh says Johnny himself paid her a visit. He stayed for an hour and told her what happened and why he could never come home or see her again because of the criminal activity he's now involved in. That sparked a book penned by Noreen called Why Johnny Can't Come Home. But the latest twist is the most bizarre. On August 27, 2006, two photos were left at the home of Noreen Gosh. In one photo, a young boy is tied and gagged and a brand mark is seen on his upper arm, which surprisingly appears identical to the brand mark on Jimmy's ankle that America's Most Wanted videotaped in 1993. It is also identical to the one Paul Bonacci described to America's Most Wanted in 1992 that he claimed to have seen on Johnny Gosh's rear end in the late 80s. The other photo shows three boys lying side by side in a bed also bound and gagged. Noreen Gosh was certain her son Johnny is in two of the photos and quickly turned them over to the police for analysis. But just this week, the West Des Moines police say Johnny Gosh is not among the boys in the photos. Nelson Zalva, a retired detective from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office in Tampa, recognized the photos as evidence in a case he investigated in 78 or 79, which predates Johnny Gosh's 82 disappearance. Zalva says all the boys in the photos were identified, but failed to provide authorities with enough evidence to prosecute the man who took the pictures. Hillsborough Sheriff's Department is now researching their files to locate the original photos because retired detective Zalva does not recall seeing a brand mark on the boy in the photo. Also, how old is this guy? Is he having memory issues? Which raises the probability that this is in all likelihood another cruel hoax played on Noreen Gosh, a mother so desperate to have her son back. So let's go over this timeline again, just to get the, the record straight here. So September 6th, 82, the disappearance. March 83, sightings. A 12-year-old boy matching Johnny's description approached a woman leaving a store in Oklahoma. He says, I'm John David Gosh. Please help me. Before the woman could do anything, two men approached the boy and led him away. She later reported this to police in October 83 after seeing Johnny's photo during the NBC movie Adam. She immediately phoned authorities and the FBI later confirmed that they believe it was Johnny Gosh. So are the, the FBI has stated they believe that this sighting was Gosh in March 83. So he says, I'm John David Gosh. She doesn't know who that is. But he's saying, please help me in March. And she doesn't report it till October until she sees a photo of the, of the boy that was missing. So what, what was she thinking? I mean, yeah, it's, it's crazy. That's crazy. April 19th, 1983. On the night of April 19th, 83, Noreen answers her telephone. It's a boy on the other end who says, please help me, please help me, I can't get away. Are you okay, Noreen asks? Yes, says the caller, his speech was slurred. Where are you? She asked, but the caller hung up. Noreen was convinced it's Johnny on the phone and she hangs on to the idea that he's still alive. Unfortunately, police were unable to trace the call and the lead slipped through their fingers. The West Des Moines police don't believe the calls are legitimate, but Noreen insisted the caller was her son. Even her husband, John, began to worry, is it true or is it just a mother grasping at straws? Yeah, I don't see that. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I don't know what to make of that one because... I mean, it, so they verified that there was a call at that time. They were just unable to trace it based on the wording here. That's what it seems like. Hmm. Yeah, that's tough. That's really tough. It, now, here's how did Johnny Gosh usually speak? Because if would he say, help me, mom, or... When she picked up, she didn't say hello, and he just rambled that out because he didn't know who picked up. And he said, please help me, please help me, I can't get away. He could, if, also, if he was drugged, I mean, yeah, who knows how exactly he'd be talking. But continuing on in the timeline here, August 12th, 1984, another paper boy vanishes. Two years after Johnny disappeared, 12-year-old Eugene Martin, another paper boy for the Des Moines Register, disappeared while on his newspaper route. So he's also 12 years old. Mm. 
1985, so many leads, so little hope. In the mid-80s, sightings of Johnny were reported all over the U.S. His mother received letters supposedly from Johnny saying he was alive, still under kidnappers' control. Unfortunately, the case remained a mystery and no progress was made from these leads. I mean, how many missing persons cases of, uh, of a young kid like this does the family receive hoax letters, supposedly, from, from their missing child? I mean, how could he have gotten a way to get the letter? I mean, mm, yeah, it's, it's tough. 89, a conspiracy is born. Paul Bonacci, convicted child molester, went public with a story he said he helped abduct Johnny Gosh back in 82. Bonacci claimed that he himself had been kidnapped by a man named Emilio and was forced into an organized ring of pedophiles. From there, he was prostituted and also helped lure young boys for the abduction. As Bonacci says, was the case was Johnny Gosh. 1990, smoking gun exploded. Investigator Gary Caridori, who was investigating Paul Bonacci's claims for the Nebraska state legislation, urgently phoned State Senator Lauren Schmidt from Chicago saying he had found the smoking gun. On his plane flight to show the case cracking evidence, his plane exploded and everything was lost. October 91, Noreen Gosh meets Paul Bonacci face to face, emotional conversation. She says that Bonacci told her things about her son that nobody else would know. 1991, that summer, a message was written in red nail polish on a bathroom wall of a Denver restaurant. Johnny Gosh was here. 1992, Johnny's story airs on America's Most Wanted, Jimmy Stemps Forward. America's Most Wanted aired the Johnny Gosh story, and with the help of Paul Bonacci, several composite sketches were drawn of the principals he says were involved. After the show aired, Noreen Gosh received a 14-page letter from a boy named Jimmy, who said the same men who had abducted her son had abducted him, and he told her that Johnny was still alive. Noreen said he knew personal details about her son that he had never, that had never been released before, and she believes him. March 93, Jimmy gets interviewed. Jimmy stepped forward and was interviewed on America's Most Wanted. While he never showed his face, Jimmy gave a lot of solid evidence. He spoke of his friendship with Johnny, showed evidence of branding he tells was a punishment for the boys, and even got a diary he kept of it, and even gave a diary he kept of his horrible experience. So then basically nothing until 97. In 97, this is the, the visit, the Johnny Gosh visit to Noreen Gosh, stayed for an hour, described the criminal activity. August 2006, the latest piece of evidence in the World One case was the arrival of two photos left on Noreen Gosh's porch. The two photos show a series of boys bound and gagged. Noreen says that she recognizes one of these boys as her son. You know what's also curious is, is it just too convenient? That Detective Zalva and this uh, Tampa area sheriff's office, they cannot provide definitive proof that this was from that case. I mean, is, is that troubling? That's kind of troubling. It's like you can't rule that out. It's just weird. It's just weird and unnerving. So let's continue now here back to the CavDef.org write-up. So... The suspicious activity in the timeline started with this woman with California plates taking photos of Johnny Gosh months before his disappearance. Okay, now the next point of suspicious activity, there were hang-up phone calls at the Gosh's home. So this is from Noreen Gosh's book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home. So page two, early on September 5th, 82, our phone rang. I looked at the clock and it was 1.30 a.m. My husband took the call saying, yes, all right, yes, all right, okay, then hung up. I asked him who it was and he replied it was a wrong number. I remember thinking it was very odd. We had been receiving calls like this every Sunday morning at the same time for the past four weeks. Never before had my husband spoken to anyone until this call, but he always said they were just hang-up calls. So some people, I might as well introduce this theory here, some people think that Johnny Gosh's father might have been involved in some way. Now, this phone activity, I don't know what to make of that. Continuing our book here, page 75, following this business trip, we began to receive hang-up phone calls every night, usually about 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. John always answered the phone. It was located on his nightstand. 
page 77, we received a phone call at 1.30 a.m. every Sunday morning from the beginning of August until September 5th, the morning Johnny was kidnapped. My husband John would pick up the phone and say you've got the wrong number and hang up. On the morning of the kidnapping, September 5th, 1982, at 1.35 a.m., the phone rang. He answered. I woke up to him to hear him saying, All right. All right. Okay. Then he hung up. I questioned him about the call, and he kept insisting it was a wrong number. He seemed nervous at the time. But it was late, and I drifted back to sleep, not realizing the worst was about to happen. Okay, what does everybody make of that? Because, again, anything out of the ordinary, so these calls only happen on Sundays, which happened to be the day of the paper route and when he disappeared. I mean, yeah, the coincidence stack, I mean, I don't like it. I don't like it. I mean, this is just, this is really weird. What does everybody make of this? I mean, at first I was I was kind of thinking maybe it's not related, but it was on only on Sundays, and then apparently up till he disappeared. So then they never happen again. I mean, that's kind of weird. Okay, another suspicious activity here: weird encounter with a policeman at a football game on Friday. Okay, I mean we're going into major mind shock territory here. So this is an article by Tom Alex and Tom Suck. Suk, S U K, <laughs> the Des Moines Register. The Goshes state police not cooperating with us. Parents of John Gosh, the missing West Des Moines newspaper carrier, say that two days before their son disappeared, he spent some time talking to a police officer at Valley Stadium in West Des Moines. In fact, on the way home that night, young John Gosh said he might want to become a police officer when he grew up, the parents say. The Goshes say the man who talked to their son on September 3rd resembles a man talking to their son the morning he disappeared, but they say West Des Moines police have not cooperated in their efforts to identify the officer. What? The missing boy's parents, John and Noreen Gosh, said in a letter to the Des Moines Register, we have been fighting, trying to get the police to get the names of the men that were on duty that night, and they said that they couldn't. That it wasn't that important. Well, it is important because this man bears a resemblance to the composite sketch of the last person John Gosh was seen talking to. West Des Moines Police Chief Orville Cooney said he did not know the Goshes had been having a problem getting to see photos of the men. There were a total of 10 officers working the game that night, said Cooney. They have seen all but two of them, and we are going to get Polaroids of those two. But what's taking so long? He has time to do all these interviews, but he doesn't have time to get the polar... What? Relations between the Goshes and the police have been strained at times during the investigation. The Goshes continued their criticism of the police in the letter, saying the police investigation of their son's disappearance September 5th as he prepared to deliver his newspapers leaves a lot to be desired. West Des Moines police still do not have a set of fingerprints of our son for identification purposes. What? This is November 9th, 1982 in the Des Moines Register. This is unbelievable. What? Says the letter, nor hair samples, etc. Our private detective did this immediately when he came on the case. Over half of our son's customers on the paper route were never interviewed. Our private detective did this immediately, Noreen Gosh added that the police have still not released the composite drawing of the man who was seen talking to young John the morning he disappeared. Cooney said police had gone through the boy's room, but he said he didn't know if fingerprints had been lifted. At this point, fingerprints are not important to the investigation, the chief said. He added that he did not know how many people have been interviewed by the investigators, but I do know they interviewed an awful lot of people up there. Police have def deferring sketches from two witnesses and the man last seen with the boy. He said police have not released the sketches because if it's inaccurate, I hate like heck to release it. So it's better to release nothing? I mean, if there's two sketches, it's either one or the other, possibly neither, possibly a mix of two, but how does releasing nothing help the case? Asked how he responded to the criticism, Cooney said, I'd probably be saying and doing just what they are if I were them. I want to keep the pressure on too, but we're doing everything we can. Okay, so what do we make of this? So 
obviously a terrible response, but if one of the officers, I mean, this is kind of crazy. If one of the officers is one of the abductors, I mean, that could explain if the police department is in on the conspiracy. I mean, that sure would explain why they're dragging their feet on the investigation and they're only showing like some of the officers that were present, but wow. Okay. So another issue here is the insistence by Johnny that he could go on the paper route by himself. So that's the other thing too. So this is the first time ever he goes by himself. People Magazine has an article here, October 10th, 1988. An anguished mother refuses to give up hope for the son who vanished six years ago. And it states here that there were two men seen talking to Johnny before the... Okay. Hmm, not one. Also, it states the Goshes have two other children, a daughter and a son and that they are dealing with crank calls, death threats, and exploitation by people trying to capitalize on their desperation. So here's Noreen Gosh. Johnny was in junior high, wanted to have a paper route so he could start earning a little money of his own. During the week, he delivered the papers in the afternoon, but on Sunday mornings, he had to leave when it was still dark and the streets were empty. That concerned me, but my husband said he would go with Johnny, and that became the pattern. On this particular Sunday, however, that's not what happened. The night before, Johnny complained that he was the biggest kid picking up papers and he wanted to do the route by himself. We said no, but the next morning, Johnny went off alone without waking his father. We were awakened by the phone at 7 a.m. as neighbors called to say they hadn't gotten their papers. A block and a half from the house is where Johnny's wagon full of papers was found, and then the dog had actually wandered home later. Okay, this is going to get totally mind shock land. So here, here's, okay. So my husband called the police. I began phoning the other newsboys who picked up their papers at the same corner. They told me about a man who had pulled up in a car, supposedly to ask Johnny for directions. A short time later, the man came back. The other boys said Johnny thought there was something weird about this guy. And he told them, quote, I don't like this. I'm taking my papers and going home, end quote. So something disturbed him so much about this guy that he's not going to deliver the papers. He's just going home. One of the boys heard our dog growling. And when he looked up, he saw a second, very tall man following Johnny and attempting to talk to him. The man followed Johnny around the corner out of sight. Then the boys heard a car door slam. That noise also woke up a kid in a nearby house. He looked out of the window and saw a blue two-tone car run the stop sign and speed away. So there's some interesting details here in this People magazine article that weren't anywhere else here. The whole abduction sequence took no longer than 12 minutes. Yeah, this is really creepy. And then, of course, this article also has, uh... I mean, another, another interesting, just through this whole People magazine article, I mean, she describes uh, people, I mean, calls. I mean, she got one call here, June 84. We got a call from a local man who claimed he had information about Johnny and wanted to help. We met with him and became suspicious because he knew so much about the case. The police started monitoring him. Soon, I started getting phone threats. A mail caller with an unfamiliar voice said, Why don't you drop the case before you get hurt, Mrs. Gosh? The calls continued for months with someone breathing on the other end and hanging up. Within 20 minutes of the call, a man we didn't recognize would appear in our backyard and throw rocks at the windows. We called the police, but they, would never, they could never catch him. 
Why didn't they just shoot him in the knee? Then in August 85, I heard from a Tulsa man who said he had information that could close the case. He told me to meet him at a Tulsa hotel and what airline to take. The FBI checked and the, and indeed the man had made a reservation for me. The decision was made to send the police woman in my place. The man met her and was arrested, convicted of fraud, and sent to prison. This incident made us feel all the more that our personal safety was now at stake, so with police consent, I held a press conference and said we knew who Johnny's kidnapper was. The local man police had been watching left town and the threats and harassment stopped a further indication of his involvement. I mean, if he was really guilty in all this, why would he be drawing attention to himself by going in their backyard and throwing rocks? I mean, right? I mean, if if the whole Franklin ring is true and all that, it seems like they, they hired some stooge guy to do some harassment, or he's just an unrelated psycho. The man is back in Des Moines now. The police can't prove anything against him, so it's still a waiting game, and it may be that way for years. This past February, we received a typed letter postmarked from a western city, supposedly from Johnny. It starts out by saying he was forced to do many things that disgusted him and that he hopes we will never forget him and we will continue to love him even though he will not be permitted to return home. He talks about his hair being dyed and his looks being changed. The thing that really hit us was the way the letter was signed, your son, Johnny Gosh. Johnny was the only one of our children who ever signed notes that way. We used to make it a family joke, telling him he didn't have to give us his first and last name and sign things your son because we knew who he was. When I asked the FBI if they thought Johnny wrote it, they said they were keeping an open mind. Does that sound kind of patronizing? Some more dark details here. Six months after Johnny was kidnapped, our private detective received information about an auction that was being held in Houston. He was told that American boys between the age of 10 and 14 were being sold to foreign buyers. The detective had a contact who had gotten into the auction and agreed to buy Johnny back if he was on the block that night. But Johnny wasn't there. John, I, I hope they got all the people involved there. What the heck? That's crazy. John and I have spent hours going through the porn magazines where missing kids have been known to show up so far nothing with johnny's picture has surfaced it's still may i have to have something to cling to there hasn't been a day when johnny has been out of my thoughts i keep wondering what he looks like if he's alive he's 18 and looks like a man maybe with a beard but in our minds johnny will always be 12 years old laughing and happy like he was we've lived without johnny a long time now it's not new to us but it still hurts so yeah i mean Obviously, very, very heart-wrenching for the family. But, yeah, some interesting details there. And also, this was the first time that Johnny is going to go on the route by himself. So, a man in a car, creepy guy, talks to Johnny, asks directions, leaves. And po actually asks other boys, then leaves. The boys and Johnny say that the guy is creepy, whatever. And then the guy comes back talks to him again, and then leaves again, and then Johnny states he's going home now because something's not right with that guy. Uh, see, in these situations, I mean, what's the best course of action for him to, like, cut through the neighbor's properties and hop fences, get off the main road? I mean, it's just... And then the other boys actually heard a car door slam. I mean, that's crazy. And the door slam was loud enough that it woke up someone else in the house nearby who saw the car. So, okay, I don't know. What are everybody's thoughts on police involvement? Let's examine more details here. So the police and FBI response, taking 45 minutes until their arrival, during which time Noreen had already collected the witness accounts suspecting Johnny was a runaway. On September 8th, Noreen says she told police about suspicious incidents occurring just before the abduction, like the phone calls and the policeman who interacted with Johnny at the football game. Noreen sees a story in early October on two Des Moines girls forced into prostitution in Nebraska 
and suggests the police investigate. When Cooney refuses, she holds a press conference to call attention to the story and soon receives a death threat to, quote, stop making waves, end quote. Wow. Who, so she's making waves. Who made this death threat? Police? I mean, this is crazy. Let's continue on here, Noreen's investigation. Hiring private detectives within about a month of Johnny's abduction. Dennis Whalen attended a child auction in Houston, Texas in December 82 to look for Johnny Gosh. I hope he gave all that information to investigators. On March 2nd, 83, Johnny Gosh was sighted in a large southwestern city later identified as being in Oklahoma. A boy was being chased by two men, ran up to a woman, and told her, Please, lady, help me. My name is John David Gosh. Before the men dragged him away, police initially dismissed the woman's report as a family situation. But after, I mean, what kind of family situation has two grown men stronging arming a boy? I mean, that's weird. But after seeing Johnny Gosh's photograph on TV, the woman recognized him as the boy she had seen and reported it to police again. So she did report it initially. Okay, because I was a little, that's kind of weird to not report that. So she reported it, brushed off, then she reported it again when she recognized him. The report made its way to Gosh's family's private detectives at the investigative research agency who checked it out with the FBI. Both the PIs and the FBI came to the conclusion that the boy was indeed Johnny Gosh. Early in 84, Noreen was first contacted by a PI from D.C. named Paul Bishop. As she would later reveal, Bishop identified himself as a CIA asset. What the heck? So she, he was the one who contacted her in 1984. Huh, this is weird. In June 84, Noreen was contacted by a local man who claimed to have valuable information on Johnny's case. According to Noreen's sworn 1999 testimony and 2000 book, this was Des Moines PI Sam Soda calling her to arrange a meeting. They met at Soda's office, June 13, 1984. Noreen brought a tape recorder, switched it on, and listened as Soda revealed that there would be a second kidnapping taking place in Des Moines. Soda specified that it would occur on the south side of Des Moines. The victim would be another paperboy, and it would take place on the second weekend in August. He credited the information to an informant. Noreen thanked him for the information, but was puzzled why he didn't go to the police. Why is he telling her of all people? I mean, what? What? This doesn't make any sense. So she has a tape recording of this. And this is Sam Soda. A local PI. Does this make any sense to anybody? So regarding Sam Soda's involvement here, apparently he did blow the whistle on Frank Sikora, a sexual predator who worked at the paper. So this is an article, October 19th, 1984, UPI archives. A former newspaper employee who confessed to having sexual contact with at least seven of the young carriers he supervised at Iowa's largest newspaper pled innocent today to sexual abuse charges. Frank Sikora, 37, of Des Moines, turned himself into authority 7 a.m., and pled innocent to one charge of third-degree sexual abuse and one count of lewd and lascivious acts with a child. Polk County Associate District Judge Norman Elliott set the bond to $5,000 each count. Sikora was fired from his job in the Des Moines Register Circulation Department Monday when a PI released a videotape confession in which Sikora discusses his relationship with at least seven paperboys. However, Haviland said officials do not rely solely on the two-hour tape made by investigator Sam Soda. He said Thursday's charges were based on information gathered during a police investigation. Police have said a polygraph test earlier this week showed Sikora had no involvement in the disappearance of registered newspaper carriers Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin. Gosh vanished September 5th, 82, while delivering newspapers. Martin disappeared from his paper route August 12th. On the videotape, Sikora confessed to sleeping with seven young newspaper carriers who worked as runners on his routes. 
He said he fondled almost all the boys, Soda said. Soda suggested Sakura may have some information about the missing boys. This is a man who is in a position where he knows all the routes and all the carriers, said Soda. Spokesman of the anti-child pornography group called Stolen Children are reported every day. Okay, other people say Soda is uh, not a trustworthy source. However, if he did this investigation into Sakura and possibly others at the newspaper, I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy. So this newspaper official, newspaper employee is abusing these children and uh, there could be a con and and these newspaper and newspaper boys happen to be going missing. I mean, is this all not coincident? What what's going on here? This is not a coincidence, really. I mean, what is going on? And then Sam Soda is now knows the exact date of when someone else is going missing, but he doesn't tell the police, or maybe he does, or maybe does he know the police are compromised? By Noreen's account, she then unsuccessfully tried to convince law enforcement and the media to heed the warning about a second kidnapping. Only Des Moines Register reporter Frank Santiago was willing to listen to the tape. So nobody else even wanted to listen to the tape. They just don't care. This is just so insane. Sometime around August 84, Noreen was invited to testify in Washington, D.C. at Senator Arlen Specter's hearing on pedophile rings. Her book, written in 2000, called the hearings Organized Crime and Its Relationship to Kidnapping or the Organized Crime Hearings and Its Relationship to Missing Children, but the published title was The Effect of Pornography on Women and Children. Paul Bishop accompanied her to the testimony which took place August 8, 1984. And there is a sketch here of the man seen talking to Eugene Martin just before his disappearance. And mm -hmm. in September 1984, a federal grand jury in Des Moines subpoenaed Paul Bishop to testify about the Gosh and Martin cases. What? Why? The CIA, why is the CIA asset involved in this in these cases? During the month of October, Sam Soda exposed a pedophile named Frank Sakura, who worked for the Des Moines Register. I went over that article. In June 1985, a dollar bill surfaced in Sioux City, Iowa, with the message, I am alive, Johnny Gosh, written on it. Three handwriting experts confirmed the message as having been written by Johnny Gosh. I mean, how old was it, though? Because this is a dollar bill. Like, how old was the writing on it by June 1985? According to Noreen, shortly after the disappearance of Eugene Martin, she and several others in Des Moines were anonymously mailed a rather, a, a rather curious modified version of the kidnapped John David Gosh poster. Below, the sketch of the man from the Blue Ford Fairmont was another sketch that perfectly resembled Sam Soda. And perhaps to illustrate that point, a newspaper photograph of Soda was included right next to the sketch. An arrow was drawn from the sketch of Soda to the sketch of the man in the Ford Fairmont. With the exact date that the poster was mailed, while the exact date that the poster was mailed is unknown because it incorporated a photo of Sam Soda from a Des Moines Register article on October 10th, 1984. The poster must have been sent in late 85 at the earliest. It is interesting to note that the Sam Soda composite sketch was not drawn from scratch, but rather modified from the sketch of the man in the blue car as the hairline, ears, nose, and facial structure are identical. Thus, the poster appears to have been suggesting that Sam Soda was the man in the car seen on the morning of Johnny's abduction. I mean, is anybody having trouble keeping up with the amount of coincidences here? As Noreen would later recount in 1988, the local man who called in June 1984 offering to help on the case, Sam Soda, soon attracted suspicion from the Gosh family because of how much he knew about the pedophile underworld in Des Moines. 
His foreknowledge of Martin's disappearance and his exposure of a previously unknown pedophile at the Des Moines Register confirmed that. Noreen claims that police began monitoring the man, which in turn led the Goshes to start receiving harassment and threats at home. Are they saying that Sam Soto was the guy threatening them? Okay. Following the Tulsa incident, the Gosh family feared for their safety. So Noreen held a press conference saying they knew who kidnapped Johnny. At the press conference, Noreen referred to three men from Des Moines along with a pedophile contact in Houston. She asserted that the police also knew the identities of the men and were doing everything within their legal boundaries to arrest them. A statement to which police gave no comment. Noreen acknowledged that her announcement might cause the kidnappers to flee, but pointed out that that would be revealing too, wouldn't it? Following the press conference, said Noreen, the local man being watched by police, Sam Soda, left town and the harassment against the family stopped. Not long afterwards, the man returned to Des Moines. It is unclear whether the perpetrators she named were actual suspects or if the announcement was some kind of bluff to put pressure on the real person of interest, Soda. On Valentine's Day in 1988, a typed letter by someone claiming to be Johnny arrived at the Gosh home postmarked from Idaho. The author said that the captors dyed his hair, changed his looks, and that he was forced to do things that disgusted him. He asked that the Goshes for their continued love and forgiveness, even though he would not be allowed to return home. The letter was signed, Your Son Johnny Gosh, a very distinctive way that Johnny used to sign notes. According to Noreen, the letter was further validated by its reference to the 1983 incident with Johnny in Oklahoma, which was publicized but never had the city revealed. Bonacci comes forward. By September 1990, the Gosh family stated that their investigation had wound down. Nevertheless, they held firm to the belief that Johnny was taken out of the area in a well-organized kidnapping and resolved to continue working on their case. It was around that time they had received a major lead from John DeCamp, the lawyer for the Franklin child sex ring victim Paul Bonacci. As DeCamp recounted, it was reading a transcript of Bonacci's interview with a psychiatrist and noticed that Bonacci mentioned an incident involving a newspaper carrier in Iowa. DeCamp was struck by its similarity to the Gosh case and went to the library to verify the details, confirming that the date stated by Bonacci matched the date of Johnny's abduction. He contacted the Gosh family in late 1990 to inform them he had a client who confessed to helping abduct Johnny Gosh. The call was taken by John Gosh Sr., who did not tell Maureen about the new information. Though initially skeptical, Leonard Gosh ultimately did come down to the prison to meet Bonacci. DeCamp recalled that John came to Nebraska a couple weeks after their initial contact and walked into the Lincoln Correctional Center to meet with Bonacci. He asked Bonacci, do you know who I am? And Bonacci responded, you look like, it can't be the eyes, you look like Johnny Gosh. John came away from the meeting believing that Bonacci was sincere and telling the truth. Around the time John met with Bonacci in prison, he hired Omaha private detective Roy Stevens to check out Bonacci's story. Stevens spent hundreds of hours interviewing Bonacci and tracking down leads in Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, and Colorado that Bonacci provided. Bonacci described to Stevens how a man named Emilio, who made his living abducting and selling children, brought him to Des Moines to help abduct Johnny Gosh. Emilio was the driver of the blue car who stopped to ask Johnny for directions, and Bonacci was in the back of the car given the task of holding Johnny down after he was shoved into the car. Two other people were also implicated by Bonacci in the kidnapping, one of whom who was a local contact in Des Moines. The night before, they stayed at a hotel in Des Moines. Going from a skeptic of Bonacci's to a believer in his account, Stevens insisted that Bonacci hasn't told me anything that hasn't been true. I wonder how much investigation was done. So at the hotel, I mean, did they give fake names? They weren't able to track these guys from the hotel. Or they paid cash, whatever. 
Noreen Gosh did not learn about Bonacci until March 91, although accounts differ on whether it was her husband or Roy Stevens who first informed her. The account in which her husband was the one to inform her contains what is likely a false explanation of why Noreen was not in the loop regarding Bonacci from the beginning. Giving more credibility to the account in Noreen's book that it was Stevens who first called her about Bonacci's confession and visited Des Moines to show her tapes of Bonacci interviews. To test Bonacci's veracity, the Goshes gave Stevens a photo for Bonacci to identify of a Des Moines man whom they had already suspected of being involved in the abduction. Stevens only received a photo, not a name or any other identifying information. When Stevens placed it in a lineup of a dozen photos, Bonacci picked out the Des Moines man, said the man's name, and identified him as the local contact who came to the motel the night before with a photo of Johnny informing the kidnappers that he was the kid they were going to take. As Noreen told the Des Moines Register, this contact in Des Moines had been under suspicion by the family for some time. The Des, Mo the Des Moines man was not identified in news reports at the time, but the Goshes said that Bonacci provided good information on him and identified his photograph and stated that PIs were gathering information on him almost daily. His first name of Sam would eventually be publicized, and in 2000, Noreen publicly, Noreen explicitly revealed that the man picked out of the lineup was Sam Soda. It can be seen above that even as far back as 1986, Soda was suspected by the Gosh family. At the end of June 1991, it was made public that Roy Stevens was investigating good information that had recently surfaced in Johnny's case. No specifics were revealed until a month later when news stories began to break about Bonacci's confession to helping abduct Johnny Gosh. In October 91, Bonacci gave his first detailed public account of the Johnny Gosh abduction. He claimed to have met the ringleader Emilio as a young boy living in Carter Lake, Iowa. The day before the abduction, Emilio took him from Omaha to a hotel in Des Moines where they met men named Sam and Tony. Bonacci described Sam as white, medium height, and heavy, and Tony as tall, blonde, with a bad complexion. In the motel room the night before the abduction, Sam was shown Sam was showing Emilio photographs of various paper boys, telling him how much money he could make off of them. One photo, that of Johnny Gosh, was separated from the stack. Early the next morning, all of them went out to abduct Johnny. Bonacci rode in the back of the car, driven by Emilio. At a certain point, the car stopped and a boy was shoved in. Following the orders of Emilio, Bonacci held the boy down and chloroformed him. All of the kidnappers drove off, with Johnny's body being transferred between the other two vehicles driven by Sam and Tony. They stopped in Council Bluffs, Iowa to get a drink, then brought Johnny to a farmhouse near Sioux City, owned by a man named Charlie. Johnny was scared and crying and asked Bonacci what was going to happen to him. For at least a week, Johnny was kept in a locked, windowless room at the farmhouse. Subsequently, Johnny ended up being held captive in Colorado, where Bonacci saw him again in March 1986. Paul Bonacci's account of meeting Johnny Gosh predated the visit from John Gosh Sr. In October 1990, while Bonacci was in prison, he had been since 89, Caracor investigator Robert Hansel met with Alicia Owens' mother to discuss the contents of Bonacci's diary. One passage referred to an incident in September 82 in which Emilio took Bonacci to a farmhouse in Iowa where two boys were being held captive. The older of the two boys was named Johnny, came from Des Moines, was about 13 years old, had blue eyes, brown hair, and wore a Kim's Academy shirt with black athletic pants. All of these characteristics noted down in Bonacci's diary, including the clothing, match up with Johnny Gosh at the time of his abduction. Not only would Bonacci not have access to these diaries while in prison, but forensic analysis verified that Bonacci's diaries were written contemporaneously with the events they referred to. Robert Hansel confirmed that Johnny Gosh had surfaced in the Franklin investigation no later than July 1990 and from other kids besides Bonacci. Throughout the past decade, many had tried to deceive the Gosh family into thinking they had information on Johnny. Unlike these hoaxers, Bonacci not only knew multiple obscure, 
like tongue and leg scars, and undisclosed, a stutter when stressed and being taken by Noreen to her yoga classes, personal characteristics of Johnny Gosh, but possessed substantial information about the abduction logistics, which had never been revealed to the public. Photos taken of Johnny before the abduction. The Gosh's PI turned up a witness in the neighborhood who saw Johnny being photographed by a stranger a couple weeks before his kidnapping. This discovery was never publicized. In Paul Bonacci's account of the abduction, he described how Sam brought a photograph of Johnny and told the kidnappers that he was the boy they would abduct, matching this then unrevealed information that Johnny had been photographed by a third party in advance of his kidnapping. Beyond just knowing the existence of pre-abduction photography, Bonacci's description of the photograph shown by Sam matched the location where in the neighborhood Johnny was and circumstances Johnny carrying his paper bag of the photos as described by the neighbor. How the abduction took place. As discussed above, Bonacci identified Sam Soto's photograph from a lineup and named his as Sam. The fact that he could identify a Des Moines man whom the Gashes had already come to suspect in their own investigation confirms Bonacci's knowledge of the circumstances behind the abduction. Moreover, Bonacci accurately described the multiple vehicles that were involved in the abduction. As explained below, press reports consistently claimed that there were different vehicles on Ashworth and Marquardt, even though the Gashes had concluded that the same car simply drove around the block. Bonacci only described one blue car that approached Johnny and then drove around the block to abduct him, contradicting most public reports but matching what private investigators had found. Aside from the car publicly mentioned by police, the Gosh's private investigators also discovered a van that had been in the neighborhood, and Bonacci knew about it. Noreen described how one of her investigators spoke to a man who noticed something very strange on the morning of the abduction. A van was sitting parked on the street with its motor running. After some time, a car drove up. The passengers of that car transferred a large object with a blanket into their van. Then both vehicles left. What? That's crazy. Bonacci independently matched these unpublicized details in his own account of the abduction, mentioning a van driven by Tony that they transferred Johnny's body into. He also described there being a station wagon near the scene of the abduction that was driven by Sam. According to Noreen, the Iowa DMV confirmed to her that Sam Soda did own a vehicle matching Bonacci's description. Wow. I mean, how many people's heads are spinning now? Because I, I know a lot of people just totally and outright dismiss Bonacci. But like, he just keeps nailing all these details. Like it's, how can you, how can you just discount this? It's crazy. Johnny Gosh was here at a Denver restaurant. Bonacci's story to Roy Stevens given in late 1990 and early 1991 involved Johnny being taken to Colorado. At the time, there was no reason for anyone to think Johnny had been in Colorado. Then, in the summer of 1991, family friends of the Goshes who were at a Mexican restaurant in Denver noticed Johnny Gosh was here written on the bathroom wall. This was a remarkable after-the-fact validation of Bonacci's claims regarding Johnny's whereabouts. After this sighting made its way back to the Gosh family, Roy Stevens went to check out the lead. He took several photos of the restaurant, including its exterior and the bathroom wall. When Bonacci was shown a picture of nothing but the restaurant from the outside, he accurately described the distinctive interior and recounted how he, Johnny, and another boy were painting their nails, then went into the bathroom and wrote on the wall using their red nail polish. Indeed, the message turned out to have been written with red nail polish, validating Bonacci's scenario of being with Johnny. I mean, that's a specific, that's definitely a specific thing to write with. Most people would say marker or whatever, pen. I mean, nail polish, wow. Bonacci had also received many letters during his incarceration, which referred to JG or Johnny Emilio and the COL. These were, according to Bonacci, sent to him by former victims of the Franklin Ring. One letter, postmarked June 1990 from Sacramento, referred to JG getting face surgery and going back to blonde, and that stated the colonel has gone to Mexico and took JG with him. And again, is it just coincidentally that there's this other John Gosh 
who died in Mexico, who, whose body turns up in Mexico. Another letter alluded to the other missing boys from Des Moines, like Eugene Martin, stating that JG was not the only boy we got from DM. Following his revelation of it to Roy Stevens, Bonacci showed Stevens a letter discussing the 1986 graffiti at the Mexican restaurant in Denver, which included the excerpt, I remember the restaurant in Colorado, we painted our nails, and I wrote on the wall with J.G. All right, so we're going to go even further into mind shock land now here. I mean, you cannot make this stuff up. I mean, I don't know how people just discredit all of this, but the coincidence stacks are so high. So the first America's Most Wanted episode on the case airs November 92. Jimmy Gibson comes forward in early 1993. He meets with Noreen. He stays in various places such as Nebraska with DeCamp and Reverend Morrow, the Gosh Hobby Farm outside of Woodward, Iowa, and perhaps Mary Schmidt's Hotel in Deadwood, South Dakota. Subsequent episodes of America's Most Wanted Air, which interview Jimmy and visit the house in Colorado. The Charlie Kerr farm surveillance is ruined by Leonard John Gosh, divorced not long after, hobby farm in Dallas County, Iowa. Okay, so what is this all about? So Charlie Kerr is this supposed Chuck, Charlie, whatever. This is where some believe Johnny and others were taken immediately after the abduction. So, Leonard John Gosh, Johnny Gosh's own father, is alleged to have warned Charlie Kerr that he was going to be arrested. And this is what's, what caused, basically, the incident that caused the divorce. Now, this is just completely mind-shocking. But I'm going to go in order here on the Cav Def right up. So, we'll get to that in a moment. So, controversies, other missing kids. It is suspected, but not confirmed, that the 1984 disappearance of Eugene Martin and the 1986 disappearance of Mark Allen are both connected to the same pedophile ring said to have abducted Johnny. All three boys were from Des Moines and about 13 years old at the time of the disappearances and roughly two years passed between each boy going missing, potentially implying some kind of pattern. Johnny and Eugene were particularly alike as they were both paper boys for the Des Moines Register. Another boy in the Midwest commonly linked to Johnny's abduction is Jacob Wetterling, who was kidnapped in Minnesota in 1989. Jacob's involvement in the Franklin pedophile ring is highly disputed. In 2016, local pedophile Danny Heinrich confessed to abducting and murdering Jacob and led them to his body, which was the same age as when he was abducted. Some local investigators, however, maintain that the body found was not really Jacob at all. What? I haven't seen that. They point to anomalies such as animal bones initially being found at the burial site amongst Jacob's clothing. And how police announced they would DNA test Jacob's alleged remains, but do not appear to have released any results. I wonder what the date of this is. I'm going I'm to double check this in a moment. Former New York Police Department officer Jim Rothstein, who did investigative work for Noreen, is one such person who believes the Wetterling case is still unresolved. Prior to Heinrich's confession, Noreen divulged in her book that Bonacci got a letter from another Franklin victim identifying Emilio and Charlie Kerr as participants in Jacob's abduction. She also claimed in a 2013 Franklin Files post, likely citing Rothstein, who said the same in a 2018 interview, that Sam Soda was in St. Cloud, Minnesota immediately before the kidnapping. In the same interview, Rostin claimed that Soda's presence in St. Cloud was under the cover of working for the Rowan Trucking Company, a non-publicized piece of information that Soda himself would later corroborate in an interview with the Faded Out podcast. Michaela Garricht, a nine-year-old girl abducted from the San Fran area in 1988, was long suspected to be another victim of Tony. 
The description that Bonacci gave of Tony was remarkably similar to the description of Michaela's kidnapper, and when Roy Stevens showed Bonacci sketches from several child abductions that resembled his Tony description, Bonacci adamantly identified the sketch from Michaela's case. In December 2020, David Mish was arrested for Michaela's kidnapping and murder based on an alleged identification of a handprint on Michaela's scooter that the kidnapper had moved near his car to lure her over. That case is currently in progress and it remains to be seen whether the evidence holds up in court. Although Mish's involvement does not negate the pre-existing evidence of a larger plot behind her kidnapping. Back in 1989, U.S. Customs agents found indications that Michaela Garrett and Amber Swartz Garcia, another Bay Area kidnapping victim from earlier in 1988, were trafficked by pedophile Richard Helwig. Two child victims of Helwig in Mexico identified Michaela and Amber as having been with Helwig, and the mother of those victims said, but later recanted, that Helwig gave her earrings identical to the ones worn by Michaela. Helwig had been busted across the border near San Diego with, with child pornography information on ages of consent in various countries, copies of the Nambla Bulletin, and other pedophilia-related items. His San Francisco address was the same as the address for the Nambla chapter in that city. Nambla itself has been linked to the Franklin pedophile ring with Alicia Owens' lawyer reportedly finding evidence of a $5 million account for Nambla at the Franklin Credit Union. Okay, wow. That's, uh, that's a lot to unpack there. An interesting point here on Mark Allen, which is also suspicious. This is a post on charlieross.wordpress.com, November 27, 2010. A lot of people know that two boys named Johnny Gosh, age 12, and Eugene Martin, age 13, disappeared from Des Moines, Iowa in the 80s and were never found. But there was a third boy, 13-year-old Mark James Warren Allen, who also vanished mysteriously from Des Moines during that time period. And for whatever reason, he never gets any media attention. The police refused to investigate for two days. You'd think that from the previous two disappearances, they would have learned that time is of the essence, but no. So Mark Allen went missing March 29th, 1986, the day before Easter. Again, I mean, with these holidays, some of these saintness, man. 13-year-old Mark James Warren Allen told his mother he planned to walk to a friend's house down the street but never arrived at the neighbor's home, and he hasn't been seen since. Based on previous media reports, Allen initially was thought to be the third Iowa paperboy to vanish without a trace during the 80s. Johnny Gosh, 12, of West Des Moines, disappeared September 5th, 1982. 13-year-old Eugene Martin vanishes from Des Moines' south side just two years later, 84, under very similar circumstances. An in-depth Des Moines Register article on Iowa's missing persons published August 18th, 2013, confirmed Allen was not a paper boy. Teen was handful shifted back and forth. Mark's mother, Nancy Allen, admitted her son had been a handful. The teen had been shifted back and forth between her Iowa residence and his father's Minnesota home most of his young life, and he'd often get into trouble. But in late November 2010, a week normally filmed, filled with family get-togethers, shopping, and holiday activities, Nancy took time to speak with WHO-TV Channel 13's Aaron Brillbeck about what it's like waiting so many years for answers and wondering about the fate of a young son who never quite seemed to fit in. It was hard because he had been living with his dad for a while, then came back and lived with me, Nancy said. November 25th, 2010. His younger brother and older sister were real close, and he wanted to be in there in tight. They never got a chance for that to happen. The night before Easter 86, the teen left his Southwest Emma Avenue home to hang out with friends and perhaps take in a movie just as his siblings prepared for a pizza dinner. He walked out the door and the kids were getting ready to have pizza and I'll never forget it as long as I live. Alan told Brillbeck, the last thing he said to me as he walked out the door was, save me some pizza, mom. I'll be hungry when I get home. 
Nancy watched her son walk down the sidewalk past the bushes and then he was gone. He waved when he got to the bushes and I waved at him and that was that and I never saw him again, his mother said. The next morning, when Nancy realized Mark hadn't come home the night before, she knew immediately something wasn't right, but hoped against hope he'd prove her wrong. It was Easter Sunday, so I thought maybe he went to Grandma's, knowing Grandma would have an Easter basket there for each of the kids. So I asked my mom, but he wasn't there, she said. I had phone numbers for his friends, called all of them. No one had seen him. Alan said she called police, but they told her they couldn't do anything for 48 hours. Days turned into months. Police checked in Minnesota, where Mark's father lived, and in Connecticut, where the boy's paternal grandmother lived. Nothing. Alan told Brillbeck she didn't know whether her son's disappearance was linked to the disappearances of Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin, but said police seemed reluctant to help her because of the other missing teens. Wait, what? Because other missing people are... are because there's other missing people, they're not going to help her? What the heck is this? I just feel like at this time they were just afraid of afraid of what would happen with the Eugene Martin and Gosh thing. I got the distinct feeling that they did not want parents to be frightened to let their children sell newspapers or do different things, she said. What? So they intentionally downplayed his case in the media, which seemed to have worked because he this Mar the Mark Allen case is the least publicized. I mean, in most of these write-ups I'm reading on Gosh, they only mention... Eugene Martin as the other missing, I mean, maybe because he was also a, a paper boy, but still, I mean, this is still relevant if there's a two-year pattern here. The Des Moines Police Department Sergeant Jeff Edwards disagrees. I know detectives followed up on leads that did not pan out, Edwards told Brillbeck in a separate interview, aired Thanksgiving Day 2010. They were not able to locate him. He's still listed as a missing person. No kidding. Mark's mother said she doesn't know whether her son is dead or alive, but after 25 years, she'd like to know for sure so she and her son can find peace. There are times when the news says they've found a body and they're not sh sure how old it is, but they're pretty sure it's male, said Nancy. And in one instant, you hold your breath and bite your fingernails and hope that it's not your child. And in other ways, you wish they would come out and say that it is your child so you can finally bury them and go to rest. Mark Allen was last seen wearing a light blue t-shirt, blue jean shorts, white socks, gray tennis shoes with Velcro, Velcro tabs. He has a small scar on the top of his head, and his first name might be spelled Mark with a K by some agencies involving missing children and persons. To date, there is no definitive evidence connecting Mark Allen's case to that of, of Johnny Gosh or Eugene Martin. So apparently a DNA sample was only submitted. Oh, a DNA sample was submitted. Okay. Regarding Jacob Wetterling, I actually can't find a definitive link. Just reports that it's him, but I can't find any official statements about the results of the DNA on the remains. Now, I guess I'm going to have to do a, a podcast on the Wetterling case because apparently... Actually, there's CBS News stated in uh, September 3rd, 2016, that a forensic odontologist identified the remains as Wetterlings. So this is dental or from his teeth? Hmm. I mean, again, if this was some kind of cover-up, obviously they could have done that. It would be nice to have multiple independent verifications here and DNA on the bone fragments, not just the teeth. Because supposedly they are, they, supposedly they were testing the remains, so, I don't know. This is really bizarre. Also, supposedly his DNA was found on other kidnapped victims. So, uh, again, this is not a Wetterling podcast, I'm not going to go too far down that, so depending on how quickly he would have been killed... Also, yeah, the timeline's weird, so they confirmed, supposedly they confirmed it was him before the results. I don't know. This is weird. So, let's uh, continue on here, back to Cav Def. Father's involvement. Since the late 90s, there have been suggestions that Johnny's father, Leonard John Gosh, was complicit in his son's kidnapping. No definitive evidence of his involvement has ever surfaced, 
All the while, Noreen Gosh and others have alleged many instances of suspicious behavior on Leonard's part, and he is known to be deceptive about key facts of the case. One question that has never been answered is why Johnny, on the one day he got abducted, did the paper route by himself instead of being accompanied by his father as usual. As Noreen stated in 1988 and in her 2000 book, Leonard always went with Johnny on Sunday mornings, and Leonard himself said this in the film Who Took Johnny that, quote, I was with him every Sunday morning except that particular Sunday morning that he was kidnapped, end quote. Going out that morning without Leonard left Johnny far more open to being abducted. Indeed, it is unlikely that an abduction would have succeeded in Leonard's presence. That Johnny broke this pattern for the first time on September 5th, 1982 and happened to be abducted the same day is incredible enough to raise suspicion that him being alone that morning was planned. I still, I'm still kind of reeling from the, the woman taking his photograph from weeks before. I mean, that's kind of, I can't get over that. I mean, that's so creepy. That's so creepy. And then, yeah, people, when you combine it with the phone calls and all these statements Leonard supposedly made, Noreen goes over them in the book, like last chance to go fishing that summer. I mean, with Johnny, there were, there were certain statements that Leonard had made. Supposedly he was very agitated. And then all those phone calls... Some alleged he was being blackmailed in some capacity. Noreen also said he threat Leonard threatened his own suicide from pressure or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely weird. Let's continue on here. At first glance, since it was up to Johnny to wake his father, not the other way around, this suspicion does not reflect on Leonard. Noreen stated as far back as 1988 that on the night before the kidnapping, Johnny asked to do the route alone, and she and her husband refused. But he disobeyed to deliver papers by himself that morning. But Noreen claimed in her book that when Johnny asked to do the route on his own, Leonard initially said yes before Noreen overruled him. Furthermore, even though Noreen refused his request, Johnny came back downstairs shortly after going to bed to hug his mother again and tell her, you are the best. Based on that, there are indications that Leonard went behind Noreen's back to ensure that Johnny would go out unaccompanied the next morning. I mean, how would anybody know if Leonard did? Yeah, if he did go to Johnny later and say, uh, yeah, you could actually go by yourself. How would anybody other than them know? This was far from the only irregular occurrence involving Leonard that Noreen alleged in her book. According to her, Leonard began acting very erratically a few months prior to Johnny's abduction, and his behavior only worsened afterwards. While many of her accusations about Leonard have not been corroborated, some of them have, and his inconsistent false statements about the case, see below, illustrate a general lack of credibility on his part. Early in 1982, Leonard allegedly developed a very hateful attitude, which he took out on all of Noreen's kids, but especially her older son, Joe Gosh. In June 82, he purportedly arranged a fishing trip with Joe and Johnny to Lake of the Ozarks because it might be their, quote, last or only opportunity to do so, end quote. And when they got back, Noreen's son told her that Leonard was very evidently depressed. The next month, while Leonard was on a business trip in Raleigh, North Carolina, he allegedly called Noreen threatening to kill himself because he could no longer live with it. And she had to make the Raleigh police do a welfare check. It can be surmised from Noreen's account that something happened in 1982 that put Leonard under a substantial amount of stress. So this is a this is August 82, before the abduction, or even earlier than, no, July. Ju this is July, has been the trip. Okay, then in August 82, Noreen claims that Leonard took Johnny on a j day trip to Omaha, with one of their destinations being Ofut Air Force Base. Johnny was said to have had a foggy memory of the trip. 
Per Noreen's account, immediately after the Omaha trip, she and Leonard began receiving those hang-up phone calls every Sunday morning, 1 a.m. They continued until the day of Johnny's abduction when Leonard answered not with wrong number as he usually did, but instead gave the caller a series of affirmative responses. After Johnny was kidnapped, the call stopped. These calls have only received limited corroboration, but if true, they raise the questions about what Leonard was up to in the weeks just before Johnny's abduction. Oh, I do not like this uh, Omaha trip. Johnny couldn't recall what happened. Then there's also a CIA asset calling Noreen afterwards to try to be involved in the case. So just a few weeks, he's at Air Force Base. Did the woman taking his pictures, was that after their visit to the Air Force Base? What kind of uh, personnel at the Air Force Base might have seen Johnny? I mean, this is kind of weird. This is really weird. After Johnny was kidnapped, Noreen was forced to shoulder most of the responsibility for keeping the case alive as Leonard was less inclined to go out in the public eye. Behind the scenes, meanwhile, the marriage was in serious turmoil, according to Noreen. Leonard began spending most of his time on purported business trips, not informing Noreen of his plans, whereabouts, or contact information while he was gone. Much of his time away was spent in Lincoln, Nebraska, and Omaha, Nebraska. There's Omaha again. They did still make public appearances together on the case, but some of them turned disastrous. Following an event near Davenport, Iowa, August 17, 1984, they were mm. invited to Leonard severely beat Noreen, an accusation corroborated by Scott County Sheriff's Deputy Sam Raley. Wow. After Franklin scandal victim Paul Bonacci confessed his involvement in Johnny's abduction, his attorney, John DeCamp, informed the Gosh family, but Noreen has accused Leonard of hiding this information from her. It was acknowledged even back in 1992 that Leonard checked out Bonacci on his own for several months before Noreen found out, and Leonard confirmed in 2018 interviews that he visited Bonacci in prison with John DeCamp and project investigator Roy Stevens, but not his wife. The question is whether Leonard's intent was to inform Noreen about Bonacci eventually, or keep the information hidden from her indefinitely. While the 92 article claims that it was Leonard who ultimately informed her about Bonacci, there are doubts about how accurately it describes Noreen and Leonard's motivations. It claims that Leonard checked out Bonacci during a period of six or seven months from late 1990 to March 91, when Noreen had completely shut down on the case. But there are newspaper quotes of her during that period which contradict that. It is therefore unexplained why Leonard spent a long period of time investigating Bonacci without telling Noreen, especially if he didn't seem that interested in any other aspect of the investigation. Is it because he knew Bonacci had real credible info? Per Noreen's later account in her book, she was actually informed not by her husband, but by Roy Stevens. In 1999 court testimony and her book, Noreen claimed that Leonard, in fact, went to great lengths to hide Bonacci from her, visiting key people from the Franklin investigation with a woman other than Noreen, who he introduced as his wife. Okay, all right, we're kind of going past the point of no return with Leonard here. I mean, this is not looking good. Noreen's book has a picture of this alleged Noreen impersonator standing beside Leonard, and the woman is exactly who Noreen claims, a Nebraska private eye who used to work with Roy Stevens. Yet the woman in question denies ever playing the role of a Noreen imposter and insists the image is faked. There is no definitive proof either way at the moment. If, however, the image is authentic, then it is clear that Leonard did have someone impersonate his wife, which certainly indicates an intent to deceive Noreen. See, this is kind of weird, though, because... If this is just a woman who works with Roy Stevens and unbeknownst to her, Leonard just introduced her as his wife and she didn't, whatever, it was an awkward moment and she didn't jump in to clarify, etc. But why would she claim the image is fake? I mean, that's, I mean, that's a bridge too far there. And now can Roy Stevens be trusted? But then again, he uncovered so much of this. Why wouldn't he be? I mean, I don't know. A lot of this does not make any sense. The final alleged incident between Noreen and Leonard had to do with the investigation of Charlie Kerr, on whose Iowa farmhouse Johnny was said to be held for a brief period of time following his abduction. Bonacci only knew Kerr by his first name, Charlie, but according to Noreen, he was able to draw a picture which Roy Stevens matched to Kerr with the help of Sioux City authorities. 
Kerr was described by Noreen as having a lengthy rap sheet for sexual offenses against children. The county attorney in Sioux City then purportedly arranged for a months-long surveillance operation on Kerr. One day in 1993, the county attorney informed Noreen that they were about to arrest Charlie Kerr, and she told her husband, believing she could trust him. Later that day, Noreen got an angry call from the county attorney saying that Leonard had driven up to Kerr's trailer and gone inside to speak with him, which resulted in Kerr fleeing the area before they could arrest him. According to Noreen, for whatever reason, Leonard went to tip off Charlie Kerr about the impending arrest. This incident has not been definitively proven, but Jimmy Gibson corroborated the story and certain details check out. Noreen described Kerr as having a record of pedophilia and living in a trailer, both of which are proven true by a Sioux City police report. It appears that the arrest of one of the perpetrators in Johnny's abduction was sabotaged by Johnny's own father, which is highly suspicious. Noreen and Leonard divorced very shortly after September 1993. Wow. Okay. I mean, this, the plot has thickened so much here. I mean, I really don't know what to make of this. Is that not true, though? Like, what, are, how can it be verified? I mean, obviously this chart, okay. All, is there evidence that there was an impending arrest? Is there evidence that Leonard went to tip off Kerr? Hmm. I mean, there's definitely, I mean... The, the father is just highly suspect, given all of these other issues here. I mean, this is just highly suspect. I mean, and how heartbreaking that, again, I'm not, this is mind shock. I'm not alleging anything is true or untrue. But if this theory is true, again, I'm not stating it is, but if it is, how heartbreaking is that for Johnny, set up by his own father to get kid? I mean, this is, and again, the, something's not right, I'm going home. I mean, his statement from the other witness, I mean, that's just creepy on so many levels that, like, there are these weird people driving around talking to him, and he's just going home. I mean, it's just, yeah, this, this is one rough case. Following the divorce between him and Noreen, Leonard disappeared from public view, aside from a statement to the Des Moines Register in 1999, denouncing Noreen's claim that Johnny had visited her. And also for Noreen, how does your heart not break for Noreen? She has to go through all this and also the possibility that your own husband, the father of your missing son, might have been responsible and involved. He then reemerged on 2011 to give his own side of the story, vanished with Beth Holloway in 2011 to the company rumor behind who took Johnny in 2012 and most recently to Sarah DeMeo, who ran the Faded Out podcast in 2018. Leonard insisted that Noreen and Paul Bonacci's versions of events was untrue. However, numerous statements that he made were at odds with the established record and even his own prior statements. Flip-flop on Paul Bonacci. Leonard told Sarah that he knew Paul Bonacci was lying from the very first meeting. He claimed that he asked Bonacci how tall Johnny was, and Bonacci responded that Johnny was 5'2", even though Johnny was a big kid for his age at 5'7". Then, according to Leonard, he spoke to a prison guard who informed him that Bonacci's cell was full of newspapers about the Gosh case, proof that Bonacci was studying the details of the case to insert himself into the story. But then how did he not measure memorize the height. No corroboration exists for Leonard's account to fade it out, and much of it is explicitly contradicted. In Bonacci's diary, he estimated Johnny's height to be 5'5", five five, which is very close to accurate. Furthermore, what Leonard told Sarah about Bonacci immediately exposing himself as a con man contradicts his own statements from 1991-1992. Most egregiously, in April 92, he held a press conference at John DeCamp's office endorsing the Franklin cover-up, which lauds Bonacci as a credible witness in the Gosh case, and said, Paul told my wife and I things we've never told anybody. On Inside Edition, Leonard called law enforcement's refusal to interview Bonacci a major cover-up and pushed back against law enforcement accusations that Bonacci was a pathological liar. It is also weird, though, like, if he was responsible, was he just going along to get along, and then he flip-flops later? I mean, there's a lot that doesn't make sense here. Lie about going home immediately upon finding John's wagon. 
Johnny's wagon. In recounting the morning of September 5th, 82, Leonard said on Faded Out that as soon as he found Johnny's wagon abandoned, he knew something was wrong and quickly headed home to have Noreen call the police. This has been a fairly consistent part of Leonard's story, also being told by him in America's MIA Children 1992 and Who Took Johnny 2014. Yet, a September 6th, 1982 news article says that after neighbors called the Goshes at 7.45 a.m. asking where their Sunday papers were, Leonard went out and found the wagon, realized Johnny was missing, but delivered all of Johnny's papers before calling the police at 8.30 a.m. That's super weird. The 8.30 a.m. time is corroborated by the police report. And also indicates that Leonard's account of coming home immediately upon finding the wagon is false unless the neighbors called after 8 a.m., far later than it has ever been claimed. Claim that sometimes Johnny went alone on Sunday mornings. Leonard stated during his Faded Out interviews that he did not accompany Johnny on his paper route every Sunday morning, just the vast majority of them. As detailed above, both Noreen, as far back as 1988, before any conceivable motive to make Leonard look bad after the divorce, and Leonard himself contradict that, stating that Leonard always accompanied Johnny except on the day Johnny was abducted. Disavowing the proofs of life for Johnny. When asked about it, by Sarah, Leonard responded that he never believed any of the occurrences supposedly indicating Johnny was still alive, sightings, dollar bills, etc., were actually Johnny. Yet in the 80s, Leonard clearly viewed these proof of life as authentic. He was right alongside Noreen at an 85 press conference where they both announced the I am alive dollar bill, including the verification of Johnny's handwriting. At the press conference, Leonard called the dollar bill a source of additional hope that Johnny was alive. In the 84 documentary, Kidnapped by a Stranger, when asked about the evidence that Johnny was still alive, Leonard cited phone calls made to Noreen, as well as the Oklahoma sighting, which he explained in great detail. The origin of the Emilio sketch and name. Leonard made two strange claims about the kidnapper more commonly known as Emilio. The widely distributed sketch came not from the Goshes, but from the police. And the name Emilio originated not from Paul Bonacci, but from the Goshes' private investigator, Dennis Whalen. An old Des Moines Register article shows that the Gosh family held a press conference in November 1982 where they unveiled two sketches of the kidnapper they had commissioned, which are the same sketches still in use today. Police insisted that their sketch was similar to the Gosh's, but the police sketch was not released. Why would, why would it not be released? Leonard was also even quoted in the article as criticizing the sketch made of police, claiming that the witnesses considered it very inaccurate. As for the origin of the name Emilio, no evidence exists that anyone used the name prior to Bonacci, and Leonard did not explain how Bonacci would have come across a name used by their private investigator. If Whalen and Bonacci did use the same name, it was almost certainly independently, which only strengthens Bonacci's credibility. Curiously, Bonacci described Emilio as selling children at auctions, and Whalen was known to have attended one such child auction while searching for Johnny. The Sam Soda Rehabilitation Despite Sam Soda having been a person of interest for the Goshes since very early on in the investigation, all that Leonard recounted about Sam on Faded Out was that he did some investigative work on the case and had mafia connections. Well, with a name like that. It cannot be credibly asserted that Leonard was unaware of Sam being a prime suspect in the abduction because he co-authored an opinion piece with Noreen which called the local man in Des Moines named Sam a longtime suspect who Paul Bonacci had accurately identified. The, this attempted rehabilitation of Sam Soda's image is part of a larger issue. The multitude of inconsistent statements by Leonard demonstrates a severe lack of credibility on his part. Leonard's motives for repeatedly misrepresenting the facts of the case are unknown. The apparent intention, however, is to rewrite history in a very self-serving manner. All of Leonard's inconsistencies revise the facts of the case in a particular direction. Erasing details that might portray him in a suspicious light, i.e. Johnny having never done the route before, him delaying the call to police. Attacking claims by Noreen, the proofs of life, Sam Soda's guilt. And attacking evidence of the Franklin connection, Paul Bonacci accurately describing Johnny Emilio origin. As for why denying a link to Franklin might be self-serving for Leonard, that gets to the darkest allegations that have been levied against him. After they both testified at Bonacci's 1999 civil damages hearing, Noreen showed Larry King's photographer, Rusty Nelson, a photo of Leonard to see if he could identify it. The photo itself had no other information attached to it. 
Nelson responded that he had seen the man before in Larry King's office at the Franklin Credit Union. He also recognized the man as having been at the Max, a gay bar in Omaha that King would frequent to find child prostitutes, where he originally recruited Nelson. Rusty Nelson's identification of Leonard implicated Johnny Gosh's father as a likely participant in the Franklin Pedophile Network. Wow. I mean, this just gets more and more mind shocking. I was not prepared for this level of mind shock. Noreen claimed to receive additional confirmation of Leonard's involvement in the Franklin Milieu from a West Des Moines coworker of hers. This coworker was a young man who had grown up in Omaha. According to Noreen, he kept looking at her while on the job, and when she went to the stockroom, he followed her inside, asking to speak with her. Noreen's co-worker recounted how, as a teenager, he used to go to the Omaha club called The Mark. While at The Mark, Larry King attempted to recruit him for child pornography and prostitution, and Leonard was also seen there multiple times. The club allegedly was well known as a place where pedophiles could pick up young boys and young girls. More claims linking Leonard to Franklin soon came out directly from Omaha child abuse victims. In 2008, apparent Franklin victim David Scherter released a walking tour of the old market area in Omaha. One of the locations he pointed out, a favorite hangout in his words, was Star's Restaurant below Godfather's Pizza, where he had worked as a waiter. Scherter expressed a tentative belief that he had seen Leonard eating at Star's Restaurant. Star's was a gay bar in Omaha, just as the Max was. In a 2009 chat on the Franklin Files website, Paul Bonacci said that when he first met Leonard while in prison, he knew he had seen Leonard before, most likely at Ofut Air Force Base during the early 80s. What? That observation might lend context to Noreen's allegation that Leonard took Johnny to Ofut Air Force Base at the beginning of August 82. What is going on at that Air Force Base? And why was Paul Bonacci there? And can anybody verify that Leonard took Johnny there? L.A. pedophile ring victim Darren Reimer told his own disturbing story that paralleled the Omaha allegations about Leonard. In 74, at the age of 10, Darren ended up getting drawn into a well-connected pedophile group involving child prostitution and the production of child pornography. He was one of many children forced to act in pornographic films and photo shoots and sexually service men who appeared to be quite wealthy. The network's apparent ringleader was Guy Strait, S-T-R-A-I-T, a Hollywood resident who jumped bail after his 1973 arrest for selling child pornography with D.O.M. Lyric and did not resurface publicly until 1976. Straight admitted to knowing other pedophile ring operators in the 70s like John Norman. Locations all around Inglewood, California and Santa Monica, California were sites for this abuse, and one location in particular was a nightclub called The Green Horse, allegedly a location where men would go to pick up children for sex. Darren was adamant that Leonard John Gosh was one of the men who he saw at that nightclub. He claimed that upon seeing a photo of Leonard for the first time, he had a flashback to his own experience back in 1974 at the Green Horse. So where was Leonard living in 1974? I mean, where? Though he first experienced this around 2008 when he began studying Franklin, he still experiences these flashbacks when shown a photo of Leonard in 2018. Noreen had allegedly confirmed to Darren that Leonard, whose job involved taking business trips across the country, did in fact visit Los Angeles. This mentions Leonard being at a nightclub where adult pedophiles sought out kids corroborates the claims about his activities in Omaha. Because Darren's experience was in Los Angeles in 1974, his story implies that Leonard was involved in a nationwide pedophile group for a substantial amount of time before Johnny's abduction. Darren also related what he heard from Jimmy Gibson, a Franklin victim who appeared on America's Most Wanted and was active on websites about the Franklin and Gosh case. After Jimmy came forward to America's Most Wanted in 93, he stayed at many residences throughout the Midwest, one of which was Leonard's hobby farm northwest of Des Moines. 
The overall credibility of Jimmy Gibson is its own controversial issue, but key aspects of his story have checked out, including the existence of Leonard's Hobby Farm, which Jimmy was the first person to mention. Jimmy painted a highly unfavorable picture of Leonard, claiming that Leonard was violent and even tried to rape him on one occasion. He also corroborated Noreen's account of Leonard sabotaging the county attorney's arrest of Charlie Kerr. According to Jimmy, Kerr had blackmail material on Leonard regarding a criminal enterprise they were both involved in. Kerr had gotten wind that he was about to be arrested and threatened Leonard that he would implicate him too if he got busted. So on the planned day of the arrest, Leonard got in his car and brought Jimmy along with him to drive to Kerr's home. Jimmy said that Leonard initially planned to shoot Kerr out of anger, but he talked Leonard out of it. Leonard Gosh instead just ended up tipping off Kerr about the impending arrest. Although Leonard apparently told Jimmy that the criminal enterprise Kerr was blackmailing him over was illegal gambling, there's a good chance of that being a euphemism for child trafficking. Kerr was clearly implicated as owning a safe house used to stir, store trafficked kids. Furthermore, Leonard was most likely only able to tip off Kerr because Noreen told him of the impending arrest, and she in turn must have heard about it from the county attorney, who would not have informed her unless the inform information, unless their investigation was related to the abduction of Johnny, again indicating that Kerr was being investigating for investigated for child trafficking. Jimmy's story then indicates that Kerr and Leonard were both acquainted through a pedophile ring and Kerr was able to blackmail Leonard with evidence of his involvement. Back in 2004, when he was posting under the name CPP Webb, Jimmy claimed that just like Noreen alleged in her book, the Gosh home did receive a phone call in the early mornings, morning hours of September 5th, 82, and it came from the Sioux City area. Given how Charlie Kerr is the Gosh's case main link to Sioux City and the alleged association between him and Leonard, if Jimmy was telling the truth about the phone call, Kerr is very likely to have been the caller. And for Kerr, one of the kidnappers, to be calling Leonard just before Johnny's abduction would imply that Kerr was making arrangements with Johnny's father regarding the kidnapping. Noreen has in fact claimed that Bonacci testified in court that the kidnappers had prior arrangements with Johnny's father to ensure that Johnny would be alone that morning. This does not show up in the publicly released court transcripts, but Noreen's delivery has enough authenticity, even asking her interviewer at one point, were you surprised when you heard that in court? To raise the question of whether the transcripts accurately reflect the entirety of the 1999 hearing. The allegation that Kerr had blackmail material on Leonard might also, if Kerr was the one making arrangements with Leonard, explain Noreen's account of Leonard's very odd behavior in 1982 leading up to Johnny's abduction. He allegedly exhibited tremendous stress and even suicidal tendencies, consistent with the possibility that he was being blackmailed to facilitate the kidnapping of his own son. Being a longtime member of a pedophile ring, as numerous victims and witnesses claim, would easily provide such blackmail material. It is noteworthy that the array of witnesses implicating Leonard, Rusty Nelson, Noreen Gosh, Paul Bonacci, J Dave Scherter, Jimmy Gibson, Darren Reimer, have their own rivalries and would not be inclined to conspire together in a hoax implicating Johnny's father. The fact that multiple people otherwise opposed to each other have made overlapping allegations about John Gosh Sr. Strengthen those, strengthens those allegations. Obviously, however, they have not been proven definitively. Leonard's 1999 challenge to Doreen's account of Johnny visiting might have been unintentionally revealing. He insisted that if Johnny came back to West Des Moines to visit his parents, Johnny would have visited his childhood home, which Leonard was still living in at the time. Yet Leonard did not receive a visit from Johnny. For Johnny to forego visiting his old home but make an effort to track down Noreen at her new address would be bizarre, except for the possibility Leonard did not address. Johnny was specifically avoiding his father. If the visit from Johnny was real, then by Leonard's own logic, Johnny had some reason not to want to see his father. This is consistent with allegations that Leonard was involved in Franklin, something that Johnny could have easily learned by virtue of being in the same pedophile ring.
Wow. So, I mean, yeah, this is, this is mind shocking. This is a whole new level of mind shock here. I don't know if the mind shock listeners were expecting this level of mind shocking material. The connections here are so damning. I mean, the timeline, if it's all true, of course, if it's not true, then there's there's more to be explored. I mean, there's more to be explored either way. We're still not even done with this theory. There's actually a few other suspects that have nothing to do with this theory. It's just, it's hard to disprove this trafficking angle when you have this many PIs, Ted Gunderson, all of these witnesses with information that wasn't publicly released. It's just, it's tough to just completely write it off. I know a lot of coincidence theorists love to just write it off because... I mean, they are too mentally weak. You have to have a certain amount of mental strength to understand that there's this level of darkness and criminality and just straight-up scumbag people in this world, and it's just not a safe world. And it's easier, of course, to believe that it's all fake, right? Because then you could just continue living in fairy tale land where it's something this bad and this, these vast networks couldn't exist. It's just, it's more soothing to believe that. I mean, obviously, like, I get it. I get it. It's easier to be mentally weak. Unfortunately, criminal scumbags that do these things and human trafficking does still exist. Unfortunately. So if you're, if you're out for the truth, you have to examine all these theories. So uh, yeah, this is obviously going to be the beginning of a series. We have so much more to go over. So I'll be continuing this in episode two. Uh, plenty more evidence to go over. Hope you guys found another edition of Mind Shock interesting and informative. If you want to help support the Mind Shock podcast, help us get more mind shocking content out there. Keep up awareness in missing persons cases, cold cases of all kinds, and wrongful convictions. You can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Support the channel that way. Get access to exclusive streams and chats. Like and share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, code podcast requests. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.
you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shock True Crime. This is the Johnny Gosh series, episode two. Our continuing descent down some of the darkest rabbit holes. And make sure you check out episode one. We went over a lot of the case, and there is still plenty more. Uh, Just a whole lot more. And we'll be delving deep, continuing to go down all of these different rabbit holes, and continuing our examinations in typical Mindshock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront, attempting not to fall for any logical fallacies. As always, if you enjoy the Mind Shock podcast, want to help support the podcast, help us get more mind shocking content out there to keep up awareness in cold cases, missing persons cases, unsolved cases of all kinds, and wrongful convictions, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications. You could also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube, help support the channel that way. Like and share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get a priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunks of any kind, leave them in the comment section. So we left off the last episode taking a look at Johnny Gosh's father, Leonard John Gosh. And eyewitness testimony, which some believe is credible, placing him at various hangouts associated with child traffickers. So if that's all true, is Johnny Gosh's own father somehow involved, blackmail or otherwise, in the kidnapping of his own son? Very, very dark. Now, regarding Jimmy Gibson, the witness who came forward corroborating a lot of what Bonacci had said regarding these rings. So Leonard's hobby farm was not mentioned publicly until Jimmy Gibson himself mentioned it. And he described it supposedly accurately. So that's curious. So supposedly this is the first known mention of the hobby farm of Leonard. And this came from Jimmy Gibson. So let's get a little bit more specific here as we continue our cavdef.org write-up going through all of the available details on the Johnny Gosh case. Events that morning. Several major controversies have arisen over the events of the morning that Johnny was abducted. Was Johnny at Ashworth that morning, or did witnesses mistake another paper boy for him? Did a tall man follow Johnny, or whoever that boy was, after he picked up his papers on Ashworth? Were there two separate cars, a blue car at Ashworth and a silver Ford Fairmont at Marcourt, or just one blue car? Did the Bosun brothers... See Johnny slumped over his wagon as they passed by him on Marcourt. What? I haven't heard that one before. Is it true that PJ Smith saw Johnny being forced into the car and was forced by Orville Cooney to suppress his account? Was there a van parked several blocks away that a witness saw an object wrapped in a blanket get transferred into from another car? So Mike Seskis and John Rossi were both at 42nd and Ashworth that morning and both were adamant that they saw Johnny. Chris Beers asserting that Johnny really picked up his papers at Marcourt, not Ashworth. So is so there's is there only one witness with a dissenting account? This was entirely uncorroborated until the non-credible Leonard endorsed Chris's story despite never having challenged it in the past. And even then, Leonard admitted that Johnny did norm- normally get his papers on Ashworth. This doesn't make any sense. So he normally does get his papers on Ashworth. Neighbor Lawrence Headland heard someone pulling a wagon through his backyard on the morning of the kidnapping, just as Leonard admitted Johnny usually did. Seskis was a friend, and Rossi saw the boy had a wagon and dog with him, 
which no paper boys besides Johnny did. Insinuation, which uh, Chris first suggested and Sarah tried leading Matt Seskis into, that Matt Seskis was fed a false story about the tall man coming out to follow Johnny. Numerous press accounts described two separate cars. By 1988, Noreen in People magazine mentioned only a single blue car at both places. This 1985 Senate hearing, the Goshes shared the map of the immediate neighborhood containing summaries of witness accounts. Okay. Wow. Rather implausibly, Sarah repeated dismissing the idea that the same car could have driven around the block to meet Johnny on Marcourt. Bozins retract retracted their account of seeing Johnny slumped in his wagon to Chris. Huh, okay. March 6, 1983, news article, Leonard in 84, the above neighborhood sketch, and Noreen in 1992 all mentioned two paper boys seeing Johnny slumped over his wagon before Noreen finally named them in her book as the Bozen brothers by their own admission. So the bosons were in the right place at the right time. What? So he was slumped over his wagon by himself? Was there or was there not a car there at that moment? PJ Smith also denied to Chris his alleged disclosures to Noreen about witnessing the abduction. See, the thing is, if police are somehow involved, I mean, they could easily coerce people into uh, denying or retracting accounts as necessary, and we'll be getting into that later. Based on the geographical details that Noreen mentioned, the van was near the intersection 42nd and Woodland. Coincidentally or not, this is where Chris Burge picked up his papers, raising the question of whether he saw something he shouldn't have and got similar treatment to what P.J. Smith allegedly faced. Apparently, P.J. Smith was discounted or told not to tell his story and suppressed. So, followers of the Faded Out podcast on Facebook, Chris Birge posted here, I heard about the van from the documentary. I was there that morning on the corner of 42nd and Woodland Ave when and where the van was supposed to be. I did not see it. What are the names of the witnesses who saw the van? Can you provide names or facts you assume you know? Where did you get your info? Your info seems wrong. Thank you for assuming that really helps everybody. <laughs> Sarcastic fella. Okay, so he's stating he didn't see the van? Huh. So, on the Johnny Gosh subreddit, there's uh, there's some discussion here on Chris Beers and the sighting of the van. When Franklin victim Paul Bonacci came forward with an account of Johnny's abduction, he said that Johnny's body was transferred into a van. This was taken by Noreen Gosh as crucial validation of Bonacci's story since, according to her, her private investigators had interviewed witnesses who made such a sighting years before Bonacci came forward. You can hear her talk about this in various interviews, such as her early 2000 interview with Ted Gunderson. Many people, for whatever reason, have dismissed Noreen's account about the van or suggested that her private investigators were making up non-existent leads to keep getting paid. But what's very interesting is that a key witness interviewed on the highly dubious Faded Out podcast appears to have inadv inadvertently confirmed the sighting. Chris Beardge was interviewed by the host Sarah DeMeo in late June 2018. He was a former paperboy, just 10 years old, when Johnny was abducted, and made claims about Johnny's movements that morning, which contradicted all prior witness accounts. Whereas neighbor Lawrence Hedlund, fellow paperboy Mike Seskis, and father of a fellow paperboy John Rossi, all made statements to police back in 82, indicating that Johnny picked up his papers at the intersection of 42nd and Ashworth. Chris insisted that Johnny actually got his papers one block north at the intersection of 42nd and Marcourt Lane. See, the, here's the thing, though. You're going to take the word of this one 10-year-old boy over all these other boys plus a father? And neighbors and, and all this? 
Unless, I mean, if there's a conspiracy afoot and he's not towing the line. I mean, this is all kind of random, but taking Chris's account as factual, the sighting of a strange Latino man in a blue car approaching Johnny would be irrelevant to the case because the boy would be someone else who got mistaken for Johnny. The likelihood of all these witnesses who went on record with police immediately after the abduction being wrong and this never before aired account being right is pretty low, so Chris doesn't have a lot of credibility. Amusingly, in Faded Out's last addendum to season one, you can hear how Sarah finally began questioning Chris's story after hearing one of her other witnesses, Yellow Bag, spoke to John Rossi and found Rossi credible. Chris became very incensed and he had a falling out with Sarah. Of course, the reason for Chris not to be telling the truth is unclear. He could be lying or just mistaken. However, there's something very interesting about his account which makes him a bit suspicious. Noreen Gosh, despite talking about the van sighting several times, has never stated where it was seen. But in 2016, she appeared on the FAW cast and gave enough geographic clues to deduce where it is. She has, in many of her interviews about Johnny's abduction, referred to how after grabbing Johnny on Marquardt Lane, the blue car ran the stop sign and turned left on 42nd, which was north towards the interstate. Listen to the FAW cast starting at 20 minutes, where Noreen discusses the neighborhood witness who saw a van parked on the street with its motor running, a blue car drive up, its passengers transfer a large object to the van, and then the van and car both drive off. She says that the van turned right and headed back north again towards the interstate. It is reasonable to infer from the description of the van's movements that it turned right on 42nd and continued north in that direction. So from which street did it turn onto 42nd Street? Here's a map of the area where Johnny was taken. The nearest interstate to the north and the only one within West Des Moines is I-235. Between Marquardt and I-235, there are only two roads connected to 42nd from which you could turn right onto 42nd and head north. Woodland Ave and Lexington Plaza. It can be verified through street view that Lexington Plaza is not a real street but rather a private road that's part of a nearby apartment complex. That leaves Woodland Ave as almost certainly being the road where the van was sighted according to Noreen. Now, according to Chris Beers in his Faded Out interview, his deliveries were to the apartments near Woodland Ave and his paper pickup spot was in fact at the intersection of 42nd and Woodland, exactly where the van would have made its getaway. So he would have been in a prime position to witness the van. Did he see it? On July 19th, 2018, Chris made a bizarre comment in the Faded Out group, and that's the one I just read. He stated, I did not see it regarding the van. And again, is it possible that was somebody else using his account or whatever? I mean, this is the internet. Chris Burge claims he did not see the van that morning, but his statement raises a very important question. How exactly does Chris know where the van was supposed to be? The documentary, the documentary Who Took Johnny Where He Claims to Have Heard About the Van made no mention of the van, and literally no treatment of the Gosh case has ever mentioned the specific location of the van as being at 42nd and Woodland. Chris attributes his knowledge to a source that did not even mention the van. There is no known source there, which ever gave the van's location, and yet he got it exactly right. Furthermore, the location just happens to be where he was delivering his papers on the morning of the abduction. While this do doesn't definitively prove anything, I find Chris's unexplained knowledge about the van's location to be highly suspect. It seems he either knows it from his own personal experience, i.e. he saw it that morning, or he received inside knowledge about Noreen's private investigation from somebody. The former is interesting because Noreen claims that P.J. Smith, another witness to the events that morning, saw a lot more than was initially claimed in news accounts and was forced by the police chief to suppress his statement. If Chris saw something inconvenient, like multiple vehicles coordinating the transfer of some large object within minutes of Johnny's abduction, he may have received similar treatment to P.J. Smith. And perhaps that police intimidation to an impressionable 10-year-old explains the dubious story he now tells on the podcast. So what does everybody make of that? I mean, this case just has so many wrinkles, way too many wrinkles. I mean, it's just, it's tough. It's tough to make heads or tails about this.
so let's continue on here regarding the Sam Soda rehabilitation. Obviously, that doesn't make a lot of sense either. Sam claimed that Noreen asked him to get involved in the investigation, but an early news article from 1984 makes it clear that Sam inserted himself into the case offering to help the Gosh family. And again, for those that don't remember from episode one, Sam Soda is the PI that contacted Noreen, told her to come to his office, and then told her that there'd be another kidnapping. And then, of course, that transpired exactly as he said. Now, what motivates a guy like this? Because if, and, and he was a prime suspect, as the Goshes have stated. So, and police apparently believed him and had him, had him under surveillance. Now, if he really was involved in the kidnapping... Like, does he just get, like, a sick kick out of inviting the mother of the boy he kidna kidnapped and or helped kidnapped in some fashion and tell her somebody else is getting kidnapped? Like, what's the point? I, I don't, I don't, I mean, if this is a mentally ill individual, I mean, I guess there doesn't have to be a point, right? And he's going to harass the family and give them phone calls and possibly even show up in their backyard and throw rocks at the house. I mean, is this somebody who's involved in a kidnapping? This is what they would do? I mean... Here's the thing, though. If he does know the police are involved and he doesn't fear repercussion, I guess a sick bastard like that would do all that, right? Because if they know the chief of police is involved and is going to cover for them, I mean, I guess. Or, again, they're just completely mentally ill or a combination of all those things. The child pornography he showed at the scared conferences purportedly came from a Minnesota police officer he knew which raises the question of why a law enforcement officer would be giving out child pornography even to a private investigator. That's really messed up. Yet another question is why Ron Wheeler would say to Sam, I should tell you to stop, but instead gave Sam his blessing to continue the scared conferences in which he showed child pornography. Note that Ron Wheeler later represented Sam in private practice. After claiming that Mary Bach was by his side while he interviewed Frank Sikora and taking up how sweet and wonderful she was, he said that her brain is probably scrambled and she's not worth a damn now. When Sarah interviewed Mary Bach, she in fact contradicted Sam's account, saying that she may have been in the other room not by his side, but believed she was actually not with Sam at all. Man, this, this case, I mean, can you verify anything in this case? This is getting really weird. Sam disputed that Johnny was targeted in advance, saying the kidnapping was a crime of opportunity. This contradicts what both Noreen and Leonard Gosh have said about Johnny being photographed a couple weeks prior to the abduction, and is quite revealing, given that Paul Bonacci implicated Sam as the one who brought the photo of Johnny to the motel on the night before the abduction. Confirmation by Sam of him working for Ruan Trucking, which Jim Rothstein had already brought up in connection with the Jacob Wetterling abduction. Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. Okay, so let's continue on here with some curiosities. So apparently there's an anonymous source here on the bottom of calf, uh, calfdef.org. Also, actually, I mean, yeah, there's... There's quite a few curiosities here. Was Jimmy Gibson constantly stopping at phone booths to make collect calls throughout the America's Most Wanted filming, as Noreen says Paul Sparrow and Roy Stevens told her? This would imply that Jimmy was acting as a government informant. Okay, because we have this other CIA asset contacting Noreen. Now we have Jimmy Gibson coming out of the woodwork with seemingly credible info, I mean, what is going on here? Is like th this is just such an unusual case, and if it's really part of some gigantic ring, I mean, you could see why they would want to uh, keep it silent and have their own operatives trying to control the narrative at all times. Apparently, there was a 1997 or 1998 2020 special, and I'm guessing people can't find it. Hmm. What information is on that one? Wow. There was a web sleuth user, Green Ray. He claimed that in 1987, approximately, when he worked at a restaurant in a wealthy part of Chicago, someone left behind a crumpled dollar bill that had I'm Alive, Eugene Martin, written on it. So here's the post here by Green Ray, December 1st, 2004. 
I found this form when I did a Google search on Eugene Martin. 17 years ago, I was in a restaurant in an affluent neighborhood of Chicago. I, as I was leaving, I noticed a balled up dollar bill on a nearby table. The table hadn't been cleared yet, and I thought someone might think that's garbage and throw it out. I picked it up, gave it directly to the waiter. As I walked to the front of the restaurant, I uncrumpled the bill and saw written on it, I'm alive, Eugene Martin. I thought it was so strange that I kept the bill, and a couple days later, I thought to call the National Center for Missing Children. I was shocked when they told me he was an abducted child. I was told that he was 13 when he was kidnapped and he would now be 17. I asked if they wanted me to send them the bill, and I was told that I could photocopy it and send it in if I wanted. If, or if they wanted. The person I talked to didn't convey any sense of urgency or even much interest in it. A few days ago, I suddenly wondered if he had ever been found. I had no idea why it occurred to me after all these years. I went to the NCMEC website and saw that he has never been found. For the first time, I read the story about his abduction. Somehow, finding out his story made it seem much more real and it brought me to tears. I began to wonder if anyone ever told his family about the message I had found so that they would at least know that he was still alive at that time. I felt kind of silly, but I called NCMESC and asked if there was any record of it, and I was told there wasn't. She suggested I contact the Des Moines police if I wanted any more information. I didn't do it, as it seems like such a small piece of information from so long ago. Anyway, I just thought I'd add that info here. I'm not exactly sure what the purpose of this website is, but people here at least seem interested. I felt so upset that I had apparently been sitting right near Eugene and found his note, and that there was no happy ending. So yeah, other people, of course, okay, so some other people are saying how old was the bill, because if it was passed around through many, many people, but his response here, at the time, I had the distinct impression that Eugene Martin had actually been in the restaurant because the dollar bill was crumpled up in a strange way. It was in a very compact ball shape, and after I read what was written on it, I thought that must be why it was crumpled up like that. The person wanted it to be noticed and not just put back into circulation. I certainly noticed it, and I've never given any thought to the tips left on restaurant tables before or since. I don't have the actual dollar bill anymore. A friend at the time took it to a psychic and then threw it out. I may still have a photocopy of it. I don't know who I'd even give it to. Huh. It's kind of sad that if this account is true that the... Uh, National Center for Missing Children didn't take this seriously. I mean, I don't know what to make of that, but still, it's just, it's crazy. Back to CAVDEF, uh, failed public records inquiries. Iowa Division of Criminal Justice, no records on Leonard Gosh or John Gosh, unwilling to release records on the Johnny Gosh investigation. This is kind of like the Moore Murray case where they say there are no files to release. Meanwhile, the Moore Murray case is the largest case file in New Hampshire state history. <laughs> I mean, some of these aid government agencies, the way they operate, I mean, it's just, wow. Polk County Sheriff's Office, no records on Leonard Gosh or John Gosh. Milwaukee Police Department does not retain records dating back to the 80s when Jimmy Gibson would have gone missing. So is it awfully convenient there's just no record of these guys? I mean, what about Bonacci, Gibson? Nobody can verify anything? Woodbury County Attorney's Office, no records on Leonard Gosh, John Gosh, or Noreen Gosh. No records on Roy Stevens. Raleigh Police Department, no records on Leonard Gosh, John Gosh, or Noreen Gosh, and then they quite definitively state that they would have retained the records about John threatening suicide if they existed, although they acknowledge it is possible an officer was dispatched and went to the address but did not take a report. Woodbury County Sheriff's Office, no records. Colorado Department of Corrections, no records. Hmm. Email correspondence with Anonymous. Okay, what do we have here? Noreen Gosh was the person who revealed that John Gosh Sr. took $5,000 out of his bank account just before the kidnapping. This is kind of weird, though. Shouldn't he be the one getting the money if he's black? I mean, what is going on here? Jimmy Gibson purportedly joined the Marines in an intelligence capacity and had a DIA email, which he used to threaten Anonymous. 
We did some snooping and found out he often used the usernames Dan with a lot of various numbers after it. I also, being the webmaster, had access to everyone's email addresses they used to register on the website. Jimmy used an official 100% real DIA Defense Intelligence Agency email address. He apparently had an alter ego named Dan. He also joined the Marines and worked in an intelligence unit. And Jimmy using a DIA email address scared the heck out of me. When I sent him a message and asked him about who is Dan, he flipped out and lost it. He threatened to get his lawyers after me, and then he mentioned the town I live in in a threatening way. He also sent me a copy of a letter from his lawyer. Man, this Jimmy Gibson's a shady character. Gibson mentioned the hobby farm to Anonymous several times, saying that uh, John Gosh Sr. kept evidence of his and other people's crime hidden under the seat of an old Jeep on the farm. From what Noreen told me, everything Jimmy said about this farm is true. Charles Kerr died in 2004. He was involved in the pedophile group. The cops raided the farm and John Gosh warned Charlie Kerr and they removed all of the evidence, etc., from bef there from bef before the cops got there. Jimmy said he had hidden a lot of it in a vehicle there on the farm. And yes, Noreen told me and others that this farm existed and is a real place, but she wasn't aware of it or a lot of things her ex-husband was involved in. She said that he worked for a sales company and was gone most of the week traveling and would only be home on the weekends. He would have had a lot of property all over the country and kept it. He could have had a lot of property all over the country and kept it from Noreen. CPP Webb on Web Sleuths was also Jimmy posting in order to discredit Noreen and others associated with the investigation. CPP Webb was Jimmy Gibson posting messages on Web Sleuth years ago. That's him. We found out that's who he was on Web Sleuth by getting his location, which was the same small town Jimmy lived in at the time in Wisconsin. We also mentioned, messaged him pretending to be from that area and asked him questions. Jimmy was not an undercover FBI agent like he said. He was probably a paid, blackmailed FBI informant. Jimmy Gibson escaped with Johnny and his Ojibwa heritage allowed them to hide on reservations. Jimmy and Johnny Gosh escaped around 1987 from their captors on a ranch in Idaho. They stole a car and traveled to far north Minnesota, close to the Canadian border, and lived on the American Indian Reservation called the White Earth Band of the Ojibwe. The Ojibwe is a Native American Indian tribe that Jimmy knows well and trusts. He is part Ojibwe Indian. They worked as loggers in Minnesota with fake identities. I think Johnny went by the name Mark. When Johnny went to visit his mom Noreen that night in 1997, the other person who was with him that didn't speak was an Ojibwe Indian who was sort of Johnny's bodyguard. Johnny had dyed his hair black and grew it very long and had a dark tan to try to blend in with the Native American Indian people. Wow. Has anybody heard that explanation before? That's crazy. So he escaped, but he committed so many other crimes that he didn't want to, he couldn't return and be public? I mean, what? Hmm. What does everybody think of this? I just, I really don't know what to make of any of this information. I mean, this is just clearly one of the most mind-shocking cases ever. Despite being commonly repeated elsewhere, the colonel does not refer to... The colonel does not refer to Michael Aquino. And the Michael Aquino conspiracy, I mean, that's out there. If you want to read something out there, some people even say he's the Zodiac killer, he's got some de demonic temples set up. And he's in the, the military community and all part of all of this craziness. But for continuing from Cav Def here, yes, you are correct. The JG in those letters to Paul are Johnny Gosh. Paul confirmed this, but Paul to told me directly that the Colonel is not Colonel Aquino. He said the Colonel mentioned in those letters is the nickname of one of the pedophiles who bought kids and pimped them and sold them in the Southwest. Colonel Michael Aquino was a mind control programmer. 
He was one of Paul's monarch programmers, as he calls them. I don't think Colonel Aquino was buying and keeping kidnapped children or anyone else since he was an active duty colonel in the U.S. military, traveling to military bases and busy most of the time. It doesn't make sense to me how he could keep kidnapped people somewhere. He's, of course, guilty and probably has bought children. I'm not making excuses for the evil man. And on my old website in the chat room that we had, there was a discussion about the colonel. Paul Bonacci, who was often in the chat room, said that the colonel was not Lieutenant Colonel Aquino. The colonel was the nickname of the man who operated one of the child abduction groups that kidnapped children and others all around the U.S. They were sort of freelancers or independent contractors, if you will, that worked for wealthy pedophiles like Larry King and people in the U.S. government. Paul sent a few of uh, us some of the letters that his friends who were abducted in the 80s sent to him. They mentioned that the colonel had moved back to Mexico. Now, I know that Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino never moved to Mexico. He stayed in the San Fran area and was sometimes stationed in Missouri, Colorado, and D.C. As a U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel, he couldn't really be living in Mexico. Or someone was just mistaken that he moved to Mexico. But yeah, there's, I mean, I'm not going to go down that the Michael Aquino rabbit hole. I mean, it is deep. It is just insanely deep. But what about the, the this, again, the Omaha visit? With Leonard taking Johnny there to the to the Air Force Base, I mean that that just that's just such an oddity that just jumps out. That's weird. Continuing on here, a corrupt judge in Nebraska who was involved with Larry King owned a farm in South Georgia used for satanic activities, perhaps related to Harmon Tucker and the plantation used by Harold Anderson and Nick O'Hara which were linked to the Atlanta child murders. One of the people in that Johnny Gosh Foundation told me and others that one of the corrupt judges in Nebraska who was a pedophile Satanist in Larry King's group owned a farm somewhere in South Georgia where they had satanic rituals and, of course, murders, rapes, orgies, etc. of children and others back in the 70s and 80s. I sort of remember back in the late 80s or early 90s, there was supposed to be a serial killer in Atlanta and other areas of Georgia who was murdering young black children all over the state. This person at the foundation told us that these serial murders were connected to this judge's satanic group at their farm in Georgia. Wow, so dark. John DeCamp talked about Penn State being linked to Franklin back in the 90s. This group was spread out all over the country. I don't know if you are aware of this, but the Penn State Jerry Sandusky pedophile scandal of a few years ago was directly linked to the Franklin cover-up back in the early 90s by John DeCamp. Alex Jones interviewed John DeCamp around late 90s, and he talked about Penn State being involved. Alex had to edit that out of his radio show back then because he was afraid of lawsuits. When the Penn State scandal came out a few years ago, Alex remembered his conversation with John DeCamp in the 90s and talked about it on his show. Man. Okay. Wow. So let's go back to the Johnny Gosh subreddit. There's an interesting post here with some information. What are the smoking guns for and against the Franklin theory? One, for those of you who believe that Johnny was taken by an organized pedophile trafficking network, especially the Franklin network, what are the key pieces of evidence, smoking guns, that lead you to this conclusion? Or two, for those of you who don't believe the Franklin theories, Paul Bonacci, what are the smoking guns for you that it is a hoax? So... A few posts here. I went down this rabbit hole a while ago and listened to Sarah DeMio's podcast called Faded Out. She theorizes it was a person or people at the register or connected to it. She goes into the fact that there were known pedophiles connected to the register and that one of them likely took him. It's been a while since I listened to it, but I do think she's on the right track with her theory and it was someone a lot closer to home. I'm not doubting that there was a Franklin network, just the fact that he was actually a part of it. He was probably was killed soon after he was taken. Sorry, no smoking gun. And of course, if there was a pedophile at the register and they were involved, that doesn't mean another ring wasn't also involved. I mean, of course, again, there are some very sick independent contractors, as mentioned. Marion number one responded, I would be incredibly cautious when listening to Fade It Out. This is something I've written about on the sub before. It has a record of twisting, ignoring evidence to suit an agenda of discrediting Noreen Gosh and Paul Bonacci. 
to the point where highly dubious or provably false statements by their star witnesses are accepted as fact as long as they fit that narrative. Response, I'm confused where you found they had an agenda to discredit Noreen. Marion responds, its agenda shows through how they uncritically accept the story of anyone who disputes Noreen's version of events, no matter how contradictory their statements are, like Chris Berge's late arriving story, which places Johnny at a different location that morning, than Noreen and everyone else had been stating up until that point, was uncritically accepted as fact despite every other eyewitness account, including the ones made in 1982 when the abduction actually happened, backing what she said. Leonard, John Gosh, and Sam Soda have repeatedly contradicted their prior statements and other verifiable facts about the case, yet they are given free reign to accuse Noreen of making things up with no acknowledgement of their own credibility issues. Fair point there. As such, the podcast clearly doesn't paint Noreen in a sympathetic light at all. What they have is a faux sympathetic attitude that's very common among those who seek to discredit Noreen, emphasizing how sorry they are for her loss and basis, baselessly adding on that, they, that having her son kidnapped must have caused her to lose her grip on reality. In reality, Noreen has remained consistent throughout the decades and her stories have never been contradicted by anyone who doesn't have credibility problems of their own, like her former husband. If Faded Out's theory is the most logical, it should have been able to advance that theory without distorting evidence to make the pedophile ring theory seem weaker than it truly is. I mean, there's some really great points there. So he's about to get into uh, some theories regarding this other suspect, Wilbur Milhouse. So let's get into Wilbur Milhouse here before we get back to that. So Marion number one also posted here in the Johnny Gosh subreddit regarding Milhouse. So Wilbur Milhouse was a circulation manager for the Des Moines Register. A former DMR paperboy posting on the Iowa Cold Cases page for Johnny Gosh under the name Yellow Bag told a story in 2016 about how he believed Milhouse might have been involved in Johnny's kidnapping. Yellowbag recalls being approached in early 1982 by an apparent pedophile driving a Ford Fairmont asking him for directions. Later, when Yellowbag moved from West Des Moines to Des Moines, his new circulation manager became Milhouse, who had himself been moved around the same time. Yellow Bag speculates it was due to pedophilia complaints akin to how the Catholic Church would shuffle around its pedo priests. Yellow Bag reported how Milhouse tried to sexually proposition him several times and even saw him in the company of that creep who tried to accost him in early 1982. Is this, is he talking about Emilio here? So, and, and Milhouse is linked to Emilio? Most disturbing of all, Yellow Bag says that Milhouse claimed to know Johnny from back in West Des Moines and said that nothing would have happened to Johnny if he would have just kept his mouth shut. Wow. So did he attempt to assault Johnny and Johnny told? The legitimacy of Yellowbag's claims are unknown. Milhouse certainly was a pedophile. He was arrested in 1986, three years after he left the DMR due to health issues for sexually abusing numerous teenage boys. Faded Out, a podcast on the gosh case that's popular but has many flaws, came across Yellowbag's story in 2018 and pursued it. They interviewed Yellowbag, got his mother on the podcast to confirm the story, and even pursued a suspect from Maryland who later became a DMR circulation manager that Yellowbag had identified as the creepy Ford Fairmont man. What? Sometime later, however, Yellowbag and the host Sarah DeMio had a falling out. And she actually deleted season one, episode 27, where she spoke with Yellowbag about his story and this suspect, claiming it had to do with a theory that didn't pan out. Huh. Interesting. Sam Soda is a very odd character from this case, and Johnny's mother believes he was involved in the abduction, as do I. A former Vietnam vet and sheriff's deputy turned private investigator, he inserted himself into Johnny's case in 1984, approaching Noreen offering help, though he'd later tell Faded Out that the Goshes reached out to him. 
Noreen claims that Sam invited her to his office and he told her there would be a second paperboy kidnapping on the second weekend in August on the south side of Des Moines. That did indeed happen with Eugene Martin. He also played a role in exposing a pedophile at the DMR named Frank Sikora. Although he faced controversy over claims he had falsely presented himself as a law enforcement officer, and there was no apparent connection to the Gosh or Martin cases. Ultimately, by her account, Noreen became suspicious of Sam for seeming to know too much about the case, and police began monitoring him, at which point the Goshes received threats and harassment. He was a person of interest for a number of years, but they can never make anything stick. Then, when Paul Bonacci came forward, the Goshes gave the PI who was checking out Bonacci's story a photo of Sam to put in a photo lineup for him. Bonacci picked out the photo of Sam, accurately said his name, and said that Sam was the kidnapping group's local contact who helped to arrange the abduction. While working as a PI, he ran an organization called Stolen Children Are Reported Every Day, Scared purportedly meant to raise awareness about child exploitation. At some of these meetings, he showed real child pornography to his audience that included police officers. He claimed on Faded Out that his that first assistant Polk County attorney, Ron Wheeler, told Sam, I should tell you to stop, but instead gave Sam his blessing to continue. Wheeler later represented Sam in private practice in 1993 on charges of beating his teenage stepson. Wow. I mean, yeah, it's, it's really weird, too, because... Why would he be exposing, I mean, I, I don't know, like if he's part of the network, but he's exposing, I guess, people who aren't part of the network to make him look like he's a good guy, since look, he's exposing these criminals while protecting other criminals. I mean, I don't know. Apparently, Milhouse moved to Overland Park, Kansas in the late 80s. Wilbur died before the Faded Out podcast came out. Yellow Bag also said he reported the incidents to police, but nobody followed up on them. Now that makes people believe that uh, law enforcement is indeed involved. Also, I forgot to mention, let's, uh, regarding Noreen Gosh's interview with Ted Gunderson, I mean, there are some major bombshells dropped in this interview. So let's go over the bullet points here. So... She mentions the private investigators canvassed the area around the Gosh home talking to witnesses, describes them interviewing one man who noticed a van parked against the flow of traffic with a loud motor running, looked through the window to observe, and saw a car pull up just before a large object was transferred from it to the van. Noreen says that two weeks before the abduction, a neighbor saw a man in a car with out-of-state plates taking photos of Johnny with a long telephoto lens as he walked home from school. Now, this is weird because other accounts, aren't they saying it was a woman who was taking his photos? This is weird. Noreen says, or was his photo taken on more than one occasion? Noreen says that after learning about Franklin, she recalled how about three weeks after Johnny was kidnapped, the Des Moines Register ran an article on two young girls, 13 and 14, who were taken from Des Moines to Omaha for prostitution, and the police chief ignored it, and she got a death threat for calling attention to it at a press conference. Noreen says she later found out that West Des Moines police chief Orville Cooney was good friends with Robert Wadman, and attended the Franklin pedophile parties with him. She says the imposter made my husband look very suspect, but points out there are no definitive answers. What? That's a bold claim against Orville Cooney, the police chief. She's saying he attended these parties. That's why there was going to be no investigation. That also explains why they don't even want to give the photos of the policeman that Johnny was talking to before the disappearance. They only gave some of them. Wow. I mean, this is crazy. Noreen shows her book with the photo of the Noreen impersonator. Noreen says she was informed that the impersonator had a stroke upon learning that her photo was in the book. Noreen describes the farmhouse outside of Sioux City, where Johnny was taken, and calls it the Charlie Kerr Farm, with an old house that has since burned down. Noreen credits Paul Bonacci with witnessing the colonel paying the kidnappers in cash for Johnny. She says he identified Michael Aquino as the colonel, 
and heard that Johnny was going to Colorado and the West Coast with him, but never saw him again until 1986 at an orgy at Aquino's home in Colorado. Noreen says Johnny stayed on many Indian reservations and eventually left the last one to live elsewhere in the country. Mentions the child victims turning into perpetrators once they reach adulthood. Noreen says on the topic of how the kidnappers knew Johnny would be alone that morning that, uh, quote, I heard something in court I had never heard anywhere from Paul Bonacci, that there were prior arrangements with Johnny's father. She asks Gunderson, were you surprised when you heard that in court? Has Rusty Nelson confirmed the identification of John Gosh Sr. as being in the Franklin Credit Union at Larry King's office, saying it was in John DeCamp's office and it was her husband, George, who pulled out the picture? Noreen says that her ex-husband was also at the Max. Noreen asks, so what was Sam Soda in the whole connection? She says that according to Paul Bonacci, they called him Soda Pop. Recounts that he brought photos of Johnny to the motel the night before and said he was the kid they would be taking the next morning. She also says Bonacci placed him at the farm in Sioux City while the kidnappers were photographing the molestation of Johnny. Noreen says that in her discussions with Bonacci and other victims, she learned that Eugene Martin was taken by the same ring and another victim said Jacob Wetterling was as well. Noreen claims the police rejected her info about the warning from Soda because he denied ever saying it. Noreen discusses Barry's Lounge, saying that in a room upstairs they showed adult films including child pornography and after it burned down, a waitress told her that Soda would bring in big brown bags wrapped with duct tape upstairs on the nights when the child porn was shown. She says the waitress also told her that many Des Moines police officers came to watch the films. Noreen claims that her son told her about satanic rituals whose purpose was both to exhilarate the adults and traumatize the children and used the term breeder mothers. She refers to the children being used to entrap and blackmail politicians. See, in the post-Epstein era, I mean, does she sound less crazy? The post-Epstein Jill Zane Maxwell era. I mean, what does everybody think of this? I mean, all the coincidence theorists poo-pooed all this stuff. But now, again, post-Epstein, I mean, is it really that outlandish? I mean, again, Ted Gunderson exposed this a while ago, but a lot of people don't even know about Ted Gunderson. It's also hard to claim that the former head of the FBI, the, a former FBI head, uh, is not credible. <laughs> I mean, coincidence theorists love to go for the genetic logical fallacy where they just, anything that triggers them or triggers their cognitive dissonance, they immediately have to go to that person's not credible. It's kind of hard to do that with Gunders because <laughs> he was so accomplished in his own right, there was no need for him to come out with this. Noreen is asked if she knows why Conspiracy of Silence never aired, and she responds that she was told that the Discovery Channel got purchased by the Bush family around that time. Okay, her new husband, George, brings up ABC, devoting a lot of time and money only to drop the story. She says that in 1997, Karen Burns of ABC approached her to do a one-hour special called The Johnny Gosh Story, The Final Curtain. According to her, they spent two years and hundreds of thousands of dollars filming interviews with victims and other witnesses, but then they kept repeatedly postponing the airing until she was eventually told it wouldn't air at all. Noreen claims that from talking to another ABC producer, she learned that the 2020 spread the word throughout the whole building that they alone owned the Johnny Gosh story and were waiting for him to come forward so they could interview him. What? Noreen refers to Disney buying ABC or maybe just 2020 as Gunderson corrects her and calls them a big player in the Franklin type situation. She says many kids were traumatized at Disney World. Wow. So this is a... Uh, Wow. I mean, see, back back when this interview, so this interview, so this interview took place approximately the year 2000. I can't find an exact date here, but it's a pretty long interview. So back in 2000, I mean, a lot of these notions were definitely just uh, discarded by uh, devout coincidence theorists, authority-worshipping cultists who think that politicians or any kind of high-ranking government officials or law enforcement would never be involved in anything like this. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just really weird. 
Obviously, more and more information regarding Disney's coming out and all that. Noreen tells the story of how her first private investigator, Dennis Whalen, attended a child auction near Houston, Texas, shortly after Johnny's kidnapping, which she and John financed with a second mortgage on their home and says there were foreign buyers there. Noreen says she heard about child auctions in Toronto and Las Vegas from Bonacci and Rusty Nelson says off camera that Larry King took him to such an auction north of Vegas near Area 51 around Indian Springs, Nevada, happens to be near Creech Air Force Base. Gunderson mentions another tip about child auctions in Lincoln, Nebraska at the barn, and when DeCamp sent out a call to check on the barn, a deputy sheriff involved in Satanism prevented the auction from happening. They also refer to some child auctions in Pennsylvania and rest areas near Lincoln, the latter of which Gary Caridori found out about. Nelson says that the buyers at the auction included one Jewish man, a couple Middle Easterners, and some American businessmen. Noreen says Linda Blood kept calling and asking if she was sick. And for those that don't know, Linda Blood is known for her book, The New Satanists. And she's a former cult member who's uh, brought forth information that uh, Satanists are a lot more organized, more powerful, and there's a lot of underground criminal movement, uh, including uh, child abuse and child trafficking involved with the Satanism as well. Another interesting tidbit we didn't go into before is the Alex Merklinger interview, June 17th, 2004. So they mention a Northern Iowa boy, Sean Jacobson of Milford, Iowa, was found dead in a barn refrigerator in September 1982. It was labeled a suicide by the DCI despite his young age and claw marks on the inside. Noreen described the Oklahoma contract hit in more detail, revealing that the man she was to meet with at a coffee shop would drive them both out to a remote area where evidence was located. Oh, this was from the supposed uh, hit on Noreen. But yeah, the Sean Jacobson, wow, September 1982. Northern Iowa. There's an article here from the Des Moines Register. I mean, it's curious, too. A lot of people think Noreen is just insane or whatever, but it seems like obviously there's a certain percentage of what she says that can't be verified, but so much of it can be specifically verified. Here's a Des Moines Register article. September 25th, 1982. Missing boy's body is found at Spirit Lake. Authorities said Friday that they have found the body of 14-year-old Sean Lee Jacobson of Milford, who disappeared while on his way to school Monday. The body was found at about 6.30 p.m. Friday in a rural area west of Spirit Lake. The body reportedly was found by a farmer. Spirit Lake is about eight miles north of Milford. Dickinson County Sheriff Wendell Kilt said that the cause of the boy's death had not yet been determined. He declined to release more information about the boy's death. County Sheriff's officers, Milford Police, and agents of the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation searched the area where the body was found Friday night. A neighbor of the Jacobson family said the ID of the body was based on clothing the boy was wearing. The boy's books and lunch pail were found Monday near a water-filled gravel pit near Milford. Authorities had searched all week for the missing boy. Ponds and gravel pits were dragged, and about 300 people joined in the effort, which was focused on a rugged area west of Milford. About 60 of Jacobson's high school classmates joined in the search Thursday, again combing the area west of Milford. It was not known whether the boy had met with foul play or had been the victim of an accident. His father, Raymond, had said Thursday that he was certain his son had not run away. I know my boy, he said, and he'd never run away. DCI Chief Gerald Shanahan said criminologists were flown to the scene Friday night. His agents are also involved in the investigation two weeks ago of 12-year-old West Des Moines youth John Gosh. But he said Friday night that, as far as we know, there is no connection between the cases of the two missing boys. Wow. And the DCI is just really sketchy in all of this as well. I mean, these are just endless details that just... It's, it's just so hard to make, uh, to make sense of all of this. 
the Michael Corbin interview. I mean, it's it's also curious how many people are dying as a result of uh, being involved in this case. Michael Corbin interview, two thousand uh, July eighteenth, two thousand five. Noreen claims that she was recently in contact with Paul Bishop, this supposed CIA asset. Does she also disclose that a month ago, the witness who from his bedroom window heard a car door slam and saw the Ford Fairmont speed away, this was PJ Smith, revealed that he actually saw a man, and most likely Tony, shoot Johnny with a stun gun, then lift him into the car with the help of someone, most likely Paul Bonacci, who was in the back seat. References information she recently received and revealed on the Marty Stacy show that the West Des Moines police chief attended child sex parties in Omaha with Robert Wadman, and that shortly after publicizing it, the source of the information died. Noreen starts to elaborate that the West Des Moines police chief told the witness, P.J. Smith, not to reveal what he had seen to anybody. Does this sound like a legitimate inf- uh, investigation here? The May 22nd, 2008 blog talk radio interview, Noreen states that she, that witnesses noticed the man in the blue car had a brown manila envelope on the seat. She recants how the man in the blue car got flicked the dome lights before pulling away, just before another man who was described as quite tall, over six feet, came out of the trees between the two houses, describes how a witness who was in his bedroom, PJ Smith, heard a car pull up really quickly, looked out the window and saw Johnny being shot with a stun gun before the tall man, and someone who jumped out of the back seat loaded him into the car and it sped away through the stop sign, going on to say that the vehicle pulled into a side street some ways away from the Gosh home and transferred something long wrapped in a blanket, Johnny's body, from it to a van parked there. As recounted to private investigators by a man who got up early, heard a car running and looked out the window. Noreen says that when neighbors called about not getting their papers waking up, John went out to search, came home within minutes after finding Johnny's wagon. She claims police took her sheet of written statements from witnesses who she'd contacted before the police even arrived. Noreen insists that Johnny stayed listed as a runaway for multiple months. She recalls the article published a couple weeks later about two girls from Des Moines. Noreen also mentions the lesser-known 1986 kidnapping of Mark Allen which she was first notified about by the NCMEC because it did not receive publicity. She says she took the ruling of Judge Warren Erbaum in Bonacci's 99 trial to the county attorney and West Des Moines police who refused to accept it. She mentioned how 25 years later, on the morning of August 27th, a Sunday, her birthday, a package was delivered with photos of Johnny bound, gagged, and looking drugged claims that a lab at the NCMEC confirmed the photos were taken in the 1980s and were of Johnny a couple months following his kidnapping, says she took the photos to the police, but someone else who received them took them to the media. She also describes getting more photographs, around 250, from a CD sent to her through the U.S. mail without a stamp, some of Johnny and some of other kids, and how the police never called her back about it. She says she called a programmer friend to examine the CD, who found the photos were being posted on a Russian website, got the passwords to different areas on the site, and gave her enough information to provide to the NCMEC, who had been trying to break into that website for a long time. Reports that the Russian website had 8 million photos of children from all over the world, according to Noreen. The photos of Johnny didn't appear on the Russian pedophile website until they were sent to her indicating someone had them in their private collection for a while. Wow, the Des Moines Register purportedly printed a statement from police admitting they never investigated the origin of the photographs. Wow. That's crazy. What else is curious, on a recent, more recent interview, Catherine April Waters, January 5th, 2017, She stated the NCMEC tried to set up a task force to investigate Johnny, Eugene, and Mark Allen's disappearances, but the West Des Moines police refused to cooperate. She claims that the police told Mark Allen's parents not to talk to the press about their son's abduction to avoid panicking the public, and also told them not to talk to Noreen because she was a troublemaker. 
ensuring that she didn't even find out about Mark Allen until recently when the NCMEC told her. Wow. Okay, here's another major mind shock. Noreen compliments Nick Bryant as doing an excellent job on his book about the Franklin scandal with no mention of their earlier falling out. She mentions that the West Des Moines police chief, referring to Orville Cooney, died of a heart attack just as her attorney was preparing a civil case against him. Says that much earlier she told the city council of her plans to file a $20 million lawsuit against the city for the police chief's negligence, leading them to conduct an emergency non-public council meeting in which they forced Cooney to resign. She then says that four months later, Cooney was arrested for stealing blank videotapes and Molly screws from Target. What? What? Wow. Okay, that's all insane. Now let's go back to the smoking gun posts for and against this theory. Marion number one says this. A repeated occurrence on Faded Out was that it only took one new piece of information to make her do a complete 180 on her beliefs when the evidence wasn't nearly strong enough to warrant it. To give a few examples, as soon as she interviewed Chris Berge, she accepted his story without reservations and revised her view of Johnny's activities that morning to match Chris's account, putting it above all other witnesses who actually gave their accounts back in 1982. In response to an early newspaper account stating that Leonard delivered Johnny's papers before coming home to report him missing to police, Sarah came up with a theory that this wasn't suspicious, but rather an indication that Leonard was just searching the neighborhood for Johnny. As soon as she interviewed Leonard, and he said that he immediately went home to have Noreen call the police, Sarah abandoned her prior theory and just accepted what Leonard told her. Yet she did absolutely nothing to resolve or even acknowledge these contradictory accounts of what Leonard's actions had been. And based on the timing of when police were called, 8.30 a.m. per police files, the idea that Leonard called the police immediately upon discovering Johnny was missing does not hold water. Sarah spent most of her time on the Johnny Gosh investigation believing that Sam Soda was suspect, and rightfully so. Then, after talking to him, she uncritically believed every word he said and came to believe that he was the honest one who Noreen had to fame. All of this despite the fact that his interview was full of red flags, a false statement that the Goshes hired him when it was the other way around, a dubious assertion Eugene Martin's kidnapping was unconnected, an even, well, how would, even, how would he even know if it was or wasn't connected? An even more dubious attempt to dissuade Sarah from her Millhouse theory, and claim Johnny's kidnapping wasn't premeditated, an odd assertion that the county attorney's office gave him a blessing to show child pornography in public, and an attempt to stop Sarah from seeking out witness Mary Bach, who he had just claimed would corroborate his story on Frank Sikora. Not surprisingly, because when Sarah did interview Bach, she contradicted Sam. Wow, that's weird. So he's so Sam Soda's like, oh yeah, the Frank Sikora thing, Mary Bach can... Uh, can uh, can corroborate the story, but by the way, don't seek her out to actually have her do that. She can, but don't talk to her and actually do that. <laughs> That's kind of weird. All right, continuing the post here, do you really think this is a legitimate way to go about investigating a case? It's one thing to change your mind, but Sarah immediately fell head over heels for any new fact that arrived in front of her, no matter if the fact was of highly dubious providence or failed to answer legitimate questions or concerns that she had previously raised on the podcast. As such, there really wasn't a fair consideration of different theories at all. By the time of Leonard and Sam Soda's interviews, the podcast was incredibly one-sided, accepting these anti-Noreen accounts with no criticism and making unfounded arguments against the Franklin theory. Hell, it got to the point, see season 1 episode 22, where it was debunking Paul Bonacci which in with incredibly bizarre claims like using Chris Baird to deny that Johnny had a stammer when upset, even though Johnny's own mother said that he did. I mean, it would be curious to see also what his brother and sister said about his stutter and other friends and family members. I mean, you can't just trust one source. I mean, that's definitely an issue. It's for reasons like this that I feel it occasionally attempts to defend Noreen are just a way of deflecting from how awfully the podcast treated her. When you're using the word of a neighborhood boy who was at best an acquaintance of Johnny to dispute his mother's observation of Johnny's behavior, I don't think that represents having much respect for Noreen. They gave Leonard a platform to accuse Noreen of falling for a con man and later being delusional enough to accuse him of burying Johnny in their basement. What? 
All the while, none of the serious contradictions in Leonard's story were addressed, even though I repeatedly told Sarah about them. Sam Soto was given an opportunity to do the same, expressing how sorry he felt for Noreen's loss while accusing her of making up the claims against him. And once again, it was never acknowledged that Sam had essentially no credibility whatsoever. Sarah may have been limited in how much she herself went after Noreen, but if you give non-credible witnesses a platform to do so and make the audience think they are credible by withholding the problems with their stories, you are effectively complicit in a smear. If anything, given how Sarah simultaneously maintains that Noreen has all her wits about her, and that Noreen has falsely accused people like Leonard and Sam, it seems like she's hinting to the audience that Noreen is not delusional, but in fact a willful liar. And again, this is another good time to reiterate the mind shock motto. I do not allege anything is true or untrue. I do not claim anyone is lying or telling the truth. This is mind shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. Here's another post by Marion number one. I couldn't say that there is any outright smoking gun because if there were, the case would be unequivocally solved already. But the patchwork of circumstantial evidence regarding Johnny's case and Paul Bonacci's claims make the Franklin theory by far the most likely explanation. Well, before Bonacci came forward, the evidence pointed to Johnny surviving months, if not years, after his kidnapping, which rules out most kidnapper motives other than human trafficking. Most compelling are a 1983 Oklahoma sighting of Johnny and a 1985 dollar bill with a message signed by Johnny and matched to Johnny's handwriting. So on the face of it, even without getting into the Franklin evidence, child trafficking already seems to be what happened to Johnny, making it far more likely than a that a theory like Franklin is the truth. Also, if you believe Noreen's statements about Johnny calling the house, so she spoke to him at least one occasion, but, I mean, has she ever been brain fingerprint scanned? Because I think that would convince a lot of people too. I mean, I talk about the brain fingerprint scan technology. This is not like a polygraph. It completely bypasses any intention to deceive or tell the truth. It simply measures brain wave recognition of information being presented. This is what's used by the military. There's a $150,000 reward for anybody who can beat it. Supposedly no one has beat it before. And uh, this is what Stephen Avery took of making a murderer fame, where he did not recognize any of the information that the, the prosecution alleges uh, was involved with the, uh, the murder of Teresa Hallback. So everybody's still alive in this case. I mean, that's just a major tool, brain fingerprint scan technology. It should be used in all these cases. Just to remove all doubt. Although it is often suggested that Bonacci decided to link himself to the Johnny Gosh story while in prison, his claims predate that. Bonacci's diary made reference to a September 1982 incident in which he was taken to an Iowa farmhouse by Emilio and saw a Des Moines boy named Johnny fitting Johnny Gosh's description held captive there. This is reprinted on page 107 of Why Johnny Can't Come Home by Noreen Gosh. The diaries were stored at Bonacci's grandmother's house during his time in prison, so he did not have access to them. Interesting. Page 244 of the Franklin Scandal by Nick Bryan. And a forensic ink analyst of the diary on January 14th, 1991, found no evidence that any diary entry was written more than 1.5 years prior, which predates Bonacci's incarceration. Curious. Bonacci's story included numerous accurate and pertinent facts that were not known publicly. His account of the kidnappers showing a photograph of Johnny matched with the then unreleased information that Johnny was photographed a couple weeks prior to his kidnapping, which both Noreen and her then husband have confirmed. His mention of the kidnappers using multiple vehicles beyond just the car seen by the paper drop witnesses matched the also non-public at the time information about a suspicious van being seen in the neighborhood, which was first alleged by Noreen and then inadvertently confirmed by Chris Burge. It's funny because he's like, I didn't see it, but it was at, but was it at the intersection? The van that was supposedly at the intersection? I didn't see it. <laughs> Bonacci even implicated Sam Soda, who had been an unrevealed suspect of the Gosh's prior to Bonacci coming forward. 
Also powerful is how Bonacci claimed that a Sioux City area farmhouse owned by a ma man named Charlie was used as a holding facility for Johnny and other kids in the trafficking ring, when in fact there was a pedophile farmhouse owner near Sioux City named Charlie Kerr, whom Bonacci ended up identifying per Noreen's account. Bonacci, in my view, knew too much that he had no reasonable way of knowing unless he truly was involved in the child trafficking ring and involved with Johnny Gosh. And while it is hearsay, former Franklin investigator Robert Hansel told me that the Franklin ring victims other than Bonacci mentioned encountering Johnny Gosh as well. Now, here is another major mind shock, if true. So check out this post by Truly Woke over, just over a week ago. Well, first of all, Paul Bonacci is the stepbrother of one of John Wayne Gacy's victims. Many young boys worked for John Wayne Gacy, but one of which was Philip R. Pask. Philip Pask assisted a man named John D. Norman in the Delta Project, which was basically a pedophilia child trafficking organization which facilitated clients across the continent. This can help back up Paul Bonacci's claims about him being part of a human trafficking ring. The reason why the media isn't saying much about the Gacy connections is because many of the clients of the Delta Project were law enforcement officials, politicians, and elite individuals who have the power to cover this stuff up. We also can't forget about many different victims and witnesses who've come forward about conspiring with one another and have said that they've been sexually abused by these corrupt elites involved in the cover-up. We assume that our government isn't involved in harming others because they're meant to protect and serve, but clearly we've been mistaken. Sometimes the truth is crazier than fiction. So the last rabbit hole we're going to go down here is the Delta Project. This is also by Truly Woke 111. Someone also posted here the reason paper boys were targeted is they have an exact route. So they have a predictable movement. Curious. So one of Gacy's victims, Timothy McCoy, Paul Bonacci was the stepbrother of him. This led me to do some research on the John Wayne Gacy case, and I made the recent discovery that Philip R. Pask, a man who assisted John D. Norman in the Delta Project, worked for John Wayne Gacy's PDM Contractors, a company John Wayne Gacy owned. What a coincidence. The Delta Project was a pedophilia child trafficking organization which facilitated clients across the continent. After two child pornographers were arrested in Chicago, 50 to 100,000 index cards containing information about clients and victims were confiscated by law enforcement officials. It's said that these index cards were confiscated and classified due to law enforcement officials, politicians, and elite individuals being involved in some way. And the last podcast on the left had a write-up on this. Wow, a lot of crazy stuff. And on the last podcast on the left regarding John Norman, the Delta Project, a cover-up of a giant trafficking network, and the accomplices of John Wayne Gacy. I mean, these rabbit holes just keep on coming. I mean, this is crazy stuff. We can connect the Delta Project to the Franklin Child Prostitution Ring through Paul Bonacci's claims. Uh, so in, 19, in June 1978... Chicago police officers seized tens of thousands of these index cards from Norman's apartment. During an interview by Ted Gunderson, Franklin victim Paul Bonacci mentioned being abused by a Chicago school teacher named Joe Reynolds, who procured children for a nationwide boy prostitution network. The man in Chicago who ran the child prosecution ring kept a pink collection of file cards listing customers and the kinds of boys they liked. When the man who had a history of sex offenses against children was once again arrested, law enforcement discovered his file cards. Bonacci recounted being in the apartment where the file cards were kept performing administrative tasks for the network. According to Bonacci, two names that showed up in the file cards were Alan Baer and Harold Anderson, both implicated in the Franklin case. Based on the location, Chicago, the timing of Bonacci's abuse, late 70s, early 80s, the description of the man in charge of the network, and the nature of the file cards, their color and information they contained, it is extremely likely that the man was John Norman. That would indicate that multiple Franklin abusers purchased boys from Norman's operation. I mean, this is just, I mean, this is just crazy. Another thing relating to Pask 
Tony, one of the individuals involved in Johnny Gosh's abduction, is, sus is suspected to be Philip Pask. According to Paul Bonacci, Tony was a tall man, had long hair, had acne scars on his face, and would also dress up as a woman. According to witnesses at the Johnny Gosh abduction scene, he was described as a tall, stocky man seen walking behind Johnny while he walked away from the paper drop. These two photos are the only ones I could find. He is six feet tall, just like Paul Bonacci claims. He, he is, was a child trafficker who worked for a human trafficking organization connected to the Franklin child prostitution ring. Dressed up like a woman, just like, just like Paul Bonacci claims. He also had long blonde hair, just like Paul Bonacci claims, blue eyes, and was thin. Not only does Philip Paske match Paul's description, but he also matches the description of Michaela Garrett's kidnapper. Witnesses at the Michaela Garrett abduction scene described the abductor as following white male in his 20s, seen with several acne or pockmarks on his face, shoulder length, dirty blonde hair, around six feet in height, and had a slender build, fox-like blue eyes, almost all of which match the descriptions of Tony and Philip Pask. At the time of Michaela Garrett's abduction, he would have been 35 years old, so mid-30s, this can easily be explained due to the fact that acne can occur well into your 30s, 40s, and even 50s. He may have also had a younger appearance, like many men in their early to mid-30s. The Local Pedophilia Human Trafficking in Des Moines Disclaimer, I've discussed this possibility before on previous posts, but I'm going to reiterate it so I can match the information that I've recently discovered. There are two variations of this theory, but both are ultimately the same, but a little different in their own way. Variation one, Johnny Gosh's father, Leonard John Gosh, could have contacted the Franklin Child Prostitution Ring and sold his son into it. And due to human trafficking being a widespread network that operates globally, meaning that all local trafficking ring cults and criminal organizations that are involved in human trafficking have to remain interconnected in order to successfully traffic individuals from one place to another. So it is possible that people from the Franklin Child Prostitution Ring could have had connections with people in one of the local Des Moines human trafficking pedophilia rings and used them in assistance in Johnny's kidnapping. This can explain Sam Soda's involvement and how he knew about Eugene's kidnapping before it happened. Variation two, there were many pedophiles who worked for the Des Moines Register, two of which being, okay, also new names, numbers, paper routes, and addresses, and were giving it out to people within the ring. Then it's possible they could have used this information to put Johnny on the market where he was then sold to the Franklin Child Prostitution Ring. After he initially was sold, I believe that Paul Bonacci and Emilio were sent to assist Sam Soda and Tony, possibly Philip Pask, in Johnny Gosh's abduction. I believe that this variation is more plausible considering the fact that Eugene Martin and later Mark Allen disappeared under similar circumstances. I believe that the Des Moines local human trafficking ring could have sold Eugene Martin and Mark Allen to different buyers who less known than the people who purchased Johnny. Many of the Franklin victims are still unknown, so Eugene Martin and Mark Allen being sold to Franklin, the Franklin ring, is still a possibility. Ultimately, both variations follow the same theory that a smaller local human trafficking ring worked with Franklin ring in order to abduct Johnny and possibly others. Variation 2 also supports the yellow bags experiences and the idea that a local ring could have been trying to abduct and traffic others. Remember that Des Moines is still a big city and child prostitution was a big thing back then. The Delta Project also points out how they would recruit young boys as prostitutes and would pimp them out to customers or clients. Disclaimer, ultimately this is just a theory and I don't want anybody to think that I'm spreading false information to people and feeding them as true. I'm still doing more research and will update everyone. The more info I find about Johnny, Gosh, Franklin, and anything connected to it. So, wow. I mean, the rabbit holes run deep. What do all the Mind Shock listeners think about all of this so far? I mean, it's kind of hard to ignore all of these coincidences and bizarre oddities. I mean, there's just so many of them and corroborating evidence. But in the next episode, we'll be taking a look at the bizarre Jeff Gannon situation. Some believe that he was Johnny Gosh. And uh, there's a lot of information there. We'll be going over that. And there's uh, plenty more to come in the Johnny Gosh series. If you find the Mind Shock True Crime podcast interesting and informative, you can donate to our PayPal, help support the channel, help us get more Mind Shocking content out there, and keep up awareness in these missing persons, cold cases, and wrongful convictions. Just check the link in the description. 
You could also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube, help support the channel that way, get access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast request. You could also be a guest on the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.
if you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shock True Crime. This is the Johnny Gosh series. And this is episode three, Deeper Down the Rabbit Hole. In typical Mind Shock fashion, with logic and reason at the forefront. If you want to help support Mind Shock, help us get more Mind Shocking content out there with logic and reason, objectively examining cold cases, various true crime cases, missing persons cases, unsolved mysteries, the paranormal, and anything and everything in between. You can donate to our PayPal, just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast, hit that bell for notifications, so you can be notified when we drop the latest mind-shocking podcasts in a variety of cases and topics. Like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. All right, so let's get right to it. We do have to clarify quite a bit. There have been a lot of rabbit holes we've gone down in the previous two episodes, and uh, there's plenty more. There's plenty more in what can only be described as a, a cesspool of madness, in this case, of just vile, vile human beings exploiting and uh, taking advantage of children, child trafficking, all of these uh, lowest of the low criminal activity and depravity that can be imagined. And these people all need to be held accountable. The guilty parties need to be held accountable. For those that believe that there is zero involvement from law enforcement and government officials of all kind, I mean, the coincidence stack is so high to believe that, it's it's very difficult. But hey, obviously everybody's entitled to their opinion, but if these people are guilty, I think every normal human being with a conscience would agree that they need to be held accountable. I mean, these are the lowest of the low when it comes to so-called human beings in this world. So, we're going to clarify quite a few things. On the Sword and Scale podcast, 2015, Noreen Gosh stated that Orville Cooney, the police chief, went to pedophile parties in Omaha. She actually stated, quote, one young boy who actually saw Johnny stuffed into a vehicle, end quote. So this most likely she's referring to PJ Smith here. This is also from cavdef.org regarding these uh, interviews, the notes on the interviews that we're going through right now. She also said that Cooney's successor was kinder, but the case had been so bungled by that point that the police still couldn't pursue it effectively, if they were even allowed to pursue it. She claims that they had a lab run by the NCMEC authenticate the photos that Noreen received as being of Johnny. Now, why is there no verification on the NCMEC side here? So, I mean, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but uh, it's time to go on, a so on an aside. IowaColdCases.org so the Johnny Gosh write up here from this website featuring a couple details that we have not yet gone over. Case summary by Jody Ewing and Aaron Brillbeck. It's a story that shot communities and catapulted Iowa into the national spotlight, changed state law, and forever changed the way parents monitored their children's activities. 12-year-old Des Moines Register paperboy Johnny Gosh left his West Des Moines home on Sunday morning, September 5th, 1982, to begin his paper route, he wore a white sweatshirt and Kim's Academy on the back, warm-up pants, blue rubber flip-flops, and carried a yellow paper bag. Normally, his father, John Gosh, accompanied him on the route, but on this day, Johnny went alone. He never came home. What happened after that has been the subject of speculation for more than three decades. In a November 11th, 2010 interview, the day before Johnny would have celebrated his 41st birthday, Johnny's mother, Noreen Gosh, told WHO-TV Channel 13's Aaron Brillbeck that several other paper boys, all witnesses to the abduction, said Johnny was approached by a man driving a blue Ford Fairmont. The guy shut off his engine, opened the passenger door, and swung his feet out on the curb where the boys were assembling their newspapers. And he started talking about 
Where's 86th Street? Miss Gosh told Brillback. Johnny turned to Mike and said, quote, I've got my papers loaded in the wagon. I'm scared. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to head home, end quote. So this is really weird. So was it just the demeanor of the driver? Like he opened the door as if he was trying to get the, him to get in the vehicle? Like the demeanor, the tone? Because simply asking for directions, I mean, why would you open the door to ask for directions? Though? That's kind of weird. Or did Johnny actually see that there were other people in the car? And they all looked shady and he just got that uh, intuitive feeling that this is just a bad situation with bad people. But continuing on here, as Johnny left, the driver of the car took off too, the boys told police. The man pulled the door shut and started up the engine. And why would he turn off the engine? I guess the engine was that loud that it, he wouldn't be heard. Okay, whatever. Started up the engine, but before he left, he reached up and flicked the dome light three times. Then he pulled out and left, Miss Gosh said. She said she believes the driver was signaling another person who later grabbed Johnny and that one of the paper boys saw a tall man come out in between two houses and follow her son. West Des Moines Police Lieutenant Jeff Miller, a rookie cop at the time, told Brillbeck police began scouring the area immediately but hit one wall after another. They went ahead and called in the staff, Miller said. The troopers, they called in detectives, reserves, contacted Polk County sheriffs, the state patrol. At that point, they did a door-to-door -door canvas of that neighborhood trying to find someone who saw something of Johnny. Nothing was found, and they saw nothing at all, said Miller. Noreen Gosh kept meticulous notes about her son's disappearance and documented the first two years in an early chapter. They have no crime, I have no son, the first two years. In a book she'd later publish about her unsuccessful efforts to work with police and what it took to finally get law enforcement's attention. Now, again, uh, I don't know how many people actually think Noreen might have been involved in Johnny's disappearance. I mean, there's all kinds of people online. Obviously, I haven't seen any evidence of that. I don't know if anybody's presented any solid evidence of that. A lot of people like to say, oh, it's always the parents, whatever. And obviously, there, there's some strange information about Leonard John Gosh, Johnny Gosh's father, and what he may or may not have been involved in. But, uh, yeah, as far as Noreen goes, if, and Noreen's stories never changed, unlike Leonard's, and regarding other individuals. So, would Noreen be keeping meticulous notes and trying this hard, risking her life, going through all these threats and death threats, if she was in on it in any way? It just doesn't seem likely. I just wanted to point that out just to be thorough, not that there's a lot of people saying that she was involved. Just, again, this is Mind Shock where we examine every single possible theory. But, yeah, I don't think anybody keeping meticulous notes like this that could be double-checked unless someone wants to uh, assert that she's uh, keeping them, kind of trying to keep tabs on who knows what, where, how in order to keep something covered up. But, again, would she push this hard and endure all these death threats and push back against police? Also, keep in mind the year here. This is the early 80s. I mean, there wasn't this level of police criticism at that time on the scale that there is post-internet where, you know, you can find literally countless hours of police beating up old women and people in wheelchairs, et cetera, et cetera, and shooting unarmed people. So the level, this kind of, uh, th that wasn't public information to the extent that it is now or a lot of police corruption in the early 80s it wasn't exposed to the degree it is now it's barely exposed at all so yeah all things to keep in mind let's continue here a mother's crusade one month after her son's disappearance noreen founded the johnny gosh foundation and also developed a program called in defense of children she began touring the nation making nearly 1,000 personal appearances with law enforcement missing persons organizations those involving human trafficking and doing whatever she could to increase overall awareness of crimes involving children again if she was involved in some kind of ring why would she do that that would make the ring even more difficult to function <laughs> with with this with the more awareness of all these things 
On July 1st, 1984, a bill she authored, the Johnny Gosh bill, was passed into Iowa law. It mandated immediate police involvement whenever a child went missing and was subsequently adopted by eight additional states. And it's also kind of, you know you're living in a clown world where you actually need to have this passed into law? Like, a missing child, like, how? why would you not investigate that seriously immediately, especially under these kinds of circumstances? A boy does not leave his dog. I mean, you know, that's well known. Okay, anyway... That same year, she traveled to Washington, D.C. and testified before Congress during hearings on organized crime. Her testimony, she said, led to death threats and also, in part, the eventual establishment of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. President Ronald Reagan invited her to the center's opening and dedication. She went on to work on two documentaries, one for HBO and another for the State Department. Her story and what she believed happened to her son led to her writing Why Can't Johnny Come Home, a book published in 2000. Time marched onward, months turning into more years, still with no sign of her son. In the interim, two more young Des Moines boys also vanished under mysterious circumstances. 13-year-old paper boy Eugene Martin vanished from Des Moines' south side on August 12, 1984. Not quite two years after Martin's disappearance, 13-year-old Mark Allen told his mother he planned to walk to a friend's house down the street but never arrived at the neighbor's home and hasn't been seen since March 29, 1986. And I, have to, I just have to make a comment on it because it is absolutely disgusting, vile, and evil what police told Mark Allen's mother that we can't publicize his case and don't make a stink because we don't want people to be afraid. They totally swept this poor kid and his uh, grieving family under the rug. I mean, this is criminal behavior by the police department. I mean, even if they're innocent of all any kind of corruption and all that, like the whole point is to serve and protect not to sweep under the rug and deny justice by denying awareness. I mean, this is just unconscionable, and it just, it needs to be stated, because, I mean, even Eugene Martin's case relatively downplayed, like, again, compared to Josh, uh, compared to Gosh's anyway, but Mark Allen, just unconscionable. Even people familiar with Johnny Gosh's case, some of them don't know about Mark Allen. Some of them know about Eugene Martin, not even all of them, but Mark Allen just has been completely swept under the rug, absolutely unacceptable on the part of law enforcement. Uh, there's also a write-up here on the milk carton kids. I'm not going to get into that because that's not quite specific to gosh, but I would like to address, we're going to move on to the next point because this is something that coincidence theorists still write off, but uh, we're going to get to the bottom of these photos that may or may not have contained Johnny Gosh. Still awaiting answers. Mark Allen's mother, Nancy Allen, has stated she doesn't know whether her son's disappearance is linked to the disappearance of either Johnny Gosh or Eugene Martin, but po felt police were reluctant to pursue her son's case because of the other two missing boys. I got the distinct feeling police did not want parents to be frightened to let their children sell newspapers or do different things, Nancy Allen told WHO-TV's Aaron Brobeck in a story Channel 13 aired November 25, 2010. More than two decades after all these boys disappeared, one mother received a stark reminder. Early one September morning in 2006, Noreen Gosh said a mysterious envelope showed up on her front doorstep. Inside, she said she found three disturbing photos of several boys all tied up. One of the boys appeared to be Johnny. I literally could not breathe. I could not get my breath, Gosh told Brillback. I was so totally unprepared to see something like that. All these years had gone by, and here was this picture. The image in question depicted a young boy hogtied and wearing only his underpants and socks. Gosh took the photos to the West Des Moines Police Department. When I did, we spread them out, and the detective kept saying, That's Johnny, that's Johnny, and Gosh said, I know, that's Johnny. The press went wild. Newspapers and television stations across the country reported Gosh's story. Then came a call from West Des Moines police who told Gosh they were planning a press conference of their own. They planned to announce the pictures weren't of Johnny after all. I said, that picture is Johnny. And the detective said to me, well, somebody from Florida called in and he said he used to be an investigator and remembered the pictures, those pictures from a case in 1970-something, Gosh said. So they didn't even verify that this guy was actually police. It was just some guy who said he was a cop that worked on the case. <laughs> I mean, wow, these West Des Moines police. 
Noreen Gosh said she asked the detective if the caller had provided them with any evidence. And he'd responded with, no, just telling them they had, they just had the phone call. <laughs> and based on his phone call, you're going to do a press conference and say that a picture's not Do Johnny, she recalled asking him. And he said, well, yes, I am. Now, again, is this a case of Keystone Cops or is this a case of commands coming down from above? To this day, Gosh believes the boy in the photo is her son and that he was bound, gagged and abused, and taken for the purpose of satisfying pedophiles. Police continue to insist it's not him. We found out where the photos were taken, Lieutenant Miller told Brilbeck. We talked with investigators in Florida and they were able to identify all of the kids in that picture and they weren't Johnny Gosh. Now that's an interesting summary by Lieutenant Miller because according to other sources, they only identified two of the three boys and not the third one who is presumed to be Johnny. So, I mean, th there's a little bit more information here, a lot of heart a heartbreaking photo or image rendering of Johnny Gosh at age 41 and uh, what, uh, what his mother believed his life would have been like. So let's see if we can settle this issue regarding the photos, because I found something very interesting on the CavDef.org message board posted by uh, Johnny's mom, Noreen Gosh herself, if this is her post. Wow, this is actually really interesting. Okay, so... This isn't a thread, was Johnny ever in Denver? And I'll get to the Denver issues in a moment. I know we're jumping around a lot, but I wanna I wanna get as much information out here as possible. Cause this is of course Mind Chuck where we try to be as exhaustive and comprehensive as possible. So this is a post by Johnny's mom, December 17, 2010. At the time the West Des Moines police called me to tell me they were gonna do a press release saying the photos were not Johnny. I warned them that they would look like a pile of monkey nuts within a few days because the photos are of Johnny. They proceeded with their press release despite the warning. Later, it was shown that their source, Nelson Zalva, had no evidence whatsoever. And they proceeded with their press release just based on a phone call from Zalva. No evidence. Can anyone believe that a police department can operate this way? I mean, from the way they handled this particular case from the outset, and Mark Allen, yes. <laughs> this particular police department seems highly compromised, corrupt, and or incompetent. I also had the photos authenticated by a photo lab, which the police decided they did not want to accept either. It was the National Center who authenticated the photos. It would be interesting to see if we could get them to verify that, but... Anyway, or do they not want that public for whatever reason? The photos which were debunked by a Florida detective, Nelson Zalva, was a planned effort to throw the public in the opposite direction. Zalva realized his mistake and realized the photos were not part of his 79 investigation. He called the West Des Moines police and asked them to do another press release, correcting the earlier misinformation. The police declined to correct the story. The Des Moines Register ran the story that Zalva had no evidence whatsoever to back up his story. We have had personal contact with Zalva, and this is the accurate account of what took place concerning his mistake, which was widely publicized. It served the purpose of the West Des Moines police to leave the impression with the public that the photos were not genuine. Okay, a lot to unpack there. So was Zalva simply told to do this by a higher up, but he's supposedly retired? Or did he genuinely, if he's older and his memory's not great, did he genuinely just make an honest mistake and then he called to apologize and correct it? So again, this is Johnny's mom. If this is really Noreen Gosh posting as Johnny's mom with the moniker Johnny's mom, she's claiming here in this post or whoever the poster is that Zalva has corrected this mistake. Furthermore, there's another interesting post from Ginger, Gingerbread Man here. I just want to further lay to rest Zalva's claim that the photos were investigated in 1979. This was all discussed previously, but for those that are new, the picture contains a baseball banner and a World's Fair shirt that can be verified to have been produced in 1982. They clearly did not exist 
1979. Okay, then. <laughs> Another post here by Dorka the Just. Despite the fact that the information from Zalva has so clearly been debunked, it has long been a source of constant annoyance to me that many internet sites still cling to it as gospel. On the other hand, it only goes to show that people would pretty much believe what they want to. My observation, though, is that I... is that were I to have been Zalva, and had he my old job at the court, he would have been skinned alive and roasted over a proverbial barbecue pit for submitting a statement in a report that was unsupported by the record on appeal, which he clearly did in this instance. Unhappily, I did just that a few times while I was there and was deservedly trounced for having done. I'd also like to observe that I wish the America's Most Wanted website would at least frame this part of the equation to more properly fit the reality of the situation at hand, i.e. that while this detective from Florida claimed that the pictures were not of Johnny but were of other boys who had participated in a sort of game back in 1979, three years before John's disappearance, these claims were not substantiated by any evidence and that, in fact, had there been any evidence to justify this conclusion, he, Zalva, lost it. I suppose I could respect Zalva were he man enough to say, gee, I think I missed this one and shouldn't have shot off my mouth. I actually don't have any evidence to support my claim. That's something my father taught me to do when I was knee-high to an ant. Admit you made a mistake when you did, apologize, and go on. Sorry, just ranting. In any case, wherever he is, I do wish Johnny all the best. We could all use a lot more happiness these days. Okay. So here's the thing, too. I mentioned this all the way back in episode one. The coincidence theorists, the authority-worshipping cultists who take as dogma whatever a so-called detective retired or not stated, it's, it's weird because if he has no evidence, why would anybody believe the claim? I mean, even if it's true, maybe, like, let's say it could be true now that it's, if this information about the baseball banner and the World's Fair t-shirt that was only manufactured in 1982... That removes any possibility of the photo ha being taken in 1979, not to mention if Noreen Gosh is, uh, is saying it was lab tested and it was confirmed to have been taken in 1982 and not 1979. I mean, that's all pretty damning. Now, that still doesn't mean it's Johnny Gosh, but that throws the Zalva claim out the window that these photos were part of a 79 investigation. So the question is, what facilitated all of this? Now, I know we're jumping around, but I do want to get to this because this isn't a thread. Was Johnny ever in Denver? I'm looking at the summer of 1986, around July, August, around the Capitol Hill area. So, what's also curious, of course, the Denver restaurant where Johnny is alleged to have uh, wrote, Johnny Gosh was here with, with nail polish, in red nail polish. And this was uh, confirmed, apparently, by not only Bonacci, but even a letter from another individual, Mike, corroborating this story. And this was before any of this was known. So here is a post here by Trocaria. I used to live in Iowa, was born there. My youth straddled the two states of Iowa and Colorado. In September 82, my mom put me on a plane to Iowa to go to see my dad, sending me off with the benediction of, at least I don't have to worry about anything bad happening to you there. 48 hours later, the world caved in on Johnny's family and changed the way folks in that part of the state saw themselves in other communities. A lot of doors got locked that night for the first time in years. And yeah, the impact of the Johnny Gosh case, especially locally in that area, cannot be understated. Uh, the reason I ask about Denver, not just Colorado as a whole, is I think I may have seen Johnny on an RTD bus in the summer of 1986. I had just come from an interview with the state of Colorado, got on the Zero bus or O bus that went up Colfax, a long hour ride into Aurora and through some very dicey parts of town. About six blocks from where I got on to the, at the Capitol, a kid gets on. He looks out of it, maybe even a little off in the head. Then I look again. He had dark hair to the collar and in need of a shampoo. He had glasses, wore a striped t-shirt, pimples. But something about his eyes, nose, and mouth made me suck in my breath. 
He looked like Johnny. Part of me wanted to get up right there and slip into the seat behind him, call his name and see if it rang a bell. But then I took in the dark hair, the glasses. Nah, Johnny was lighter, didn't wear specs. Besides, what's he doing all the way over here? If he was kidnapped into the juvie sex trade, wouldn't he be in New York City or LA? I'm guessing, so this was in 86, so this was before... Is this before the information about the uh, the red, red nail polish came forward? I kept an eye on him. He stayed on the bus about eight or ten blocks, then got off, walking towards the south. I was gobsmacked at what I had seen, and it had stuck with me all this time. Would Johnny have ever been let out on his own by that point? The part of town he got on and off at were not good, not at all. Indeed, as I would come to find out, a lot of young males plied the world's oldest profession in front of the Centennial Building, near the state capital where I work. The more I have read, the more I find out. I could about kick myself for not following my gut and trying to make contact with the kid on the bus. If that was he, please forgive me. I pray that God has John in his keeping and that the day will come when he can at last come home. So interesting information there. And furthermore, apparently, so this, this is something I found odd. Because the friends of the Goshes were the ones who saw the, red, the, the Johnny Gosh was here in Denver. Apparently, it's been reported, not just the friend, they were the Goshes' neighbors in Des Moines. And they just happened to see Johnny, was, Johnny Gosh was here. I mean, I don't know what to make of that. We might have to do an episode examining the neighbors because there are some people that think the neighbors might have been involved. But... Let's go all the way back to the Sword and Scale interview that we started with. Now that we have debunked Zalva, again, if the, uh, the baseball banner and uh, World's Fair t-shirt can be verified, and Zalva himself, I mean, if he really did contact Noreen and, and state his mistake, I mean, that's, that's all that would make that situation very clear. So... The host, Mike, starts to get into the controversial issue of Noreen implicating her ex-husband. Noreen says that she never directly accused her husband of being involved in the case, and that she considers it an unanswered question stemming from Bonacci answering the judge's own question of how they knew Johnny would be alone by saying prior arrangements were made with Johnny's father. So... For the people that don't trust Ted Gunderson, because some people are stating that Ted Gunderson is compromised. Now, I don't know how much sense that could make. Again, I'm not claiming anything is true or untrue. But uh, as posters have pointed out regarding Ted Gunderson, if he really is controlled up and some kind of a shill, that would mean that he was put out to put out this info, true or not, in order to distract away from even more damning info. But it's, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense because Gunderson was one of these first guys that got the ball rolling into exposing these corrupt politicians, law enforcement, in satanic abuse and child trafficking. So either way, apparently, if this information's coming from Bonacci, verified by Gunderson, then, then Noreen is not really the source of this info regarding implicating Leonard, her husband Johnny's father. Because this is Bonacci. So she goes on to say that she doesn't see why Bonacci would lie about that detail. But is unwilling to embrace his allegation until it is proven. So again, if she really was just uh, wanted to implicate her husband, she could make a lot stronger claims. But she clearly doesn't here. She's saying she's she, it's an unanswered question and more proof is needed. I mean, that's that's a measured, level-headed response for the people who think that she went mad or whatever. She also states that Bonacci identified Michael Aquino as the colonel who paid for Johnny. She says she knows where the house in Sioux City, Iowa was and who owned it. Noreen refers to the court records of the Bonacci trial being sealed, and she says that in 2008, former Omaha police chief Robert Wadman tried to gain control of the sealed file so he could destroy it, leading her to enlist John DeCamp to stop it from happening. Noreen also states that Alicia Owen's child looks exactly like Robert Wadman, and he refused to take a DNA test. Noreen claims that Wadman started threatening her because her website hosted a report given to her 
by Ted Gonderson and mentioned public information from the Omaha World Herald about him. She also discusses being sued by Weidman, which was dropped after DeCamp beat him in court. And she says that Wadman left threatening messages on her home answering machine. So not only does she have issues with the West, uh, the Des Moines police chief, but also the Omaha police. I mean, this is corruption across the board. Noreen describes giving a personal message to Johnny on the Lisa Gibbons show, telling him how to find her just before his 1997 visit. So now here is a critical point because I know a lot of people are on the fence about whether or not Johnny actually visited her. And myself included, I don't know what to make of it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm definitely not willing to call her a liar. I wasn't there if that really was Johnny or if it was another individual, not Johnny pretending to be Johnny, yet he had all the same scars. That's a curiosity. Or if this was either imagined or made up by Noreen for whatever purpose. Again, I wasn't there. I don't know her. She hasn't been brain fingerprint scanned to my knowledge. But assuming, like, it seems like everything she said has been either verified or not, or not verified, but not debunked. So that's that's curious because across this whole case, across all these decades, either certain things she said are unable to be verified because they're either in sealed files or have not been released, whatever. But a lot of things she said can be verified by third parties. That's very curious. So she's not lying about any of those things. They were verified. There doesn't seem to be a third category where what she stated has been proven to have been made up, a made-up lie. That category doesn't exist unless people, if people want to point that out, that's fine. I haven't seen anything yet at my current level of research into this case when episode three yet. So I haven't seen that third category where it is proven that she lied or made something up. So she told, so some people say, why would he randomly visit her in 1997? So if she was on the Lisa Gibbons show specifically talking to him and how to find her, if he saw the show, that would be the time, right? So that actually makes it highly, see, I didn't know about this Lisa Gibbons interview. If she specifically told him how to visit her, how to reach her, because she wasn't at the house with Leonard, Leonard was living at the house at the time. And if Leonard was somehow involved or whatever, Maybe Johnny didn't want to have anything to do with him or see him. He, but of course, if his mother, he would want to see his mother. So if his mother gave him specific instructions to come see her on the Lisa Gibbons show, a nationally televised show, he would know exactly where to go, how, and the fact that his mother wanted to see him at that time. That, I mean, that's a major, major piece of evidence that lends more credibility to this visit actually being true because of this specific appeal and specific instructions on the Lisa Gibbons show. I haven't been able to find a copy of the show, so if, if anybody has this episode from, in, from 1997, but that's, I mean, that's a piece of information that we cannot ignore here. Now, she did get upset at being questioned about the visit, and she threatens to hang up. I mean, that could be for a bunch of different reasons. I mean, clearly it's very emotional, and she probably doesn't like being called a liar. If, if she's telling the truth, you know, and this is very emotional, of course. It seems like if she would be lying, it wouldn't really affect her that much to the point where, you know, if she's lying she's about everything all the time and the visit, it's like, why would she? I don't know. It just seems more likely that it is true, or at least she believes it's true. She says that Johnny related how the pedophile operation, such as safe houses, worked and named names. After which she went to the county attorney and gave him all the information, crediting it to an informant. Noreen claims that the county attorney, John Sarcone, has had her back ever since and knows the information is accurate. Says she was recently invited to an early morning law enforcement conference where someone recognized her as the one who forced the FBI to change how it investigated missing children's cases. David Bellinson says that elements which couldn't be verified beyond the surface level allegations were left out. Bellinson gives his standard Q&A about belief in Noreen's account. Was Johnny abducted? If so, was it organized? If so, who it was? What else they did? He made clear he believes that there was an organized conspiracy to abduct Donnie, to abduct Johnny, but is unable to say how far beyond that it goes. So not a single abductor. 
All right, so we have even more potential information that could prove Noreen's account that Johnny visited her. Because if this, if this county attorney got information that could, could only be given by Johnny Gosh or someone directly involved and was able to verify it, and this was right after the alleged visit, I mean, that's quite conclusive. That's quite conclusive. Now, I'm just going to do a quick aside here on Sarcone because Sarcone stated to the Des Moines Register in 1999. All right, so here's an article here by Frank Santiago, Des Moines Register. Noreen Gosh stated, I saw Johnny. Mother of missing carrier didn't tell police because she feared for son's life. February 7th, 1999. Noreen Gosh said Saturday that her missing son Johnny visited her at her West Des Moines apartment in 1997. She said she never told authorities because Johnny said it would put their lives in danger. I had no warning, she said. He just showed up. She said she didn't call police right away because her son, who would have been 27 years old at the time, arrived with another man and she thought others might be outside in the car. She said Johnny told her not to disclose that he was alive. And I haven't done so because it was in his best interests. Gosh said she immediately recognized the long-haired visitor who knocked on her door at about 2.30 a.m. in March 97. He opened his shirt to show a birthmark on his chest. We talked about an hour, an hour and a half. He was with another man, but I have no idea who the person was. Johnny would look over to the other person for approval to speak. West Des Moines police said the case remains under investigation and would not comment further. Polk County attorney John Sarcone said he is happy for Noreen Gosh if her son is alive, but he said he thinks Johnny Gosh would be safer coming to police than trying to hide. That's an interesting statement there. So does he have information that he is alive? The reported visit was yet another odd twist. In the bizarre disappearance of newspaper carrier Johnny Gosh, who was 12 years old when he vanished without a trace September 5th, 1982 in West Des Moines. His wagon was found about two blocks from his home, filled with copies of the Des Moines Sunday Register he was to deliver. On August 12th, 1984, Eugene Martin, 13, who was also delivering the Des Moines Sunday Register, vanished from a South Des Moines neighborhood, also without a trace. Dozens of people as far away as Africa and Canada have claimed to see the boys, individually or together. Police have been skeptical and haven't established a motive. But Noreen Gosh has insisted her son was taken by a ring of international pornographers who abused children. Although investigators say they've been unable to link the abductions, there is a suspicion that they are connected because of the boys' ages, the fact that the incidents happened on early Sunday morning, and because both victims were carriers. Noreen Gosh disclosed the early morning meeting with her son while under oath in federal court. So she didn't just state this to the media. This was under oath. She made the statement under oath in, a Lincoln, in Lincoln, Nebraska during a hearing on a civil lawsuit. The suit was brought by Paul A. Bonacci against Larry King, a manager of the defunct Franklin Credit Union, who Bonacci says sexually abused him. Bonacci said he took part in Johnny Gosh's abduction, but Sarcone said investigators concluded any involvement by Bonacci was not credible. And I'll get back to that in a statement. Let me just uh, in a second. Let me just finish the article. Noreen Gosh said she doesn't know the whereabouts of her now of her son. He didn't say where he's living or where he was going. She said she did not tell her former husband John Gosh of the meeting. John Gosh, Leonard John Gosh, could not be reached for comment Saturday. Okay, so let's go back to Sir, so did Sir so Noreen said that Sarcone, she gave information to Sarcone that made him believe that it was Johnny who visited her. Or at least that the information she gave him from an... Oh, she didn't tell him it was Johnny originally. She said it was from an informant. So, But supposedly Sarcone verified it. Now, Sarcone is also stating that involvement by Benacci is not credible. Is he just saying that? As a throw? Because if he really... If, if him and Noreen have a trusted relationship and he's really trying to help Noreen... Would he just say that in order to not for people not to target Bonacci? Because again, if, if he's a good guy here, so here's there, there's some interesting points here further too. Because for the for the those that say that Bonacci just made all this up, he did win his case. So here's an excerpt here. 
from the Associated Press, January 13, 2000, King drops appeal of $1 million judgment. On February 5th, 1999, in U.S. District Court in Lincoln, Nebraska, an extraordinary hearing occurred in Paul A. Bonacci v. Lawrence E. King, a civil action in which the plaintiff charged that he had been ritualistically abused by the defendant as part of a nationwide pedophile ring linked to powerful political figures in Washington and to elements of the U.S. military and intelligence establishment. Three weeks later, February 27th, Judge Warren K. Urborm ordered King, who is currently in federal prison, to pay $1 million in damages to Bonacci, in which Bonacci's attorney, John DeCamp, said was a clear sign that the evidence presented was credible. So to all the coincidence theorists and authority-worshipping cultists out there who allege that there is no such cr- there is no such rings or politicians' involvement and military involvement in all of this, how did Bonacci win a $1 million judgment? I mean, this isn't a settlement. This was a judgment for damages ordered by the, the uh, judge. This is not a settlement to prevent Bonacci from further speaking on the matter. This is a judgment for $1 million in damages. I would like to hear the coincidence theorists' thoughts on this. I mean, what do they think? Because, I mean, to be able to prove it in a court of law beyond reasonable doubt, and again, these files supposedly are sealed, so we don't know the exact evidence presented, but I mean, they don't just hand out a million dollars to people who say they've been abused without evidence. And of course, the kibosh was put on the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. We went over that as well. So how credible is Bonacci if he's able to present enough evidence to win a $1 million judgment? And why would King drop the appeal if the evidence wasn't legitimate? I mean, if the if the evidence was wasn't legitimate, because if it's just all hearsay, of course you appeal. There's no evidence, guilty or innocent, he would appeal. But in order, if there's no chance of winning the appeal, I guess he didn't want to go through the fees because if the evidence presented was that damning, I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. But yeah, so what does everybody make of this visit by Johnny? Now that we have further information here. So she actually appealed on the Lisa Gibbons show nationally, publicly for him to come visit her. And then he actually does. This story also match and supposedly Sarcone can verify the information that Johnny or another individual who's not Johnny gave her. Because even if the information is all credible, technically that doesn't mean it was Johnny. That just means it was someone who knew information about these criminals. So this information also matches Jimmy Gibson's account, though, shady as he might be, if if Johnny Gosh is going to, like, Native American reservations, he would grow his hair out long, try to blend in, etc. That kind of matches. So, yeah, and then if, if he really got Noreen to believe their lives are all in danger, or at least he, his is, because she didn't even go to the police with this, she testified under oath of this a few years later, so... Some more information here. This is the FAW cast interview, September 2016. Noreen mentions the night before Johnny asked to do his paper route by himself because the, all the other boys were, and Noreen rejected it, saying that the other boys were older than him. He went out alone anyway, says a blue over blue car pulled up. A man shouted through the window that he was asking for directions. But Johnny kept walking to the paper drop at the corner. The blue car made a U-turn in the street and pulled back up to where the kids were sitting folding their papers. I went over some of these details before, so apparently he made two attempts to get directions from Johnny Gosh, even making a U-turn to do so. That's kind of creepy. I mean, that's enough to freak somebody out. Because if it was just the one pull up, okay, open the door, ask, whatever. If it's the second time and, and Johnny Gosh is getting a really bad feeling here... So check this account out. So in this FAW cast interview, so Noreen is stating the car made a U-turn, pulled back up to where the kids were sitting, folding their papers. Then the man got out through the passenger door. So not just opened. In this interview, she's stating he got out of the passenger, out of the car, through the passenger door, and started asking questions using garbled words as if he was under the influence or had a speech impediment. Says that as Johnny walked away, 
creeped out by the man, the man got back in his car, slammed the door, started the engine and flicked the dome light three times before speeding away. Wow. Okay. A lot more details here. So Johnny's freaked out by this guy, maybe because he's not, he's seems insane. <laughs> and if he can't speak properly and then the man got back into his car and slammed the door as if angry. Okay. She says, as soon as that happened, a tall, thin man estimated about six, five. And again, to kids, he might, someone who's tall, 6'2", 6'3", might look 6'5", whatever. Again, we don't know that. Came out from B, between two houses and followed. Also, if people that are, like, really skinny and lanky, they look taller than they actually are due to their uh, disproportionate frame. Two houses followed Johnny quite stealthily. What does that mean? Does that mean he was, like, ducking low by bushes? Says that the blue car had gone full circle, came back up on a side street where it parked. Noreen claims that as Johnny turned, the back door opened, someone got out. The man following Johnny shot him with something that made him drop to the ground. Then they both loaded Johnny into the car before they slammed the car door and ran the stop sign heading north on 42nd Street. According to Noreen, a boy in his bedroom, PJ Smith, is the one who heard a scuffle, looked out the window, and saw Johnny being shot with the stun gun, allegedly, then loaded into the car. Noreen claims to have had written witness statements from all the people on the street written down before the police arrived. She says the police did go to interview all the witnesses, but didn't bother to bring any writing implements which baffled the parents of the witnesses and caused them to call Noreen. Okay. Okay. Hold on a second. I mean, where we're going really far into mind shock land. So the police aren't even taking notes, and the parents of the witnesses found this so strange because this, I guess, they knew Noreen. This is the same neighborhood. They called her to tell her how strange that was. Now, also, the people who think Noreen makes stuff up, they would presumably, uh, these other people could verify all this information. I mean, this is just straight up mind shock. I mean, it gets even worse because uh, the police chief himself said that there's no evidence of a crime when he knew full well that P.J. Smith said that he saw Johnny being shot by something and physically abducted into a vehicle. Noreen states that the police chief got very angry at her for wanting a private investigator. Oh, that's telling. Noreen says that the kids who saw the blue car were then taken to a dealership to pick out the color of the paint chips, which changed color under mercury vapor light. She claims that Chief Cooney also made statements to the news that Johnny was just a runaway. Noreen recalls being at a press conference with parents of missing children who were mistreated by police, and the RCMP were there speaking about how in a short time they'd be able to uplink a child's information throughout the world in a matter of seconds on the information superhighway. Does anybody still call the internet that? Noreen says on a daily basis she worked with private investigators who canvassed a radius surrounding her home and performed door-to-door -door interviews. She refers to one man who was extremely grateful to have been approached by the investigators saying that he had tried unsuccessfully to tell police what he saw. He got up early to get a drink, heard a motor running, and looked out the window where he noticed a van parked against the flow of traffic, and after watching the van for a while, a blue over blue car pulled up, something long was unloaded from the back seat, and it was put in the van before both cars headed back north towards the interstate. She says that when the detective came back to her with the report, he told her to bury it and never give it to police. Noreen says that members of the finance committee pulled her aside and said that the Johnny Gosh law wouldn't be enforced. What? That's messed up. She claims that at the July 1984 signing, another legislator next to her said the bill was only to humor her, as there would never be another kidnapping. And that the foundation subsequently began... I mean, even if that's true, why would you tell her that? Like, what is wrong with these people? that the foundation subsequently began a letter-writing campaign against the legislature legislator with his quote. Noreen says that the, earlier in the summer of 84, she was contacted by a man who said she had information about the case and wanted to meet. 
And this is kind of ironic, too, because this other individual who's stating that there wouldn't be a kidnapping, and then here we go here, he told her, she's talking about Sam Soda here, he told her at the meeting that there would be a second paperboy kidnapping in Des Moines on the south side in the second weekend in August. I mean, this is very specific information. The second weekend in August, and he wanted her to go to the police with information, but balked at her willingness to tell them his name. Noreen says the Des Moines police wouldn't let her talk to a detective. So she walked in and they wouldn't even, the people at the desk wouldn't even let her talk to the detective. What? She told the news director at local TV stations as well as one reporter at the Des Moines Register. Editor's note, Frank Santiago. Noreen says she arrived home from a hearing in D.C. and ABC 2020 arrived the next day doing a follow-up story of Johnny Gosh. Claims that after the filming, she told the producer about the forewarning of the kidnapping the next day, Sunday, prompting the producer to stay in Des Moines. Okay, so if this can all be verified, so she's telling, wow, this is crazy. Because some people are alleging she made up this whole story about the Sam Soda's warning of a second kidnapping. Noreen claims that early the next morning, a TV reporter called out of breath, stating that there had been another kidnapping exactly like she said, which he heard because the news director shared it to make fun of Noreen. What is wrong with these people? Noreen says Johnny was photographed two weeks before the kidnapping, as witnessed by a neighbor. Now, also, I have to interject here. Which neighbor? The same neighbor who saw that Johnny Gosh was here writing in the Denver Mexican restaurant in red nail polish? I would like to know that information. Noreen says that she knows for certain that after his abduction, Johnny was transported to a house, kept there for about two weeks, and photographed so that pictures could be advertised to pedophile buyers, one of whom arrived, and counted out money on the table to purchase Johnny. Wow. Noreen says that in 1985, a prisoner in Des Moines sent a letter claiming that there was a ring operating in northwest Iowa, all of whom were using children from some kind of list. She says she checked out the lead on her own, getting all the information which she gave to Governor Branstad, leading to a ring in the Fort Dodge area getting busted. Go Noreen. Noreen claims that after Bonacci confessed to his attorney, his attorney hired a private investigator to vet what Bonacci said, and everything checked out. She says that after the PI did his work, he contacted the family and brought tapes of the interviews, says he wanted her to do a meeting with Bonacci in person, and she called the WHO to document it. Noreen describes fainting upon seeing Bonacci in person for the first time. She says the PI asked Bonacci, do you know who this lady is? He said, no. The investigator told him it was Johnny's mom, leading Bonacci to burst into tears and apologize profusely before he gave a detailed account of the kidnapping. So this, apparently, if he's acting, his acting was good enough to convince Noreen. His acting was good enough to convince a judge to give him a million-dollar settlement for the abuse he suffered. His acting was good enough to convince former FBI head Ted Gunderson and other private investigators. I mean, so either this, so what does this mean? Either this guy's like the greatest actor of all time, or he's legit. Noreen points out how Bonacci said in the prison interview, and apparently this is, uh, there is a video of this, that they drove a few blocks to where a van whose color and direction told by Bonacci matched that of the buried witness account. So imagine you're Noreen here, so you spoke to neighbors, now all of a sudden this guy in prison is giving all this unreleased information about Johnny, his personality quirks, all of these things that were never released publicly, and also this account that nobody knows except her and pos and whatever police, actually did the police even take this guy's account? So the color and direction told by Benacci matched that of the buried witness account. So about this parked van. Noreen recalls how in response to the PI wanting to set up a prison meeting with Bonacci, she said she needed some time to be able to face Bonacci without being angry. 
She references that all the safe houses used to keep children, some of which Bonacci revealed, they tended to be in the middle of nowhere. Noreen claims that the Colorado ranch was burned down after America's Most Wanted aired. So, okay, so this is the house supposedly owned by the prison guard that couldn't be tracked down. So she's stating that after it was aired in America's Most Wanted, it mysteriously burned down. That's kind of damning. An interesting comment here regarding, I don't even know where this was from, but apparently, yeah, people cannot find anything out about this supposed prison guard who owned this house that Bonacci pointed out in Colorado. One huge crucial question that needs answering is, who is the prison guard that supposedly owned the ranch that Paul Bonacci takes America's Most Wanted to visit in Colorado? The ranch has an underground area where they supposedly kept children. There was also initials carved into the wood. They mention it was owned by a prison guard. I have yet to find out anything regarding who this person may or may not be. Why wouldn't he be a person of interest? Why not a huge search? Then, as always, we see cases like this which may involve powerful people like politicians, military like Michael Aquino. What happens after the airing? The ranch burns down. Yeah, that isn't suspicious at all. And did they, did America's Most Wanted have time to do DNA testing on that building? Because, I mean, come on, in that basement, if children really were kept there, I mean, would they find many, many different samples of DNA? And who would they match? How many missing children would they match if this is true? If bon Paul Bonacci's account is true here? I mean, obviously, Paul Bonacci's other accounts were enough to win him a $1 million settlement. So clearly there was evidence there. So would he make up some information and not other information? Like what are people, what are his critic? What are those that criticize Bonacci think about all of this? But this house was burned down. Curious. Continuing on here regarding the, uh, the FAW cast interview here. So Bonacci mentioned how the kids were taken to a Mexican restaurant in Colorado. One of the kids had a bottle of red nail polish, which they used to write a message, something that friends of the Gosh family later saw on their trip to the restaurant. Again, were these just friends or were these the actual neighbors? And were these neighbors the same people who reported the woman taking pictures of Johnny Gosh two weeks prior? And who knows what else? Noreen recounts how Bonacci said that after the kidnapping, they took Johnny to a house outside of Sioux City, ran by a man named Charlie, and sketched a detailed picture of the man, which the private investigator for Bonacci's attorney took to the county attorney, who searched through all the county's mugshots to find the man. She claims Charlie had a lengthy rap sheet for sexual offenses. She also says Orville Cooney resigned on a Monday morning due to stress, which was actually her threat to sue the city. Noreen mentions how in the 1980s, it was very prevalent for kids to be photographed and targeted for abduction. She describes the neighbor witnessing photos being taken of Johnny by a man using a telephoto lens in a car with California plates. You know, what's weird though, in other accounts, it states woman. Like, was it a man and a woman? Was there a woman in a car and the man was the one taking the photos? Were they both? I mean, I don't know. She also states that one particular man had a vehicle that was at the kidnapping site, editor's note, Sam Soda, brought photos of Johnny to the motel the night before and said he was the kid they were taking the next morning. She recounts how many years later, NCMEC President Robert Lowry revealed to her that there was a third kidnapping in Des Moines in 1986, which she had never heard before and told Jan Michelson she claims the police told Mark Allen's mother back in 86 not to go to the press or Noreen Gosh and broke the Johnny Gosh law. And this is corroborated by Mark Allen's mother, which we just went over this article either. I mean, every step of the way, Noreen's account gets corroborated by third parties. Obviously not every piece of information, because some of them uh, have not been corroborated yet, but they haven't been disproven either. So it's just weird, like years and years go by and she gets vindicated more and more and more. Will she be eventually be vindicated of every single claim she's made? I mean, that's the way it's going so far. Noreen says the March 97 visitor, when knocking, 
said, it's me, mom. It's Johnny. She wanted Johnny to stay and tell his story to help get the perpetrators to justice. Noreen says the attorney in the 1999 trial asked her if she'd ever seen or talked to Johnny again, and she remained silent, but the judge instructed her to answer. And she testified she had seen him once. So, okay, all right, I'm, I'm going to have to say here, she seems completely honest to me because she didn't even want to. She, she, it seems like she's honest to a fault. She's under oath. The judge is instructing her to answer and she remains silent. So she does not wish to lie or reveal the information, but the judge persists and she admits, basically, if this is true, she admits that she's seen him once. It's like she can't lie. So she, it's almost like she did not want to reveal this information and the judge forced her and she took her oath seriously in that courtroom. I mean, I really do not understand the Noreen Gosh detractors. It seems like they're just trying to soothe their own cognitive dissonance by trying to paint her as crazy or insane. Almost every claim she's made has turned out to be corroborated by third parties. So at this point, I think I'm going to have to say it was either Johnny or it was someone who was able to trick her enough to think that he was Johnny. I mean, you could also say it could have possibly been a hallucination, but I mean, why then? I mean, I mean, right after the Lisa Gibbons show when she pleads for him to come and gives him direction. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. The Mind Shock listeners can chime in with their opinions here. According to her, a reporter from the Associated Press was sitting there, wrote everything down. She says she learned a lot more about how the trafficking network operated at the trial. Noreen insists around, okay, around the time mentioning the Wetterling case, there's no evidence Johnny is dead, and her investigators have received reports of him living under another identity. Interesting. So her private detectives stated that he's living under another identity. So maybe she knows where he is the whole time. So why Johnny can't come home? Not that she doesn't know where he is, but why he can't come home. I mean, that's curious. That's a good title, Why Johnny Can't Come Home. She suggests those who want the book get in touch to her, with her by writing to the Johnny Gosh Foundation at AOL.com. Again, this is an old interview. I don't know if that email is still valid. So, wow. All I can say is, wow, this is some mind-shocking information. Furthermore, I would like to go over... For those that say that there's no evidence of a ring or conspiracies or anything of the sort, I mean, there's actually there's, there's been a multitude of people arrested for trafficking children in these, these pedophile rings. Like, the coincidence theorist goofs here really don't have a leg to stand on when they're trying to deny any possibility of a ring being involved here. So, this is Des Moines Register, March 15th, 1986. Man named in pedophile network case pleads guilty! by Ann Carruthers K. A Des Moines man who hired teenagers for the state fair and worked for two years at Merle Hay Mall's Chatsworth, the talking reindeer, pleaded, I mean, these, a lot of these people are just attracted to, uh, to these events where there's teenagers and children, it's weird, pleaded guilty Friday to three counts of sexually abusing teenage boys. Jerry Wintz, 47, one of five Des Moines men accused of acting as a pedophile network that passed boys around for sexual purposes, accepted a plea bargain less than a week before he was to go to trial on six counts of sexual abuse. Wintz is the fourth man in the group to come to court. One of the men, Larry Hoffman, was declared mentally incompetent to stand trial. Former Des Moines elementary teacher Stephen Woodcock was convicted of two felony sex abuse charges. Another former teacher, David Graham, pled guilty to a reduced charge of conspiracy to commit lascivious acts with a child. A fifth man, Patrick Baird, an insurance company clerk, is awaiting trial on four felony sex abuse charges. Wint's plea, guilty plea was taken by Polk County District Judge Jack Levin in an empty courtroom after court hours Friday. Are you pleading guilty because you are in fact guilty, Levin asked Wintz. Yes, sir, I am, replied Wintz in firm voice. 
He told the judge that he considers himself an intelligent man except for these acts. Mr. Wentz is going to prison, said Prosecutor Gregory Byler, noting that each of the three convictions carries a mandatory 10-year term. However, Byler said that as part of the plea bargain, he will not make a recommendation on whether Levin should allow Wentz to serve the sentences together or insist that they be served consecutively. Byler said he will give Levin the facts of the three crimes as well as Mr. Wentz's prior history. He is to be sentenced May 27. Byler said Wentz, he met two of the boys through the state fair and a third boy through the boy's father, who at one time worked for Wentz, a tax preparer. The boys were 14 and 15 years old at the time of the sexual abuse occurred. Wentz told Levin that he believed one of the boys was 18 because the boy had lied about his age in an application for a job at the Iowa State Fair. So he believed one of them was 18, but not the other. No evidence of drugs. Byler said statements from the boys indicated that Wince befriended the boys and then seduced them. He said there was no evidence that Wince provided alcohol or drugs, and Wince said he used neither himself. Wince worked for Job Service of Iowa, hiring temporary help for the fair. He also worked at Chatsworth the Talking Reindeer. In 1982 and 1983, Byler said, Chatsworth was a popular Christmas feature for preschool children. As Chatsworth winced, sat in a mock gingerbread house in the mall and talked to children through a microphone which amplified his voice through a reindeer head. After the hearing, Wince denied allegations that he was involved in a local witch's coven, allegedly led by Graham. The allegation was made in a sworn statement by a woman who said she had been a longtime friend of Graham. I don't think the coven had anything to do with the sexual bonds, said Byler. So he... What? Wentz also denied the prosecution contention that five men introduced their alleged victims to each other. He admitted he knew all the men, but said he hadn't seen any of them except Baird in several years. What? So he admits he knows all of them, but denied that they uh, were involved in these crimes together in any way. Wow, that's weird. But yeah, no, just for all the coincidence theorists and those who, uh, re religious, who vehemently deny with religious fer fervor any possibility of, of a ring or or anybody exploiting children in there in the West Des Moines area. I mean, there's so much precedent here. I mean, it's scary stuff. I mean, I, I don't know how many people have researched this in other areas, but is this just more prevalent in Des Moines in this air in, in this during this time period? And West Des Moines isn't even that populated. I'm looking at the census figure from uh, publications.iowa.gov right now. In 1980, the population of West Des Moines was 21,894. In 1990, it was 31,702. So we're talking, we're not talking big numbers here. I mean, this is actually, this must be disproportionate abuse of, of young boys because, I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy. It's not like some huge city. Like, it's just weird. So that was West Des Moines. Des Moines itself... 190,000, so quite larger, but still not, I mean, not, you know, not as big as many, many other cities, but most of this activity is specifically in West Des Moines. I mean, this is mind-shocking stuff. Let's go over a couple more issues. This is from uh, the Web Sleuth thread on Johnny Gosh uh, from February 2020. Just a couple more points I want to go over here for the coincidence theorists. So... The Des Moines Register was ignoring any kind of helpful publicity. No one could understand why, because Johnny worked for them. So we worked with other forms of the press in and outside of our state. I received a phone call in the spring of 1983. So this is Noreen Gosh's testimony here. In the spring of 83, a woman saying she worked for the Des Moines Register in the newsroom. She reported, quote, Shortly after the kidnapping, the editor at the time came into the newsroom and announced, all articles written about the Gosh Boy will be slanted against the family and for the police. She would not give me her name. She was afraid of losing her job. I now knew what was happening, but I didn't understand why. So clearly, so is this orders from above or were the Des Moines Register protecting their own individuals who were involved in the ring specifically or were they just following orders from above? Because if this goes all the way to the White House, Noreen Gosh also stated here, Des Moines Register, September 22nd, 1989. 
Noreen Gosh stated, Paul Bonacci, who participated in the kidnapping of Johnny, also stated he was repeatedly sent to Washington, D.C. to have sex with Massachusetts Representative Barney Frank. The Washington Times published a front-page story stating a child prostitution ring was being run out of his D.C. apartment. I mean, what do all, again, what do all the coincidence theorists make of this? I mean, there's just so much evidence here. And published in major newspapers, too. We're not talking about GeoCities blogs or, like, Reddit. or We're talking about evidence produced to major newspaper. I mean, this is... And in the court of law, Bonacci's winning $1 million settlements. Check this out. This was New York Times, August 26, 1989. Representative Frank acknowledges hiring male prostitute as personal aid. Representative Barney Frank of Massachusetts said today that without his knowledge, oh sure, a male prostitute he had hired to do personal errands had run a prostitution service from the congressman's Washington Department. Wait a second. So he acknowledges hiring the male prostitute as a personal aid. He just simply didn't know that this male prostitute personal aide was also running a prostitution service directly from his own apartment, from, from the congressman's apartment. Mr. Frank, who made his homosexuality public in May 87, said he paid for sex with a prostitute one time in the spring of 85 and then hired him as a personal employee later that year because he thought he could encourage the man to change his life. Anybody buying that? Thinking I was going to be Henry Higgins and trying to turn him into Pygmalion was the biggest mistake I've made, Mr. Frank said at a news conference in Newton, a Boston suburb that is part of the state's 4th Congressional District. Mr. Frank, a 49-year-old Democrat, has represented the district since 81. A very good con man. Conceding poor judgment, Mr. Frank said, it turns out that I was being suckered. He was, among other things, a very good con man. Better than a politician? <laughs> Mr. Frank's remarks followed publication of an article today in Washington Times that disclosed the congressman's link to a prostitute, the man's use of the Capitol Hill apartment for a prostitution service. The newspaper called the man by what it said was a professional name. Mr. Frank said today his name was Stephen Gobi. Washington police records show that Mr. Gobi has a history of offenses, including drug charges. The congressman said that to help Mr. Gobi, he hired him as a housekeeper and driver. Mr. Frank also said he made some calls and wrote letters using congressional stationery to Mr. Gobi's probation officer in Virginia to let him know the office he was employed. Proof of employment is usually a condition of probation. Knowledge is denied. In the Washington Times article, the man was quoted as saying Mr. Franklin knew of the use of his apartment for prostitution. At his news conference, Mr. Frank denied having such knowledge. And of course, he would deny it even if he had it, right? <laughs> Efforts by New York Times to reach Mr. Gobi at various listed addresses today were unsuccessful. But in an interview in Washington television station WUSA this evening, Mr. Gobi told of bringing clients to the congressman's apartment and he acknowledged that he had been convicted on felony sex and drug charges in Virginia. Mr. Frank said he dismissed Mr. Gobi in August 87 after his landlords had told him for the second time about people coming and going from the apartment while he was away. The congressman said that he had paid Mr. Gobi with his own money for the personal errands and that government or campaign money was not involved. Mr. Frank acknowledged that, well, if he accepted that government or campaign money, then it's going into his personal account, then it's going to Gobi. It's still derived from extorted funds or donated funds specifically to his campaign. Mr. Frank acknowledges that he broke the law by patronizing a prostitute but said he had not violated any ethics or congressional rules. <laughs> The congressman said the disclosure would not diminish his influence in Congress, where he is known for sharp wit and skillful floor debate, and where, is he, where he is considered a leading voice of liberalism. Mr. Frank said the voters of his district would not judge him on the basis of indiscretions in his private life. Well, if he's hiring him to be his aide, I mean, that's kind of professional. On the other hand, Mr. Frank said the incident is likely to be used against him in a campaign. If I was planning strategy, this is not one of the events I would propose, he said. Okay, let me skip along here. Mr. Frank said that the episode would become public because Mr. Gobi decided to get some revenge by telling his story to the Washington Times. 
Mr. Gobi has a history of run-ins with the local police. Court records in Washington show that he was placed on four years probation in 1975 when he was 18 years old for selling and possessing narcotics. The Washington Times reported that he was convicted in Virginia in 82 on two obscenity charges, one sodomy charge, and a single charge of cocaine possession. He was on probation for those crimes at the time that Mr. Frank hired him, the paper said. After he left Mr. Frank's employment in early 88, Mr. Gobi was twice arrested by the police in Washington and charged with burglary and shoplifting food from a supermarket. He was not prosecuted on the first charge. Okay. Some more posts here regarding the ranch where that Bonacci said they were taken to. So apparently this was near Elephant Rock, Colorado, near Aurora, just north of the springs. Buena Vista is going by the roads from there south on I-25, then back up northwest by county roads. Newer built home in that region. I won't say the address, and the address has also been changed since the 90s, which is interesting. What? So they actually changed the lot's address after this aired? What? Mountains and background matches up to the footage from the background of, of Paul on the ranch in Who Took Johnny and also America's Most Wanted. It's also interesting how many names have changed with the deeds military man name comes up. So this is a poster, Johnny Chicago, on Web Sleuth stating this information. So apparently he has the address, and the address actually changed. How often is that done where they actually change the name of the lot, the name, number, whatever? And apparently military man, does that mean Aquino? Is that him? Or is it another military man? Also, further posts from Johnny Chicago here... So supposedly in this area around Sedalia, there is some kind of a cult, Brotherhood of the White Temple. This area around Sedalia is very strange. There is a huge cult compound there near Sedalia called the Brotherhood of the White Robe. They publish occult literature out there and have been since the 1930s and have hundreds of members, also an eccentric woman named Tweet Kimball, yes, that's her real name, who married an OSS CIA man after World War II, brought a huge section of land near Sedalia with her husband, and built a recreation of a Scottish Masonic castle overlooking their ranch land. The Kimball family are millionaires, and they are cattle barons, and are friends with the Bush family. Okay, all right. We were supposed to actually get to uh, Jeff Gannon and the Bush connections, but we're going to have to get that in the next episode because uh, we got to wrap up here. But this is some mind-shocking stuff here. I've seen on a few other websites that people think this castle is used for some kind of satanic rituals on the summer and winter equinox, June 21st, December 21st. I wouldn't doubt it. Also, I've seen Noreen's PI, Dennis Whalen, talk about the same county in Colorado and how the local sheriff doesn't prosecute cult members. It was posted on the Democratic Underground website, but I can't find it. There is an Elephant Rock and an Elephant Rock Road near Sedalia. County Road NCO67 is also named Elephant Rock Road. If you look up Elephant Rock Sedalia, Colorado, on Google Maps, it will take you to the area. If you look at the terrain style map, the road seems to just end after it curves past Elephant Rock. Also very interesting to me is that the satellite imagery on either side of Elephant Rock has less quality. Intentionally, is this intentionally degraded so people can't see anything? Another post here, Google Maps description calls it San, Is San Isabel National Forest. That right there should throw up a red flag. National Forest means that the federal government is some sort of vested interest in the area. Anywho, Buena Vista is a rinky-dink nowhere place. On the advertiser censored cheek of Backwoods, Colorado, is that supposed to be butt cheek or something? There's nothing there. The whole concept of some rancher selling a huge chunk of his property to a developer for a quick buck happened all the time back in the late 80s in Colorado. Believe me, I was stationed there for the first time from 86 to 89. Just doesn't hold water. What the hell would some get-rich-quick developer be thinking by investing in setting up a housing development 40 to 50 miles from the nearest population center? And believe me, if you've never lived in Colorado during the winter, 4 to 50 miles means you're snowed the hell in.
Any county south of Denver doesn't get state funding for its infrastructure and never has. Not even El Paso County, which contains Fort Carson and Colorado Springs. They also linked some interesting articles here. Daily Sentinel, Grand Junction, Colorado, June 17, 1982. Princess Anne arrives in Denver for short stay. After a 13-hour flight, Britain's Princess Anne arrived here without fanfare to begin a four-day Colorado visit. The princess arrived at approximately 8.40 p.m. Wednesday at Denver's Stapleton International Airport and was taken by car to the 23-room home of the Vernon Taylors on their 30-D-acre estate near Green Gables Country Club. Not stopping to talk to a reporter or to pose for photographers, Princess Anne was presented a bouquet of flowers by one of the group of Denver officials that included Governor Richard Lamb and Mayor William McNichols. Only city and state officials were on hand with members of the press to greet the princess. Her arrival was closed to the public. Area sympathizers for Northern Ireland have said that they would picket the princess at her Denver appearances to protest the military occupation of that country, but they failed to show up at the airport. Princess Anne, scheduled for today, called for an informal news conference at the Brown Palace Hotel here later. There was to be a private reception at the governor's mansion hosted by the British Consul General Richard Tallboys, where the princess will meet members of Denver's British business community and organizers of the British Fair. She will be the featured guest at the British Fair Saturday. The event is a cultural and trade exposition at Kent Denver Country Day School and is sponsored by the English-speaking union and the Institute of International Education. On Friday, the princess will tour the North American Air Defense Command at Colorado Springs, lunch with the city's leaders at Broadmoor Hotel, and spend the afternoon at INMOS, a British-owned technology corporation, Saturday. She will tour Denver, Children's Hospital, visit the British Fair, and have supper at Cherokee Ranch near Sedalia, home of the fair's co-chairman, Tweet Kimball. Sunday, the princess will attend a service at Denver's St. John's Episcopal Cathedral and spend the rest of the day in private. Princess Anne will leave Denver Monday to begin a three-day visit in New Mexico where more receptions, dinners, and other royal events are planned. I mean, is it safe disclosing, like, the princess's every move? I mean, that's kind of weird. They did that right in the newspaper. Interesting. So, is this poster alleging that Tweet Kimball owns all of these properties? This is uh, Daily Sentinel, July 7th, 1990. Sons sue rancher giving away land. A prominent rancher who wants to preserve her 6,000-acre Cherokee ranch as open space is being challenged in court by her two grown sons, who say she showed wanton disregard for their feelings. Richard and Kirk Campbell filed suit in Douglas County District Court to wrest control of the ranch from their mother, Tweet Kimball. They want to stop their mother from trying to preserve the Cherokee ranch as open space. And how many buildings are on this open space? Hmm. Daily Sentinel, December 11th, 96. Douglas County commissioners have agreed to pay $2 million for development rights to an 82-year-old heiress, 5,000-acre ranch. Tweet Kimball, heiress of a Tennessee ranching family, has owned the Cherokee Ranch and its medieval Scottish castle reproduction since 1954. So supposedly, yeah, there's there's some kind of cult activity at this castle, and who knows how many ranches are on all of this uh, property. Hmm, weird stuff. Another post by Johnny Chicago here. Anyone have thoughts on this Colorado region where Bonacci showed the house where Gosh was held captive? This does appear to be the best, not to be the best logical place to make homes, since it is an area that gets snowed in often to the point where travel to nearby towns is difficult. It makes sense if you if you are someone who wants complete privacy and committing child trafficking. Why have multiple people in the military have connections with this region and keep owning these same properties? Also, again, as I always state, anything with Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino attached to it has to involve evil. Also, uh, obviously, we've talked about a conspiracy of silence, this... Uh, documentary that was uh, pre prevented from airing to, to keep all this information on the download, but there was actually another one in 19... So, Conspiracy of Silence was supposed to be aired May 3rd, 1994, but there was an older documentary, Boys for Sale, 1981. Uh, journalist Tom Phillip, professor at the University of Austin, Texas, was involved, and he there was an assassination attempt upon him. 
and his death was ruled a suicide afterwards. Again, a lot of these people commit suicide with uh, two gunshot wounds to the head. I mean, it's really weird. I don't know if that's what happened to him. I just, in generalities, a lot of people who get taken out, the autopsy report does not match suicide. And uh, Thomas Lee Philippot, he was the director of Boys for Sale, known as the Campus Crusader. And so, I mean, again, so this is 1981. This is before the Johnny Gosh abduction. And there's already information here on Ill, the so-called elite pedophile rings and child trafficking and all of this. So this actually existed and was exposed to a certain extent before Johnny Gosh was even kidnapped. So the coincidence theorists, I mean, they really don't have a leg to stand on here. This is actually really weird. Here's a post on Unresolved Mysteries re regarding Tom Philpott. Did he commit suicide? Was he suicided for exposing an elite child trafficking ring? In light of all of this Prince Andrew Jeffrey Epstein stuff, I started thinking of Tom Philpott. He was a much-loved history professor at the University of Texas who was known for his activism against what he saw as the worst treatment of teenage boys who supported them with sex work in the country. We need to go back to 1980 for some perspective. Homicide rates were rising and about to reach their peak. Dean Coral had just been shot by his accomplice after murdering almost 30 teenage boys, and John Wayne Gacy would be nearing the end of his notorious killing spree. Somebody else could probably explain all this better, but this seem, the takeaway seems to be that there was a climate of violence and disregard for the welfare of teenage boys. You might be wondering why I'm putting so much emphasis on teenage boys rather than girls. That's because Tom Philpott alleges that at that time in Houston, for every adult female prostitute, there were nine boys supporting themselves through sex work. He goes on to say they are frequently the target of more sadistic violence. When asked why the boys seem to be more popular, he thinks it's because they're more exotic and more forbidden. There is a great public access documentary on YouTube called Boys for Sale that goes into the subject more. Warning, it goes into graphic detail about the sexual abuse of teenagers. I really wish I could read the Texas Monthly article I cited, but for some reason my phone won't let me. I can't find a whole lot of information about the circumstances surrounding Tom Philpott's death, except that he was found dead at his home in 1991 with a gunshot wound to the head. It was declared a suicide pretty quickly, but there are many people that wonder if he was in fact murdered for exposing the systemic abuse of teenage boys. It's important to note that an attempt was made on his life just a couple years prior when two men broke into his home to rob it and shot at his head. Thankfully he was unharmed and apparently the whole thing was written off as a home invasion gone wrong. What a coincidence. Whether he killed himself or not, I truly consider him a hero way ahead of the time, a great example of a living lawful good. And in light of all this Epstein stuff, I think he deserves more attention. Yeah, in the post-Epstein era, again, like all of these authority-worshipping cultists and coincidence theorists desperately trying to soothe their dissonance that any anything like this could happen in the world. I mean, again, they really don't have a leg to stand on. All of this is getting exposed more and more. So was this some kind of a connection in Houston mentioned specifically in the Johnny Gosh case about these, like, child auctions? Because this guy is exposing all this stuff in Houston. Interesting post here back at the Web Sleuths Forum. Your post really alludes to the fact that the rich, powerful, and influential within government can make anything go away if it threatens their political career and that of their cohorts, notably before it becomes public. Another great follow-up post by Johnny Chicago here. Indeed, our intelligence community slash CIA has a long history of making things go away or using the term conspiracy theorists directed at people to discredit them as crazy. The inception of the CIA was in 1947, and this psych dispatch went out around April 67. It is from the point that point on that the term conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist has been shoved down the public's throats. It was weaponized just as so many other labels have been used to distract, manipulate, and change the narrative to suit their agenda. Conspiracy is a term created by the CIA in 1967 and very likely responsible for the widespread introduction of conspiracy theory as a term of political abuse, having orchestrated that development as a deliberate means of influencing public opinion. This is a quote from Professor Lance de Havensmith. A perfect example is how the mainstream media keeps the public believe Oswald was the lone gunman in the JFK assassination, when in fact he was a patsy. 
And again, if you haven't checked out the Mind Shock episode on JFK, make sure you check that out. We go deep. <laughs> if all you watch is mainstream programs with Peter Jennings keeping the same narrative going, then an individual will never know the full details of the case. People who are truly interested in cases will look at every source possible. Here I go off on a tangent. In addition, my favorite statistic about the JFK assassination related stats is that if you calculate the probability that many witnesses connected to the JFK assassination would die, many of the deaths seem a tad suspicious, karate chopped to the neck, heart attacks and cancer in young people, suicides, the odds of that many listed people connected to the Kennedy assassination would die of any cause within three years after the event is one in 167 trillion. The probability is 1.4 to the negative 33rd or one in over 714 trillion trillion. That number is greater than all the stars in the universe and all the grains of sand on Earth. There are an estimated 300 billion trillion stars in the universe, three followed by 23 zeros. There are an estimated 700,000 trillion grains of sand on Earth. Mathematically proven, all these deaths cannot be a coincidence. Unless you're a hardcore coincidence theorist. Also, this kind of reminds me of all the, the astronauts and uh, people that work for NASA that just keep dying in disproportionate numbers to any other organization. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's crazy stuff. But another point, so in recent times, they're like, what's the scoreboard in the past couple of years alone on, conspiracy, on critical thinking conspiracy theorists versus authority-worshipping cultists who are coincidence theorists? I mean, it's not even close. I mean, have the coincidence theorists been right about anything the past couple of years? I mean, the more things that are exposed, I mean, just corruption awareness, a.k.a. conspiracy theorism, I guess if you would call it that. I mean, it's simply aware of all these corrupt people engaged in crime. I mean, it's not rocket science. I'm going to go over one more thing in this coincidence stack. Quite mind-shocking. So, Corrine Elaine Perry was murdered in Des Moines around this time period here. Des Moines Register, September 2nd, 1984. Odyssey of Hope and Despair by Larry Fruling and Bob Shaw. Several days after 14-year-old Eugene Martin disappeared, Donald and Sue Martin, Eugene's father and stepmother, found themselves in a yellow and black sedan riding with a stranger down the narrow road through a rural Polk County graveyard. The Martins were with a middle-aged husky man who identified himself only as Bernie. He had come to the door saying his psychic powers would lead the Martins to the graves of Eugene, Johnny Gosh, and three other young men. Bernie drove south eastward from the Martins' home at a maddeningly slow speed. Occasionally, he pulled off the street and rubbed his eyes as though in deep concentration. And if this is all an act, like, would he, I mean, was this, who, I mean, would a psychic make this act where they drive super slow, every 10 minutes they stop and rub their eyes? I mean, maybe, I don't know, but just continuing on here. The Martins became increasingly edgy as Bernie seemed to put himself in the place of Eugene, and then as Eugene lapsed into unconsciousness in the place of the boy's abductor. A week earlier, the Martins could in no way have imagined such a bizarre ride. Married only four months, they and the children that each brought to the newly formed household were busy adjusting to one another. Their main worry was that Donald was out of work and money was scarce. Now, Eugene had vanished from a street corner on Des Moines' south side in a haunting rerun of the disappearance of Johnny Gosh from a West Des Moines street corner nearly two years earlier. And the Martins' lives were cast upon an odyssey of grief, horror, faint hopes, and crushing despair in an all-too-familiar journey for two other Iowa families, those of the Gosh boy and of Corrine Perry of Creston. Now, I'm not sure... If the Corinne Perry case is connected here, but just a quick write-up here on Web Sleuths, February 15, 2020. We have to keep in mind the date of the article we're reading before. So Corinne Elaine Perry, 17 years old, April 17, 83, case summary by Jody Ewing. 
Corrine Perry, 17, had everything going for her. The Creston High School senior had just earned a scholarship to college and planned to double major in psychology and acting. She belonged to the school's mime troupe, acted in several school plays, and also participated in speech contests. She was last seen Sunday, April 17, 1983, at a coin-operated laundromat in Creston, Iowa. According to authorities, a man walked out of the laundromat right behind the teen sometime between 8.30 and 9 p.m. the night she disappeared. The following day, her car, with her clothes neatly folded and lying on the seat, was found parked at the laundromat. Her purse turned up on a highway bridge seven miles away between Kent and Lenox, Iowa. Officials described the missing teen as five foot seven, white female, strawberry blonde hair, gray eyes, a fair complexion, and weighing 110 pounds. On Tuesday, November 27, 1984, nearly two years after Corinne went missing, her remains were discovered near a creek bed in a shallow grave south of Creston between Kent and Lenox, fairly close to the bridge where her purse had been found. Due to the length of time she'd gone missing, the coroner could not establish how she died. I mean, another sad and tragic case from the general area, and also quite shocking, they didn't find her remains, even though the purse was found the following day. Hmm. What a sad case, and apparently no leads or nothing. I mean... Yeah, this is this is sad indeed. Not a lot of coverage. What a tragic case. This is Creston, Iowa. So at the time of this article, Odyssey of Hope and Despair, this is uh, September. So two months, a little over two months before her remains would have been found. So at the time she was missing at the time of this article that we're going through right now. So, the Martins' of lives were cast upon an odyssey of grief, horror, faint hopes, and crushing despair, an all-too-familiar journey for two other Iowa families, those of the Gosh Boy and of Corinne Perry of Creston. Within hours of Eugene's disappearance, the Martins were under the magnifying lenses of detectives and reporters. Within days, they had learned of the slimy underworld of child trafficking and prostitution within two weeks they had seen the story of eugene's disappearance fade away under the dead weight of no new leads no new information donald and sue martin and eugene's mother janice martin were the people most directly affected by eugene's disappearance on august 12th as he prepared to deliver the des moines register sunday register to its 58 customers in middle class south side neighborhood but hundreds of other lives were touched too an army of val volunteers plastered the nation with missing person posters, searched woods and cornfields, and did whatever else they could to solve the mystery of Eugene Martin's disappearance. Attention was focused anew on the Gosh and Perry families and wounds that never closed. Parents found fresh concerns for their own children. This story is about people cast into unfamiliar roles by the disappearances of three young people. Continued from page one is about fear, hope, anger, most of all the unbearable suspense of three mysteries that have just eluded a conclusion. One for two years, one for 17 months, and one for three agonizing weeks. Almost four hours went by before Bernie the Psychic had made his way with Don and Sue Martin to Avon Cemetery southeast of the Des Moines city limits, a trip of no more than six miles from the Martins' house. Inside the cemetery, Bernie said it had grown too dark to find the graves. By then, the Martins were frightened and only too happy to call off the whole thing. Not too many people scare me, but he had my skin crawling, Donald Martin said later. The Martins, a friend and a policeman, went back the next day to search the cemetery. They found nothing, and they heard no more from Bernie. December 18th to 21st, 1983. God, how appalling to have to, to sell a piece of chocolate to find our boy. Christy and Tammy are working Locust Street Mall selling candy. A lady walks up to Christy, spits on her, and says, I wouldn't help your mother find that kid if it was the last thing I ever did. Our daughter fell completely apart. This will be the last time any of our children would participate in any fundraiser. What? A random lady walked up... What?
I mean, spitting on somebody's is basically assault. I mean, you're putting your DNA on somebody without their consent. I would say retaliation would have been warranted there. Some people just need to get taught a lesson, especially, I mean, what the heck? I mean, these are, these are grieving family. Noreen Gosh, whose son Johnny vanished September 5th, 1982, while on his Des Moines Sunday Register route in West Des Moines, wrote those words in her diary. Janice Martin sits in her darkened apartment by a telephone, brown vial of tranquilizers by her elbow and a cup of coffee in her hand. I drink three or four pots a day, she said in a thin, brittle voice. It doesn't bother me because I take my pills. Since her son Eugene vanished three weeks ago, her life has been reduced to waiting by the phone and occasionally searching fields and ditches with teams of volunteers. They let me go sometimes, but I was told that I shouldn't really come along because if I was with them and they found something, first you get scared, then hurt, then angry, then you blow a fuse, then you start all over again, she says. My mind isn't there. I'm in and out. Until Eugene vanished, she worked part-time supporting three children. I'm a bartender. A lot of people say, yep, see, when they hear that. She says, describing the telephone accusations that she had failed as a mother. It isn't true, but it still hurts. I've had six or seven calls saying things like, if Gene had been home where he belongs, he'd be there, to, he'd be here today. I don't know how many strange people there were. Martin recalls the Sunday Eugene disappeared. For her, the night before had been a late one at the Sunrise Tap a fixture at East 42nd Street and Easton Boulevard for as long as anyone can remember. She'd had to close the bar and did not get to sleep until 3 a.m. Four hours later, the phone jangled her awake. It was her sister-in-law, Linda Martin, telling her Eugene had vanished while on his paper route. He had been staying at the south side home of his father, Don Martin, whom Martin had divorced two years before. It took a couple of seconds for it to connect, Martin said. I knew he didn't, ra he didn't run away. I talked to him that Tuesday. His birthday was coming up, and he told him and he told me he wanted a ghetto blaster like his brother's. As the investigation ground into its third week, Martin says, everyone has their theories, but no cold heart facts. I guess you could say there is no trace. I wonder where he is at, what he is doing, whether he is asking for me and his dad. Two of Martin's uncles from Sailorville, Roger Blanchard and Bob Walker, drop by to check on Martin. They have been searching for Gene, sweating through weeds for hours, and they are bushed. Walker, a likable gallum of a man, plops onto a sofa. Yep, every year the kooks come out of the woodwork and them paper boys are easy targets that, that early in the morning. At the sunrise tap, a Tupperware box full of collected money sits on the bar. A note taped to it reads, Janice, you have our prayers, also our love, and most of all, our support. Your friends at sunrise. Everyone there is fiercely protective of Martin. Between serving Budweiser's owner Darlene McElwee shook her head. It's awful hard to lose a child, but to lose one with no finality to it is something else. People go down the street looking both ways now. Johnny Gosh upset them. This one made them aware. To a reporter, one bar patron says, Hey, don't write anything to hurt her, okay? More than 400 people sit in the spacious sanctuary of the First Assembly of God Church on Merle Hay Road in Des Moines for a terror filled a two-hour, 20-minute program on sexual abuse and the murder of children. One speaker, Bob Curry, had three children who were among many students allegedly molested by the owners and staff of the Virginia McMartin Preschool in Manhattan Beach, California, Los Angeles suburb. Curry tells of watching a videotape in which a psychologist interviews Curry's son, now five years old, about the boy's experiences at the school. And there's a lot of coincidence theorists that just deny all of that. It's really weird. Eugene Martin leads have dwindled. Johnny Gosh, nothing but dead ends. Corinne Perry disappeared in Creston. The end of the interview, the child vents his rage by thrashing the puppets the psychologist has used as go-betweens for the questions and answers. It looked like an Alfred Hitchcock movie, one in which his own son was the featured actor. Curry tells the crowd, a film made by the Minnesota-based Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children opens with a news conference called by two officials of the North American Man-Boy Love Association. One of the uh, lisping officials is saying that young boys and girls should be allowed to engage in sex acts without their parents' consent. In it, he says it's a matter of civil rights. He refuses to say how young is too young. The film ends with the heartbreaking funeral of Adam Walsh. Adam was six years old when he was abducted from a Fort Lauderdale, Florida shopping center in 1981. His head was found later in a canal. Many people are weeping when the movie ends. 
When the lights go on again, there is an appeal for money to help find Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin, and about $1,000 is dropped in the blue bags the ushers have circulated throughout the pews. The crowd's most enthusiastic applause is delivered for Noreen Gosh when she suggested reinstating the death penalty in Iowa for certain sexual offenses against children. These pedophiles, their desires never die, she says. The implication is clear. Even if their desires will not die, pedophile adults with a sexual attraction for children will. After the meeting, Denise Lies, 33 of Clive, explains why she came. I have a 12-year-old son. The bottom line with me is I'm scared. It's as simple as that. At the regular Corinne Perry support group meeting in Creston, the mood is brisk and businesslike. Since April 17, 1983, when Corinne Perry, 17, vanished after washing her clothes at the Highlander laundromat, the group has brainstormed. The street corners where Eugene Martin, I'm assuming some of this text is out of order, twice monthly in the basement of the First Congressional United Church of Christ about brainstorm, twice monthly in the basement of the First Congressional United Church of Christ about how to find her, where are we on the flyers, did we decide not to do the airports, asked the Reverend Lyle Kuel, the church pastor. He looks at the 13 people huddled around the folding table, then at Corinne's mother, Barbara. Well, how many do we send to each airport, he asked. To Joplin, we send 10. How many to Kansas City, Denver? Don Perry, Corinne's father, scans the table, cluttered with posters and pamphlets about Corinne and with magazines about missing children. The Reverend Dolores Donch of nearby Cromwell gets an idea. She has recently married a couple in New York City, and the groom is a mechanic for a bus company. Would it be advantageous to see if he knows about the ad rates for the posters in those buses? She asks. Everyone nods. Corinne Perry and the two paper boys are the only victims of possible abductions in the state who are not accounted for, officials say. And as in many other cases, friends and strangers have instinctively gathered around the grieving parents. I'd lose my mind without these people, Corinne's mother says. Support groups bake hot dishes, they lick stamps and call congressmen. They plaster posters and truck stops on their vacations, they cry with the families. But above all, support groups keep hope alive. Corinne's sister, Letitia, 21, keeps a plain spiral ring notebook to record every personal event that would be of interest to Corinne. The most recent entry is Lloyd and Laura moved to Council Bluffs, Letitia says. I put in births, deaths, divorces, anything she will need to know when she gets back. Dennis Gregory Whelan, private detective with offices on the ground floor of an apartment building on the west side of Omaha, worked on the Johnny Gosh case about eight months before giving it up in exhaustion and frustration. Although he is no longer employed, Stanley Johnson helped search. A colorful, a color photo of Johnny is prominent on his office wall, along with smaller black and white pictures of about 40 other children from whom Whelan has searched. Some were returned to the parents dead, some alive. In Whelan's front office is a large U.S. map on which are pinned 62 small red flags, one for each reported sighting of Johnny. The markers span the map from Fargo, North Dakota, to McAllen, Texas, and from San Francisco, California, to Taunton, Massachusetts. Whelan is one of many investigators' private official who have been frustrated in their search for Johnny Gosh. They are well aware that they have so far failed in what they are paid to do. I think everyone would take it personally to a degree, says Lieutenant Lyle McKinney of the West Des Moines Police Department, whose full-time assignment for nearly two years has been to find Johnny Gosh. McKinney started on the case September 27, 1982, when he returned from a police training school in Virginia. You're given a job to do and you take pride in doing the job as well as you can in reaching some type of successful conclusion, says McKinney. The Gosh case occupies four drawers in McKinney's filing cabinet. His carefully lettered notes fill a handful of battered, much-used notebooks. Thousands of tips and leads have come to nothing. I don't know where Johnny Gosh is, McKinney says. I don't have any idea. The Gosh case still brings five, six, seven calls a week from people wanting to uh, or offering information, McKinney says. One of the things that keeps me interested is that I have a boy that age who had a paper route at the time and was delivering papers on Ashworth Road that morning, says McKinney, who, unlike many other law officers, has retained the Gosh's respect. Detective Whelan, who looks like he has been down a lot of leads in his 49 years, tells of many twists and turns in the Gosh investigation, all leading to dead ends. Nothing came of Whelan's reporting of a young man, a homosexual from Omaha, to infiltrate Des Moines' homosexual community in hopes of a lead to Johnny's disappearance. Nothing came of Whelan's trip to New England to look through thousands of uh, 
child exploitation pictures sees in a raid. Nothing came of the investigation of a Texas trucker who claimed to have picked up Johnny in West Des Moines and driven him as far as Atlantic. If he is alive, he's not in the U.S., Whelan says. Well, how would he know that? And now, with the second one, the disappearance of Eugene Martin, I'm not even sure he's alive. Eugene Martin has been missing without a trace for six days. When Stanley C. Johnson, 63-year-old retired insurance salesman, drives up to a large cornfield south of Ankeny to help find him. Johnson and about 35 others who answered the Des Moines Police Department plea for volunteers fight their way through the dirty, dense rows of seven-foot-tall corn for several hours in the suffocating humidity, sharp corn leaves slapping their faces. Their instructions were delivered at 8.30 a.m. by a bleary-eyed policeman, Richard Davis, who had been among the officers who went through part of the field from midnight until 3.30 the same morning, reportedly on the advice of a psychic. Davis tells the volunteers they are looking for a shirt, blue jeans, and size 8 tennis shoes the Martin boy was wearing when he disappeared, or for Martin's body. If you find anything, don't touch it, Davis instructs. Just stop and call for an officer. We don't want any evidence disturbed. Stanley C. Johnson fumbled for words to explain why he had joined the search. For one thing, he regretted not having helped look for Johnny Gosh. The fact that this has happened again makes you even more concerned, he says. He adds, we've been praying for them, but sometimes praying is not enough. We are God's hands and voice and feet. We need to pitch in sometimes. I'm not very good at expressing myself when it comes to something like this, but that's the way I feel. The search is fruitless. 250 miles away, Corbin Jacobs, chief of the 16-member Palmyra Volunteer Fire Department, requests missing posters of the Martin and Gosh boys. Jacobs, 62, and the other boys on the fire department soon have plastered western Illinois and eastern Missouri with pictures of Martin and Gosh. A few weeks before Eugene Martin disappeared, a Burlington Northern freight train went by Jacobs' house in Palmyra, a town of 3,644 residents. He had seen a young boy riding on a rail car with a dog. He called a Burlington Northern dispatcher about the boy and was told a railroad detective would get in touch right away. Nobody called me back about that lad, Jacob says. That's one of the things that touched me off about those Des Moines boys. Nobody seemed to care. The boy on the train had to belong to somebody, too. He had to be a good kid. He had his dog with him. The 300 posters distributed by Jacobs and his volunteer firemen are among 148,000 that the Des Moines Register and the Tribune Company ordered to fill requests. Thousands of additional posters were provided by other printers. Noreen Gosh trembled as she inched her car down Forest Avenue past 13th Street, peering through the dark for the fire hydrant where she was supposed to drop $120,000 in ransom. Besides her, in a paper bag, was a ransom of two pieces of wood. Crouched behind her in the back seat was her private detective, gun drawn. She thought of what it would be like to get the severed hand of her son in the mail. Hours before, a deep voice on the telephone had threatened to arrange just that. Man, what this woman has gone through, I mean, this is just crazy. She pulled over, stepped in front of the headlights, and threw the bag down. Several hours later, police officers returned to the bag to the goshes. No one had picked it up, and there was still no Johnny. What? So somebody pranked her, said that they were going to send her uh, son's severed hand in the mail to her if she didn't deliver $120,000, and they didn't even bother to check if she delivered it. I mean, these are some sick people. No one picked it up. There was still no Johnny. I never was so scared in all my life, she said later, describing the false alarm that happened October 13th, 1982. She has since endured worse. Like an angry mother, grizzly Noreen Gosh has snarled and snapped and fought. She and her husband John have prodded, begged, defended, hustled, stepped on toes, and frazzled nerves. They have endured insults, accusations, and a procession of swooning psychics. They have been dogged and even outrageous. But no one can talk to the couple very long without realizing they would run naked down the McVicar freeway if it would help them find Johnny. We still walk by his bedroom every day, said the mother. Noreen Gosh is a phenomenon. Des Moines parents who have never met her refer to Noreen in conversations. She and John have appeared on the Today Show, changed Iowa's kidnapping laws, and supervised distribution of tens of thousands of fine Johnny Gosh posters. Noreen should run for president, declared one woman in her neighborhood. She gets things done. After the September 5th, 1982 disappearance, Noreen Gosh got some advice. She said, a very wise man told me, whatever you do, keep yourself under control, make a plea for your son's life, but don't break down, because if you do, 
They'll use your story maybe once or twice and then it's done. You are in for a long search and it's going to be up to you to keep the story going. That she has done, and parents whose children have vanished since, Johnny acknowledge a debt to her. There wouldn't be such a big deal about Eugene Martin if Noreen hadn't made such a stink, said a mother in a supermarket checkout line. By maximizing exposure to the public, the Goshes have opened themselves to attack. Noreen said that many one of her presentations, the publisher of a small newspaper said, I don't think you ever had a son named Johnny. I think you are doing this for the money, the power, and the glory. I told him, I hope they get your kid next. Wow. Damn. I don't have to take that. I am arrogant now. Dallas Davis, neighbor, neighbor and close friend, snapped, Most of the comments I have heard from what I would call extremely ignorant people are things like Noreen appeared in full makeup or Noreen appeared on TV with her fingernails painted. So interesting snapshot into the area and the sentiment at the time. And we also went over a bunch of these scumbags getting arrested. I mean, there's clearly rings. There were all these rings operating all over the U.S. involved with, with politicians, police, corrupt police, etc. So, yeah, very, very unfortunate and uh, tragic for all of these uh, missing and trafficked children and, uh, yeah, I mean, coincidence theorists are not doing a favor to these kids and their families by denying the existence of these rings. It's just, I mean, it's just, it, it's rough. It's really rough. All of these people deserve justice and closure. And, uh, yeah, awareness needs to be kept up. And in, in the post-Epstein era, it is getting a little bit easier. The, uh, the coincidence theorists and the authority-worshipping cultists have been just proven wrong time and time again that now it's a little bit easier to discuss these things without these goofs coming out of the woodwork denying the possibility that criminals can work together. So we have plenty more to cover. We will be getting to Jeff Gannon in the next episode. So this was just going deep down the rabbit hole. Hope you guys found another edition of Mind Shock True Crime interesting and informative in the Johnny Gosh case. You can help support Mind Shock, donate to our PayPal, become a YouTube member right here on YouTube, like and share the podcast, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunks of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off.
If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shock True Crime. This is the Johnny Gosh series. I am, of course, your host, Bruce McGuire. We are on episode four, Jeff Gannon. And this was quite the story a number of years back on whether or not Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh. And not only that, regardless of whether he is or he isn't Johnny Gosh, how did he get his White House credentials? What is up with his history of uh, male escort websites and then all of a sudden he's, he's a White House uh, journalist with White House credentials? And what is up with his shady background that can't be verified? So again, whether he is or he isn't Johnny Gosh, I mean, there's some serious questions regarding Jeff Gannon. Now, if he is Johnny Gosh, can that be proven? And what are we to make of this deep-rooted conspiracy within the upper echelons of corrupt politicians and corrupt establishments? That the Dunning-Kruger crowd, the coincidence theorists, the authority-worshipping cultists who refuse to believe they're too mentally weak to even consider the possibility that maybe former FBI head Ted Gunderson is not a complete moron, and maybe that Paul Bonacci got a $1 million judgment in his case for his own child abuse, exploitation, and trafficking, that that judge is not a complete moron, and the evidence was was sufficient enough to give him a $1 million judgment verifying Bonacci's story, or at least certain parts of his story, of being a human trafficking victim and part of this ring in these corrupt establishments, particularly in the Des Moines area in Iowa, but also supposedly a far-reaching conspiracy going all the way to the White House. So in typical mind shock fashion, with logic and reason at the forefront, instead of hallucinations and blind faith in the corrupt with horrible track records, we will be diving into the Jeff Gannon angle in this uh, very, very daunting case, tragic case, haunting case that's just incredibly disturbing. I mean, not only that politicians and there's these corrupt bankers and all of these scum would be involved in harming children, but the clueless goofs who deny that it's even a possibility. I mean, it's really, really weird. On Mindshock, we don't claim anything is true or untrue. We just follow the evidence in as objective a fashion as possible. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast, find it interesting and informative, and want to help support the podcast, want to help us get awareness out there in some of these cold cases, unsolved cases, and corruption exposés, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You could also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, and like and share on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patreon Patrons do get a priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. All right. We are going to start off with MSNBC and Jeff Gannon's appearance and what he had to say about this whole debacle. And then we will deconstruct from there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Deedal and Daniels Show. This is a story 20 years in the, 23 years in the making. On our first show, we told you about a missing Iowa boy, Johnny Gosh. He was kidnapped back in 1982. His mother, Noreen, was here to tell her side of the story. You are obsessed with the story, I know. Today, we have the man who may know what happened to little Johnny. Some claim that former White House reporter Jeff Gannon may actually be the missing boy. So right now, let's take a look back at how the story got started. Johnny Gosh vanished from his West Des Moines, Iowa neighborhood without a trace. The newspaper delivery boy was on his morning route when he disappeared. One theory, the boy was kidnapped sexually abused, sold into a child sex slavery ring, and brainwashed by the CIA. Some claim Gosh was snatched for the Monarch Project, a government-sponsored mind and behavioral control program designed to create top-secret escorts. The story then picks up in 2005. 
The internet was abuzz with word that former White House reporter Jeff Gannon may in fact be Johnny Gosh. The claim, based on similar body markings and a lack of information about Gannon's early years. We have looked into uh, some records that came from Pennsylvania where uh, Mr. Gannon slash Guckert supposedly went to high school. Um, we've looked at photographs and, and some of them match, some of them don't. There's, uh, there's several photographs that, that look strikingly like Johnny Gosh and there are, there are some that don't even look like him at all. In February, Gannon was exposed. His name, actually James Guckert, a man with no journalism experience whatsoever who had links to several Several gay escort services online. And joining us right now from Davie, Florida, the man at the center of the controversy. You're looking at him, former White House reporter Jeff Gannon, who watched our show and Bo's interview and wanted to come on and chat. And we appreciate that, sir. So, uh, Jeff, here's what Noreen Gosh said on our last show. Let's listen, and then I'm going to ask you to react. I do not know if Gannon is Johnny or not. Only a DNA test would provide that information conclusively. Jeff, one question for you. Let's get right to the point. Are you willing to take a DNA test and settle the controversy once and for all? Yes Abs or no? Absolutely, I would definitely take a DNA test, but that isn't even necessary because there's so much evidence to uh, available to disprove these accusations. That's a yes, then. Well, you are well he's saying yes. My friend Jeff yeah, is you know saying what? yes. As a lawyer, I can, I can, right. smell, I can smell a no, 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 no. you so. got to understand something. My friend here, Jeff, who's come on our show today, didn't do anybody else's show, he's going to tell us the fact. Jeff, how old are you first off? I'm, I'm 48 years 48 old. 48 years old. My man Johnny Gashi there would be 35 years old. Lisa, Why the are you numbers, avoiding the question? The, no, 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 no. Question. He just said, he just said, hey, Jeff. You said you would take a DNA. I could set this whole thing up, but let's get to the point. Let's get to the point. The point is, by giving a DNA sample, there could be opening up some other avenues of things that I kind of know that you possibly could be involved. And I don't knock it. Again, if you want to go suck on a Johnny Pump or whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, you could do in this world. But the point is, Why all we're here for, speak, all Let we're here speak. for is to show that my friend Jeff is not Johnny Gush. Jeff? There are dozens of people who have known me most of my life that uh, could uh, definitely vouch for the fact that I am not this person. Look, what happened to this, this child and the, the suffering that his mother has endured is, is a tragedy. But it's also uh, been very difficult for, for me and my family, my real mother and, and, and members of my family, who have had to uh, listen to these uh, fabrications being spread uh, in newspapers, on television, and uh, on the Internet. All right, so I'm going to ask you a question, not Bo. Jeff, are you willing to take a DNA test, yes or no? Yes uh, or no? Yes. When I cut my finger yesterday, there was plenty of DNA available. You should have stopped by. What else you want, Lisa? Are the you man... his lawyer? No, Bo? excuse me. Excuse he... me. He's my friend, my friend Jeff down here. Jeff, thank you for coming on the show again. You know what we're doing here? All this conspiracy stuff on the blogs, on all these Internets, what we're doing is we're cutting to the chase. Now, again, again... I don't understand why, you know, and you said it to me over the phone, and you said that you feel sorry for Noreen. Uh, you feel sorry for her missing her son, and you wouldn't put her through if you were her son. And you're you said you're 40. In his mouth, he so says he's 40. Jeff, let's hear from him. What did you think when you saw Noreen Gosh? Let him speak. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. I feel that, that this woman is being used by people who are trying to promote themselves as being investigators when they're not. They're fabricators. They're, uh, they've defamed me and put this woman through, uh, through unnecessary pain, uh, giving her hope where, where it, uh, it doesn't exist. Jeff, you tell them. And I'm going to tell you something right now, Jeff. If we, we want to shut everybody's mouths up, I'll arrange with you a little DNA, give me a little blood, a little survive, saliva, whatever you want to do, and then we'll get a little from Noreen, and we'll see, and we'll show them it doesn't match, and then everyone will keep their mouths shut and let you get on with your life. Because as far as I'm concerned, whatever you do in your life, if it's not a crime involved, whatever you want to be involved with, I don't really care. What I care about is people making up stories about other people and letting, making you live now on the edge of your life. Here's my question. Jeff, have you reached out to Noreen? What have you told her? I, I have not been in communication with this woman uh, because I can't uh, determine whether some of the emails I'm getting are actually this woman or not. There, there are hundreds of people that are contacting me about this story. 
I have no idea who they are. Nameless, faceless people making wild accusations. Do you have a pen and paper? Because I can give you her phone number oh. right after the show. Bo, are you, you on know, a payroll? No, I'm not on a payroll. But when a guy is falsely accused, you got to stand up for, for, for innocent people. You're an attorney. You understand that, too. The man is going to give his DNA. The man is 48 years old. Johnny Gosh would be 35 years old. He looks 48 years old. I'm 54 years old. He looks 48 years old. Why can't the guy be telling the truth? How about we talk about Gannon Gate? Jeff. Are you on any type of payroll, White House, oh. Republican? <clears throat> absolutely, thing? absolutely not. Never, never. I have been in the past or, or now. Have, can you understand why people would think that you're not always telling the truth? Your name isn't what you said it was. Then the liberal blogs come out and say that there's a different story. You resign. Not that there's anything wrong with it. But can you see that people may not know that you're telling the truth here? Well, I, I think uh, people who are listening to nameless, faceless people making accusations on the Internet, I'm sitting here in front of uh, your cameras today to, uh, to answer your questions. Where are these people? These people hide behind screen names mm -hmm. on the Internet. I'm here. I'm willing to give the evidence and tell my side of the story. Frankly, I haven't had the opportunity to tell my side of the story. Any time that I've made appearances, people have... Uh, uh, protested my appearance, tried to shout me down. I had to go six on one uh, two weeks ago right. at, at one event. Uh, it's it's my turn. Why don't people believe Jeff, me Jeff, as opposed to some of these other friend people? Bo, your friend Bo Dito believes you. I want to thank you very much for coming on the show today and clearing this thing up. We'll do this DNA thing, and I'll make my friend Lisa here see that you are, in fact, who you say you are. And Noreen Gosh, we did invite to come on to the show, but she refused. I want to thank Jeff Gannon and his lawyer, Bo Dito, for coming on the show. Okay, so, wow, Dito, what a complete obnoxious buffoon. I mean, does this guy have a mental disability or something? He doesn't even let the guy speak, and he pre he presupposes he's innocent. Like, he made it perfectly clear he's not here to find out the truth. He's here to dispel any accusation which he already assumed and hallucinated was definitively false in the direction of Jeff Gannon. Despite Jeff Gannon's name being, I mean, how many names does this guy have? Came out of nowhere, how did he get his White House credentials? Like, all these things that are shady regarding Gannon, he's calling him his friend, etc. And what's hilarious is that Daniel, she calls this buffoon out on it. It's like, is he on some kind of payroll? Because that's what it looks like. <laughs> I mean, this Dital goof. I mean... This is this guy is such a buffoon. I mean, how does he have his own show? This is crazy. But anyway, what did we notice about Jeff Gannon? The first thing I noticed is he refused to say Johnny Gosh's name or even Noreen Gosh's name. So he's trying to depersonalize this as much as possible. Why? Would someone who's not Gosh and has no emotional connection to him, why would there be this desperate need to depersonalize? Now, the other thing that's very alarming is Gannon's blinking rate. Now, his, I mean, his blinking is completely out of control. So whether he is or he isn't Johnny Gosh, it seems very possible he has been a victim of some kind of uh, brainwashing or mind control experiments. I mean, his, his micro-expressions here just do not seem natural. And neither does his blink rate, especially if he's not Gosh and he's not connected to any kind of uh, shady dealings. Like, he was a 100% law-abiding citizen with no shady history. Why, why would he be like this? It's really weird. So, let's just do a quick aside here. We're going to go to Business Insider with FBI agent Mark Bouton. FBI agent of 30 years who wrote the book How to Spot Lies Like the FBI. This was published here January 11th, 2019 by Rachel Gillette and Samantha Lee. You can tell someone's lying to you by watching their face. Here are 12 dead giveaways. Just about everyone you know tells low stake lies, but some people even go so far as to lie about important matters that could forever change their relationships, end their employment, or even send them to jail. 
Detecting high-stakes liars is often the work of the FBI, and they frequently look to facial expressions, body language, and verbal indicators as signals or tells that someone is lying. And it's really funny, too, because a, a lot of the Dunning-Kruger crowd, these, like, clueless goofs who think micro-expressions are all BS and you can't tell how someone's lying, just because, I mean, yes, a small percentage of the population that are good liars or sociopaths or whatever, they might not have these giveaways. But that doesn't mean that micro-expressions aren't scientific and that they aren't tells. But for whatever reason, a lot of these clueless goofs hallucinate that uh, it's 100% fraud, like fake and fraud like, like psychics or something, which is another can of worms. But anyway, continuing on here... Mark Bowton, an FBI agent of 30 years and author of How to Spot Lies with the FBI, tells Business Insider that he used certain tells to help identify Timothy McVeigh as a suspect in the Oklahoma City bombing. But, and of course, that's different from him acting alone, which, yeah, a lot of people have actually asked for an Oklahoma City uh, mind shock episode. Uh, that one might have to be for the Rumble channel. I don't know if YouTube uh, would be happy with, uh, with the search for the truth in that particular case. But being able to read facial expressions to detect lies can be beneficial even if you're not conducting criminal investigations, he says. There are a number of facial expressions and associated reactions that could indicate someone is lying to you, he says. Some are caused by nervousness, some by chemical reactions, and others by physical reactions. Now, let's keep in mind here. Gannon is a White House reporter used to being on camera asking rapid-fire questions of high-profile politicians. So this is not some guy that, like, works in some kind of cubicle that's never, that's the first time on the news, first time in front of an audience, first time speaking, in which case that could theoretically justify some kind of nervousness. So let's keep that in mind as well. To start, he says it's important to understand how the person in question normally acts. It's best to observe someone for a while as you make small talk or ask innocuous questions in order to see what his usual reactions are, including tics he may have, he says. Then if he exhibits several lying indicators when you ask more pointed or suggestive questions, and these are not the ones he previously performed, you can be confident that he's likely lying. Here are some things you can do to tell if someone's lying. Watch their eyes. Eyes darting back and forth. People's eyes usually dart back and forth when they feel uncomfortable. Now again uncomfortable doesn't mean lying, they just are uncomfortable. And make of that what you will. This is a, a physiological reaction to him feeling uncomfortable or trapped by qu your questions that he doesn't want to answer, Bouton says. It's a throwback to when people had to seek an escape route when they feared they were in a dangerous situation such as facing a human or animal adversary. And here's another point, if Gannon is that uncomfortable, why would he even go on the show to talk about this? Unless either someone forced him to, but again, if he's not Johnny Gosh, why would he be that uncomfortable? And again, I'm not alleging he is or he isn't. I'm just trying to discern because maybe he isn't Johnny Gosh, but he is involved in some kind of shady dealings at the White House or possibly even human trafficking operations or some kind of mind control experiments, whatever. But why would he be... For I mean, it's just weird how, how he would go on the show regardless of that as well. But anyway... Keep an eye out for rapid blinking. Rapid blinking. When people are stressed about lying, they may blink five or six times in rapid succession. So it's not just lying, but they're lying and they're stressed about it. So, for example, some kind of sociopathic serial killer, they might be perfectly happy to lie and they wouldn't be stressed about lying. So they could just lie to your face all day long and not excessive or rapid blink. Because they're not stressed about their lying, they're, they're, they're comfortable with it. So Jeff Gannon here, he seems highly stressed. Now, is it stressed about lying specifically? Or is it stressed about something else and other connections? Either way, he seems highly stressed and agitated and some kind of lying involved. A person will ordinarily blink about five or six times a minute or once every 10 or 12 seconds. Bouton says, when stressed, for instance, when someone knows he's lying, he may blink five or six times in rapid succession. And that's exactly what we see here with Gannon. Bouton says exceptions to the usual blink rate mostly have to do with production of dopamine in the body. For example, a person with Parkinson's will have a noticeably slower blink rate than what is usual. 
while a person with schizophrenia will blink more rapidly than normal. And again, compare it to when Ganon is not answering a question. He seems to be sitting there calmly without excessive blinking. It's only when he's speaking on this matter that he goes into excessive blinking mode. Count how long someone closes their eyes. Closing eyes for more than one second at a time. People often close their eyes for more than a second at a time when they're lying. Bounton says that when a person closes his eyes for a second or two, he may indicate he's lied to you, since this is a type of defense mechanism. Normally, he says a person will blink at a speed of 100 to 400 milliseconds, or 0.1 to 0.4 of a second. Pay attention to the direction they look. Up, Looking up to the right, right-handed people usually look up to the right when they're about when they're about what they saw. When you ask a normal right-handed person about something he's supposed to have seen, if he looks upward and to his left, he's usually accessing his memory of the incident, Bouton says. However, if he looks upward and to his right, he's assessing his imagination and he's inventing an answer. Bouton says that left-handed people will usually have just the opposite reactions, and some people will stare straight ahead when trying to recall a visual memory, he says. And I have to jump in here because there's a very important caveat here to establish the control, because that might be true for, let's say, 80% of the population, 70-80%, but there's a decent percentage that do the opposite right-handed or they do the opposite of what was just stated here so that's why you need to ask them a definitive question so you could that that's easy that you know is true so you could see which way they look when they're telling the truth not to just jump at them with try to figure out if they're lying or not because uh you know even 10 percent of the population i mean out of a country of hundreds of millions of people that that's millions and millions of people that will have the opposite of this so that's not, you know, yes, you could say the majority of people do that, but you really have to establish. Take note of what you're asking them, looking directly to the right. Right-handed people normally look directly to the right when they're lying about what they heard. And again, that's something that's individual more. If you ask a person about what a person heard, the eyes will shift to his left ear to recollect the sound he heard, but if his eyes shift towards his right, he's about to fib, Bouton says. The key is what they're trying to recall, looking down to the right. Right-handed people often look down and to the right when they're lying about smells or sensations. His eyes will shift downward and to his left if he's going to tell you his memory of a smell or touch or sensation, such as a cold draft or a terrible odor, Bouton explains. But his eyes will shift down and to his right if he's going to lie. Bunched skin beneath and wrinkles beside the eyes indicate a real smile. A false smile doesn't affect the eyes, and it's just done with the mouth. Bouton says that when people genuinely smile, the skin around their eyes bunch and wrinkle. And you can clearly see Gannon's false smile here after mentioning the DNA test. Uh, and of course, he never actually did take a DNA test. So, But before we get back to that... Watch their hands as well. Face touching. People's faces often itch when they lie. Touching one's face may indicate lying. And again, this is so individualistic. And then, of course, there are... Now, you also have to factor X percentage of the time there will be an itch. So, regardless of whether they're lying or not. So, this one's a little tougher unless they're excessively itching only when answering certain types of questions and they're not itching at all for long stretches of time on the questions that they're answering truthfully. Bouton explains that a chemical reaction causes people's faces to itch when they lie. And keep an eye on what they do with their mouth, pursed lips. People may purse their lips to counteract the dry mouth that comes with lying. Again, that dry mouth is because they're nervous. So a sociopathic serial killer wouldn't be nervous about killing people or lying about it. So again, just keeping all that in mind. A person's mouth will often go dry as she's lying. Bouton says this may do a sucking motion, pursing her lips to try to overcome this. When their lips are so tightened that they appear pinched and white, this can indicate lying. Take note of any excessive sweating. Excessive sweating. People who are lying will often perspire more than is usual for the conditions. Bouton says sweat may appear on the forehead, cheeks, or back of the neck, and you'll likely observe the person try to wipe it away. And in some instances, notice when the person blushes. Blushing, some people, usually women, will blush after lying. Blushing is an involuntary reflex caused by sympathetic nervous system. This activates your fight-or-flight response and is a response to the release of adrenaline. Pay attention to which direction they shake their head. So what is your name and what do you do? I'm Jeff Gannon. I 
uh, am a writer. I'm currently working on a book about my experience as a White House reporter. And where are you from originally? I grew up in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania in a rural area. Oh, really? Um, what was it like growing up there? It was uh, a perfect upbringing. It was, I had, uh, went to a good school, had a great family, uh, lots of friends, uh, great opportunities. Um, Western Pennsylvania, I was talking to someone in one of my past interviews and they said that West, Western Pennsylvania is very much Midwest oriented, like the, the yes. way people think and whatnot yes. is very mis Midwest, whereas Eastern Pennsylvania is very New England. So you'd fall into like the Midwest. Midwestern, absolutely, Midwestern <laughs> value set. But uh, one of the things I've maintained from the start is uh, the important things to know about me. I am an independent conservative journalist. Uh, I, I always was and I always will be. And my personal life has no impact on that whatsoever. And frankly, it's nobody's darn business. And uh, all the things that have been uh, written about me, uh, posted on the internet, there's so much misinformation out there. I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to pick through it and tell you, well, this is, this is true, this is not true. So, uh, as a matter of course, I just don't deal with it. You know, I learned early on that you can't, uh, you can't keep people from saying things, can't keep people from posting these things on the internet. Uh, so I just don't. You know, people are going to say what they're going to say, and uh, I'm, I will eventually be able to present myself uh, in, to people in the way that they need to see me. Head shaking. If people shake their heads while saying something, they've just denied their statement. I mean, this is actually prevalent. Um, Amanda Knox actually does this a lot. Not necessarily about whether she, you know, w whether or not she was the actual killer, but where she was and her movements, she, uh, th there was some clear indications of lying in, in a lot of her interviews. If you haven't checked out the Amanda Knox podcast on Mindshock, make sure you check that out. Often when people tell the truth, they will nod their heads simultaneously in agreement with what they're saying, but if they shake their heads in disagreement with what they've just said, their bodies are betraying their lie. That's their subconscious. Okay, so clearly... We have some excessive, excessive tells here regarding Jeff Gannon. And of course, you know, again, with this goof, with this didal goof, he thinks someone claim, says, someone verbally states they're a certain age. Oh, case closed! <laughs> I mean, this guy, I mean, this didal goof is, this is one of the goofiest bastards I have ever ever seen in my entire life. I've, luckily, I've never watched this show. I don't I have no clue who he is before I watch this little clip here, luckily. But this guy is among the goofiest of goofs. I mean, he could vie for some Dunning-Kruger championships because this guy is so dumb here. Someone tells him he's a certain... He didn't even provide his ID. He just verbally told him he's a certain age. Oh, case closed! It was a false accusation. It was a conspiracy. <laughs> And if this guy, if there is a conspiracy, obviously, how easy is it to fake documents and change the age by a couple of years? It's not like he's 50 years off. I mean, yeah, he's a number of years off, but he also happens to look exactly like Johnny Gosh. I mean, the similarity is uncanny. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily mean I, I wouldn't use it as proof because th there's a lot of people that look very similar to other people. So I wouldn't say that's undeniable, but the markings on the body, I mean, we'll get to that, but... I just wanted to lay the foundation with the interview here just so people can kind of get an idea, get a sentiment of what this Jeff Gannon character is about. And I still don't even know why he appeared on the show because, again, with all these micro-expressions and tells, he's clearly lying about a lot. Now, whether he's lying about being Johnny Gosh, that's, you know, up to debate, of course. So, in the discussion here, on the conspiracy subreddit just one year ago or so, Vina Cute posted uh, this this clip that we just watched. What happened to the Jeff Gannon conspiracy? Do you guys remember this story? Gay prostitute fakes his way into the White House, uh, allegedly fakes. I mean, who knows if he was if he's part of some kind of MK Ultra experiment and he was placed there under a fake news agency. Gets busted by another journalist. Story gets huge, then completely disappears. Pictures of him and George Bush. How did he get that job? 
who put him there. Is he actually Johnny Gosh, the once kidnapped boy from Iowa? Now, here's the thing, too. I mean, you have Gosh with George Bush kissing his head and all this weird stuff. There's also this old photo of George Bush with this supposedly as of yet unidentified young boy who happens to look exactly like Johnny Gosh as well. I mean, what do all the coincidence theorists make of this? Because this isn't just a guy who looks like the older version of Gosh. We have another boy who happens to look like Johnny Gosh who's also photographed with George Bush. And then if you checked out the previous episode of the Mindshot Johnny Gosh series, there's the Colorado area where Bonacci claims that he and Gosh were taken in this Colorado ranch in a general vicinity of areas tied to Tweet Kimball, this ranch owner who's friends with none other than the Bush family. So, I mean, the coincidence stack is so stratospheric here. I mean, I just, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, what do all the coincidence theorists and corruption deniers think about this? Vina Cute also posted this. Let's keep this thread going. Really curious about what happened to the story. Post what you can find. This was the news agency he worked for at the time, Talon News. You can see that Talon News is owned by Endeavor Media Group. Is this a fake company? Endeavor Media Group is a company with a P.O. box and a fake phone number listing. When checking on EndeavorMediaGroup.com on who is, the same info comes up, but EndeavorMediaGroup.com is a forbidden domain. Also, when Googling Endeavor Group... Media, Endeavor Media Group in February 2005, it got you nothing. It's like this company didn't exist. And it didn't until Monday, February 7, 2005. Huh. That's weird. And that's in Herndon, Virginia, near the Pentagon. So other people stated here, uh, he was on the White House guest register over 200 times. So this wasn't just one or two instances. Okay, now, before we go further down the rabbit hole, let's, uh, let's go to a really, really mind-shocking article here, December 15, 2012, on clandestinerageRevealed.wordpress.com. This is pretty crazy. Johnny Gosh, a rare survivor. Found this article on Facebook earlier this month. It pissed me off to no end. There are many people lecturing, writing, and appearing in person to disclose MK Ultra. Only a few of the writers will discuss what is happening to the children. This person at Blogspot did an ex incredible job of putting this phenomenal article together about Johnny Gosh on pedophileringilluminati.blogspot.com. This article is no longer up. Okay. But the, it, it's been reposted here on clandestineragereveal.wordpress.com. Okay. So originally the article was written October 24th, 2009, Johnny Gosh, a rare survivor. And this, this is really, really crazy stuff. So we're going to get into some of the occult angles and, and all of that that Ted Gunderson blew the whistle on before. But this will set the stage for more Gannon coincidences. I mean, the amount of coincidences connected to the name Gannon itself. I mean, it's just absolutely mind-boggling. On Sunday, September 6, 1982, in the bedroom community of West Des Moines, Iowa, 12-year-old Johnny Gosh is headed out on his newspaper route. He brings with him his family dog and his red wagon to carry the papers. This is the last time Johnny is ever seen again. Johnny's parents, Noreen and John Gosh, Sr., launched the initial search for their son because the West Des Moines police were short-staffed due to the Labor Day weekend. Noreen knew in her heart that her son had not run away from home, as the police suspected, but he had been abducted by a stranger. Because both the Goshes were asleep when Johnny left that house that morning, there was conflicting information on what he was wearing that day. Their best guess was either dark sweatpants or a white t-shirt with blue jean cutoffs. Another newspaper boy named Mike tells police that a stocky man in a 1979 or 1980 blue two-tone, two-door Ford Fairmont with Iowa plates had been driving around that morning asking the newspaper boys for directions. Johnny told Mike that the man made him feel uncomfortable when he asked him for directions. As the boys noticed the Fairmont circling the area again, Johnny said he was heading home. Mike watched Johnny walking down the street and noticed another man he hadn't seen before walking closely behind Johnny as he turned the corner. 
A police artist creates a composite sketch of the stocky, dark, complected man seen driving the car. Witnesses describe him in his 30s with a mustache. The sketch is released to the media, but nothing solid comes from the lead. Days turn into weeks, and weeks bled into months. Noreen becomes obsessed with finding her son. Every night she leaves her porch light on. She does numerous television interviews, hoping that Johnny will see her and know that help is on the way. Usually when a child is abducted, he's not seen or heard from again, but in the years following Johnny's disappearance, there were sightings, evidence, and bizarre coincidences. And to this very day, many believe Johnny was the victim of a bizarre and insidious plot and is still alive and in hiding. Soon after his abduction, Johnny was drugged, molested, sold, and prostituted. This was not a random kidnapping. Johnny was clearly targeted. On September 19, 1982, Michael Aquino purchases Johnny for $35,000. They travel to Colorado to a house near Sedalia in the vicinity of Elephant Rock and Jar Canyon. This house was shown on one of America's most wanted programs broadcast in 1992, where Johnny begins a program of torture, mind control, and prostitution. Aquino is a military intelligence officer with ties to the CIA's mind control branch. He has the contacts, resources, and motivation to head an organization of criminals that kidnap children and transform them into sex slaves to satisfy his own personal mental illness while disguising the operation under the umbrella of national security. On August 12, 1984, two years after Johnny disappeared, 12-year-old Eugene Martin, another paperboy for the Des Moines Register, disappears while on his newspaper route. Noreen Gosh receives information another paperboy will be abducted prior to Martin's disappearance and reports it to local police. They call her crazy and disregard the tip. The FBI jumps on the Martin case immediately, but like Johnny, it's as though Eugene has disappeared without a trace. On August 16th, President Reagan phones the editor of the Des Moines Register, James Gannon. So, yeah, James Gannon. Now, keep in mind, Jeff Gannon, supposed original name, is James Gucker. James Dale Gucker. The West Des Moines, the, the Des Moines Register editor is James Gannon. So, Jeff Gannon, formerly James Gucker, the editor, James Gannon. Gannon. Swap first and last names. Does anybody find that strange? And Gannon itself, I mean, it's not like Gannon is like Smith or Johnson. I mean, Gannon is not that common of a name. I actually cannot recall ever knowing anybody Nate, with the last name Gannon. I mean, I've probably seen it somewhere, not in relation to this case, once in a blue moon, but this is not a po super popular last name. Mm. What does everybody make of that? But continuing the story here, Des Moines Register, okay, so President Reagan phones the editor of the Des Moines Register, James Gannon, and asks what, if anything, he can do to help in the disappearance of the two boys. To date, authorities have been unable to positively link these two cases. For the next two years, there are sightings of Johnny all over the U.S., including a dollar bill, which shows up in Sioux City, Iowa. Written on the front of the currency is, I am alive, dash, Johnny Gosh. Then on Valentine's Day, 1988, a typed letter arrives at the Gosh home. It's postmarked Idaho. The writer says he's Johnny and he's been kidnapped and forced to do terrible things. He says his kidnappers have dyed his hair and given him a new name. He types at the end of the letter, your son, Johnny Gosh. The note also mentions the incident in Oklahoma where Johnny approached a woman for help. According to Noreen, that tip was also never made public, which validates for her that the letter is authentic. Johnny Gosh was here, was painted in red nail polish on the bathroom wall of a restaurant in Denver, Colorado. In 1989, 21-year-old Paul Bonacci, a convicted child molester, comes forward. While serving time in an Omaha, Nebraska prison for molesting a young boy, Bonacci admitted to his psychiatrist he helped abduct Iowa newspaper boy Johnny Gosh. He claimed there was an organized ring of pedophiles in Omaha that abducts children and forces them into a life of pornography and prostitution, and in some cases, auctions off these children to clients for sex. Bonacci, who suffers from a multiple personality disorder, had been a key witness in Omaha's Franklin Federal Credit Union Bank scandal. He testified that Larry E. King, who was charged and convicted with embezzling $40 million from the bank, had wild sex parties at his home, and Bonacci himself had sex with several prominent Omaha citizens who were there. Larry E. King was a major Republican fundraiser based in Omaha and sang the national anthem at both the 84 and 88 Republican conventions.
Bonacci claimed that he and others were taken to the Republican convention in Dallas and also made numerous trips to the King's Washington, D.C. apartment in Embassy Row where they were offered up for sex for pay with prominent Republican politicians. Bonacci claims that this organized ring picked him up at the age of eight and forced him into prostitution. He says he was photographed, blackmailed, and later forced to be a decoy to lure young boys like Johnny into waiting vehicles. Bonacci admits that he became a molester himself. Bonacci's attorney, John DeCamp, phoned the Goshes with his story, and the Goshes' private investigator, Roy Stevens, spent two years trying to disprove Bonacci's claims. Because Bonacci had been charged with perjury and perpetrating a hoax by the grand jury in the Franklin Credit scandal, neither the FBI nor the West Des Moines police would even interview him about the Gosh case. They still feel he's an un un unreliable witness. Now, by the way, he did get a $1 million judgment. Now, those case files are sealed, for obvious reasons, for those that believe in the conspiracy. But why is he being awarded million-dollar judgments by judges if he has no evidence or he's not credible? In the two years, Roy Stevens investigated Bonacci. I mean, if anything, I mean, you have to think the evidence and his testimony must have been so overwhelming because he's already painted as a perjurer and unreliable witness. So the amount of evidence he would have to produce would be well in excess of someone who's not a who hasn't been looked at as a perjurer, uh, you know, so and unreliable with mental health issues. So one can only imagine what is in those sealed files that is so definitive that he was awarded this million dollar judgment. In the two years Roy Stevens investigated Bonacci, he went from skeptic to supporter. And some of Bonacci's story and the evidence Roy Stevens uncovered is compelling. Emilio is the ringleader of the organization with who orders the abductions and sells the children to the pedophiles. Bonacci claims Emilio was the man in the Ford Fairmont asking Johnny for directions. Tony is used as the driver. Remarkably, He's been identified in other child abductions across the country, including Michaela Joy Garrett, who disappeared in November 88 from her home in Hayward, California. The night before Johnny's abduction, Bonacci saw a man bring photos of young boys to Emilio. He says one was Johnny Gosh. Noreen Gosh remembered that a neighbor noticed a woman taking pictures of Johnny exactly three months before his abduction. Even more interesting, when the neighbor saw the picture being taken, matches exactly the background described by Bonacci in the photo he saw. And you know what's curious, if Bonacci's interview here, if he's describing this photo from prison and he had never been to the Gosh home and didn't know what the neighbor's houses looked like, how would he be able to describe that? And again, check out all the previous episodes, for, especially the previous one, episode three, for definitive information on how, on how they came to believe Bonacci because of these diaries that were age-tested to have been written before he was in prison. So before he had access to any, before any of this information was public, he had written it in his diary regarding Johnny Gosh and these other criminals. Mike was a boy who Bonacci claims was with him in the backseat of the car that Emilio was driving on the day of the abduction. He said another man pushed Johnny into the car and Paul used chloroform to knock Johnny out. Bonacci said they were taken to a farmhouse in Sioux City, Iowa, where he was the first to sexually abuse Johnny and then photos were taken. Emilio entered the room and told Bonacci and Mike to undress Johnny. Emilio had a buyer who wanted to see the photos of the boys doing things to each other. Eventually the buyer arrived, looked at the pictures, paid $35,000 and took Johnny to Colorado. Charlie ran the farm in Sioux City, Bonacci says. Roy Stevens actually located a Chuck who he believes is Charlie and found people who said things about Chuck that were similar to what ben Bonacci said about Charlie. The Colonel was the man who Bonacci said ran a ranch in Colorado. Bonacci said the last time he saw Johnny was, in the, was back in 1986 at that same ranch. Johnny, whose hair was now dyed black and was renamed Mark, had attempted to run away. When they caught up with him, they branded Johnny on his right buttock like a piece of livestock. John DeCamp, legal counsel to the chairman of the state senate committee that investigated the federal credit union and who later became a state senator, wrote a book on the scandal called The Franklin Cover-Up. At first, he too was skeptical of Bonacci's claims, but now he believes that high-level government officials wanted to keep everything quiet and did everything they could to discredit Paul Bonacci. He wonders why the FBI completely refused to investigate Bonacci's claims regarding Johnny Gosh. It was a forbidden zone. They wouldn't even talk about it, says DeCamp. DeCamp says Bonacci's multiple personalities, at last count 28, is a result of years of sexual abuse and mind control. It's caused by the very things he describes. In 1990, investigator Gary Caradori, who was investigating Paul Bonacci's claims for the Nebraska state legislation, urgently phoned State Senator Lauren Schmidt from Chicago saying he had found the smoking gun. 
Caradori told Schmidt he would fly that night from Chicago in his private plane with his son back to Lincoln, Nebraska. The plane exploded over Aurora, Illinois, killing Caradori and his eight-year-old son. According to an eyewitness, just before hearing the explosion, he saw a flash of light. A sheriff's deputy recovers pictures of children with high-profile politicians. Caradori's briefcase containing photos in on the rear seat of the plane disappear and are never recovered. Huh. October 91, Noreen Gosh met Paul Bonacci in a face-to-face -face meeting. She said Paul described to her things about Johnny that she had never released to the press, that Johnny Gosh had a stutter, and that he had taken yoga. And this is, again, as we went over in the previous episode, pretty much everything Noreen Gosh says has been verified at one point or another. So just looking at the time, even things that weren't verified previously, like as time goes by, she seems to be vindicated at every turn. And again, because because can anybody turn up any initial articles talking about Johnny Gosh's stutter and his yoga? Because, I mean, yoga is not that popular back I mean, even now it's not really popular with 12-year-old boys, but back then it wasn't really that popular with anybody. So, yeah, I mean, th this is crazy stuff here. Because of these small details, she believes... Paul Bonacci's story is true. In a bizarre coincidence, that summer, a friend of the Gosh... See, th this is truly a coincidence. I went over this in the previous episode. This might have actually been a neighbor, and I would like to know if this was the same neighbor that saw that woman photographing Gosh. In a bizarre coincidence, that summer, a friend of the Gosh's was in a Denver restaurant and, hap and noticed painted on the bathroom wall in a bright red nail polish, Johnny Gosh was here. Roy Stevens showed a series of photos, including the Mexican restaurant, to Bonacci without prompting... Bonacci identified the restaurant and recalled how he, Johnny, and Mike went into the bathroom and Johnny painted Johnny Gosh was here on the wall. Bonacci even produced a letter from his friend Mike mentioning how Johnny Gosh wrote on the bathroom walls in a Mexican restaurant in red nail polish. In 1992, America's Most Wanted aired the Johnny Gosh story and with the help of Paul Bonacci, several composite sketches were drawn of the principals involved in the alleged pedophilia ring. The FBI attempts to get the network to kill the story. Why would the FBI not want the show to air? After the show aired, Noreen Gosh received a 14-page letter from a boy named Jimmy, who said the same men who abducted her son had abducted him, and he told her that Johnny was still alive. Noreen said he knew personal details about her son that she had never before released, and she believes him. America's Most Wanted aired a series of interviews with Jimmy in March 93 in which Jimmy talked about his friendship with Johnny. He said they had made a blood oath to protect and help each other and to trust each other always. Jimmy said he was with Johnny at the ranch in Colorado for four years and that when Jimmy overheard talking about escaping, he too was branded. Jimmy lifted his pant leg and revealed a large brand on his leg similar to the brand Paul Bonacci had seen on Johnny. Jimmy later met with Noreen and John Gosh Sr. and gave them a diary he had kept of his life. Included in it were some of Johnny's memories of the time when he was a paper boy. Jimmy wrote that Johnny had 37 customers and how proud he felt when he won the local paper boy competition and won a free airline ticket. Noreen says all of that is true. America's Most Wanted Producers took Bonacci to Colorado in an attempt to find the Colonel's Ranch where these boys say they were held. Outside of Buena Vista, but Paul Bonacci recognized a piece of property. He physically reacted when he walks up to the front door and began to cry uncontrollably. Paul showed America's Most Wanted the secret underground chamber where he says the children were put in case authorities came by. Paul says some of the boys were placed there blindfolded as a form of punishment. In 97, Noreen Gosh says Johnny himself paid her a visit. A visit. He stayed for an hour and told her what happened to, her, to him and why he could never come home or see her again because of the criminal activity he's now involved in. That sparked a book penned by Noreen called Why Johnny Can't Come Home. But the latest twist is the most bizarre. On August 27, 2006, two photos were left at the home of Noreen Gosh. In one photo, a young boy is tied up and gagged, and a brand mark is seen on his upper arm, which surprisingly appears identical 
to the brand mark on Jimmy's ankle that America's Most Wanted videotaped in 1993. It's curious, too, that this America's Most Wanted episode apparently is, is not available anywhere. I mean, someone must have taped it even off the TV. Like, this is kind of weird. And we didn't go over this detail before. So, I mean, that, this, is, this is crazy. It is also identical to the one Paul Bonacci described to America's Most Wanted in 1992 that he claimed to have seen on Johnny Gosh's rear end in the late 80s. So the, the, the timeline of this of branding, this branding, this type of branding is Bonacci first, then in 93, Jimmy presents it. And, and in 2006, two photos show up to Noreen Gosh, and it's the same exact brand mark. That's weird. The other photo shows three boys lying side by side in a bed, also bound and gagged. Noreen Gosh was certain her son Johnny is in two of the photos and quickly turned them over to the police for analysis. But just this week, the West Des Moines police say Johnny Gosh is not among the boys in the photos. Nelson Zalva, a retired detective from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office in Tampa, recognized the photos as evidence in a case he investigated in 78 or 79, which predate Johnny Gosh's 82 disappearance. Retired Detective Zalva says all the boys in the photos were identified, but failed to provide authorities with enough evidence to prosecute the man who took the pictures. Hillsborough Sheriff's Department is now researching their files to locate the original photos because retired Detective Zalva does not recall seeing a brand mark on the boy in the photo. And just an update here, this is I went over in the previous episode, that photo was taken in 82 because there there's there's, uh, there's things in the background that were only available after 82. So that photo could not have been taken in 78 or 79. And supposedly Zalva admits this and his own mistake. According to Noreen Gosh, he apologized for this. So here's an update here. Photo of George H.W. Bush surfaces with what appears to be a young Johnny Gosh standing behind Bush. I chose to post Johnny's story first because it's been established it was an Illuminati abduction. Now this is on clandestine rage revealed WordPress. So they're claiming that it's been established that it's an Illuminati, not just an abduction by a pedophile ring, but an Illuminati abduction. Given what you've learned thus far in this blog, what characteristics common to Illuminati abductions appear in the Gosh abduction? Johnny can fit either of the two abdu types of abductees given the uncertainty of the clothes he was wearing at the time. A possible white t-shirt and blue jeans would fit type 1, but given the fact that Johnny had a slight disability, a stutter, he could also fit the type 2 abductee. We know from an eyewitness account a neighbor saw a strange woman photographing Johnny three months prior to his actual abduction, which means Johnny had been under surveillance prior to the abduction. What the article doesn't mention is the fact that Johnny's dad normally accompanied Johnny on his paper route, but couldn't that day, also supports Johnny having been under surveillance. They kn knew which morning to snatch him as his dad wasn't with him. What a woman, what woman was seen photographing Johnny also supports the male-female abduction team. Okay, also some people believe, of course, Leonard got Johnny, Leonard... Gosh, Johnny's father is responsible as well. Local police stalled the initial investigation by insisting Johnny was a runaway, despite his mother's claim he was not, that he must have been abducted, which is what forced Johnny's law to be passed, forcing police to act immediately in child disappearances, which of course they didn't because there was the, there was also the Mark Allen case, the third boy from the area abducted. I also question the police claiming to be understaffed on Labor Day weekend. While this may have been true, police generally schedule more officers to work holiday weekends. While when Noreen Gosh tells local law enforcement she's received a tip, another paper boy will be abducted. Police call her crazy and ignore the tip. This is the typical Illuminati tactic of portraying credible witnesses as mentally ill in order to discredit them. And the fact police refuse to act on her tip speaks for itself. The abduction vehicle was a blue sedan. Johnny was drugged with chloroform, one or a, one of two drugs favored by the Illuminati. I mean, yeah, but criminals also use that all the time. The FBI quickly stepped into both the Gosh and Martin disappearances in order to control the investigation and media coverage. This is evidenced by the FBI attempting to prevent America's Most Wanted from airing their episode on Johnny's abduction. We have Illuminati repetition as well. Both Gosh and Martin were paperboys. You have the suspicious death of investigator Gary Caridori, who was preparing to expose the government pedophile ring, so was murdered when his plan exploded. This, again, speaks to Illuminati reputation of tactics, as the exact same method was used by our government. Typically, George H.W. Bush and his spawn offspring, W, to bring down JFK Jr.'s plane and kill him. The Illuminati appear to have a penchant for blowing up planes.
Again, I am not claiming any of this is true or untrue. This is the clandestine rage revealed WordPress blog here. Symbolism appears via the branding of the boys with the rocking X brand. Numerology, Johnny was born in the 11th month, was under surveillance for three months, and was just shy of his 13th birthday, as is often the case in male abductions for this pedophile ring. The boys are often just shy of their 13th birthday or are 13 years old when abducted. Satanic Holidays, while Johnny was abducted just two days before the marriage of the beast Satanic Holiday, his, up his upcoming birthday may have been more of a mitigating factor, as the most important holiday to Satanists is one's own birthday. We have evidence tampering in the Caridori plane crash by apparently both law enforcement and the government. The photos recovered by the sheriff's deputy and the backseat of the plane both mysteriously disappear. What's, so the entire backseat disappeared. What's really interesting about this so they were there in the, during the crash and then disappeared, never recovered. What's really interesting about this case is that all questioning of witnesses and discovery of evidence that Johnny was abducted into this pedophile ring was not done by law enforcement or the FBI, but by the private investigators Noreen Gosh hired to investigate Johnny's abduction. Johnny Gosh is now 39 years old, and to date, no one has been charged or prosecuted in his abduction, despite the overwhelming evidence that was discovered pointing to an Illuminati abduction. Thinker Bell posted a response to this article here, January 27, 2013. Very interesting response here. There's nothing clandestine about them. These people stalk and terrorize for profit. Some claim they are trying to solve crime. Most are committing crimes. They pop up and reveal themselves in the groups they represent easily enough. Most get out of the military or police force or simply want to be private detectives and perpetuate the stalking. They hawk their unfounded wares to the ears of liars who believe their lies. They curl up in conspiracy blogs and rage on. They snuggle up to police who protect their atrocities. They sell their wares to religious outlets and media moguls as well. Gosh's case is representative of what they really do. They pinned all their robberies on one bank. The fact is they filter through many of the purpose of running the same scam. They pull this crap in my state too. It wasn't until I was in another state that I realized that they were not only stalking me, but had been working over my brother, who once lived near a military base in another state. He thinks anyone that has been in the military does so for the betterment of the country. Most are there for the betterment of themselves. We saw a woman sitting at the end of the block. She'd sit there for a long time with no obvious reason, as most were rather elderly, so it isn't reasonable they were surveying a drug house. I figured she was the wife of a Marine that had befriended him earlier. The conspiracy theorists have set up shop in the area. It was noticeable a few years ago when I noticed I couldn't get a car repaired anywhere they were. What? What they do is stalk people, break in, and try to convince people they have some type of mental dysfunction. For elderly, it would be a dementia-type syndrome. Some have dementia, but what they do is consistent with what they are doing to even younger people. They, what they want is their meds and access to their financial records. When they start the genetic connecting, it's only a reason to track down family members and threaten their target with the harm they'll do to those people if they don't do their bidding. They'll haul in illegals and drugs and find people to hide behind in the process. The media hides them well with their experts. In my state, they chase storms and catastrophes. They haul these illegal with them. They target people to hide behind for their credit card scams and identity theft operations. Recently, I had a man make a plate for my mailbox to keep these mind-reading superheroes out. I told him what was going on. He asked if I'd ever seen them, as he, too, believes in the power of the military to create the same effects. Yes, many times. These people aren't masterminds. It's just they've conducted studies that endorse that ensures they employ the worst and most insecure people imaginable. I recall a woman who administered these tests once said when they took it, it was suggestive she'd go into, the, into plumbing. He lives in fear, much like cancer patients, because people want the painkillers. This is why the woman was sitting at the end of the block, no doubt. Nothing a decent switch played couldn't take care of. What the heck comment is that? Okay. Well, anyway, let's, uh, let's continue on here. So, Illuminati mind control abduction or not, what is going on with Jeff Gannon? So, let's go through the wiki breakdown on Jeff Gannon. James Dale Guckert, born May 22nd, 1957, allegedly, is an American conservative columnist better known by the pseudonym Jeff Gannon. 
Between 2003 and 2005, he was given credentials as a White House reporter. He was eventually employed by the conservative website Talon News during the later part of this period. Gannon first gained national attention during a presidential press conference on January 26, 2005, when he asked United States President George W. Bush a question that some in the press corps considered so friendly it might have been planted. The question was, how are you going to work with Senate Democratic leaders who seem to have divorced themselves from reality, end quote. <laughs> divorced themselves from reality. I mean, is that kind of like an inside joke? I mean, I'm going to go over the theory that Jeff Gannon, the mind control and the multiple personality disorders are so crazy that if he really is Johnny Gosh, he doesn't think he is. And he doesn't believe he is, even if he is. But of course, the subconscious knows. Gannon routinely obtained daily passes to White House briefings, attended four Bush press conferences, and appearing regularly at White House press briefings. Although he did not qualify for a congressional press pass, Gannon was given daily passes to White House briefings after supplying his real name, date of birth, and social security number. Gannon came under public scrutiny for his lack of a journalistic background prior to his work with Talon and his involvement with various gay escort service websites using the professional name Bulldog. Gannon resigned from Talon News. And it is the Talon News, like, so this, well, this was some kind of fake company, but what, what does Talon mean? That he's within the Talons of this uh, conspiracy and these uh, group of traffickers? Gannon resigned from Talon News February 8, 2005, continuing to use the name Gannon. He has since created his own official homepage and worked for a time as a columnist for the Washington Blade newspaper, where he confirmed he was gay after he was outed. Most recently, Gannon operated JeffGannon.com, a blog where he criticized those who exposed him, the old media, and the angry gay left, accusing them of promoting a double standard. The site has since been taken offline and the domain expired. He published a book titled The Great Media War in 2007. Media career, White House press credentials. Gannon first attended White House press conference February 28, 2003, and there asked a question of then White House press secretary Ari Flesher. At the time, Gannon had never had an article published and was not associated with any kind of news organization. Talon News had not yet been created. However, Gannon states that he was editor of his high school student newspaper as proof of having some journalistic experience. And was that ever verified? That's just his claim. White House Press Secretary Scott McClellan later stated that there had been no breakdown in security and no one had intervened intervened on Gannon's behalf to ensure his access, despite the fact that he had been able to get a press pass for the White House using an assumed name. Gannon's response was that the alias Jeff Gannon was a professional name used for convenience, claiming that his real last name is hard to spell and pronounce. Guckert? That's not that hard. And that the Secret Service was aware of his identity. Journalists have said that it can take weeks to get the kind of clearance Gannon received. He was issued one-day press passes for nearly two years, avoiding the extensive background checks for permanent passes. And sidestepping his inability to gain the necessary congressional press pass. He applied for a congressional press pass in April 2004, but was denied one by the Standing Committee of Correspondence, a group of congressional reporters who oversee press credential distribution on Capitol Hill, on the grounds that Talon did not qualify as a legitimate independent news service. So it was just a shell company or something? On his resume, Gannon said he's a graduate of the Leadership Institute Broadcast School of Journalism, a two-day seminar for conservatives who want a career in journalism. And has that ever been re has that ever been verified? Again, these are just claims by Gannon. Who has verified these claims? Talon News was a virtual organization with no physical office or newsroom owned by the website Go GOP USA. Robert Eberl is the president and CEO of both GOP USA and Talon News. This has led to unproven charges that Talon News was created specifically to give Gannon a news organization that he could ostensibly represent to justify his continuing to work at the White House. By the middle of February 2005, the Talon News website had shut down indefinitely, according to the message on the site. And since May 2007, the Talon News site has been a parody, and its pages link to the Firesign Theaters website. What? What the heck? So the Firesign Theater 
an American surreal comedy troupe. Okay, so is this 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 whole case some kind of psyop? Because the coincidence stack is insane. The names are insane. I mean, everything you look at, it just doesn't make any sense. Controversy. The controversy over Gannon's background started after President George W. Bush's January 26, 2005 press conference, at which Gannon asked the president the following question. Senate Democratic leaders have painted a very bleak picture of the U.S. economy. Harry Reid was talking about soup lines, and Senator Hillary Clinton was talking about the economy being on the verge of collapse. Yet, in the same breath, they say that Social Security is rock solid and there's no crisis here. How are you going to work? You've said you're going to reach out to these people. How are you going to work with people who seem to have divorced themselves from reality? Gannon's question was ridiculed on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart inquiring, Who is this muckraking Jeff Gannon who is holding the president's feet to the fire so that he can more easily give him a reach around? The question was also derided by a number of bloggers who considered it an excessively deferential question for a reporter to ask at a presidential press conference. The question also contained a factually inaccurate assertion. The supposed comments about soup lines had not been made by Reed, but had been satirically attributed to him by conservative commentator Rush Limbaugh. So Gannon couldn't even get his facts straight. After the January 26, 2005 press conference, scrutiny into his personal and professional background by news organizations and blogs began. On February 8, 2005, Gannon resigned from Talon News and shut down his website, jeffgannon.com, according to Howard Kurtz of the Washington Post, who stated this, Jeff Gannon, whose naked pictures have appeared in a number of gay escort sites, says that he has regrets about his past, but that White House officials knew nothing about his salacious activities. Gannon said that he has been stalked and that his family has been harassed. Any evidence of that? He has revived his website since that time. Gannon is alleged to have registered several internet domain names, including hotmilitarystud.com and militaryescorts4m.com, and posted naked pictures of himself. According to The Independent, bloggers revealed that Jeff Gannon had previously worked as a $200 an hour gay prostitute who advertised himself on a series of websites with names such as hotmilitarystud.com. So again, if he was a kidnapped child who was forced into some prostitution life, does that match up with this, with this Gannon individual? When those ads became public, Gannon refused to specifically address them, but admitted that he had made mistakes in his past. During the 04 election, he wrote that John Kerry might someday be known as the first gay president, and that Kerry had supported the pro-gay agenda. Cliff Kincaid, editor of the conservative organization Accuracy in Media, wrote that the campaign against Gannon demonstrates the paranoid mentality and mean-spirited nature of the political left. In April of 06, Gannon appeared on the television program Lie Detector, produced by Mark Phillips Films and Television for the PAX Network, now Ion Television, submitting to and passing a polygraph test while asserting that he was not a White House operative. Okay, so was that polygraph fixed? And if not, they should have asked him the Johnny Gosh questions. Connections to Plame investigation. Gannon was questioned by the Justice Department in relation to the department's criminal investigation into the Valerie Plame affair, in which Plame's identif identity as an employee of the CIA was leaked to a journalist by an administration official. On October 28, 2003, Talon News published an interview in three parts that Gannon had conducted with Ambassador Joseph C. Wilson, Plame's husband whom the CIA had sent to Niger in 2003 to investigate claims that Iraq was attempting to procure yellow cake uranium. In the interview, Gannon asked Wilson about an internal government memo prepared by U.S. intelligence personnel that said Plame had suggested Wilson for the job. In a February 2005 interview, Gannon told CNN's Wolf Blitzer that the FBI had spoken to him in an effort to learn who had leaked the, invest the classified memo and to whom, but that he had not been asked be to appear before the grand jury investigating the case. Many assumed that the White House had leaked this memo to him. Gannon said he learned about its existence after it had been mentioned in a story published in the Wall Street Journal. Previously, Gannon has been criticized by Tom Daschle's supporters when he covered the South Dakota Senate race between Daschle and John Thune. Supporters of Daschle claimed he acted as a de facto member of the Thune campaign while ostensibly a journalist. 
Washington Blade. In July 2005, Gannon began writing for the D.C. area gay publication Washington Blade. His articles in included criticisms of gay blogger John Aravosis, who had accused him of having pornographic ads. Blade editor Chris Crane attracted his own criticism from many in the gay community for this decision due to Gannon's criticism of the gay rights movement, as well as his refusal to disclose his sexual orientation. He has said, my personal life is a private matter despite the fact that I have become a public person. Crane defended his decision in September 2005 editorial, writing that the steady stream of feedback and vitriol has declined a, li a little with each new Gannon article. Crane resigned as editor in 06, retaining ownership in the paper's parent company. The new editorial team fired Gannon as a result of what editor Kevin Naff called Gannon's huge credibility problem. The House Judiciary Committee. The House Judiciary Committee voted against House Resolution 136 on March 16, 2005 that would have directed the Attorney General and the Secretary of Homeland Security to transmit documents in the possession of officials to the House of Representatives. These documents related to the security investigations and background checks involved in granting Gannon access to the White House. The documents were to be transmitted no later than 14 days after the date of adoption of the resolution. During the committee meeting, Democratic Representative Sheila Jackson Lee claimed that Gannon had engaged in a penetration of the White House, maybe a security breach, and I do not believe it can be answered with self-investigation. Wow. Chairman Jim Sessenbrenner said that the letter from the Secret Service dated March 7, 2005 stated, Please be advised that our Office of Protective Operations has looked into this matter and has determined that there was no deviation from Secret Service standards and procedures as your letter suggests. Gannon later wrote in his blog, quote, I hope this vote will put these issues to rest and allow me to return to my work as a journalist, end quote. In his self-published book, The Great Media War, he responds to questions about whether he played some role for the Bush White House other than that of an independent journalist. White House records, Democratic representatives John Conyers of Michigan and Louis Slaughter of New York had submitted similar requests under FOIA on February 15, 2005. The Department of Homeland Security answered Slaughter's request with Secret Service records of Gannon's check-in and out times at the White House. In a 2005 interview, he stated that he has never spent the night at the White House. Okay, and if he had, what would he state? Okay, so... There's just, uh, there's just, I mean, this case, obviously, one big mess here, and so many unanswered questions. So, let's go to Web Sleuths for some posts here from 2019. According to people claiming to be involved in the pedophile ring, Johnny was kept alive because he was so much in the media limelight. He was the golden boy or the media boy, then he ran away and escaped. Neither Eugene Martin nor Mark James Allen had the same publicity as Johnny, so if Johnny is alive, and if the others were abducted into the same organization and are dead, then one could justify it that way. I mean, that's an interesting point that nobody thinks about. So all these sickos, would they want to pay more for this missing boy who had all this national attention? So would this pedophile ring make a lot more money by keeping him alive? The only reason I can think of that would keep a grown man from resurfacing and reconnecting with his family are, one, the family had something to do with the abduction, John Leonard Gosh, question mark, or two, the now grown man had done some pretty bad things that are against the law and stepping forward might cause him to have to answer to those bad things. What else could keep a 40-something man from stepping forward and saying, hey, I'm John Gosh and this is what happened when I was 12? Some responses here, never underestimate the power of fear. And that's a good point as well. Some re posts here regarding uh, Gannon. I suppose technically, barring a DNA test, Gannon is up in the air. But I really don't think he is Johnny. Isn't there proof that Gannon was alive and well, last name Guckert, before Johnny was even abducted, school record and whatnot? And again, if there were a few photos produced or like one article, I mean, if this is a vast government conspiracy, you know, that's the weird thing about coincidence theorists. I mean, if there is a, cons a vast, far-reaching government conspiracy involving, like, possibly billions of dollars, or if not, at least millions, how would they not be able to produce a couple of fake records? But coincidence theorists, they see those records and say, oh, well, that's that! That settles that! 
because records can't be faked. It's just really weird, the Dunning-Kruger stylings of coincidence theorists. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's what happened. I'm just saying if there is a vast conspiracy and there was an attempt to cover it up, I mean, it clearly wouldn't be that diff difficult to fabricate some records and possibly pay off a couple people at schools or whatever. Another post here, we also have to remember that Johnny would be a very damaged human being and may not be ready to face the outside world. And again, or if this MK Ultra is so advanced, again, even if he's not Ganon, if he's somebody else, if he doesn't even know he's Johnny Gosh, he would never be able to come forward. Another response here, I don't think Ganon is Johnny Gosh either, but his background is very strange. I cannot let this one go as being possible. I am normally really dismissive of conspiracy theories. Everything about the idea Ganon is Gosh seems ridiculous on the surface. But I don't think Ganon has ever produced anything to indicate evidence of a life before he was Guckert. I believe he indicated at one point that he would introduce parents or family members to the media, but that never happened. He also said he would take a DNA test, and never did. Look, if he is Johnny Gosh and had his reasons for not wanting to come forward, I don't think anyone should pressure him to. But this theory that seems so crazy, yet given the details of the case as plausible, is out there. And I can conceive of reasons he might not want to take a DNA test or bring family members into this, but no one in the media ever found a family member. And if you wanted to test someone's DNA, it's not illegal to use their trash or any discarded refuse of theirs to do so. I can't believe Noreen Gosh wouldn't have tried this already. Uh, unless she did. Unless she has nothing with Johnny's DNA on it to compare it to, in which, I mean, I'm sure they have his DNA. I can't believe Noreen wouldn't have tried this already. Okay, in which case, they, why haven't they given it to the police, given it a try? DNA obtained in the April Tinsley case was obtained without a warrant, simply by intercepting the two remaining suspects' trash. I know it's a crazy theory, but everything about this case is crazy. Part of me wants to know what happened to Johnny Gosh, really wants someone to do a DNA test. That part of me doesn't want to see someone thrust into the spotlight unwillingly if they are Gosh. Knows it should be left alone. For me, it will always be something that hangs over this case, and I think it's possibly true. Yeah, I mean, th this is crazy. So let's continue down this rabbit hole, and we will be touching upon Hunter S. Thompson. This is a post from imaginativeworlds.com, Enter the Realm of Unknown Forums, and uh, I don't believe this is up anymore, but back in 2005, an interesting post here, March 28, 2005, by Gormworm. Friday, 2000, uh, February 25, 2005, Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh, Hunter Thompson, and Bohemian Grove Snuff Porn. I've been watching this story percolate since this weekend, and with Thursday's return of Jeff Gannon to the blogosphere with a column entitled Fear and Loathing in the Press Room, really brings it all full circle. Several questions are begged here. As the Jeff Gannon story progressed and turned into a Bush White House homosexual prostitution scandal, internet investigators started asking if there could be a connection to the previous Bush White House homosexual prostitution scandal. If you recall, the stories of 15-year-old callboys wandering through the White House in the middle of the night was linked to the Franklin cover-up case exposed by Nebraska State Senator John DeCamp. In that case, a Republican operative named Larry King was involved with procuring boys and girls from Boys Town in Nebraska and elsewhere and entrapping them in a child sex slave and espionage ring. King, with an annual salary of under $20,000, was throwing sex parties for the powerful in a $5,000 a month condo in Washington, D.C., apparently taping the proceedings for blackmail purposes. And again, in 2005, to coincidence theorists and authority-worshipping cultists, they probably were like, oh, this is complete nonsense. But in the post-Epstein area, a lot of these coincidence theorist goofs, I mean, even they, are they still pretending and hallucinating that there's no... No corruption of this kind. I mean, it's just weird. One of the victims of this ring was one Paul Bonacci, who testified in court proceedings that he helped kidnap Johnny Gosh in the, into the ring in 1982. It was apparently 2.29 a.m. Sunday, February 20th, when the question was first asked, is Jeff Gannon really Johnny Gosh? By the end of the day, Hunter S. Thompson was reported dead. 
Must have been another coincidence, though. I mean, how could it not be a coincidence, right? So let's go to total411.info. I don't think this is up anymore either, but February 2005. Total information analysis. Friday, February 25th, 2005. Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh, Hunter Thompson, and Bohemian uh, Grove of Snuff Porn. And this is where it gets really interesting. Bonacci also testified that he was forced in July 1984 to participate in a homosexual, pedophilic, necrophilic orgy at what has since been identified as Bohemian Grove, all of which was filmed. And according to Bonacci, the man in charge of the filming was someone picked up in Las Vegas on the plane headed to the Grove, a man who Bonacci was told was one Hunter Thompson. No doubt most people who came across this information in the past were familiar with Thompson's work, dismissed the idea that the man behind the camera could have been the famous writer. After all, this was a man who had been fighting the likes of Nixon and Bush his entire career. But could Thompson have been brought to the Grove by someone who presented it as an opportunity to investigate what the power elite was up to behind closed doors? Could Thompson have quickly found himself in over his head, compromised by virtue of his very presence at this horrific crime, by the men he thought he was investigating undercover? Wow, what a theory that is. Or perhaps compromised some other way. Perhaps, for instance, he was surreptitiously filmed with an adult female prostitute who was then murdered, but I digress. But back for now to the who is Jeff Gannon question. James D. Guckert seems to have appeared out of nowhere around 1999 setting up male escort websites. In profiles on these sites from around 2001, Jeff said he was 31 years old, closer to Johnny Gosh's age than James Guckert's. Huh. Guckert Gannon claims to be 47 today in 2005, at the time of this article. So he changed his age. Okay, well, that's weird. Jeff Gannon, a.k.a. James Guckert, also was attending alumni events at the TKE fraternity of Westchester College in Pennsylvania. Local media called the college and confirmed that a James Guckert graduated from Westchester in 1980, but apparently no one has checked yearbooks and such to confirm if the same man seems to be depicted. Okay, and Guckert, I would argue Guckert is a more popular name than Gannon, because I've known a couple Guckerts uh, in passing. I've seen that name quite more often than, than, uh, than Gannon. Could James Guckert be just another false identity? Another Democratic underground investigator found 1986 and 1987 pictures of a Jeff Guckert not a James Guckert, but a Jeff Guckert from Fairview High School in that same Pennsylvania-Delaware border area that James D. Guckert, a.k.a. Jeff Gannon, claimed residence on his escort and porn website and was cited for $20,000 in back taxes. Jeff Guckert would have been about the same age as Johnny Gosh when he was playing high school golf. Huh. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Did Gosh go on to assume the identity of James Guckert, a man 10 years older than himself, sometime in the 90s? Huh. Consider this. From his mother, Noreen Gosh, uh, Johnny Gosh Foundation website in 2001, Johnny was subjected to severe trauma and torture of a satanic and sexual nature in order to intentionally destroy the conscious personality brainwashing. This intentional application of trauma is a systematic procedure used to control these victims in order to use them in sexual slavery, pornography, and more. In February 1999, a federal court testimony in Omaha, Nebraska, Noreen Gosh testified that Johnny Gosh came to see her in 1997, providing information about his experience, asking for his mother's help, and pleading for her to not reveal his visit. Johnny is now 31 years old. After years of suffering tremendous torture and pain at the hands of his captors being used and abused, he and several others have escaped. They have been hiding, they have been living and hiding under new identities, 
They fear for their lives. People ask, why is it necessary for someone to hide and live this way? It is simple. Johnny can identify many of the people involved and would be a threat to the very people who took him. He is known as the chameleon. Why? Because he can so completely change his appearance. Chameleon, again, on Democratic Underground, someone points to a purple blemish on Jeff's chest in one of his circa 2002 escort photos, asking if that is a mark left by birthmark removal. According to his mother, Johnny the Chameleon Gosh still had the birthmark in 1997. So he just happens to have a blemish in the exact same spot where Johnny Gosh has a birthmark. Does anybody find that strange? Well, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. In one of his first interviews on CNN's Anderson Cooper 360, Jeff Gannon said James Guckert is the name on my driver's license. His handlers have apparently warned him on that point, and he now claims it is given name. So what is the deal here? Is Jeff Gannon really Johnny Gosh? Noreen Gosh refuses to confirm or deny. If Gannon is Gosh, what is going on with him? Is his strange behavior a result of years of brainwashing? Or is it something more? Is it possible he drew attention to himself during that January 26th press conference to pique the curiosity of citizen investigators? To draw attention to the dark side of the past 24 years of the Bush regime. He invited this investigation after the press conference and before the escort revelations by publishing a column titled, Hiding in Plain Sight. What? And this was within days of the Franklin cover-up figure George Paul Bishop's sudden arrest. So he wrote, so the first major article he wrote was Hiding in Plain Sight. What? Okay. And did that investigation have anything to do with the death of Hunter Thompson? Sherman Skolnick and Tom Hennigan at Cloak and Dagger Internet Radio say Thompson was working on a book about high-level sex rings, though they haven't offered a source. But that claim aside, we still have the timing of Thompson's reported death coinciding with these investigations. Did Thompson kill himself out of shame for his part at what happened at the Grove? Was he murdered to shut him up? Or did he fake his death to go underground while all this was breaking? Is there anything to all these questions? Jeff Gannon hints at a yes by putting up a new website headlined by a piece titled After Thompson's Most Famous Works. It's all in plain sight, I'll bet through the looking glass. Huh. Comments here are that uh, the birthmark, that blemish that is could be birthmark removal, it could also just be, uh, it could also be some kind of makeup. All right, let's, let's go down this rabbit hole. I mean, this is some dark stuff. This is really, really dark. We're going to go to unicorn144.wordpress.com. And this is November 30th, 2016. The Paperboy Johnny Gosh and the Hunter S. Thompson snuff film at Bohemian Grove. In 2010, the Huffington Post released an article on a problem that gets little attention in the mainstream press. And what's curious is that it has since, uh, I don't know if it's still available, it's not coming up, but I mean, I'm gonna read a transcription of the article, but I don't, I don't know if it's still online here. One that if you do your research into it, you will uncover a monster so vile, it will make you shudder. Some cry, some fill with rage, many just turn away as if the truth of the matter is so harsh that they just can't compute it when they see what's really going on with the highest levels of government and elite circles in America. So this is Huffington Post, July 23rd, 2010. A major federal investigation has found that dozens of military officials and defense contractors, including some with top-level security clearances, allegedly bought and downloaded child pornography on private or government computers.
The Pentagon on Friday released investigative reports spanning almost a decade that implicated individuals working with agencies handling some of the nation's most closely guarded secrets, including the National Security Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office, which operates U.S. spy satellites. Defense workers who purchased child porn put the Department of Defense, the military, and national security at risk by compromising computer systems, military installations, and security clearances, a 2007 investigative report said. The suspects also put the Defense Department at risk of blackmail, bribery, and threats, one report added. The, report, the reports, however, do not point to any specific security breaches. Huh. So back to the blog here, this story, high level government workers with millions of child porn files on their work computers came to the list, came to light originally through the Boston Globe in 2010, who had obtained documents through the Freedom of Information Act from the US government, though most of the documents were blacked out, including of course, most names. Some arrests were made at the time and a few five year prison terms were handed out. Some of them accused quickly paid fines. Most were never named and got away with it. Although the Pentagon swore to investigate the disgusting epidemic further to get to the bottom of it. Skip ahead a couple years to 2012, and we find the Pentagon did nothing of the sort. There were no further findings reported. In fact, there was no action whatsoever. And according to Forbes that year, September 19th, 2012, the Pentagon is under fire for failing to examine 1,700 out of the 5,200 reports of employees doing child porn. The Pentagon claimed it wasn't a priority. Senator Grassley and his staff have made it one. The closed investigation into widespread use of child porn at the Pentagon is now reopened. And this, this article is still up on Forbes.com. Uh, September 19th, 2012, to catch government workers with ties to child porn, call the IRS. That's from that article. 5,200 reports. This could be the most disturbing thing ever reported. Can you picture any other organization having 5,200 known pedophiles all working on the same place? I mean, it's kind of unclear how many of the reports are from the same person, though. But this is no coincidence, that's for sure. These men and women who are government officials, national security agents, Pentagon workers, elected representatives, intelligence agents, etc., to be doing this at work or on government networks in general altogether shows that it is a company-wide epidemic which must stem from inside the company, the U.S. government. To this day, this case remains an unknown work in progress. Since this story has been forgotten by the mainstream media as of late, or at least suppressed, it basically doesn't exist anymore. But this sickening tale doesn't start in 2010 with the Boston Globe article. Way back in the late 1980s, there was a scandal blown open known as the Franklin cover-up in which a banker named Lawrence King, who ended up going to jail on a $40 million fraud charge for stealing, uh, for stealing from the credit union he rang, also was identified for running a child prostitution ring out of Nebraska where hundreds of children, some younger than 10, were flown around the country on chartered jets to have sex and much worse activities with extremely wealthy and powerful American men. High-ranking government officials, including including those in the White House at the time, were fingered for not only pedophilia, but making videos of their actions, beating the young men they raped, owning child prostitutes of their own, trading the kids between themselves, and even murdering them. Though there were 80 kids who came forward who were used as sex slaves for King, all telling the same story, after death threats and a few murders, 78 of the kids rescinded their stories. I mean, that's still a lot. 80 kids to come out of the woodwork if they were lying. I mean, that's a lot. The two that didn't were put in jail for perjury. No investigation has ever been launched into the matter since. The first film we're showing, though, it was bought out and canceled 20 minutes before it was set to air on TV, was made at the height of the scandal. It's enough to make your jaw drop to the floor. It will also shed light on why this is the Franklin cover-up and not the biggest case in American history. And if it wasn't covered up, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is just crazy. I mean, people, l look at the outrage over, again, I mean, perhaps uh, Donald Trump's tweets or whatever. The country went crazy. A lot of people went crazy over comments he made or, or whatever jokes he made. I mean, when there's this going on, I mean, just imagine the disproportional outrage here. 
um, the harming of children versus, you know, tweet, you know, some jokes from a politician. I mean, it's just crazy. And they're referring, of course, to the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. Long before Alex Jones snuck a camera in to film the cremation of care ceremony, one of King's child victims in the above film, Paul Bonacci, testified that he made midnight visits to the White House in the 1980s and witnessed top politicians receive sexual acts from male children. Bonacci has also been documented many times recounting a bone chilling story of himself and another boy being forced into making a snuff film, a film where someone is actually murdered in front of the camera, where a third child was raped, tortured, and killed in the notorious now not so secret elitist club in the redwoods of Northern California called the Bohemian Grove. At the time of his emotional description, which is below, Bonacci, who was in prison for child abuse and perjury charges for not retracting his story like the other 78 victims, had no idea what the Bohemian Grove was. No one did until the internet came around, but he described exactly as it looks, where it was, where the snuff filming took place, and even states the men in hoods took care of the dead boy's body. It's uncanny. And uh, Bonacci's interviews are available on YouTube in various videos. I'm actually not going to listen to them because that's, uh, that's a bit too disturbing uh, for people that actually want to hear the words from his mouth. Again, just our background into Bonacci, everything he said regarding Gosh and a lot of these people was all verified by PIs, etc. Former Republican member of the Nebraska le Legislature, Senator John DeCamp, investigated the Franklin cover-up for decades, and in his book, The Franklin Cover-Up, Child Abuse, Satanism, and Murder in Nebraska, he writes, quote, In other testimony, Paul Bonacci said that Larry King, not the CNN Larry King, Lawrence King of Franklin Credit Union, was smiling and laughing the whole time the film was being shown, and that the men in with hoods were a satanic group which planned to use the dead boy in some sort of ceremony. Bonacci also named the director of the snuff film who they had picked up in Las Vegas as Hunter Thompson. Hunter Thompson, so that's the end of the quote there. Hunter Thompson, question mark. Hunter S. Thompson of fear and loathing in Las Vegas fame. Yes, that's the allegation. And though, of course, it is only an accusation, here are some pretty damning supporting facts. A man named Russell Bridges, who was a, Rep a Republican Party photographer and also a photograph, a photographer for Lawrence King, claims Hunter S. Thompson offered him $100,000 to shoot a snuff film for him in the 80s, which he declined. Hunter S. Thompson's secretary wrote on his memoir blog that he once tried to make her watch a snuff film, which she refused to watch. Hunter S. Thompson's secretary, Nicole Brown, in in her memoirs, stated Hunter S. Thompson tried to get her to watch a snuff film connected to the Franklin cover-up. According to Wikipedia, Hunter S. Thompson lived in San Francisco, California, the same place as Bohemian Grove at the time this all allegedly took place, and he was researching twisted pornography at that time too, example bestiality and other disgusting mediums. This brings us to another link in this gruesome chain, Johnny Gosh. On September 5th, 1983, at 12 years old, while out on his paper route in West Des Moines, Johnny was kidnapped. His mother, Noreen Gosh, has been relentlessly searching for Johnny ever since and has come to some terrifying conclusions. The first, her son seems to have been targeted, photographed, and sold the night before his abductors grabbed him. Below, telling the rest is an excerpt by Noreen from johnnygosh.com. In 1989, Paul Bonacci provided his attorney, John DeCamp, with information indicating he had participated in the abduction of a Des Moines, Iowa paperboy. This paperboy was Johnny Gosh. Bonacci's testimony provided a great deal of info about Johnny in his case. However, local authorities refused to interview him, questioning his credibility. According to numerous reports, John was taken by a highly organized, very corporate, global pedophile pornography ring. Evidence links to this... 80s congressional callboy scandal, money laundering, drug running, illegal arms deals, and more. Like so many others before and since, Johnny was subjected to severe trauma and torture of a satanic and sexual nature in order to intentionally destroy the conscious personality, brainwashing. This intentional application of trauma is a systematic procedure used to control these victims in order to use them in sexual slavery, pornography, and more. End quote. 
As mentioned in one of the movie clips below, an FBI agent in the 80s who was assigned to the case named Gary Caridori once contacted Noreen saying he was flying out to Chicago to meet a source that would prove Johnny was a victim of the child sex slave ring. According to Caridori, he had photographic evidence that would blow the case out of the murky water. After meeting with his source, though, Caridori's private plane exploded in the air. He was with his 10-year-old son at the time. Both died in the crash. According to Noreen, Johnny contacted her in 97 when he was 27 and told her the whole story of how he was kidnapped, tortured, brainwashed, hooked on drugs, and sold into the child sex trade. He pleaded with her not to say anything, promising her it would be the last thing either one of them did. According to Johnny, there was no escaping. From johnnygosh.com, quote, The people who take these children also do a thorough job of brainwashing, telling these young children that if they try to resume any kind of life with their families, they will be killed. It is enough of a threat that they do not try to contact their families, end quote. Amazingly, a few years ago, it was thought that a man who went by the name of Jeff Gannon was Johnny Gosh. Gannon suddenly appeared, of all places, in the press corps of the White House during the Bush-Cheney administration. At first, nobody noticed him much. That is, until he started asking obvious softball questions meant for Bush to knock out of the park. Suspicious of the newcomer, the rest of the press corps did a little research on him. They quickly found that Jeff Gannon also went by the name James Guckert in the past and was also currently a high-paid male escort that went by the name of Bulldog. Retired agent Ted Gunderson, who intensely worked in the Johnny Gosh case until the day he died in 2011, was convinced that Gannon was Gosh. Gunderson says, my source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Go Johnny Gosh. Let's just say he's in a position to know the kids are all in touch with each other. It's a bond they all share. The only way I'd be 100% sure is if there was a DNA test or if he admitted it. So from Rents.com, August 18, 2008. Five, Noreen Gosh speaks about Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh, and the attempted theft of her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, by Charlene Fassa. So, in this article here, they talk about Noreen being threatened by this guy trying to steal her remaining book inventory and the reprint rights to her book. This is unconscionable. Noreen's book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, represents a huge part of her life story, and frankly, it's practically all she tangibly has left of her son. And that brings us to the Jeff Gannon conundrum. In addition to the potentially devastating legal battle of her book, Noreen is still trying to determine if Jeff Gannon is indeed her son, Johnny Gosh. Those who say there's not enough credible evidence to demand a DNA test, which would finally resolve the issue, are simply wrong. For example, Jim Rothstein, a retired New York City detective who spent 35 years on the force, much of it investigating child slavery and pedophile rings, asserts that the evidence is strong that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh. To me, Gannon looks like Johnny, Rothstein opines. Everything just fits. The profile, the MO, everything. Then there's Ted Gonderson. Uh, well, also, just another point there, if Gannon is not Gosh, he could be another boy who was kidnapped and sold into child slavery, etc., and then that led to his path into being a child escort and his Bush connections and all that. Then there's Ted Gunderson, a retired FBI agent who has worked on the Johnny Gosh case for over a decade. On Gunderson's website, his bio reads, prior to retirement in 1979, Ted Gunderson had over 700 persons under his command and operated a $22 million annual budget. His complete resume is at TedGunderson.com. Gunderson says he has a credible source that is certain Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh. My source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Johnny Gosh, Gunderson reveals. Let's just say he's in a position to know. The kids are all in touch with each other. It's a bond they all share. Gunderson concludes with, The only way I'd be 100% sure is if there is a DNA test or if he admitted it, end quote. Noreen confirms, quote, Ted sent me a videotape of his interview with his source, and the source said, Gannon is Gosh. And he said it, without hesitation and without blinking an, an eye, and he said he's known it for months. Noreen believes the man is credible. 
Gunderson makes it clear that Bonacci is not his informant, but is quick to add that Bonacci informed him a while back that Gosh had changed his appearance. I mean, what does that mean? Getting a, you know, shaving his head or something? In fact, there's even corroboration from John DeCamp who weighs in with, quote, Bonacci told me the same thing, that Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh. Wow. Okay, so th there's a lot of people say because because there's people saying that Bonacci says that he didn't say that or whatever, but if he did say it to DeCamp and then denied it to others, is that just a way to protect himself, even if he really did say it? Because a lot of coincidence theories, they don't consider that possibility. But continuing on here... Uh, this bombshell from Noreen, the birthmark on Johnny's chest is very similar to a mark seen on Gannon's chest in at least one photo. Gannon has a spot on his right cheek in the same place as Johnny. So he has more than one mark on his body in the exact same spot. Rostin, Gunderson, and Noreen Gosh are from the article... By Tim Schmidt, Johnny Gosh, Jeff Gannon, Hunter Thompson, and the Unraveling of a Troubling Tale. Okay, I'm going to read this article as well. It's, yeah, there, there are some crazy, crazy little tidbits here. This is April 6, 2005 by Tim Schmidt. Johnny Gosh, Jeff Gannon, Hunter Thompson, and the Unraveling of a Troubling Tale. Cover story, Death of a Conspiracy. Noreen Gosh sits in a booth at the West Des Moines Village Inn nursing a cup of coffee and managing, despite her larger-than-life personality, to blend into the surroundings and keep a low profile in the almost empty restaurant. She is open with her thoughts and willing to share what information she can, yet she remains guarded, cautious and thoughtful in a manner often mistaken as cold and standoffish. She thinks carefully as she speaks about her son Johnny and the players in a bizarre conspiracy surrounding his disappearance in 1982 that continues to evolve and may finally be on the verge of breaking down. Just because you don't want to believe something is true, says Noreen slowly, that doesn't mean it's not true. It's a statement that bears repeating. Just because you don't want to believe something is true, that doesn't mean it's not true. Anyone who has heard of the theories surrounding Johnny Gosh's disappearance on September 5th, 1982, and who in Iowa has not, knows they are difficult to accept. If there are satanic pedophiles working in the top levels of government and law enforcement, selling kids on the black market and forcing them into prostitution, pornography, extortion rings, and things far worse, it's easier as a human being to simply believe that such things could not be true. But they could be, and Noreen knows this all too well. She doesn't want to believe her child was kidnapped, sexually abused, tortured, brainwashed, and sold into slavery, but she accepts this now as an indisputable truth, and she is not alone. Many others accept the existence of a vast network of high-profile people, powerful politicians, business leaders, law enforcement, and government agents who exist in a subculture of degenerates who participate in child pornography, snuff films, drugs, devil worship, brainwashing, and kidnapping. And Noreen believes that Johnny and hundreds of other children like him were forced into this life of depravity by those who kidnapped him. But Johnny's story has been told thousands of times. It's been analyzed, disputed, and ridiculed just as frequently, and we neither have the time and space nor the inclination to repeat it in here in full. As tragic as it may be, it's old news. Nothing major has happened in the case for some time, and the alleged players in the story have been silent, absent, or simply missing for years. Until recently. In the past few months, there's been a flurry of activity among the people once related to this case and the conspiracy that surrounded it. In the midst of this commotion, some believe Johnny Gosh has been found very much alive. Recent events began with Jeff Gannon, the right-wing journalist who was found to have gained access to the White House press pool with few credentials and a fake name. The death of Hunter S. Thompson followed shortly after. The arrest of two men seemingly unrelated in Nebraska and Virginia within days of the Gannon story and Thompson's death also played a role in the story. And all these events, some suggest, are related to the 12-year-old paperboy kidnapped from West Des Moines 23 years ago. And if they are right, there is much more to come. Johnny lives. In late January, a conservative journalist in Washington, D.C. was found to have gained access to the White House press pool despite using a fake name and despite the fact that he once worked as a high-priced homosexual escort. Jeff Gannon was a White House correspondent for Talent News who regularly attended White House press briefings and had at least four press conferences with President George W. Bush. On January 26, 2005, Gannon asked a question of the president that was so friendly and factually inaccurate that some of his colleagues began looking into his background. 
And, and just a quick aside here again, and that's a very astute observation in the previous blog that we read that did Gannon do that on purpose to draw attention to himself so people would figure out he was Johnny Gosh while denying it in order not to put himself or Noreen Gosh in danger while, at the, while simultaneously exposing it to the world, hiding in plain sight as his article was titled, previous to him asking that question. Talon News, it was learned, is a barely disguised tool of the Republican Party, and Gannon's credentials as a journalist consist solely of a training course at a leadership broadcast school of journalism. After two days of training that cost $50, <laughs> Gannon was officially a graduate of a journalism school and on his way to the White House press pool. I mean, that is kind of laughable. It was soon discovered that Gannon's real name is Jeff Guckert, and that he has also gone by the nickname Bulldog when listing himself on the internet as a homosexual escort and personal trainer, charging $200 per hour for his discreet services. Gannon was removed from the White House and resigned from Talon News on February 8th. Gannon Gate quickly became the presidential scandal of the hour, though the story faded from public view as politicians and the media eagerly turned their attention to such pressing matters as steroids in baseball and the Terry Schiavo situation. But before long, internet bloggers had picked up the story and began to think back to the administration of President Bush's father which was rocked by a scandal that allegedly involved a high-level official giving private late-night tours of the White House to teenage male prostitutes. The New York Times and the Washington Post both wrote about the story and the eventual death of Washington lobbyist Craig Spence, who reportedly arranged the visits. Spence, it has been suggested, was preparing to admit publicly that he was using the teenage boys to blackmail high-powered politicians in the Beltway. He committed suicide before he had the opportunity to do so. Shades of Jeffrey Epstein, anybody? Anybody? Jill Zane Maxwell, anybody? Anybody? With a gay escort gaining access to the White House during a Bush administration while many of the same officials from the 80s are back in power, the question became, is there a connection? Private investigator Sherman H. Skolnick posted a story about the Gannon debacle on Rents.com, a site known for its conspiracy theories, and publicly stated on February 19th that Gannon is Johnny Gosh. Andy Stevenson, a blogger from Seattle familiar with the case of the, uh, the details of the Johnny Gosh case and the child sex rings in Nebraska, detailed in the book The Franklin Cover-Up, began with a group of other writers and investigators to ponder the claim. They looked at markings on Gannon's body and compared them to those reported on Johnny Gosh. They considered the lack of personal information about Gannon's early years. They considered that Johnny was alleged to have been used as a gay prostitute for blackmail purposes. They considered that the high power people alleged to have kidnapped and brainwashed children as part of the government's Monarch Project and the MK Ultra program included Johnny, did so to use them in a variety of ways to advance their own agendas. And they contacted Noreen Gosh and discussed the idea with her, the first she'd heard of the theory, and they too came to the conclusion that Jeff Gannon is none other than Johnny Gosh. The internet has been abuzz with the theory ever since, and in a way, it makes perfect sense. You've got a kid abducted and brainwashed into doing the bidding of government officials as part of a top-secret mind control program, so now that he's older, why not put him in the White House to soften press briefings to make the president look better? The suggestion for many is that Gannon is a monarch program child-turned-adult operative. Gannon, according to investigators like Skolnick, is involved in high-profile high-level espionage and is also an expert on torture. He is said to have been an expert penetration agent using sex to compile negative data on U.S. and foreign government officials and is also believed responsible for the Valerie Plame White House leak that allegedly caused 70 CIA undercover agents to be murdered. I mean, wow. I mean, what a tangled web this is. Yet others suggest that Gosh took on the persona of James Gannon, Jeff Guckert, and gained White House access with the eventual goal of exposing the people who kidnapped him and put him and his family through hell. Gannon is alleged to have a publishing deal with a Russian imprint, which some believe will result in a tell-all book that exposes those who paid for his services, as well as the pedophile ring that he, as Gosh, was victimized by after his kidnapping. I'm convinced 99% that he is Johnny Gosh, says Ted Gunderson, a retired FBI agent who has been working on the Gosh case for more than a decade. The only way I'd be 100% sure if there was a DNA test or if he admitted it. He bases his opinion on a confidential source from whom he claims to have a videotape testimony that has him identifying Gannon as Gosh. 
My source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Johnny Gosh, says Gunderson. Let's just say he's in a position to know the kids are all in touch with each other and it's a bond they all share. Again, like, what does it take to fool former FBI head Ted Gunderson with experience in all of these trafficking and missing children's cases, satanic expose? I mean, th this guy clearly has a lot of experience in this dark world. And just as an investigator. The kids he refers to are those forced into the sex slavery rings in the government-sponsored mind and behavioral control programs. One of those kids is a man named Paul Bonacci, who claims to have participated in the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh and says he was forced to be the first person to molest Johnny. Bonacci has long claimed to be part of the vast network of children trained to work for the government and participate in deviant sexual acts to make the blackmail of politicians possible. In 1999, Bonacci won a $1 million lawsuit against Larry King, the former head of the Franklin Credit Union in Nebraska, whom he claimed forced him into the pedophile ring. The federal judge ruled Bonacci was truthful in his testimony, which included that he was one of several young male prostitutes known to have toured the White House in the 1980s. Gunderson claims that Bonacci is not his source for the Gannon is Gosh claim, but adds that Bonacci informed him a while back that Gosh had changed his appearance. John DeCamp, author of the Franklin cover-up, says Bonacci told him the same thing. Yeah, we have multiple people corroborating this testimony here. I do know that Johnny Gosh altered his appearance and the changes I've heard about conform to how Gannon looks now, he says. Paul told me you could be standing right next to him and not know it's Johnny. But here's the thing, though. Gannon does look exactly like Johnny, though. And he says that Gannon has been asked the questions but he refuses to answer one way or another. A fellow in New York City went to his door and asked him about his mother in Iowa. And he... Wait, 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 wait. Wait, what? Gannon's mother's from Iowa? Or she's not, and the reporter just phrased it that way, as if it's Noreen Gosh. A fellow in New York City went to his door, asked him about his mother in Iowa, and he slammed the door on him. He says he wouldn't talk about it at all. A mother's instinct. Noreen Gosh has seen the videotape that Gunderson made with his confidential informant and believes the man is credible. Ted sent me a videotape of his interview with his source and he said Gannon is Gosh. And he said it without hesitation, without blinking an eye, recalls Noreen, and he's, he said he's known it for months. When the theory was first proposed, Noreen's phone was ringing every 15 minutes from calls from bloggers, investigators, and radio and TV stations, all asking if she would identify Gannon as her son. She has not done so. She sat with numerous photos from the internet and compared them to those of Johnny herself and John Gosh Sr. looking for similar features. I could see some of the similarities that the bloggers were talking about, she says. I could see in Gannon the features that Johnny had. And the last time I saw Paul Bonacci, he told me that Johnny had changed his entire appearance again. That he shaved his head and is going with that look for now. Okay, so apparently Bonacci told so Bonacci told Noreen before Gannon Gate that he had shaved his head and went with a different look, and this is corroborated by multiple other people, like DeCamp and Gunderson. So before Jeff Gannon was even a thing, Paul Bonacci said he went with, he he shaved his head and he has a different look. I mean that's curious. Again, that doesn't prove it's Gannon, but it's curious. She says the birthmark on Johnny's chest is very similar to a mark seen on Gannon's chest in at least one photo. She also points that Gannon has a spot on his right cheek in the same place as Johnny. Sometimes she's almost convinced, but it's, it's not quite enough, and she just can't or won't say for sure that Gannon is her son. People have asked me why can't I recognize him if I saw him in 97, and I tell them a picture from the internet is a lot different than someone sitting in your kitchen, she says. Noreen claims that Johnny visited her at his West Des Moines apartment in 97, but told her he could not come out of hiding because his life and hers would be put in grave danger. But what about her gut feeling, her maternal instinct? Honestly, it changes, she says. Sometimes I think, oh yeah, that looks like him, and other times the jump is too much to think about it. When you factor in the facts, it's hard to believe. I've spent a lot of sleepless nights over this. I really wish I could say for sure. So here's the thing. Those claiming Noreen is just out for attention or whatever, she seems to be honest about everything. I mean, just dissecting all her statements. Again, in the previous episode, we went over a lot of them. So, I mean, it seems like she's honest. And is the reason why her maternal instinct is changing is because of the split personalities and all of the mind control. I mean, again, I don't know how that would factor into instinct, but if she's seeing this Gannon guy and, and he's so different from her actual son, 
but then maybe other times he's not, or there's flickers. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is all very, very mind-shocking. But Noreen is no fool. She knows the risk of saying one way or the other if she thinks this is her son. If it is, and he's chosen not to say anything, she understands that he has his reasons for his secrecy, and that are likely life-threatening, and her outing him could very well put him at risk. If she were to claim Ganon is Johnny and is proven wrong later, then any amount of credibility she has left would go out the window. Even if he, Ganon, admitted to it, I would still want a DNA test done, she says. This is so surreal, it's like I'm on the outside looking in. Almost 23 years have passed and we know he's still alive, but to potentially have your loved one found is just unreal. If this would turn out to be Johnny, it would be a blessing for everyone to know what happened and have it all wrapped up. Subliminal hints. That is unlikely to happen anytime soon. Despite millions of words devoted to the subject on the web and investigations being conducted by hundreds of internet detectives, Gannon has not acknowledged the speculation. Despite this, some say that Gannon has been providing clues to his real identity on his webpage, jeffgannon.com, which is still active. Uh, no longer, but at the time. Shortly after the theory was presented, Gannon posted an article titled, Hiding in Plain Sight. Wait, wait, wait. He posted it after the theory was presented? Huh. And posted a column entitled Fear and Loathing in the Press Room, which some suggest is a reference to the recently deceased Hunter S. Thompson, who also was accused of involvement in pedophile child slavery in the 1980s. Wow. Oh, man. And the connection to Bonacci's claim about the snuff film of Bohemian Grove. I mean, this is a lot of coincidences here. I mean, it's a lot. Others suggest that his name itself is a clue to his real identity. Both Jeff Gannon and James Guckert share the same initials as Johnny Gosh. Furthermore, shortly after Johnny's disappearance, Noreen made a personal plea to the editor of the Des Moines Register, Johnny's employer. The editor printed her letter in the paper and mocked it by allowing the police department to dissect it. The editor's name was James Gannon. Is this all too mind-shocking for people? I would say those are subliminal messages, says Gunderson, an attempt on Gannon's part to let slip his identity. Jim Rothstein, a retired New York police detective who spent more than 35 years on the force, much of it investigating child slavery and pedophile rings, agrees that the evidence is strong that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh. To me, Gannon looks like Johnny, says Rothstein. Everything just fits. The profile, the MO, everything. Rothstein has been involved as a private investigator on the Gosh case for the past several years, and he is working to get the final proof needed to determine Gannon's true identity. We're working on getting a tail on him and getting a DNA sample to test, he says. I still can't figure out why no one knows where he, Gannon, was for 10 years. Why would he announce that, like, in an article, that they're going to tail him and get a DNA test? Although, I mean, you know, I mean, how hard can that be to do? There have been some internet postings that gave a timeline of Gannon's life, but according to Rothstein, they are based on flimsy information that is not to be trusted. Records are easy to create. Maybe this guckered kid died and someone took over his identity. If it is not Johnny Gosh, then it is one of the other kids like Johnny Gosh. Noreen says if this is all true, I don't think he was ready to be exposed just yet. Hunter and Snuff Films. The Gannon Gosh connection was first made public in the early morning, February 20th. Later the same day, Hunter S. Thompson was found dead in his home, the victim of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot. Few people would ever thought to connect Thompson and Gosh, but those familiar with the tales of child abuse and pedophilia documented in the Franklin Cover-Up, a book first released in 1994 by former Nebraska State Senator John DeCamp, understand the association. In his book, DeCamp relates many interviews and discussions with Paul Bonacci, the man who claims to have been involved with the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh. Bonacci told horrific tales of being forced into sex with adults and other children. In one case, he recalls being flown into Nevada with another young boy whom he did not know. They took on another passenger there and headed to a secluded location where Bonacci says he was forced to have sex with a younger boy. The young boy, Bonacci claims in his book, was also forced to have sex with adult males, and then they killed the boy with a gunshot to the head. Bonacci says he was then forced to have sex with the corpse. The passenger they took on in Nevada filmed the entire thing, 
and Bonacci recalled that his name was Hunter Thompson. I think it's kind of strange that Hunter Thompson would commit suicide at this time, says Gunderson. Several kids told us that he directed snuff films. I think it's a strong possibility that he was murdered, and I strongly suspect that it's all connected. That's, in, that's an interesting statement from Ted Gunderson as well, because if other people have been blowing the whistle on Thompson for quite some time, you would think if he was going to commit suicide over the first instance, he would have, or the second or the third or whatever. But now, as soon as there's a gosh Gannon connection, now he chooses to do it. I mean, it could be unrelated again, but it's just a coincidence here. And the speculation on the internet has been that Thompson was either killed to prevent his coming forward or that he killed himself because he feared his role as a director of child snuff films would be proven true. The camp also expressed some surprise at the timing of Thompson's death and says he still believes Bonacci's claim is true. Stevenson, the blogger from Seattle who has investigated the Gosh case, is also suspicious. I wonder, did he know? In light of Paul Bonacci's testimony regarding the snuff film, I submit he knew quite a bit, he says. The timing of his death was interesting. The snuff film that Thompson allegedly made with Paul Bonacci is believed, based on Bonacci's description of the surroundings, to have been filmed at Bohemian Grove, a summer camp of sorts for the rich and powerful. Bohemian Grove is a secluded area outside Sacramento, California, IA, where world leaders and dignitaries meet annually for a retreat that involves neo-pagan activities, including mock human sacrifices, or allegedly mock, made before a large owl statue referred to as Moloch. While conducting the ritual, which they call the cremation of care, participants are dressed in druid robes and chant and sing before Moloch. Information on these gatherings has been known for some time, although video footage has only been leaked out of the site, only recently been leaked out of the site. The site is very secure and access available only to a handful of people worldwide. As a child, Bonacci could never have had access to the site, but he described it accurately, including the large owl statue. I mean, that is so damning. All right, here's another mind shock. Noreen Gosh says that on one recent evening, her website, johnnygosh.com, had more than 50 hits that came from within a 10-mile radius of Bohemian Grove. So keep in mind, Sacramento is over 100 miles from, Bo from Bohemian Grove. San Francisco is 75 miles. And Santa Rosa is over twenty miles. That might be the that might be the the biggest city. I think someone local to that area of Bohemian Grove can chime in here. But so there don't appear to be any big cities. So this is pretty much the middle of nowhere retreat, or with just small towns or cities, really small within a ten mile radius of Bohemian Grove. So these are not people from major cities looking up JohnnyGosh.com. These are more than 50 hits from a 10-mile radius of Bohemian Grove out in the woods. What does that mean? I don't know. What do all the coincidence theorists think about that? The CIA pedophile. In her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, Noreen Gosh writes about a man who contacted her just six months after Johnny's disappearance, claiming he worked with a government agency that was investigating pedophile organizations. George Paul Bishop, often known as just Paul Bishop, claimed he was a CIA asset and arrived in Des Moines in July 84 to offer his assistance to the Goshes. Before he left, he provided, through his investigation, a detailed map of the kidnapping scene. Bishop, according to Noreen's book, often called the Gosh home from the Washington, D.C. office of Senator Charles Grassley, with whom Noreen had worked on Johnny's case. Many times, Paul Bishop would call me from Senator Grassley's office, and when he finished speaking with me, he would hand the phone to one of Grassley's aides, who I was familiar with, Noreen recalled in her book published in 2000. That convinced me Paul was an accepted visitor on the Hill in Washington. Based on this, Noreen believed that Bishop was responsible for securing her invitation to testify before Senator Arlen Specter's hearing on organized crime and its relationship to kidnapping at the U.S. Capitol. Bishop, in fact, picked Noreen up from her D.C. hotel and accompanied her to the hearings. Bishop became close to Noreen, even referring to her as mom. What? But suddenly, in 1985, he disappeared from the scene. The phone number he'd left was no longer valid, and no one knew how to contact him. 
No one had seen or heard from him in almost 20 years until he was suddenly arrested on February 4th of this year in Virginia after police allegedly found an explicit video of a 16-year-old boy in his home. Detectives searched Bishop's home and found the tape after receiving a complaint that he was allowing teenage boys to drink and use drugs on the premises. Noreen wonders now if Bishop was on the wrong side of Johnny's case all along. Was he involved in the kidnapping and merely running a smokescreen at the time to prevent discovery? Was his recent arrest an effort to keep him quiet about the larger story a threat? So this is all from the unfolding of, the, of, of Gannon possibly being gosh. This is weird. Or was he honest from the beginning and his, arre his recent arrest merely an effort to discredit him before he reappeared and started making noise and threatening to expose the powerful people involved? Either way, Bishop seemed to know a lot about Johnny's disappearance in 1982 and his sudden appearance on the scene coinciding with the outing of Jeff Gannon and the death of Thompson and the arrest of another man involved with the case below is too much of a coincidence for some to accept. It's very common to set someone up and arrest him to discredit him, says Rothstein. The Photographer Okay, so here's going to be the Paul Bishop aside, because we touched upon him in the first one or two episodes, and some believe he's he was working for the CIA. Very, very shady. So let's go a little deeper into George Paul Bishop here. This is from johnnygoshtruth.blogspot.com, January 4, 2009, uncovering the Johnny Gosh case. Meet George Paul Bishop, a convicted and currently incarcerated 49-year-old pedophile in Fairfax Adult Detention Center located in Virginia. Arrested on August 19, 2005 for child pornography, he was due for release in March 2008, but was apparently incarcerated again for not registering as a sex offender. He is listed as violent. Most people know him as Paul Bishop, a profound figure central to the early investigation into the disappearance of Johnny Gosh. Noreen Gosh says within six months of Johnny's disappearance, September 5, 1982, a young man named Paul Bishop had contacted her, arrived in Des Moines, Iowa, and claimed he was a CIA asset, reachable via a phone number connected to Langley Air Force Base. And how often in missing persons cases does a CIA asset with a Langley Air Force Base phone number come to assist the family? Wow. Is he connected to... Uh, Aqu Michael Aquino, the uh, the Air Force individual, w who the, the self-admitted Satanist, the open Satanist who was allegedly involved in human trafficking, and was this an attempt to keep close tabs on the investigation? Most notably, Paul had informed Noreen Gosh of an agency acknowledged pedophile ring he claimed had kidnapped her son Johnny Gosh and then drew her a detailed map supposedly outlining the planned kidnapping in question. According to Noreen Gosh, Paul Bishop was also the instrumental figure in securing her trip to Washington, D.C. for the purpose of testifying before Congress about her son's case for Senator Arlen Specter, as well as personally accompanying her with two unknown men to the U.S. Capitol building. Or is, was Paul Bishop the good guy here? And was he going rogue against these criminal elements of the government against their knowledge? in order to expose all of this? And if so, was he framed for all of these crimes to discredit him? But anyway, continuing on here, after the disappearance of local newspaper boy Eugene Martin in 1984, Paul Bishop had informed Noreen Gosh that a local PI in contact with her, Sam Soda, was in the West Des Moines area and somehow involved with the kidnapping. So allegedly here, Paul Bishop is the one who first told Noreen Gosh that Sam Soda it might be involved. Apparently, Sam Soda held a high distrust and suspicion of Paul, Bish from the, Paul Bishop from the beginning, and Noreen Gosh claims there's an audio tape brought to law enforcement, she claims they simply refuse to listen to it, of Sam Soda warning of an impending second kidnapping in Des Moines shortly before Eugene Martin disappeared. As a side note, there is exactly zero evidence of the existence of such a tape. I mean, is there, wasn't there one officer who said he listened to it? Since then, Noreen Gosh has claimed Paul Bonacci, like after the fact or something. Since then, Noreen Gosh has claimed Paul Bonacci positively identified Sam Soda as being involved in photographing Johnny Gosh shortly before his kidnapping. 
And again, was that a man and a woman who were both photographing him? After Paul Bishop had told Noreen Gosh that Sam Soda was involved in the disappearance of Eugene Martin, Noreen claimed Sam was instrumental in subpoenaing Paul Bishop to testify to a federal grand jury hearing about his whereabouts and activities in Des Moines. This comes after Paul Bishop supposedly visits Sam Soda's office, where he is promptly kicked out. Okay, so this possible CIA asset with an Air Force, uh, Langley Air Force Base phone number, he went, he actually went to Sam Soda's office and Sam Soda kicked him out. And is Sam Soda, like, what's Sam Soda connected to? Because if he's involved in this ring, I mean, who's the good guy here? Or are they both the bad guy? Noreen further claims that she had questioned Paul Bishop after he had taken a taxi to her home in West Des Moines interrupted by Sam Soda's phone calls demanding to know where Bishop was. And then Noreen organizes Paul's overnight stay at a friend's residence. So Sam Soda is calling Noreen demanding to know where Paul Bishop is. And why is Sam Soda not afraid of this possible CIA asset? It's like he's trying to track him down. After he had supposedly traveled back to D.C. two days later, apparently under the false identity Robert Levesque, she had received two calls from him and has since never heard from him again. Lastly, she claims the phone number Paul Bishop had given her to Langley Air Force Base was no longer valid. So wait a second, it was valid initially? So what happened to George Paul Bishop since then? Okay, wait a second. So trying to dissect the timeline here. So Paul Bishop, highly involved, then Paul Bishop visits Sam Soda, apparently gets kicked out, then Sam Soda calls Noreen Gosh at home demanding to know where Bishop is. Then Bishop goes back to D.C. allegedly, calls Noreen Gosh two more times, then disappears forever. This is weird. Police arrest two on child porn charges by Matthew Perrone. A complaint about excessive comings and goings of teenage boys at a Chantilly house led this week to the arrest of two Fairfax County men for child pornography offenses, Richard Evans of Annandale and George Bushop of Chantilly, who's co who co-manage a literary website, were both arrested by Fairfax County Police on Friday, January 28th. Police started investigating Bishop 46 after they received a complaint that he was allegedly inviting teenage boys to come to his house to drink alcohol and to take illegal narcotics. On January 7th, Detective Peter Charles of the Fairfax County Police Department served Bishop with a search warrant at his home in Chantilly. According to the warrant, in their search, Charles and other officers seized computer hard drives, letters, pictures, and a videotape showing a young man posing nude while dressed in bondage gear. Police identified the young man in the video as a 16-year-old resident of Sen Centerville. Bishop appeared in the video with another older man who was bald and a long, bushy white beard. After examining emails that refer to a man who looks a lot like Merlin, police identified Richard Wendell Evans, 66, as the second man in the video. When police searched Evans' home in Annandale, they found various sex toys, sex toys digital cameras, and a leather hat and vest. According to the search warrant f following his arrest, Bishop told officers that he and Evans were co-creators of the website DeweyWriter.com. Bishop was actually working on the website when police came to his house on January 7th. The search warrant described DeweyWriter.com as primarily a literary website with online books posted by authors with names like Dewey, Graham, Ryan Keith, Sterling, Grasshopper, and Carolina Shribbler. One of the books by Dewey is titled For the Love of Pete and bears a dedication in its middle chapters. The author writes, I'd like to dedicate this chapter to all the boys out there who were never allowed to be children when they were kids. May you find the child in you long before I found the child in me. What the heck? Was, was Paul Bishop possibly a trafficked kid himself earlier? And he wanted to blow the whistle on this? So he was some kind of an asset by this criminal organization, possibly in the CIA. And then he wants to blow the whistle on all this because that was him. And that's why he was so... Uh, connected to the Johnny Gosh case. As of February 1st, the website had more than 270,000 hits and featured links to several chat rooms. Both men were released the day of their arrests. Bishop, who was charged with six counts of possession of child pornography and two counts of manufacturing child pornography, was released on an $8,000 bond. Evans was charged with one count of manufacturing child pornography and was released on a $2,500 bond. This is from Times Community Newspapers 2007. Okay, so Bishop pleads guilty to producing and possessing by Bonnie Hobbs. Thursday, June 30th, 2005. After being indicted by the grand jury in May, 
A Chantilly man pled guilty as charged Monday morning in Fairfax County Circuit Court. He is George Paul Bishop, 46. Do you fully understand the nature of the charges against you today? Asked Judge Leslie Alden. Yes, Your Honor, replied Bishop. Are you entering your pleas of guilt because you are guilty of these charges? She asked. Again, he replied affirmatively. Hmm. So, okay, so if he's not guilty, would he just say he is because he knows they're going to kill him if he doesn't? Is that, I mean, is, is that what some people allege? Hmm. And Evans pled guilty as well. Okay, and there's just a bunch more articles here. So in this August 26, 2005 article, so Bishop sentenced Friday three years in prison. The parents of one of his victims testified against him. So this is mostly concerning the tape and video he made of a teenage boy in bondage gear. The parents testified whose son alerted the police to what was going on. Okay. So, okay, something weird's going on here. This is a troubling case, said Mooney. Look at the pre-sentencing investigation and what the defendant says about his account of what happened. He wants the court to believe the minor was dressed up as a male slave because he wanted to dress that way for Halloween. He says it was consensual, and he was just being a nice guy and providing the outfit and the environment. He denies giving minors drugs and alcohol and takes no responsibility for it, she continues. And he says making the tape was stupid and a simple mistake. He was 46 and he has prior criminal convictions. He'd be more believable if he didn't have them. Mooney revealed that in 88, Bishop had two felony convictions in California IA for oral copulation with a minor, plus an assault conviction in Fairfax County after he lifted a 12-year-old paper boy's shirt and kissed his stomach. What? A paper boy? So in eight, this is in 1988, in the 80s. What? This is really weird with Paul Bishop here. So if that's all true and all these previous offenses are true, that does not look good for Bishop. So here's a quote from, uh, from Bishop. Bishop stood, said he regretted the three charges and had, had pled guilty to them. Quote, I am not a predator or a pedophile, he said. I don't have a proclivity for 17-year-olds. When I had a problem 20 years ago, I resolved it. Then I don't feel I'm a threat to the community. So is he basically admitting his previous problem here while he was assisting in the Gosh case? What is going on here? What? I mean, this gets even worse. So P Paul Bishop was also arrested between September 84 and September 85 in Alexandria, Virginia for having sex with a 12-year-old boy at an Oakwood ap apartment complex. Soon after, he fled to California, but returned to Virginia after charges were filed against him there, before disappearing again up to his arrest and incarceration in 2005. So wait a second. So he's a possible CIA asset while assist... Okay, so he this was before that. September 84, he was arrested? Between 80... When was he assisting with the Gosh case? Like, so this is really weird. So again, from the blog here, let's summarize what's going on here. A longtime pedophile and child pornographer, George Paul Bishop, approaches Noreen Gosh shortly after her son's kidnapping to inform her he is a CIA asset. And how is he in this? How is he in this uh, office in D.C.? Like, what the heck's going on here? And has information about an underground network conspiracy that has kidnapped Johnny Gosh. According to Noreen. He is supposed he supposedly can be contacted at a phone number traced to Langley and organized her testimony to a congressional hearing about her son's case in DC. What is rarely mentioned was that George Paul Bishop was a child molester and admitted pedophile during all of this, associating with other pedophiles like Richard Evans who had a record of aggravated sexual assault toward a minor in 1984 up to producing child pornography of his victims in 2005. What do the disturbing latter facts have to do with Noreen Gosh. Apparently, Noreen and her camp aren't shy at all about endorsing George Paul Bishop as a heroic whistleblower of sorts, a CIA asset which provided facts that they claim proved true in their ensuing private investigations into the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh. How do they answer George Paul Bishop's obvious record of child molestation, pedophilia, and child pornography charges since the 80s? They don't, or sometimes they claim it's some kind of CIA operation frame-up. All right, here's the thing, though. Let's say it's not a frame-up, because if Bishop is part of, was also one of these kidnapped children, so he has all these mental issues, and he is guilty of all of this, of just repeating these cycles, 
does that and, and, and it maybe possibly also has multiple personality dis- disorders like like Bonacci does like because Bonacci again guilty of all these things he said he was I mean is this yeah th- this is actually kind of crazy because is that the case where he is a self-admittedly guilty of all these things due to what happened to him and he's still trying to help and blow the whistle similar to Bonacci I mean is that true all right, so that's what we have on Bishop. Now let's go back to the previous article. So Bishop, just the timeline here regarded Gannon might be gosh, Thompson. Now we're moving on here to the photographer. Rusty Nelson claimed that he once turned down an offer of $50,000 from Hunter S. Thompson to help in the production of a snuff film. The offer was allegedly made because Nelson worked closely with Larry King, the central figure in the Franklin cover-up, accused of running a pedophile and child slavery ring. Nelson would often accompany King to elaborate parties where he worked as a photographer, taking photos of high-profile individuals in compromising positions with young boys and girls. Nelson testified in court that he participated as a photographer, but claims that he took compromising photos he never took any hardcore pornographic pictures, that he absolutely refused any involvement with child pornography. But he claims that King employed a Nelson look-alike for this purpose in order to compromise the powerful people in the photos and Nelson himself. What? Nelson has admitted taking tens of thousands of photos, many of which have been confiscated and either destroyed or permanently sealed to protect those depicted. But many, according to some reports, remain hidden. Despite his denials, Nelson has served time for his photography work. Having been arrested in Oregon years ago with a van full of photos, at least one of which was said to involve a minor engaged in less than legal activity. He's been living in Nebraska for some time, providing what information he can to PIs and trying to put his life back together. More recently, he was working with a friend to open a studio that specializes in wedding photography. But two days after Thompson's death, Nelson was rounded up by police and arrested reportedly for failing to register as a sex offender in a county of which he was no longer a resident. John DeCamp bailed Nelson out of jail and says he thinks the arrest was intended as a warning to him and others that they best keep their mouths shut. Others agree. The timing is interesting, says Stevenson, especially given Thompson's death and Paul Bishop's recent arrest. I would place a suicide watch on both men. I think there's fixin' to be a heap of manure hitting the air circulating device soon, he said. I wonder about the timing. I've been wondering why all of these people have all of a sudden come out of the woodwork. I wonder if there is a purge going on. I don't think injustice ever leaves the public consciousness. I think there is far more going on here than we know. So why now, after all this time, why the activity and renewed interest in the Johnny Gosh case and tales of child abduction, slavery, and prostitution in general? Did the theory that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh hit too close to home and threaten to expose those with secrets to keep? One suggestion is that increased media attention has the players in the decades-old scandal getting jumpy and looking to protect themselves. Nick Bryant, the man who confronted Gannon at his home and asked him about Johnny Gotch, has apparently been working on this story for several years and has been shopping the finished product around for a publisher. Rothstein says he's been working with Bryant for at least three years and that Bryant was originally commissioned to do the story for Rolling Stone, which has since turned the finish piece down. The New York Times and several other outlets have reportedly shown interest in the story recently as well. Bryant declined to comment either on the Gannon situation or his involvement in writing a story. But Rothstein says that Bryant began showing the piece around the players involved have once again become active. Something is cooking here now, he says. They'll have to throw someone to the wolves, but there's no telling how high it will go. Everyone involved in the story acknowledges that it sounds like a wacky conspiracy theory, but the evidence of the conspiracy is too vast, they say, to simply dismiss it. It's, I'm a conspiracy realist, because there is conspiracy out there, says Gunderson, who says just two weeks ago he was chased through his neighborhood by an unknown man with a gun. What? Adds Rothstein, if two people were involved in kidnapping that kid, then it's a conspiracy. Well, these people don't work alone, so it's a conspiracy. Then try to discredit you by calling you a conspiracy theorist. Damn right I'm a conspiracy theorist, because that's what it is. Still, in the end, this is a story about a young boy stolen from his home and family. This simple tragedy is often lost in the complicated theories and conjecture, but it remains the single undeniable truth in the entire story. I hold out hope that we'll be able to have regular communications with him, Noreen says of her son. 
We know he's alive, and up until a few years ago, we knew what he was doing and where. What? Nor Noreen said, we know he's alive, and up until a couple years ago, we knew what he was doing and where. Maybe he could keep in touch with his mom, but moving back to Des Moines to live a life here, those windows of opportunity have closed. I hear the horrible things people say about me. I can only imagine what they would say about him, given the things he's been through. Johnny knows I tried, and who's to say it's all over? We don't know yet. If this is it, we're in the final days, and this is going to all this is going to blow wide open. So that's curious. So Noreen said that up until a few years ago. So now keep in mind, this article is April 6, 2005. So she's stating up until a few years ago, she knew what he was doing and where. So apparently there was some kind of contact after the visit. Okay, let's take another step back. Now we're going to the Rents article, which referenced this article that we just went over. But continuing on here with Rents, the bottom line is this. There is enough credible evidence linking Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh for Noreen and her private investigators to insist on a DNA test. The credible evidence phase of this case has passed. It's now a case of obtaining conclusive evidence. To her credit, Noreen has always maintained that she didn't know beyond a shadow of a doubt if Gannon was or wasn't her son, Johnny. But she'd like to know. And I believe she deserves to know whichever way it turns out. So here's an interview with Noreen Gosh linked here. Also on Rent.com. I mean... Some more interesting details here, which are problematic. So Charlene Fossa, the author of the article I just went over on rents, is interviewing her here. So she asks, Is, isn't this the first time Jeff Gannon has publicly stated that he's not Johnny Gosh? Why now? So Michael Corbin here on the Closer Look Denver-based radio talk show stated that uh, Gannon denied, officially denied that he's Gosh, and offered to Noreen Gosh to take a DNA test. Developments will follow. So this is the interview in the aftermath here. Charlene, okay, so isn't this the first time Gannon has publicly stated that he's not Gosh? Why now? Noreen responds, I think Gannon needs to continue the publicity and is now coming forward on the DNA only to keep somewhat of a spotlight on himself. Charlene in response, even though you've always publicly maintained that you didn't know if Gannon was gosh, Gannon has threatened to sue you on three different occasions. Why? What types of contact have you had with Jeff Gannon? Noreen says, I have only had email communication with Gannon. He threatened to sue me because I have stated I do not know if Gannon is or is not Johnny. He claims that is throwing doubt into the minds of people who would otherwise say he is not Johnny. I would think he would want the DNA test, and if he is not Johnny, then state it publicly and be done with it. Charlene says, I understand there are some unique physical characteristics that Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh share. What are they? There are many facial features and the basic structure of his face, which are similar to Johnny. The color of his eyes and reports of a birthmark on Gannon is the same as Johnny's. I have not seen the birthmark, however. So that was at the time of the interview. And then supposedly after she did see it and she said it was in the same spot. Charlene says, for many internet researchers and bloggers, they appear to be numerous reasons to suspect that Gannon and Gosh are the same person. For starters, the name Jeff Gannon seems to be related to Johnny Gosh in a twisted sort of way. Would you explain the name game and how it relates to other players and Johnny? Noreen states, it appears all of the aliases names Gannon has used that he has kept the same initials as Johnny. J-D-G. Oh, wow. We didn't even look at that before. So Johnny got, it's John David Gosh. And he's James D. D Guckert. What? So even the middle name has the same initial. Wow. So these games being played here, they're even worse than I thought. He's even got the same middle initial. Wow. Noreen continues here. Gannon also chose the last name of the Des Moines Register editor at the time Johnny was kidnapped. There just seems to be a replay constantly of Johnny's initials or clues that link Gannon to parts of Johnny's life. Charlene states, besides the physical attributions and JDG initials pattern, what other linkages, revelations between Gannon and Johnny may have compelled you and your team to propose a DNA test to be administered to Gannon in order to achieve closure on the Gannon-Gosh issue? Uh, 
Noreen states, there have been two informants who have stated Gannon and Johnny are one and the same person. For me, the only way that could possibly resolve is a DNA test. That is the reason my investigative team have asked for a DNA test. Charlene states, I understand you've verified that Johnny had plastic surgery about four years ago. And coincidentally, he also started shaving his head around the same time. Noreen states, yes. Long before Gannon surfaced, I had learned that Johnny had plastic surgery and bega begun to shave his head. So when Gannon did come on the scene, it was one more thing to consider. Charlene asks, not long ago in an internet radio interview, I heard Rusty Nelson, Larry King's ex-private pedophile ring photographer, speaking about, among other things, Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh. Unfortunately, Rusty Nelson's story is beyond the scope of this interview. Suffice to say... In order to survive and out of sheer desperation, Rusty managed to escape from Larry King's clutches and is currently on the lam. Naturally, having been King's private photographer, Nelson knew Johnny. During the interview, Nelson offered his opinion on whether or not he thought Johnny Gosh was Jeff Gannon. To paraphrase, he volunteered that he felt close to certain that they were one and the same person. He followed up with an anecdotal story about having serendip serendipitously bumped into Johnny Gosh several years at a farmer's market. I can't recall where. It seems to me that Rusty Nelson is qualified to speculate on the matter. Were you aware of his conjecture? Have you been in contact with Rusty Nelson? Okay, hold on a second here. Hold on a second here. So former FBI head Ted Gonderson believes 99% that Gannon is Gosh. DeCamp believes Gannon is gosh. Bonacci supposedly stated Gannon is gosh. There's another confidential source who stated definitively that Gannon is gosh. And now Rusty Nelson is stating that he bumped into gosh years ago, several years ago to Farmer's Market, and is also stating that Gannon is gosh. I mean, that's a lot of people with direct connections to the case. Some of the people who directly knew Johnny before, and, well, I mean, all of them, if you believe, Rusty Nelson and Bonacci, but, and this other guy. I mean, this is crazy. This is a lot of directly connected people stating they believe that Gannon is gosh. Wow, what does everybody make of that? So, continuing on with, with the interview here, have you been in contact with Rusty Nelson? Noreen states, I have been in contact with Rusty and have known him for years. He has shared a great deal of information with us and testified in federal court in 1999 as to all of these events. He told me nearly four years ago that he had seen Johnny at the farmer's market in a particular city, so she did not reveal which one here. Wow. Wow. Charlene states, as of, yet, as of late, you've been in contact with the Franklin kids. There are children from the Des Moines and Omaha area who were also abducted and MK ultra into Larry King's international elite controlled pedophile ring around the same time Johnny was. Some of these survivors are no doubt members of the original 83 children who came forward to testify about their horrific abuse in the Franklin case. Of course, like Johnny, these children are now approaching 40 years of age, but they are most likely developmentally arrested to greater or lesser degrees emotionally frozen at the age they were abducted and ritually traumatized. Can you share with us what these survivors, the, victim of King, the victims of King's pedophile ring, are telling you of their horrific ordeal and their feelings about the future? Noreen states, I have been in touch with a number of the Franklin kids. Many have shared information with me. They continue communication to this day. For a number of them, their lives have been broken as children who are victims of these crimes. It is true they are now all approaching 40 years of age. Many are fed up, angry about what happened to them and how their lives have been robbed. Some want to do something about it, and others are still very afraid for themselves and their loved ones. Charlene says, I believe that you said some of these survivors feel like they've been programmed to do something in the future, but they don't know what it is. It sounds like a group of sleeper Manchurian candidate cells that could be activated at any time for evil purposes, no doubt. Could you explain? Well, I mean, that's just when you think this case can't get any creepier. I mean, what the heck? Noreen states, it is a form of Venturian candidate. Many feel those kids are programmed to be accessed or triggered for some future use or a project. Charlene states, many of these kids knew Johnny. Do some of the Franklin kids you've been in contact with believe Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh? 
Wow. Who, who's ready for the response here? Who's ready for this response? Noreen states here, the majority of the Franklin kids I have been in contact with do believe Jeff Gannon is Johnny. Some say they have been in communication with him on a fairly regular basis. I would suspect this is done by email on computer rather than face-to-face -face meetings. Okay. All right. So we have former FBI head Ted Gunderson, investigator of many decades. He believes Gannon is gosh. We have this New York City detective who investigated child abductions and, and child trafficking and rings. He believes Gannon is gosh. DeCamp believes that Johnny Gosh is now Gannon. Bonacci supposedly stated that Gannon is Gosh. Rusty Nelson said that Gannon is Gosh. And now Noreen is stating here the majority of the Franklin kids she's in contact with believe that Gannon is is gosh wow charlene continues here on the johnny gosh foundation website you describe johnny as chameleon like others have also characterized him as chameleon like including some of the surviving franklin kids is it true that jeff gannon also described himself as chame chameleon like noreen stated th states throughout this investigation i have been trained as a private investigator I listen for these play on words. The reference to Johnny being a chameleon was given to me by, by seven of the Franklin kids I have known. I asked them why he was considered a chameleon. They all told me it was because Johnny was a master of disguise. Gannon then began referring to himself as the chameleon. I find that to be significant. Could it be a coincidence? Coincident? Or was it given by Gannon as some kind of a clue? Gannon has also stated he has hidden in plain sight. Interesting idea. I mean, yeah, the amount of clues here being given by Gannon, I mean, it's crazy. This is crazy. Because Gannon refers to him as the chameleon. Okay, Charlene states, and then there's that pesky DNA test Gannon's been dodging. Until now, maybe. It seems Gannon has a pattern of agreeing to submit to a DNA test only later to refuse for one reason or another. Also, most people probably aren't aware that Gannon has repeatedly stipulated various conditions that need to be met by your team as part of his agreeing to a DNA, te DNA test. Can you summarize the history of DNA negotiations with Gannon up to and including the current agreement? So Noreen states, in March 2005, shortly after this story broke about Gannon, I wrote to him by email three times to ask him to quietly agree to a DNA test to resolve the situation. Gannon did not answer my emails. We then sent a gentleman representing me to Gannon's home to talk with him. Gannon answered the door when the man asked him about a DNA and told he was there on behalf of the woman in Iowa, Gannon slammed the door on the man. We later were on a network TV show in which Gannon said he would take a DNA test only to later develop all kinds of stipulations. One, that the results should be kept private, no problem there. Two, that I would be required to make a statement saying he was not my son and sign documents agreeing not to ever mention his name in public. I mean, that's actually kind of curious because if it comes back positive, she would still be required to make a public statement saying he was not her son and sign these documents agreeing never to mention his name in public. That's an interesting uh, stipulation. Three, that Gannon would publicly make some declaration of spiritual support for me. Okay, that's weird. Four, finally, that Gannon go forward to be a national speaker for missing children. I mean, that's kind of, this is kind of weird, though, because, so she's directly involved in, uh, in NamUs and, and a lot of these organizations for missing children, and there's a stipulation that she would never be allowed to say his name, but that he would be a national speaker for missing children. Unless, again, he might just be playing games this entire time. So continuing on here, some of these conditions were absurd. To date, Gannon agreed to do the DNA on Michael Corbin's show and then 
has stalled once again. The DNA test is now in limbo for a while. Charlene asks, did Gannon ever ask to be paid for taking a DNA test? Noreen says, yes, at one time he stated he wanted to be paid big bucks for his DNA sample. I rejected that idea, but offered to pay for the actual test. Okay, so he wanted money for a sample, but not a test. So what does that mean? He provides a sample, which may or may not be his. Also, if Gannon has all these multiple personalities, is it possible he thinks he's not Johnny Gosh again, and he's speaking with Noreen that way? Even if he is, he thinks he's not. Charlene states, as I recall, your longtime PI, Mr. Rothstein, who is a retired New York City detective, is now in charge of the DNA negotiations and logistics with Jeff Gannon. If Gannon actually follows through and submits to a DNA test, I'm sure Rothstein will ensure every step of the procedure is carefully monitored. Call me paranoid, but I'd be suspicious of the results if there were any unsupervised gaps breaking the chain of evidence between be the blood being drawn and the DNA analysis. Even if the lab is reputable, elite sociopaths, the people behind Gannon, with unlimited power and money to burn, always seem to find a way to derail these well-intentioned truth-seeking investigations. I'm sure Mr. Rothstein is 20 steps ahead of me on this and has a plan in place to control as many variables as humanly possible so that Gannon's DNA test results will be bona fide. Can you comment? Noreen states that Jim Rothstein has arranged for a reliable lab to do the DNA test. We have advised Gannon of this. He, he has refused to give us the name of his attorney so we can com communicate with him to make arrangements. Charlene states, it seems obvious that Gannon is playing mind games with you regarding his willingness or lack thereof to take a DNA test. And as you've astutely surmised, this on-again, off-again DNA test scenario is free publicity for him. And I'm sure Gannon is more than capable of making good use of publicity, even if it's negative. On the other hand, if he is Johnny Gosh, taking a DNA test would undoubtedly put him in harm's way. Then again, this DNA volleyball could be part of an overall cynical strategy by Gannon and his handlers to keep the Gannon is Gosh story alive, but essentially take the energy out of it. The story continues, it limps along, but in a vapid state of limbo. This way, the character arc, the tension, and the climax of the story can be shifted to fit an agenda. Maybe this game is a backdoor approach for Gannon to gain control of the is Gannon really Gosh speculation frenzy. He knows the DNA ball will forever be in his court. If Gannon can keep the story focused at the level of a DNA test that he's never resolved, and if he can keep the public's attention focused on forensics, he's in control. And while he does his DNA dance, he can also threaten legal action against anyone who publicly wonders about the is Gannon really gosh riddle. It's a checkmate of sorts. Unless, of course, they just, you know, get his DNA from the trash. Charlene continues, a local media outlet in your region about a month ago, ran a piece on the internet site announcing that there's been significant breakthrough in the Johnny Gosh case. I think they described it as Johnny Gosh case is heating up, yet they never mentioned exactly what the breakthrough was, or I just plain missed it. However, did they mention something about the CIA and their alleged involvement in organized pedophilia? What happened to the CIA agent who had contacted you in order to help you crack the Johnny Gosh case years ago, and who was instrumental in your testifying before a congressional committee? What was the breakthrough in Johnny's case? The CIA, Noreen says, the CIA agent who resurfaced recently has brought information to Jim Rothstein, which is significant at this time. Jim shared a portion of it, which the Waterloo, Iowa TV station reported on. It was then circulated throughout the internet. He informed us that originally 1,700 children were targeted for this project. They, pedophile rings, set about kidnapping children throughout the country over a period of years. The number of usable children they ended up with was approximately 1,000. I filed a FOIA request and received a reply saying all records on Johnny's case with the CIA have vanished. Well, that doesn't sound suspicious at all. So this is kind of crazy, though. So supposedly there's uh, a CIA agent leaked info about 1,700 targeted children who were kidnapped throughout the country. This is crazy. Charlene states, after all these years, a fearful eyewitness finally came forward and detailed what really had happened to Johnny Gosh on the day he was kidnapped. He illuminated a crucial hidden aspect of Johnny's abduction. He knew Johnny wasn't a runaway. He had watched Johnny's abduction unfold from a window in the safety of his home. What's the significance of this new revelation after all these years? Could this new eyewitness reporter finally reopen the Johnny Gosh case? And we actually went over this testimony and the cover-up by Police Chief Orville Cooney. So I'm not going to go over all that again. Wow, this is crazy. Some more... Wow. 
So Charlene states, there's been some disturbing incidents and strange synchronistic events involving you and others who were or are connected to the Johnny Gosh case. Recently, there was your yearly Johnny Gosh update interview with a local radio host, a seasoned nine-year veteran who was subsequently fired. Not long after the update interview, a strange doll was delivered to your door, and then about two days later, you heard some distressing news on the radio about a man who had revealed to you important information about your local police chief and Johnny's kidnapping. Comments. Noreen stated, Marty Stacy, an Omaha radio talk show host, did an interview with me and Jim Rothstein. During the interview, we shared the information in, que in the question answer regarding the police chief being involved in the scandal. That's the Cooney. The following day, Marty was called in by his boss and fired. The reason given was the, go was the gosh Rothstein interview. The following morning, someone placed an anatomically correct blow-up nude sex doll with dark hair and a hole blown in the head at the door of my home. No one saw it being placed there. The police were called and I made a police report on the situation. We consider this to be a veiled threat towards me regarding the information that I gave during the interview. Charlene asks, how many and what types of other threats and or harassment have you experienced prior to the doll incident? Noreen states that over the years I've been followed, received threatening phone calls, had men come to my home and pound on the outside of my house, throw rocks at my home. My cars have been damaged. It has been a very nerve wracking situation and one has to wonder why would anyone harass the mother of a missing child just looking for her child? It is because there is much more to this crime and they are afraid I will uncover it and make it all public. Charlene asks, is there an official or unofficial body count related to the jo to Franklin Johnny Gosh case? Noreen states, the official body count for deaths in the Franklin Johnny case is now up to 15 deaths of witnesses and people who have come forward with information. All coincidental, probably. Charlene asks, from what you and your investigators have discovered, what have you determined about how organized pedophile rings function? For example, is it true that these rings hire professional photographers to surreptitiously photograph children and then compile these photos into catalogs so clients can choose their preferred victims? That's so creepy. Noreen stated, in August 84, I testified at a Senate hearing in Washington, D.C. It was an organized crime hearing regarding missing children. During the various testimony by myself and others, Ken Lanning of the FBI also testified. The FBI provided a catalog of materials confiscated by them during the arrest of pedophiles. There were instruction books on molesting children, torture devices, and a catalog of children who had not yet been kidnapped. A prospective buyer's guide. Another question here. Your testimony serves as an eloquent summary of the Johnny Gosh case and as a scathing indictment of government-sponsored pedophile operations. That's why I included it as part of the interview. My question, Noreen, is how did Michael Aquino specifically fit into the Johnny Gosh kidnapping? Noreen states, it was reported to me and given in federal court February 1999 by Paul Bonacci that Michael Aquino called the colonel, was in fact the man who came to Iowa, paid the kidnappers for taking Johnny, then took Johnny with him. This took place 14 days after the kidnapping. Bonacci stated this under oath in federal court. Judge Erbaum ruled Bonacci was telling the truth. Charlene asks, in your opinion, why did Judge Urban find Paul Bonacci and the overall evidence John DeCamp presented in the court so compelling? Noreen stated, it was very surprising to us that Judge Urban would allow this process to take place since he was the same judge that stated he thought Bonacci was nuts, not credible, and not telling the truth. He did an about face. Charlene asks, any clues, guesses as to why Judge Erbaum changed his mind so abruptly? You certainly found Bonacci credible. Why? Noreen states, I have no idea why Judge Erbaum changed his mind. It still baffles all of us, including DeCamp. Paul Bonacci's information, we have been able to research, verify, and prove the things he told us. This was done by a PI that DeCamp hired years ago in 89 through 2000. Charlene asks, could you connect the dots between brain wave frequencies codes multiple personality disorder and mk ultra as it relates to organized pedophilia noreen states the mind control works similar to hypnosis only much deeper levels the prog they program at alpha beta theta and beyond to omega level of brainwave frequency the desired instructions for later use during the training programming there is a technique whereby the victim is split and new personalities with identities are created for desired purposes they can be activated by a keyword a song or a verbal suggestion the mind control victim will then go into what i would call an automatic pilot situation and act out exactly what had been programmed in the individual. 
Charlene asks, was the program called Project Monarch? Didn't Bonacci's diary contain pages and pages of codes? Noreen stated, yes, it was called Project Monarch, and Bonacci had four or five diaries with coding in it, step-by-step -step instructions on constructing a bomb, etc., and an account of all of his abuses. Charlene states, Paul Bonacci won the case. Judge Erbom ruled that Lawrence E. King was to pay Paul Bonacci $1 million in damages. Although Mr. Bonacci has yet to collect a penny of this hard-won judgment, Paul Bonacci's court victory, especially what he conveyed about his role in the Johnny Gotch abduction, has given your investigation into Johnny's disappearance and organized pedophilia more credibility. You've been in, in touch off and on with Bonacci since 99. He's told you things about... Johnny's appearance, changes that Johnny had made to his person that are congruent with Jeff Gannon's appearance. What did he tell you when are you still in touch with him? Noreen stated, we are still periodically in touch with Minachi, but he has not made any reference to Gannon. He has stated he is in touch with Johnny, I believe, on a somewhat regular basis. From time to time, he would give me messages from Johnny. This was prior to Gannon appearing on the scene. Since Gannon Gate, there has been no more info on Johnny from Bonacci. That's curious as well. Although supposedly DeCamp said Bonacci told him that Gannon was gosh. Okay. So here is yet another strange coincidence. So the, the key witness in the Oakland County child murders, anyone want to guess the name? Jeff Gannon. Let's go to the Cinemaholic.com, Oakland County Child Killers case. Who is Jeff Gannon? Where is he now? By Kriti Marorta, December 25th, 2020. Investigation Discoveries Children of the Snow is a limited series that examines the horrifying string of homicides committed by the infamous Oakland County Child Killer. Between the winters of 76 and 77, four young kids, two boys, two girls, were abducted and slain in Oakland County, Michigan, with their bodies carefully laid to rest on the snow. Both the young males were sexually assaulted, whereas the females were left physically untouched. And of course, as Jeff Gannon's name is one of the most notable ones in the investigations for this case, he's been looked into as well. So this is in 70, between 76 and 77. Who is Jeff Gannon? According to a few reports, it seems like the anonymous tipster who became a common figure in the Oakland County child killer case does in fact have a name, Jeff Gannon. Whether or not even this is an alias, though, is yet to be confirmed. In 2010, he, under the name of Bob, gave an interview to the Oakland County Child Killer Task Force, wherein he claimed to know who the killer was, revealing that he had a relationship with him in 1977 as an acquaintance. As per Bob's account, there are many more victims of the child killer, and he committed all of these heinous crimes as some sort of satanic sacrifice. Bob further went on to ask the investigators if he could get information about their persons of interest and see the letter that had been mailed to them by the suspected child killer so that he could be sure that he had write the, the right man before he gave them a name. Bob's requests were denied, but he continued to meddle in the matter. Then he claimed to be an investigator who, with his team, spent over 10,000 hours over several years to examine the case. However, when asked to release his findings, he admitted that he was reluctant to do so as he doubted the competence of the Oakland officers. In 2012, Bob, with the help of Paul Hughes, an attorney representing a victim's mother, held several phone conferences intending to hand over the evidence he had accumulated. And in the end, he did so, but only to a select group of Detroit journalists. To preserve his anonymity, Bob insisted that none of the conversations be recorded. He declared that he had information linking at least a few more children to the unidentified serial killer and theorized that the perpetrator was killing so as to conduct Wiccan human sacrifices related to pagan celebrations and holidays or important dates in the lunar calendar. Where is Jeff Gannon slash Bob now? After Bob claimed that there were a total of approximately 11 to 16 victims of the Oakland County child killer, significantly more than the four that had been officially confirmed, he explained his reasoning behind it. He alleged that his team had found the other cases to be similar to the previous ones, that it was highly improbable for it to be a pure coincidence. And to be honest, his claims were seriously taken into consideration by the media, as he also said that he had worked within law enforcement in his lifetime, although he refused to reveal which division. As for who he is, or what he does, well, we're not too sure, especially as we no, have no idea what he looks like, or if Jeff Gannon is even his real name. After all, Paul Hughes himself admitted that he didn't know Bob's real identity. In fact, in all of the interviews he gave over the years, he also refused to reveal where Bob lived. All we know is in the end that all of Bob's claims were dismissed by the authorities because of lack of evidence, and that the families of the victims began feeling like Bob was trying to make a profit 
out of their ordeal. But did he actually, though? So here's a post to the, what we started with in the podcast, the whatever happened to the Jeff Gannon conspiracy on the, on the Reddit conspiracy sub. Commercial Work 3544 stated this a year ago. I just found something interesting while reading into the Oakland County child killer. I don't know if you're familiar, but it links to the pedo rings from the 70s and 80s in Ohio and Michigan and the Fox Island story. There is also a podcast called The Clown and the Candyman that puts it all together, but this is the first I've read about this Jeff Gannon, and in this story, and it was back in 2005, and he came from out of nowhere and tried to insert himself into this case. And if you were to believe the theory that Jeff Gannon may be Johnny Gosh, then I think this is the same Jeff Gannon. In 2005, an unidentified man who would later emerge to become a common figure in the case and has been referred to by the alias of Jeff was reminded of a relationship he had in 1977 with an acquaintance. In an interview given to Oakland County investigators in 2010, Jeff informed them of atypical observations and actions while driving and conversing with the acquaintance, such as taking him to buildings where satanic rituals were allegedly performed. The acquaintance navigated through the lesser-known routes associated with the case with ease. The acquaintance also spoke of details written in Allen's letter. Jeff requested information about the Allen letter to help confirm his suspicions, but was denied. In 2010, Jeff gave a recorded interview to Oakland County investigators and prosecutor Jessica Cooper to present evidence pertaining to the investigation. Jeff claimed to have tried to approach Cooper with his findings and to convince her to place the case under the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice. The department was already involved through the FBI and through resources such as VICAP database. Cooper dismissed his suggestions, and as there was no new evidence presented, his request to inspect the Allen letter was denied. Cooper described the interview as a rambling statement outlining a theory that the Oakland County child killer abductions and murders were related to pagan holidays, the lunar calendar, and Wiccan rituals. Jeff proceeded to correspond with Deborah Jarvis, the mother of victim Christine Mihalik. Wow, that sounds similar to Mihalovic, the Amy Mihalovic case, Christine Mihalik, Mihalich and investigative journalists such as Bill Proctor and Heather Catalo in 2010. He claimed that he was among a team of a dozen investigators involved with the case and could identify the perpetrator of the crimes, but refused to indicate which law enforcement division he worked for. Jeff claimed to have invested 10,000 hours into the investigation over several years, but was reluctant to release his results as he doubted the competence of Wayne and Oakland County investigators. In a press release email, Jeff indicated possible meddling by Cooper and other reasons as to why he had not made his investigation public. According to Paul Hughes, an attorney representing Jarvis, Jeff's investigation discovered the murderer. However, according to Hughes, Jeff refused to identify the culprit unless the authorities divulged crucial information which Jeff requested during the initial interviews in 2010. Jeff wanted to positively confirm the identity of a suspect using the police evidence before proceeding further. In 2012, Jeff presented his findings to a select group of Detroit journalists on Hughes' cell phone. To preserve his anonymity, he insisted that his phone interview with Hughes not be recorded. He theorized that the killers were conducting Wiccan human sacrifice rituals coinciding with pagan celebrations or the lunar calendar. According to Jeff, there was a total of approximately 11 to 16 victims, significantly more than the four officially confirmed victims. He claimed his team found a number of similarities among the cases that were highly unlikely to be purely coincidental. Who is Jeff Gannon? According to a few reports, it seems like the anonymous tipster who became a common figure in the Oakland County child killer case does in fact have a name, Jeff Gannon. Whether or not this is even an alias, though, is yet to be confirmed. In 2010, he, he under the name of Bob... Okay, so that's that just the excerpt here is from the Cinemaholic, which is uh, I've already gone over, and the claims were dismissed, of course, due to lack of evidence. And you know what's really weird? So the plot's going to thicken even further because a person of interest in the Oakland County child killer case was Archibald Edward Sloan, a child molester who victimized young boys in his neighborhood. So there was a witness who claimed to have seen... So the this is kind of weird here. So this is from wiki2.org on the Oakland County child killer. 
So hair samples found in Sloan's 1966 Pontiac Bonneville matched hair found on the bodies of King and Stebbins, but the hair was not from Sloan himself. I don't know what that means, but that's what's listed here. A witness claimed to have seen King being abducted by two men, one described as being in his late 20s, and the other described as bearing a strong resemblance to serial killer John Wayne Gacy, who was allegedly in Michigan around the time of the killings. So, you know, what's crazy, though, of course, is the Gacy Associates and all of that that I went over in the previous episodes, the Delta Project connected to the Johnny Gosh case. Okay, so actually, regarding Sloan, in 2019, Investigation Discovery did a uh, documentary. They stated, so, in 2012, New DNA Tech found that Sloan's car contained hair with the same mitochondrial profile as evidence found on the victims, but the hair itself is not Sloan. So somebody's hair, not Sloan's, that was found on the victims was found in his car. So that's the connection there to Sloan. But regarding Gacy, it doesn't end there with the coincidences. The final mind shock that we're going to finish here is that now Gannon and the subject of changing names was also involved in the John Wayne Gacy trial. Donita Ganzon, who happens to be 33 years of age. See, this is why people think that this case is a PSYOP. I mean, you have Freemasonry all over the place. But Donita uh, Ganzon testified here. That this is uh, Rockford, Illinois, Register Star, February 9th, 1980. Emotion ran high Friday during the third day of accused mass murder at John Wayne Gacy's trial with the testimony of a transsexual and a woman brought to court in a wheelchair. Transsexual Donita Ganzon, 33, said she had been living with Timothy O'Rourke, 20, when he disappeared during the fall of 77. He went out for cigarettes one night and never returned. She said his body was later pulled from the Illinois River near Morris. Ganzon sobbed as she identified a photo of O'Rourke and another of his tattooed arm. Ganzen's admission that she was a transsexual enabled the defense to imply O'Rourke was homosexual. So, another excerpt here. Gacy witness electrifies courtroom. The first week of John Wayne Gacy's murder trial has been spiced with grisly details, emotional testimony, and Friday, a witness who shocked most of those in the courtroom. Is it Miss Ganzon? Asked defense attorney Sam Amarant of witness Donita Ganzon, 33. Yes, Miss Ganzon, the witness said. What did your name used to be before you changed it to Donita? Don. How long have you been a female? Almost everyone in the courtroom gasped. Just moments before, people who had whispered how beautiful the dark-haired Filipino witness was, her long hair brushed against her shoulders, dressed in a white blouse and stylish plaid skirt, the petite witness was a striking picture. I'm in the process of being a woman, Ganzon said, anger building in her voice. When you met Tim, you weren't a woman. That's right. Have you had a sex change operation? No, I haven't. Then you're still a man. At that point, the prosecuting attorneys who had called Ganzon as a witness objected to continued questioning. Okay, kind of weird, but from the book, John Wayne Gacy, Defending a Monster, by Sam L. Amarante and Danny Broderick, what about Donita Gannon? Remember Donita Gannon? That's the little Asian registered nurse. Now, you think the state came out and told you that Miss Gannon was really Mr. Ganzen? Oh, no. No, they left that up to the defense. Let the defense lawyer be the bad guys. We'll put this little girl up there, say she's a registered nurse, talk about how much she misses Timothy O'Rourke, but don't say anything else. So then we have to get up and expose this poor person to the whole world. Why do we have to do that? Why do we have to look at the bad guys? Because we are concerned with the facts, the facts, the evidence. Talking about Miss Gannon, now here's a person who actually is having a sex change operation. She shouldn't have any fear, any worry, or anxiety about people thinking anything about her. Maybe she was intended to be that way. She was intended to be a female, so she's having a sex change operation. If that's what she wants to do, fine, but she should not have been afraid of it. She should not have to not want to say it on the stand. Okay. So, Ganzen changed his name to Gannon. That's an interesting thing to change one names to, especially with Gacy's connection to the Johnny Gosh case, or at least the Delta Project, which may or may not have overlapped. 
and other possible individuals involved in the ring who may or may not have been involved with Gacy. Now, obviously the coincidence stack is so stratospheric here that I'm going to have to just leave it at that for now. But this is, uh, is one dark case with so many coincidences. I mean, yeah, it's just the Mind Shock listeners can jump in here and let us know what they think about all these coincidences and everything else. Hope you guys found another edition of Mind Shock True Crime interesting and informative. If you want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Support the channel that way for access to exclusive streams and chats. Like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patreon do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, cold co- podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind leave them in the comment section this is bruce mcguire signing off catch you guys next time
if you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. You are listening to the Johnny Gosh series. This is episode 5, Why Des Moines? And we will discuss why Des Moines, Iowa, of all places in the United States, I mean, this is not one of the most popular cities. This is not one of the most populated cities. This is not a tourist destination. This is Des Moines, Iowa. Again, a lot of people probably don't even know what state Des Moines is in. This is not one of the foremost destinations in the U.S., not for business, not for pleasure, not for any kind of tourism. People from outside of the U.S. probably don't even know that Des Moines is a city in the United States. So that's actually one of the first things that struck me when I first started researching the Johnny Gosh case in depth. Obviously, I had heard about it years and years ago. But when I started the podcast, I was wondering, like, why is Des Moines such a hub for, for human and child trafficking? I mean, th there's so many other cities where, of course, it does take place. I mean, major cities, unfortunately, th there are a lot of people trafficked there. There's a lot of demand. But Des Moines, of all places, I mean, it does seem pretty weird. So we will go over why Des Moines, and there's actually answers that lie here that are so dark and sinister and tie in and actually give credence to a lot of these so-called conspiracy theories. I mean, simply corruption exposés also works, I suppose. Although coincidence theorists obviously would be too triggered to call them that. As always, if you find the podcast interesting and informative and want to help spread awareness about missing persons cases, missing children, and trafficking, human trafficking in general, one of the biggest problems in the world, however much attention it gets, it is simply not enough because the problem, it still persists while all of these uh, other issues get attention, and meanwhile, many children and adults are suffering in modern day slavery. So you can donate to our PayPal, just check the link in the description, help us get more content out to bring awareness to this and other cases with, of course, logic and reason at the forefront in the most comprehensive and exhaustive podcast series ever produced, going down every single rabbit hole, every single theory. You could also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube, support the channel that way. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co podcast request. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. Okay, so I'm going to go over an article from littlevillagemag.com to set the stage here on various different theories and then focus on Des Moines specifically and also what is going on in various time frames in Des Moines as well. So this was posted September 7th, 2022 by Emma McClatchy. 40 years after the Johnny Gosh disappearance, fear continues to fuel conspiracy theories in Iowa and beyond. On September 20th, 1984, President Ronald Reagan gave a speech in Cedar Rapids as part of his re-election campaign. In it, he advocated for slashing taxes and the simple values of faith, family, neighborhood, and good hard work, which he said are endemic to Iowa. Quote, Not so many decades ago, this land around here was open prairie, rugged, and unproductive. And then the pioneers began to settle here. Yankees, Germans, Swedes, Norwegians, and immigrants from many other nations, men and women as hardy as the land. He said, omitting the state's history of forced resettlement of Native peoples, racial segregation, and other less idyllic chapters. You can tell this article was written in 2022. As our economy grows, we'll need to go forward with the bedrock values that sustained the first Iowa settlers and that nourish us today. We must continue cracking down on crime. We say with no hesitation, yes, there are such things as right and wrong. And yes, for hardened criminals preying on our society, punishment must be swift and sure, end quote. 
The president name-checked Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin, Iowa paper boys that disappeared from the Des Moines area in the previous two years. We've pledged our full support in the search for these two boys. Despite the attention of President Reagan, the formation of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in 1984, FBI involvement, the hiring of PIs, five America's Most Wanted episodes on the gosh disappearance, countless news segments and editorials, hundreds of called-in leads, thousands of letters mailed to elected officials, hundreds of thousands of flyers and milk cartons distributed featuring the boys' faces, and a 2014 documentary on gosh. The case remains unsolved. With his speech, Reagan tapped into and perpetuated a feeling very real to Iowa's overwhelming white populace in the 1980s. Fear, fear of victimization, of invasion, of purity defiled. Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin epitomized boyhood innocence and vulnerability, writes historian Paul M. Renfro in his 2020 book, Stranger Danger, Family Values, Childhood, and the American Carceral State, which began its his history dissertation at the University of Iowa. Their disappearances symbolized not just physical losses, but also the losses of innocence, childhood whiteness, middle-classness, and Midwesternness. That can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Amid a new 24 hours news cycle and the birth of, a, of the creepy out-of-towner sex predator stereotype in the 80s and 90s, this fear coalesced into what sociologists and historians refer to as a moral panic, a particularly tenacious form of backlash to social progress. Racial equity, feminism, sexual liberation, LGBTQ visibility combined with rampant disinformation. Although to be fair, most people that are harmed are harmed by those they know, close to them, particularly females, but even young children, it's not necessarily an out-of-towner. Many, many cases, it is someone already in the neighborhood. The paper boys' names and faces, ubiquitous across Iowa and the nation, were used to pass legislation that continues to shape the U.S. justice system, popular culture, political movements, and notions of what and who are considered threats of the American way of life. Every president since Reagan has found ways to uphold and expand policies passed in the name of child safety, from mandatory sex offender registries to surveillance programs to laws restoring voter rights to formerly incarcerated citizens, that specifically exclude those convicted of sex crimes. That's kind of weird, though. I never got the whole voting thing. Like, who cares if they vote? <laughs> I mean, the Electoral College is going to do what they're going to do. But anyway, these laws are broadly popular with Americans, but given the low recidivism rates of sex offenders, Renfro notes, these daunting mechanisms and the culture of fear that enables them demand reevaluation. Forty years after her disappearance on September 5th, 1982, Johnny Gosh, in particular, remains at the center of conspiracy theories. True crime podcasters, populist politicians, and QAnon influencers have made a meal of the cold case, picking and choosing which wild explanation for the disappearance best suits their narrative, as opposed to mainstream media on the idiot box, because they definitely don't have narratives. (laughs) Coincidence theorists and authority worshiping cultists are so hilarious in their delusions. It's impossible to overstate the influence of Noreen Gosh, Johnny's mother, in fostering this misinformation ecosystem around her son. So when when clueless goofs accuse people of misinfo, that's misinfo if the if the accused is actually not perpetrating misinfo. I'm not gonna go into this long aside on the Alex Jones case, but Anybody that's, let's say, sued for misinfo or is fined for misinfo, if it turns out it wasn't misinfo, what happens then? Because <laughs> anybody who hasn't been asleep the past few years know that the cons- so-called conspiracy theorists, the critical thinkers, those who are scientifically skeptical of corrupt authorities with horrible track records of failure and fraud convictions, they've actually, they, their batting average is incredibly higher than the coincidence theorists and the authority-worshipping cultists who just take on blind faith whatever the corrupt on the idiot box say. Determined to keep Johnny's case in the public consciousness, Noreen is regarded as a tireless, dauntless hero by those frightened for their own children's safety or distrustful of authority. But Noreen, who is convinced her son is still alive, has also elevated sensational theories that muddy the waters between fact and speculation. 
I mean, how do you know if that muddles the waters if the case is unsolved? <laughs> Coincidence there is just so goofy. What I believe about the case seems to change every time I deep dive about it, wrote one Reddit user in the consistently active Johnny Gosh subreddit. Logically, I know that there was very little chance Johnny survived long after being abducted. I think it all goes back to Noreen. Either she should be institutionalized for the number of delusions and hallucinations she's had as a result of her grief, or she is truly onto something and owed a serious apology from those that never believed her. And if you've listened to the Mind Shock podcast, you will know that obviously there are certain claims of Noreen Gosh that have been as of yet unverified, but so many claims over the years, other parties have actually verified what she has said. So she's been vindicated almost at every turn. So again, I'm not saying she's, you know, she's reporting things or things she heard and she thinks they're true. She might say something that they're true, even if they're not. But in general, a lot of things that she had claimed, objective third parties have come out in the years since and corroborated what she was saying about the investigation. And there's no shortage of shady business. Usually authority worshiping cultists and coincidence theorists, they're really lazy, so they don't actually do their homework, they don't do the research, so they don't know the amount of evidence that exists, so they pretend it's just outlandish conspiracy theory. The disappearance. Johnny Gosh was 12 years old. He enjoyed the outdoors, the Iowa State Fair, and buying loved ones the perfect gift, his parents said. He took a job delivering newspapers for the Des Moines Register to save up for a dirt bike. Just before 6 a.m. on September 5th, 1982, Johnny departed his home in suburban West Des Moines to begin his Sunday morning paper route, accompanied by his dashund Gretchen. He collected his papers in the parking lot of a neighborhood church with fellow paper boys who said a man in a blue car stopped to ask the boys for directions. Witnesses disagreed on what happened next, according to Renfro. Some insist that a man followed Johnny around a street corner before snatching him, Others claim that they heard a car door slam and tires screech before watching a vehicle run a stop sign and travel northbound towards Interstate 235 at a high rate of speed. In addition to the blue vehicle, another witness recalled seeing a silver Ford Fairmont around the time of the disappearance. Yeah, it's almost like witnesses were in different positions at different times. I mean, what a shocker. <laughs> but there was little physical evidence to be found apart from Johnny's red wagon full of rolled up newspapers abandoned two blocks from home and Gretchen left behind. News coverage at the time reported 25 to 30 law enforcement officials joined a search for Johnny in the immediate hours after he vanished. Within, yeah, was that really true? Within days, dozens of officers from the West Des Moines Police Department, Polk County Sheriff's Department, and Iowa State Patrol were part of searches as well as an estimated 1,000 volunteers combing local parks, woods, fields, lots, and buildings. Police set up checkpoints on streets where Johnny was last seen. They are working overtime like I've never seen anybody in my life work before. Johnny's dad, John Gosh Sr., told the register in praise of the police. That's a curious statement. So for people that weren't skeptical of Johnny's dad, I mean, that's curious. Because neighbors are going to Noreen and stating that the police never even bothered to take notes on what they said they saw, and of course the heavily suppressed P.J. Smith account where he actually saw Johnny, or at least he said he did, what this would be alarming, getting pulled into a car. I mean, all mind-shocking information here. Very, very shocking. So the police could not have done a shoddier job, and yet John Gosh Sr. is telling the register that they're working overtime like I've never seen anybody in my life work before. That's a curious statement. The confidence wouldn't last. Okay, so was that just in right away? Hmm. The confidence wouldn't last. In TV appearances and letters to the editor, Noreen and John Gosh became critical of law enforcement's failure to locate either of the vehicles suspected in the abduction. Moreover, they resented being asked to submit to a polygraph test. But in, and was that resentment for different reasons? for John Sr. versus Noreen. But investigators said they had little to work with. Leads fizzled, and those coming in from callers across the nation proved bogus. There are stories about cops who wanted off this case so bad because they couldn't handle this woman. Retired Register reporter Frank Santiago told the filmmakers behind the documentary who took Johnny. Or was it for a different reason? Because we have many different accounts on the corrupt nature of the Des Moines Register and their downright despicable behavior 
regarding this missing child. West Des Moines police chief Orville Cooney made matters worse by antagonizing the Goshes in the press, specifically Johnny's mother. I really don't give a damn what Noreen Gosh has to say. He complained to the register. I really don't give a damn what she thinks. I'm interested in the boy and what we can do to find him. I'm kind of sick of her. See, what kind, even, even if those are the true feelings of a police chief, what kind of scumbag would say that to the actual newspaper? I mean, it takes a special kind of scum to publicly state that. Now, if he really felt, I mean, I mean, I don't know. How can you fault a mother? I mean, even if she's, I'm not saying Noreen is this, but in the case of a missing child, a mother going crazy and possibly being annoying, I mean, she's got every right to be. I mean, what kind of a police chief would hold that against a grieving mother in a panic for her child? I mean, this is a level of scum we haven't really seen before. Not to mention he's suppressed the account of the kid who saw Johnny being pulled into a car and pretended that Johnny just uh, ran away leaving his dog, which obviously no boy would ever leave his dog. I mean, this, I mean, I don't know if I can buy the incompetence theory. Unless Orville Cooney has a legitimate documented mental disability and possibly some kind of psychosis and split personality, in which case he would obviously not be qualified to be a police chief or even the janitor at the police station. You know, there's really no way to explain this other than evil. To Noreen, such pushback pre represented a lack of regard for Johnny system-wide, despite the fact multiple local, state, and federal agencies were investigating. You can almost become catatonic. You can almost go into a state of mind where you don't want to talk to anybody ever again, not trust anybody ever again, she told reporters. Noreen was never going to stay home crying into her handkerchief. Born and raised in eastern Iowa, she married young, lost her first husband to cancer and nearly lost her two oldest children when a tornado destroyed their home. That experience either makes you or breaks you, she says in Who Took Johnny. I had a choice. I either get up and start moving or go down in despair. Noreen showed a similar resolve after Johnny. Her son with John, her second husband, went missing. The Goshes papered Iowa with flyers, made dozens of TV appearances, and partnered up with politicians and national figures like John Walsh. When someone suggested to the Des Moines... Derry Anderson Erickson, that they help in the search, Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin became the first missing children's images printed on milk cartons in 1984. The Goshes encouraged the public to call their home number with information. Hundreds of tips poured in and were shared with authorities, though none could be verified as true sightings. Within two months of Johnny's disappearance, the Goshes established the Help Find Johnny Gosh Foundation, holding fundraisers to hire PIs, leading letter-writing campaigns to elected officials, and giving talks around the region focused on a central message. This can happen to you. And also, let's not forget Cooney and the scum police who told Mark Allen, Mark Allen's mother, the third boy who disappeared, that's not even mentioned in this article, which should tell you something. I mean, this boy's disappearance was swept under the rug because these scum didn't want people worried. They actually told his mother, Mark Allen's mother, not to make a stink about it. I mean, this is just insanity. Noreen Gosh didn't even know that Mark Allen went missing until quite a period of time afterwards because the scum police wanted the mother of this missing boy to just keep quiet and sweep it under the rug so the police don't look bad and nobody gets panicked. I mean, this level of scum, you don't see this in other cases. A sick and rotten society... FBI Special Agent Herb Hawkins said drawing intense publicity to the case, as the Gosh has had, is not generally adv advised. Too much attention can cause an abductor to panic, endangering the child. It can also make inside information that can be used to narrow down suspects part of the public narrative. Well, how so if it's not revealed? I mean, there's so many details that were held back. But the Goshes, who divorced in 93, had other advisors telling them the opposite. In a rare interview in 2018, John Gosh Sr. recalled that Kenneth Wooden, who had written extensively on missing and murdered children and lectured on the topic at Iowa State University in 81 and 82, told Noreen, whatever you have to do to keep the story alive, do it. Because if you don't, law enforcement will move on with their lives and go on their menu merry way. She really latched onto that, John told podcaster Sarah DeMeo. In her book, Noreen credits Wooden with setting her on the right course. 
Though there wasn't evidence Johnny was sexually abused, Wooden convinced Noreen her son had likely fallen victim to a class of deviants known as pedophiles. So hold on a second. There wasn't evidence? I mean, there's a lot of evidence of this going on at the register and, and people working at the register, and these are register paper boys, some of others who had been directly propositioned. I mean, there's propositioned and exploited and abused. So there's tons of evidence of it going on at the Des Moines Register. I mean, this is all public record with arrests and everything. I mean, this is really poorly researched article. I mean, what can you expect from a coincidence theorist and authority worshiping cultist? But still, I mean, very, very poorly researched here. Now, again, that doesn't mean that Johnny fell into it, but it makes it kind of likely considering what is known about the register. He believed pedophiles were seeking to change the culture and were gaining influence through organizations like NAMBLA, a barely existent group that never achieved notoriety outside of conspiracy theory circles and one memorable South Park episode. <laughs> I mean, they're being talked about now. I mean, and this article was written in 2022, also in the post-Epstein era. So it's kind of weird how, how, like, these authority-worshipping cultists, I mean, their, their cognitive distance is so extreme, they have to pretend, even in the post-Epstein era, that this is all outlandish and doesn't exist. Wooden taught Noreen how to write a press release and got her in touch with network TV producers, Noreen recalls in her 2000 memoir. He said, it might get rough. The public and press will doubt you, laugh at you, and try to discredit you, because the truth you will bring out will be difficult to accept. Wow, what prophetic words by this guy. Then he looked at me and said, are you willing to fight for your son? I agreed to do whatever was necessary. All Ken warned me about, and then some, was about to begin. And that's the thing, too. I mean, anybody with a brain, they know how society and uh, average individuals respond to anything that mentally disturbs them. I mean, the idea that these high-ranking politicians are involved in these trafficking rings, that's just disturbing to the mentally weak masses, the gullible. I mean, they just, it, it takes a certain amount of mental strength to even consider that a possibility, and they don't have it. So it's easier just to attack Noreen and pretend she's crazy than confront their own mental weakness and the truth of what might be happening in the world. Subsequent disappearances seem to support the notion of a child kidnapping epidemic. Almost two years after Gosh went missing, another register paper boy, what a coincidence, 13-year-old Des Moines resident Eugene Martin vanished as well, followed two years later by the disappearance of another Des Moines 13-year-old Mark Allen. Okay, they finally mentioned him this far into the article. Allen was not a paper boy, but the circumstances were similar to the others. Still, investigators had no physical evidence tying the cases together, no serious suspects, and no idea of the motives. But again, I mean, it's just inexcusable how, they, how the police basically intimidated Mark Allen's mother into just being quiet about the disappearance of her son. Man, I mean, the level of scum here. I mean, this is crazy. We live in a sick and rotten society that is getting sicker and rottener every day. An Iowa state senator proclaimed as legislators debated a bill named for Johnny Gosh. I don't know what's happened to the United States, but it has become more animalistic, not more humanistic in recent years. Perhaps uh, it has, uh, <laughs> perhaps there's a, a direct correlation to the uh, increase in government. The Johnny Gosh bill, co-written by Noreen, was signed into law by Iowa Governor Terry Branstad in July 84. The bill bars police from enforcing a waiting period before investigating a report of a missing child. Despite claims from the bill's supporters, such waiting periods were not part of the protocol for WDPD, nor state or federal agencies, and were rare on the local level. Similar laws were subsequently adopted by eight other states. And obviously this coincidence theorist and authority worshipping cultist writer doesn't mention how people were actually laughing at Noreen, saying, that uh, this was all for show and that they wouldn't even care about the bill or enforce it in any way. Basically making fun of her, making fun of her missing son, and basically being just so cavalier about finding future missing children because they just don't give a crap. I mean, the police in Des Moines have showed their true colors and the politicians in that area. Obviously, there are, again, I'm sure there are good ones with, with high integrity, but just the amount of of bad ones in that particular area. I mean, it's just insane. I mean, no mother should obviously have to go through that. I mean, even if we pretend and hallucinate 
that she really is insane. Maybe she to know that she's insane. Maybe she is. That still doesn't excuse any of this behavior. I mean, it's just absolutely insane. Later that year, President Reagan invited Noreen Gosh to the opening and dedication ceremony for John and Reeve Walsh's project, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. The Gosh case was one of several nationally famous cases that drove the formation of the nonprofit. NCMEC spokeswoman Barbara Chapman told the AP in an 87 article. In the first three years, she said, the center fielded reports of 14,735 missing child cases. Yeah, that's not a lot at all, right? <laughs> and those are the only ones known about and actually reported. Of those, 7,967 children were found alive and 90 were found dead. The rest remain unaccounted for. Of the reports, almost all are either runaways or stealings by relatives, usually parents who don't have custody. Only 432 were abducted by strangers. Well, of the ones they knew about. Obviously, the ones that weren't found, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, thousands and thousands not found. There's no way to know who they were abducted by. Of those, 179 have been returned and 63 are dead. The rest are missing, including Eugene Martin and Johnny Gosh. Noreen took an offer from Ted Gunderson to conduct a private investigation into the vanishings. Gunderson, who died in 2011, was a retired FBI agent and far-right figure who helped perpetuate the infamous allegations of satanic ritual abuse at the McMartin Preschool in California, perhaps the definitive case of the satanic panic. I like how they call them allegations, despite, you know, tons of evidence. <laughs> I mean, there are certain medical treatments where there's no evidence that they work, and yet anybody questioning that is labeled as misinformation. I mean, it's just a completely insane world we're living in. Logic and reason definitely going extinct, which is, of course, one of the reasons the Mind Shock podcast exists. And Gunderson actually investigated many, many other cases and successfully prosecuted them, also involving satanic abuse child trafficking, etc. I mean, the man was a foremost expert in the field, and these goofs just dismiss him as far right as if that has anything to do with whether he's what he's saying is true or not. And was he even far right? I don't even know. And is that even relevant? I mean, when you mention the police chief, is he far left? Is he far right? Does it matter? Is he a complete moron? I mean, it's just, it's, it's very telling how these authority-worshipping cultists write these articles. Like InfoWars, Alex Jones, Gunderson believed government mind control and anti-Christian New World Order forces are behind America's most deadly terrorism events. In the official Johnny Gosh Facebook group this summer, Noreen reflected on Gunderson's work as a PI on the Johnny Gosh case, saying he did superb work and deserves a gold star. Clearly he does. I mean, look at what he uncovered. America's Most Wanted Children. Another national figure who was connected with the Goshes was future America's Most Wanted host John Walsh, whose son Adam was kidnapped and murdered, likely by the serial killer Otis O'Toole. I mean, how is that likely? It's actually highly unlikely. If you haven't checked out the Jeffrey Dahmer podcast series on Mindshock, check that out. We actually go into the, into the Adam Walsh case. And there's actually basically no evidence at all that Otis O'Toole killed Walsh other than Toole saying he did, like he said he did for hundreds of other homicides that he actually didn't commit and only knew any details at all because the police gave them to him. I mean, this is all clearly found with just 10 minutes of research. Yet again, this goofy writer here is pretending that it's likely that the serial killer, who might have not even been a killer at all, he might have started a fire where someone died that does not make someone a serial killer. There, I mean, the guy was supposedly had some kind of mental disability, and he wouldn't have been capable of, of many things that he claimed, and he couldn't even keep any details straight. So it's highly unlikely that Otis Tool and the two non-corrupt, non-incompetent officers who were on the case for a very long time actually admitted that there's no evidence linking Otis Tool to the Adam Walsh kidnapping. Bunch of people did see Dahmer at the location, though. Anyway, at the mall. Uh, continuing on here, a year before Johnny disappeared in a case that captivated and horrified America's parents, setting the tone for the predator panic to come, the tragedy was adapted into a popular TV movie, Adam. Though most crimes against children... Oh, and that's another thing. Supposedly, Tool only came forward after he was watching a TV movie on TV about Adam Walsh. 
So, and he was supposedly signing story rights with one of the detectives. So he clearly was more concerned about fame than actually uh, killing, carrying out kidnappings and executions and admitting to them. Though most crimes against children are committed by people the child knows, the Walsh case helped convince Americans that godless strangers posed the greatest risk. Walsh relayed unsourced, exaggerated statistics about the rates of missing and murdered children in testimony before the U.S. Congress in 83, claiming the nation is littered with mutilated, decapitated, raped, and strangled children. Well, it kind of is. I mean, you know, you don't have to know the exact numbers to know. I mean, more than zero would be too much. But w obviously, there's more than a couple dozen also. I mean, you could say that's not a lot, but that, that's a lot. And if, it, if it's in the hundreds and the thousands, I mean, possibly even tens of thousands over the past century or whatever. I mean, that's insane. That's insane. John Walsh was helpful, Noreen told members of the official Johnny Gosh group on Facebook last month, claiming Walsh stood up to the FBI when they tried to block the airing of America's Most Wanted episodes on Johnny. And what does that tell you? Walsh's rhetoric, echoed by other activist parents like Noreen Gosh, wormed its way into the American consciousness. Or people just care about kids, could that be it? And it's not a worming into the consciousness, it's just people actually caring about children. But that's an impossibility, according to this writer, for LittleVillageMag.com. <laughs> a 1987 NBC survey of children found 76% were very concerned about kidnapping more than nuclear war or HIV AIDS. In a 97 Newsweek poll of parents, the majority viewed abduction and murder as greater threats to their family than illness or accident. See, it's the thing about this hit piece, though, it's not necessarily that the statistical chances are higher. They're just more worried about it, so they're going to take more precautions. So it's not that the risk is greater than, let's say, a car accident. Obviously, it's not. But you have to remain vigilant because you don't want to be that one out of a million. You don't want to win that lottery. So nobody's denying that it's that it's 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 not happening every everywhere all the time. It's happening more than zero, and people are just concerned about not being that lottery winner, as they should be. I mean, who wouldn't be? The modern concept of a missing child was virtually non-existent prior to the stranger danger scare. The third, and and again, part of that is due to just the media, because obviously people were being uh, people, children were being kidnapped and killed more than zero a fair amount it's just it wasn't plastered everywhere so people weren't as aware which i mean on one hand the more aware you are i mean is i think it was stephen king who said perfect paranoia is perfect awareness so again to to be overly cautious is that a good thing so to the parents that lost children would they have preferred to be paranoid and not lost their kid by obsessing over strangers i think every single one of them would say yeah The 33 young boys abducted in the 70s by one-time Waterloo resident John Wayne Gacy, for instance, only made headlines once they were found dead. Even then, the predatory sexual proclivities that motivated Gacy were underplayed. Pedophile was not in the public lexicon, though of course pedophiles always existed, who those who acted on such predatory urges were often brushed off as local creeps and weirdos. Those who suffered sexual abuse at the hands of relatives and acquaintances, 93% of sex crimes against young people were virtually invisible. Runaway or thrown away children comprise the overwhelming majority of missing youths and kids in poverty, kids of color, and those who identify as LGBTQ are far more vulnerable to predation. You know what also is weird? This authority-worshipping cultist article doesn't mention CPS and other government programs where, of course, children are... Uh, highly predated upon. Particularly after cuts to social services and increased community policy. <laughs> wow, I mean, this is just such a clueless article. I'm glad we're going over it, though, because it, it needs to be done to really understand why coincidence theorists and authority-worshipping cultists think as they do, because they're so easily brainwashed by this obviously false propaganda. Yet they are far less likely to be portrayed as victims in the media, even and perhaps especially when survivors come forward with credible accusations against prominent figures like Jeffrey Epstein and R. Kelly. Wow, big surprise they actually mentioned that. When at least 28 black children, teens and adults, mostly male, were found murdered in Atlanta, Georgia between July 79 and May 81, police and FBI attributed most of the crimes to one man, Wayne Williams, despite the fact that Williams was only convicted of two murders and maintained his innocence. 
And that's a whole nother rabbit hole. Further, significant evidence was presented that the Ku Klux Klan members were involved in many of the disappearances. Despite some media coverage highlighting the apparent injustice, the tragedies haunting Atlanta were not incorporated into the National Child Safety Movement of the 80s. The investigation wasn't reopened until 2019. Systemic violence and its vic victims are often overshadowed by crimes seen as more meaningful signals of cultural and moral decay. A comment by America's Most Wanted producer Paul Sparrow in the film Who Took Johnny illustrates this well. Sparrow believes that a secret child trafficking ring abducted and sold clean Midwestern children like Johnny Gosh into sexual slavery, even and especially after Johnny became one of the most recognizable faces in America. I mean, as if that's outlandish or something. I mean, maybe that didn't happen, but, but clearly that's a very viable theory. I mean, there's scumbags out there. I mean, corruption deniers are so weird. I mean, these coincidence theorists and authority-worshipping cultists, they completely ignore all of the evidence. I mean, there were two ki different kinds of kids that interested the elite pedophile buyers, Sparrow said. There were the throwaway kids, the runaways, drug addicts, living on the streets, hustling for sex, and then there were the virgins, and I heard that some of these sick individuals would pay large sums of money to have clean kids to abuse, and that's the part of the story I found the most horrific and most disturbing. In the absence of answers, in the pages of the Des Moines Register, Iowans lamented the stain the child disappearances left on the region, that a once quiet great place, great place to raise kids city may become the crime capital of the world. That was the most bothersome thing one Register interviewee said, was that this kind of stole our innocence from us. A climate of frustration, fear, and speculation fed by mass media coverage yielded the perfect conditions for conspiracy theories to bloom, or simple corruption awareness. Midwestern moms and dads were suddenly researching Anton LaVey, subliminal messaging, and satanic holidays. The more sensational a theory was, the quicker it spread, especially once blogs and chat rooms entered the scene. So, <laughs> the establishment could no longer suppress as efficiently <laughs> post blogs and chat rooms. Advocates were suggesting that child sacrifice was a daily event in North America, that clandestine alternative religion existed undetected and that its agents had infiltrated schools, kindergartens, churches, and police departments, that satanic rituals were commonplace in daycare institutions, that women regularly bore babies for sacrifice, and that all the phenomena had occurred systematically in American society for decades, perhaps back to the 17th century. Historian Philip Jenkins recounted his 98 book, Moral Panic, Changing Concepts of the Child Molester in Modern America. And I mean, there's tons of evidence to support that as well. I mean, Michael Aquino, the Air Force colonel who actually went on talk shows and talked about his Satanism and all that insanity. I mean, connected to many individuals surrounding the Johnny Gosh case. I mean, has this author done zero research? I mean, that's pretty typical of coincidence theorists and authority worshiping cultists. I mean, they really do zero research. And then they appeal to extremes as if it's a daily, so it's either a daily event or it never goes up. <laughs> I mean, these gifts are hilarious. Since there were no person to convict, Iowans blamed whatever vague cultural ills they felt motivated the abduction. Another child has been snatched from our streets. Why? We are obsessed with sex, wrote a Sioux City resident in a letter to the Register. Nothing pinpoints its vulgarities and sadistic pleasure more than porno material. The Register's executive editor, James Gannon, <laughs> and if you haven't checked out the previous episode on Jeff Gannon, possibly Johnny Gosh, and all of these names that seem to uh, be everywhere, published his own editorial proclaiming to be mad as hell about the spate of disappearances. He directed his anger at bureaucrats and liberalism, and the antithesis to what he saw as the all-American Midwestern family, complete with a handsome paper boy son. I didn't move my family to Des Moines to live in fear behind locked doors. I do not cede the night to shadowy figures who hide by day. The sun should never set on freedom and personal security. The more fear gave way to anger and frustration, the more Iowans seemed willing to believe a force far more sophisticated than the John Wayne Gacy or Otis Toole took the boys. And there's so many fallacies in that statement because supposedly John Wayne Gacy was connected to some of these higher up rings, whereas Otis O'Toole was not, and he was just a patsy. God is speaking through Noreen to alert us of the growing operation of molesters and abductors, a story city woman wrote to Governor Terry Branstad. I have never heard of any incidents of this nature in Story City, could it possibly be that this never happens here? I doubt it. 
Meanwhile, as the decades passed, the Gashes fell victim to the fraudsters and trolls. A Michigan man who claimed to be imprisoning Johnny in Mexico swindled more than 11,000 out of the couple. Dozens of people over the years have claimed to be Johnny in scams, delusions, reminiscent of QAnon's John F. Kennedy Jr. impersonators. You know what's weird, though? Like, a lot of politicians have doubles. <laughs> I mean, that's a fact. A, a dollar bill was found in a Nebraska cash register with I'm Alive, Johnny Gosh, written on it, which Noreen considers authentic. I mean, I'm sure this author would be able to identify Johnny's handwriting better than his mother, though, so we should just defer to her. <laughs> in a spine-chilling twist, Noreen said an envelope of photos showed up on her doorstep in 2006 depicting young boys tied up and gagged, a seeming confirmation of her worst fears. She turned them in to West Des Moines police, and at least one officer initially agreed with Noreen that one of the boys appeared to be Johnny, but a retired Florida detective recognized the photos as part of a long-solved Florida case, which they actually weren't. So there was a poster or something in the photo which, which proved it could not have been taken earlier when they alleged. WDPD were convinced, but Noreen continues to insist they are evidence of Johnny's abuse. Disinformation ran for rights grew out of unfathomable devastation and uncertainty as the parents of missing and exploited children generally had no sense of where to turn to following their respective losses. Or it wasn't disinfo or misinfo. I mean, that's like a catch-all for anything that's damaging to the establishment. They just pretend it's disinfo or misinfo, and then when it's actually proved true, it's just silence. Perhaps by transferring blame onto a faceless monster like a child prostitution ring or a religious cult operating outside the Midwest, Iowans could absolve their communities, their state, and their regions. And, you know, like, this was all in the newspaper. I went over this in the previous episodes. I mean, there were, there, there were people involved in rings in the area, in child trafficking rings, who were actually arrested for it. I mean, these goofs have just done zero research. It's crazy. A witch hunt one state over. It was one of the biggest scandals in Nebraska history. In 1990, businessman Lawrence E. King Jr., once hailed as a champion for working-class black families in Omaha, was charged with looting $38 million from the credit union he operated in a predominantly black neighborhood. King lived a conspicuously lavish lifestyle, complete with luxury cars and extravagant parties, subsidized by the customers of North Omaha's Franklin Community Credit Union, all while preaching a pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstraps philosophy as an active GOP leader and a former chairman of the National Black Republican Council. I mean, you can really tell what the writer is trying to do with, with this article. I mean, it's so blatantly obvious. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing, but let's continue. Substantial evidence corroborated the charges of embezzlement and fraud, but more accusations rolled in against King as well as other high-profile Republicans. Sadistic sexual assault of youth in Nebraska's foster care system, as well as those receiving help from the nonprofit Boys Town, the selling of children to other wealthy elites as sex slaves, flying kids around the country on private planes, plied with drugs and alcohol as part of a bisexual bacchanal, according to a 1990 Washington Post article on the allegations. I mean, are these really just allegations? Are they actually going to mention that Paul Bonacci won a $1 million judgment for the evidence that he presented, which coincidentally remains sealed to this day? This is not a settlement. With This was a judgment based on evidence he presented to the judge. But of course, no mention of that here. <laughs> John DeCamp, a former Republican state senator, committed himself to the crusade against King and others accused. The most powerful and rich public personalities of the state are central figures in the investigation, DeCamp declared, and it's got them as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. As word spread, rumors surrounding the scandal grew even stranger. King, elected officials, local business leaders, and famous folks as high up as President Bush, were said to be secretly dabbling in deviant pornography, homosexual cults, devil worship, cannibalism, the kind of terrors outlined in Geraldo Rivera's infamous 1988 TV special, Devil Worship, Exposing Satan's Underground, as well as arms deals, MK Ultra Mind Control, blackmail, and murder. Yeah, it's not like there's uh, any documents that can be checked to verify all that, right? <laughs> Half a dozen young people recorded 21 hours of testimony describing lurid crimes and naming names, but investigators were skeptical. Which investigators? Those on payroll of the accused? It was difficult to tell whether some of these kids were playing upon the neighborhood in statewide hysteria or were really telling the truth. Local attorney and former Secret Service agent James Martin Davis told The Post. 
clearly an unbiased individual. The Omaha police, a special prosecutor appointed by the county grand jury, the state attorney general, and the FBI all independently investigated the allegations and found no evidence tying King or others accused to any kind of sex ring. And you know what's funny? Not funny, but sad and traumatic, depending on how you look at it. If they're working for the accused, what do you expect them to find? I mean, coincidence theorists are really a special kind of stupid here. Again, I'm not saying they were all telling the truth, but clearly a lot of them were, and they had their family members killed, and they were intimidated. I mean, and Bon, but Bonacci was not, and he won a one million dollar judgment. Again, no mention of that here in this clueless article. The grand jury concluded it was a carefully crafted hoax, scaffolded to the Franklin credit union scandal. In 91, the primary source of the sex ring, sex ring stories was found guilty of perjury. So again, Bonacci, who suppose, was, was painted as a perjurer and also mentally ill. So you can only imagine the level of evidence he must have presented to win his $1 million judgment. Of course, these files are all sealed. So if it really was just a carefully crafted hoax, why are all the files sealed? Particularly the ones regarding Bonacci winning his $1 million judgment based on whatever evidence he was able to present. Because you know his word wouldn't have been good enough. So he must have been able to reveal something that was corroborated in some way in order to get a $1 million judgment. Also, many of the others who allegedly recanted, they later admitted that they were intimidated and everything actually did happen. But who expects this clueless writer to investigate that? Journalists at the Omaha World Herald also found no credible evidence to corroborate the testimonies or rumors. DeCamp accused the paper of being timid. Because again, if all of these rumors are true, I mean, that puts a big target on people's backs. I mean, look at the people uh, who knew stuff about the Clintons. I mean, that's, and that's a long laundry list of dead people. Who wants to end up on that list? I mean, this isn't rocket science, but coincidence, theorists, and authority worshiping cultists, I mean, their Dunning-Kruger is so off the charts. I mean, they just can't understand simple concepts and conflicts of interest. Over the 16 or 18 months, we've had five of the best reporters in the Midwest on this story, replied G. Woodson Howe, editor of the newspaper. We've not been timid. We've run 700 stories and put 7,000 reporter hours into this. What frustrated the sleazemongers was that we never did confirm that these kids were procured from state custody and dragged into a sex ring with help from some kind of state power structure. Now, what kind of evidence are they expecting? The kids told their story. I mean, a bunch of psychologists actually did did verify that this happened. I mean, there's 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 all the evidence that you possibly could have. There's Bonacci's maps of uh, private areas of the White House where he said boys or boys and girls possibly were taken for these parties with politicians that are always closed to the public. There's no way they could have known that. I mean, he's got his journals that were actually age tested to before the gosh story was ran, where he revealed all this information he couldn't have known. So, I mean, how much more evidence do they want? Not to mention, again, Bonacci won a $1 million judgment, not a settlement. But DeCamp was not dissuaded. In 1992, well, the other thing, too, if this is really a high-powered power structure doing this, of course they would have systems and people on payroll to prevent this from getting out, as they did. They just had to kill a couple relatives of the victims and then intimidate them. I mean, this is a standard operating procedure for the kind of scum that would actually carry this out. So if it's true, it would operate exactly as it just did. <laughs> but these goofs just can't comprehend that. Again, maybe it's all not true. But if it is, it it's logically would play out exactly like this. Because why would they allow freely allow evidence against them to come out? I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it is curious why they didn't just kill Bonacci. Some people believe that there's more to the story there or that he was possibly threatened and allowed to reveal a certain amount under the condition that he not reveal other things. That way it wouldn't have looked as suspicious if the most famous victim and this guy involved on America's Most Wanted making accusations regarding the Johnny Gosh case. I mean, it would perhaps, I mean, that would look kind of suspicious if they bumped him off. I mean, they killed the family members of, of less prominent victims and they no longer wanted to be prominent after that. And possibly some were scared to come forward. They, were, they weren't even named. So, yeah, it would have been easy to intimidate them. 
So DeCamp was not dissuaded. In 92, he published a paperback, The Franklin Cover-Up, Child Abuse, Satanism, and Murder in Nebraska. He also participated in the filming of a documentary by filmmaker Tim Tate, who co-authored a 2018 book speculating hypnosis mind control played a role in the Robert Kennedy assassination, focused on the rape and trafficking allegations titled Conspiracy of Silence. You know, I mean, I have to mention this here. There are so many coincidence theorists, authority-worshipping cultists, and just all-around gullible goofs. Go read the declassified MKUltra documents. And if those are declassified, you just use a modicum of brain cells to think, what have they not declassified? I mean, this isn't rocket science. DeCamp and the filmmakers say the doc was originally supposed to air on the Discovery Channel, but was pulled at the last minute. The cover-up strikes again. If Discovery did yank conspiracy silence, it was most likely to avoid opening themselves to defamation lawsuits. Sure it was. Interviewees in the doc described graphic, unimaginable crimes against children committed and facilitated by real people, presenting no verifiable evidence these flights to secret sex parties occurred. And again, this is a fundamental lack of understanding on how defamation works. Because if these really are mentally ill people that are lying, if they believe it's true, it's not defamation. If the president is no longer to become employed, like if George Bush can't get a job as a result of what this person said, then you can open up possible defamation. If they knew it was a lie and they acted with malice against a public figure, then that opens the door to defamation. I mean, again, this isn't rocket science. You can go on NOLO and just, I mean, these are basic definitions of defamation. I mean, but this writer, of course, is very clueless. There is no verifiable evidence that these flights to secret sex parties occurred. I mean... There's quite a bit. I mean, exactly who, where, how. I mean, that might be a little muddy. DeCamp's fixation on the scandal drew skepticism from even his most loyal former colleagues in the state legislature, but he would find a fervent ally in central Iowa. Paul Bonacci and The Visit. As the hubbub around the so-called Franklin scandal began to wane in 91, one of the young people who claimed to have been abused by Lawrence King came forward with information on an unsolved missing child case in Iowa claimed and won a $1 million judgment based on evidence presented. Paul Bonacci was an inmate at the Lincoln Correctional Center in Lincoln, Nebraska at the time, and through his attorney, John DeCamp, declared in on-camera testimony that he had aided in the abduction of Johnny Gosh nine years before. He'd been roped into a prostitution ring that not only sold him to high-profile clients everywhere from Nebraska to the White House, but compelled him to recruit and even abduct other children to sell, he said. Drugs and sexual violence were used to brainwash and manipulate the kids. Again, this is all very consistent with documented cases that aren't disputed by any coincidence theorists. And how does Bonacci know this in a, a pre-widespread internet age? The 24-year-old Bonacci was serving a five-year sentence at the time on three charges of sexually assaulting a child. He was diagnosed with multiple personality disorder and claimed he only remembered his role in Johnny's kidnapping after he managed to recover memories from one of his dozen personalities. Again, all consistent with the MK Ultra document. Des Moines station WHO-TV Channel 13 traveled to Lincoln to interview Bonacci in prison and seemed dumbstruck by his apparent ability to alternate personalities at will. Every time he would put his head down and call up somebody, it seemed authentic. Cameraman Mike Borland recalled wide-eyed in Who Took Johnny. It seemed to me that he couldn't fake that. This guy probably wasn't capable of coming up with all these voices and all of these different things to say. Noreen said she was hesitant to meet Bonacci. Not only was he claiming to have chloroformed Johnny and helped steal him across state lines, Bonacci said he was the first one to sexually abuse Johnny while his handler, Emilio, took photos. Why did they want Johnny, Noreen asked Bonacci in their first meeting, in front of WHO TV cameras. Bonacci was crying, covering his eyes with his hand. They wanted to get kids that weren't used, and they also liked to get kids that were close to their families. Why, she followed up. Emilio liked to hurt people. After meeting the thin, pale Bonacci and hearing his apology, Noreen began to find him credible. I was anxious, I was upset, but I was grateful to him for going out on a limb to share it. Noreen told the documentary filmmakers, he didn't have to. He didn't get a better deal. He still had to serve a sentence. So I had to admire the young man for the courage to do that. Bonacci offered a mix of wildly known and, according to Noreen, unknown information about Johnny to prove they'd met. Well, I mean, it was verifiably unknown as his journal, which he did not have in prison with him, was age-tested. But again, the clueless writer here doesn't know that. For example, the fact that Johnny had a large birthmark on his chest was highly publicized, but Bonacci also correctly guessed 
that he had a scar on his tongue, burn scar on his leg, and a stammer when upset. How did he guess? It's called knowing. <laughs> How clueless is this writer? He's just accidentally guessing everything correct. I mean, he even had his shirt. The I mean, there were comments about Johnny Gosh. He, he did yoga, which, uh, again, today that's not exactly popular among preteen boys or early teen boys. But back then, yoga wasn't really popular with anyone. I mean, this is just, this writer is just so obviously biased against Noreen. The cognitive distance is off the charts. Or she's just shilling for the corrupt and trying to uh, do damage control on the obvious here. There are things that start to fit a puzzle, Noreen told WHO-TV. They might not be big things to the police department, but it's forming a picture. West Des Moines police reviewed the interview with the TV station conducted with Bonacci and sent investigators to Omaha to interview his siblings who put their brother in Omaha at the time of Johnny's disappearance. That was enough for police to rule him out as a suspect, but it was evidence of either negligence or a cover-up to those that have found Bonacci credible. Like the judge who awarded him a million dollars. But anyway, yeah, so if the police were in on the conspiracy, they would just say his siblings said that. Or... They would intimidate them into saying that, or, according to Bonacci, if he was gone days at a time or whatever, and they either didn't notice, or they thought he was somewhere else, or with other relatives, since he kept, if he kept coming back. Again, I don't know, the, those, are, those would be interesting details to know. But again, if this is true, and law enforcement is in on it, obviously they would have just intimidated the witnesses. Again, this isn't rocket science, but for whatever reason, the coincidence dearest in the authority worshiping cultists, they don't have the modicum of brain cells required to understand that if the conspiracy is true, there would obviously be witness intimidation. I mean, this is just insane. As the 10th anniversary of Johnny's disappearance approached, Fox's America's Most Wanted saw a story. Any excuse is a good excuse to keep it in the light, host John Walsh remarked to Who Took Johnny Filmmaker. Soon, the crew of AMW was back in the Midwest to investigate Bonacci's claims. They found an abandoned house in Colorado where Bonacci said he encountered trafficked children in 86, including a long-haired Johnny Gosh with a brand on his leg. Elements of the house matched Bonacci's description. But leads-wise, it was a dead end. No individual in Bonacci's story, including Emilio, could be identified. Well, actually, they could. Wow, I mean, this writer has done zero research. I went over all this in the early episodes. From Bonacci, I mean, there's multiple people that were identified by name. From Bonacci to the hundreds of fresh tips flooding in from around the world, no information could be separated from the national media coverage, both the facts and the popular theories. Still, for a while, the Gosh case was back in the public consciousness. It would enter again in 99 when Noreen took the witness stand in a civil case Bonacci and DeCamp brought against King. She was asked under oath if she had seen or talked to her son since he disappeared. After an initial pause, she testified that she had, once, in 1997, he'd shown up at her front door in the dead of night accompanied by a friend disguised with darkened skin color and hair. But Noreen said she recognized his eyes. He'd escaped from a pedophile ring, he told her, where he'd been sexually abused, tortured, and compelled to commit crimes as collateral to keep him under their control. He couldn't re-enter society as Johnny Gosh, or they would kill him or have him imprisoned. He beseeched Noreen not to tell a soul he'd come. After about an hour or so, he disappeared into the night. The story was splashy, instant breaking news, but strained skeptics' already stretched credulity. Because appeal to incredulity, of course, logic fallacy. Noreen had spent years presenting law enforcement with any and all leads to investigate, but she hadn't come forward with what would certainly be the biggest break in the case yet. Actually, she did, and there would, and this would supposedly the details that that individual, either Johnny or somebody pretending to be Johnny, actually gave credible information. I went over this in the previous episodes. Again, this writer obviously too clueless to know that. So she hadn't even told her ex-husband until she was on the stand. Couldn't Johnny see that millions had been looking for him for 15 years and would protect him if he came out of hiding? Protect him? What are you talking about? The amount of people killed connected to this case? I mean, what is, is this writer just on some kind of drugs or something? <laughs> Wouldn't he be safer in the light? How could a mother accept his, this fate for her son? Noreen countered with her own question, who took Johnny? Why on earth would Johnny even want to come forward and be scrutinized like he's some sort of specimen? from another planet, she said. Whatever his life is now, assuming he's alive, is working for him. Sometimes the better decision for a parent is to do what's best for your child, not just what you would want to have happen. Not to mention, if he really was involved in this. 
obviously that would put a target on him, which leads to the Jeff Gannon enigma. If you haven't listened to the previous episode, I go over all the different theories connected to that in that episode. Ask me anything. For decades out, Johnny Gosh is still a flashpoint, a phrase synonymous with stranger abduction, child sex trafficking, Midwestern true crime, innocence lost. In the ideal world, he is alive and he comes home and everybody's happy, Lieutenant Jeff Miller of the WDPD told WHO-TV in 2010. But in the real world, more than likely, our best lead will come when his body is found, and at that point, it becomes a crime scene. As online conspiracy theories festered and thrived during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, yeah, because none of those came true, the mystery re-entered the public consciousness anew. If someone with only a passing knowledge of the Gosh case stumbled upon the official website for the Johnny Gosh Foundation in 2020, they'd likely be in for a shock. One can't actually visit johnnygosh.com anymore. The domain license was terminated in 2021 amid a crackdown on far-right conspiracy platforms post-January 6th, but snapshots of it are archived online. Because that's not suspicious at all. (laughs) In white and green text on the black webpage typical of Y2K era sites, facts about Johnny's case and touching memorials are interspersed with Noreen's tales of being blocked at every turn by the powers that be, targeted with death threats, told by Johnny himself that this conspiracy goes all the way to the top. Scroll past a photo of a glowing Johnny on the yellow dirt bike he bought with his paper route earnings. Hit a paragraph of Ted Gunnarsson rants against government evil, complete with broken hyperlinks and video embeds they don't want you to see because all links last forever on the internet. (laughs) Today, Noreen corresponds directly with followers in a private Facebook group of about 3,500 members, official Johnny Gosh group. Ahead of the 40th anniversary of her son's disappearance, Noreen agreed to the ultimate AMA, trying to answer 1,000 questions from the group before September 5th. It appears Noreen's perspective on the case has not shifted much since she published her book in 2000, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, Kidnapped While Delivering Newspapers, forced into pornography, prostitution, mind control, espionage, and the johnnygosh.com website shortly after. Yes, I do believe it is linked to the large pedophile network in the U.S., satanic abuse, MKUltra, all of these, or a combination, is at their fingertips. I was on the right track with my investigation from day one, she declared in early August. The Facebook group's main moderator has posted Benghazi conspiracy theories, blamed liberal agitators for January 6th insurrection, because we all know those don't exist, and called the media corrupt on his personal Facebook page. I mean, that's just outlandish. I mean, there's clearly no corrupt media out there. (laughs) At least a few members of the official Johnny Gosh group give credence to QAnon, one claiming that Q helped me wake up. Noreen has expressed belief in the debunked Pizzagate conspiracy theory. (laughs) And you know what's hilarious? All of these goofs, coincidence theories, they pretend there's no debunkings of the debunkings. (laughs) Like debunking is like a magic religious word to them. As soon as they hear debunk, they take it on faith. They don't actually see the debunking or, if the debunking is not legitimate, the debunking of the debunking. And shared links in the group from Liz Krokin, one of QAnon's biggest influencers, and a University of Iowa alum. Noreen's most troubling associate is David Icke. I mean, this is another guy. I mean, none of his predictions came true about government or anything or, or power structures. I mean, the guy's obviously been wrong about everything like Alex Jones, so maybe this writer is right to criticize him. <laughs> a prominent British conspiracy theorist since the mid-90s whose belief in a race of shape-shifting interdimensional reptilian puppet masters tend to overshadow his deeply anti-Semitic teachings associated with the white supremacist groups and spreading of bogus health advice related to 5G and COVID. Noreen told her followers Ike is a good source of information on so-called satanic ritual abuse. And you know what's funny too? It's like, so David Ike says, let's, out of 100% of the things David Ike talks about, they focus on the 1% that, let's say, it's not true. Completely ignoring that his track record, just like Alex Jones, is so vastly superior to anything from the mainstream media on the idiot box. I mean, it's just so hilarious. Years ago, I visited with Ike, and I have read a lot of what he has written, she said. his inform- I mean, what does this have anything to do with the Johnny Gosh case? Because, like, even if you... What I did in the earlier episodes, I took Noreen out of the equation. Because a lot of these coincidence theorists, goofs, and uh, corruption deniers, they all they have is, a cu- is these attacks on Noreen. Take her out of the equation. Most of what she says has been verified by various parties, either in law enforcement or other government officials. His information is very good, and I am sure some people are frightened when they read about what is happening to our country. 
and the world, but at the same time, it is better to be informed about what is around us so we can protect those we love. When someone in a comment section calls a particular belief dumb or crazy, other group members tend to chide them for closing their minds. Still, the official Johnny Gotch group is far from the most toxic community on Facebook, so now she's attacking the group. Comments critical of Noreen's narrative, I feel for her, but no way do I believe he showed up at her place, are allowed to remain. No one is calling for the eradication of trans folks or the... De why, is she, why is this goofy writer even talking about this in the Gosh article? Even if the Iowans do want these things, they will sometimes invoke Gosh, Martin, and Allen in their fear-based arguments. Because it couldn't be awareness. Definitely couldn't be that. <laughs> Members appreciate Noreen's willingness to be open with them, the comfort she's provided other parents of missing and murdered children, and her ability to shoulder enormous pressure, skepticism, and grief. To her credit, Noreen has never tied her son's case to a specific political movement, unlike this goofy writer, and doesn't advocate vigilantism. I would not take the law into my own hands, she told the group. It would be tempting when one learns the atrocities that were done to children to do so, but then the wrong person would be held responsible for a crime. Noreen frequently shows her ignorance on the science regarding pedophilia, claiming the death penalty is the only way to stop a sex criminal from re -offend. I don't know if I can finish this article. Now she's defending sex criminals? S she's saying when in fact sex offenders have notice notably lower recidivism rates than other offenses. That's clearly not true. Especially when an individual receives treatment during their incarceration. She says states are trying to legalize child sexual abuse or lower the age of consent to eight years old campaigns that are extremely fringe if they exist at all. I mean, they clearly exist. This this might be the most clueless writer ever, like zero research on any of this, while claiming certain things are fact. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's even objective cluelessness where she doesn't know anything about anything. She's pretending to know. <laughs> while research into pedophilia as a psychological disorder has only just begun to scratch the surface. I mean, what? People have been studying this for a long time. Surveys suggest a large majority of self-identifying pedophiles do not act on their urges and observe what many would consider a normal moral framework. Yeah, because surveys of disturbed individuals that want to predate on children, those are what matter, not actual studies. <laughs> wow, what a goof. But it's hard for information to penetrate communities that have committed to the belief that organized pedophilia is the greatest threat to American youth, since according to its own rules, no journalist, official, or institution can be trusted. Yeah, I mean, clearly, public schools, the Boy Scouts, CPS. I mean, clearly, these organizations never engage in any of this, right? How clueless is this writer? I mean, man, this is crazy. I'm gonna have to call out this goof writing for littlevillagemag.com, Emma McClatchley. I mean, does she have a mental disability, or is she just this clueless? There is always going to be an effort by the opposition to discredit human trafficking, pedophile rings, trafficking, etc. because they want a clear field to operate, Noreen wrote last month. They count on people to just believe the negative about someone who is trying to bring awareness and truth. I was in that role for many years. People practically were throwing rocks at me saying I was making all of this up. People used to be shocked that it happened in Iowa, but since Johnny, there has been a number of more kidnappings and murders of children. Is the writer too goofy and clueless to realize how Noreen just called her out without even knowing her? <laughs> Off the rails, inevitably conspiracy theory communities, aka corruption awareness communities, that say yes to too many ideas that, again, it's not that a lot of, yeah, sure, some of them might say yes. A lot of them are just not wanting to trust criminals. Saying that you're not going to believe criminals is not the same thing as also believing that this conspiracy is definitely true. I'm not claiming anything is true or untrue. From evidence presented on all of these newspapers, all of these court trials and judgments, it would appear that a lot of this stuff is true. Regarding whether it happened to Johnny or not, that's another matter. But again, it's simply not taking on blind faith whatever's on the idiot box peddled by the mainstream. That doesn't mean someone is taking something else on blind faith. Some conspiracy theorists do, obviously, but hasty generalization, another logical fallacy that this goofy writer happens to uh, employ. I mean, all she really has is blind faith in the corrupt and logical fallacies to support her hit piece here. That while the standard of proof down to this sounds convincing or even it just it could be true, begin to eat their own tail. A single meme suggesting an influencer for, say, flat earth believers is actually a spy for the globalists can hit an image board's front page within hours, leading to an online witch hunt and fractures within an already fringe movement. Like, what does this have to do with Johnny Gash? This has happened in recent years among pedophile cabal believers. 
I mean, is she not aware? She mentioned Jeffrey Epstein. Has she just you heard his name on the news and know nothing about him? Megan Walsh, daughter of John Walsh and an avid anti-government, anti-child protective services conspiracy theorist, has led an online campaign calling her famous dad a deep state goon after he and wife Reeve Walsh won custody of Megan's children. Some official Johnny Gosh group members have expressed support for Megan. Theory, I mean, clearly this writer knows Megan's story better than Megan. Theories that Jeff Gannon, the mad-as-hell editor of the Des Moines Register in the 80s, was personally responsible for the Paperboy abductions or is in fact Johnny Gosh himself somehow have taken off. Noreen also cut ties with longtime ally Ron Sampson, president of the Johnny Gosh Foundation from 82 to 93, saying he has aligned himself with idiot theories. Her ex-husband has come under the magnifying glass in recent years as well. Though they haven't stayed in touch since their 93 divorce, Noreen and John Gosh Sr. have long defended each other against theories that the other was involved in Johnny's disappearance. But Noreen's tone changed after John participated in a 20... It was actually way before... I mean, this writer is just so clueless. In a 2018 podcast interview in which he publicly admitted for what appeared to be the first time that he didn't find Paul Bonacci a convincing witness. The faded out host Sarah DeMeo asked him if he believed Noreen and Ken Wooden's aggressive strategy might have hindered the early investigation into local suspects. He admitted he thought he had. He said he thought he had. Again, admitted implies that, that that's the truth and him not doing damage control. Questions about John have flooded the official Johnny Gosh group, and while Noreen has refused to confirm the more lurid gossip, she main, now maintains he acted suspiciously around the time Bonacci came on the radar and could be keeping secrets. I mean, she actually said that many years ago. Again, this writer just does not know anything about this case. Though police and local journalists revealed in interviews that they became wary of Noreen's PR tactics, sooner or later and doubted many of her claims, she remains a wildly popular and respected figure among online followers of the case. You mean people that actually looked into it? <laughs> From Facebook to Reddit to the more unsavory conspiracy blogs. Yeah, I mean, con exposing corruption is not pretty. This hasn't been the case for all grieving parents of missing or murdered children. The 96 Chambonet Ramsey case is a particularly odious example of a victim's parents receiving de facto blame from a bloodthirsty public after police botched their daughter's murder investigation. Perhaps Noreen's enduring status as a woman who speaks truth to power is a perk of making herself available to anyone who will listen since 82, giving talks to parent groups, participating in podcast interviews with both renowned and controversial figures, and answering literally a thousand questions on Facebook Facebook in a single month, all for little to no financial compensation. And again, something this clueless writer is just too mentally, doesn't have the mental capacity to understand. If what Noreen is saying is true, how would you expect her to behave? Her narrative gives Johnny's case the importance it feels like a missing, a missing child's case should have. It's a convincing enough answer for those who spent decades paranoid about faceless, aimless monsters, or simply more aware than the clueless. Secret pedophile organizations, however elite or satanic, are in many ways less frightening than the relatives, guardians, care providers, and friendly neighbors on the local news arrested for harming a child who trusted them, much less the sacred all-American institutions we know protected even the most prolific abusers from Larry Nasser to Catholic priests. So th does that make this writer even dumber? Because she's obviously aware of some of this, but she's pretending and hallucinating that it couldn't happen in this case. Not to mention she's that clueless. It's not that people haven't looked at the relatives, guardians, care providers, and family neighbors. I mean, there's a theory that, that John Gosh's own father sold him into this ring. It's simply some people follow evidence instead of denying it. Plus, in Noreen's reality, Johnny's alive. It's actually not. She said she doesn't know if he's alive or not. He would. She believes it was him who visited her, but she doesn't know if he's alive after them. We haven't seen or heard from him because he isn't safe out in the open, but according to his mother, he knows how many people care about him and even follows the activity within the official Johnny Gosh group. I have a friend who said to me once through all of this, you are lucky, Noreen replied to a question about the role faith has played in her activism. I asked why she would say that, and she replied, you know what your purpose is for being here. A Legacy of Terror. On a recent weekend, I drove up to my mom's hometown, I and mean, you can tell how professional this writer is, <laughs> of Waverly, Iowa for a visit. My mother and I decided to watch The Black Phone, a breakout 2022 horror film based on a short story by Joe Hill. Though supernatural elements eventually come into play, the film begins with a gritty air of realism. Or at least it feels real. North Denver 78 suburban kids run around without a care, shooting bottle rockets, riding bikes, delivering newspapers in a red wagon alongside the family dog. Then a black panel van turns onto the street, spooky music descends, and the opening credits begin amid images of black and white missing child flyers. What does that have to do with anything? 
The villain driving the van, played by Ethan Hawke, wears a white mask with devil horns and a hooked nose. His voice and mannerisms a mix of Joaquin Phoenix's Joker and the queer-coated mustache twirlers of old. He's called The Grabber because, well, he grabs boys off the street, hides them in a basement, and eventually kills them. While it's never explicitly depicted or described, it's heavily implied the Grabber sexually assaults them. The satanic panic allusions are all very on the nose. The paperboy victim styled to look so similar to Gosh and Martin as to be insensitive. But it's effective horror movie fodder. Anyone raised during or after the 80s has been conditioned to dread this very scenario. The frustration you feel knowing the boys on screen are sitting ducks practically has you shouting stranger danger at the screen. I will say this, my Gen X mom told me, having grown up in the time of Johnny Gosh, Eugene Martin, and Adam... I was terrified for my children. I was a much different parent than I would have been. I can't blame my mother for squeezing my purple hand when we walked through crowds, getting jittery whenever I disappeared under a rack of coats at JCPenney, or picking me up from elementary school every day when I could easily have walked the few blocks. Fear is rational when you've been told the grabber could be lurking nearby, much less when the government, police, intelligence agencies, and world leaders may all be complicit. Because there's nev definitely no convictions of any of those people. But fear has consequences beyond our own households. Mass surveillance and incarceration are consequences of fear. Creating a class of Americans that are permanently disenfranchised and unemployable is a consequence of fear. Giving What does that have to do with people caring about their children? Giving credence to lies... I mean, is this a misinfo? This sounds like a misinfo article. Because they contain comforting affirmations is a consequence of fear. It's actually a sign of mental strength. I mean, what this goof fails to realize is some people simply follow the evidence even if it, it does involve dark and sinister concepts. Justifying harm under the banner of protecting children's innocence is a consequence of our fear culture. Who's justifying any kind of harm? What the heck is she talking about? The missing persons cases of Johnny Gosh, Eugene Martin, and Mark Allen remain unsolved. Their faces continue to grace milk cartons until the practice fizzled out in 1990 after too many parents complained it was scaring their kids at the breakfast table. Milk carton campaigns weren't especially effective anyway, it turns out, and the Amber Alert system took over in 96. But similar to cult, actually, I think there might be something to that, because then the kids are, are afraid, and for those that believe in the adrenochrome conspiracy theories, I mean, that just puts the fear in kids. So, yeah, I mean, kids, I mean, there, I guess there's a responsible way to do that. The parent pours the milk that the kid doesn't see in the cereal bowl while maintaining awareness for the parent. But similar cold cases have cracked in recent years, bringing bittersweet closure to communities and dumping cold water on decades of wild speculation. Like Bonacci's $1 million judgment. The disappearance of Jacob Wetterling in Painesville, Minnesota in 89, no surprise, she's clueless about that case and the lack of positive ID, generated much national attention and led to the establishment of the first state sex offender registry. Police bungled the investigation, conspiracy theories swirled around the case, and a local man suspected of being involved became a pariah. But on September 1st, 2016, a pedophile from one town over, Danny Heinrich, confessed to kidnapping and killing Jacob. Yeah, because people who confess are always guilty. <laughs> Jacob, after 27 years, police recovered Jacob's remains 30 miles from the Wetterling home where Heinrich said they'd be. Or did they? Jacob's mother, Patty Wetterling, has since become an outspoken critic of sex offender registries, regretting the role she and the Jacob Wetterling Foundation played in creating Minnesota's. What we really want is no more victims. Don't do it again. So how can we get there? Locking them up forever labeling them and not allowing them community support doesn't work. I've turned 180 degrees from where I was, Patty told APM Reports in 2016. Today, the Wetterling... See, back in the day, like, people who harm children, they were just shot. Again, I'm not advocating the murder of anybody, but a family member looking to protect their child, they are justified in doing what they need to do to protect their child. Today, the Wetterling Foundation website, zeroabuseproject.org, offers research-based guidance to families. There's even a special section explaining why the org does not recommend stranger danger rhetoric, in part because talking to unfamiliar adults is an important way for children to seek help if they're feeling unsafe. Teach children to trust their intuition, they advise. Remind children that most people in the world are good people who want them to be safe and strong. And what's stronger than mother's intuition? I mean, who's going to question Noreen Gosh's intuition here? and even being able to identify her own son. In the conclusion to Stranger Danger, Renfro paints a portrait of a nation that has shed its boogeyman where every child is looked after. If American adults wish to save our children, they will instruct children and adolescents not to fear strangers, but to maintain a healthy skepticism of those who they do not know. 
like this clueless writer on Little Village Mag and the corrupt on the idiot box. And those they do. They will care about young people as much when they are non-white as when they are white. You see, so many people are just so obsessed with people's skin color. It's just so crazy. As much as when they are homely as when they are adorable, as much as when they are born as when they are unborn, as much when they are found as when they are missing. I'm actually surprised this writer let that sneak in. Usually, uh, usually some of these psychotics are, are really prejudiced against the unborn and don't believe they have a right to live. But anyway, okay. Red bu so the author, Emma Clatchley, was born in Iowa City in 93. She can't remember not knowing the name Johnny Gosh. Interesting phrasing. So Emma Clatchley out there, wow, what a goof. Almost zero knowledge on the Johnny Gosh case despite being local. I just wanted to go over that to address the sentiment in the area and to address the sentiment of corruption deniers, despite mountains of evidence of corruption, particularly in the Johnny Gosh case. So, the last point here, I'm actually going to go straight to the Wikipedia of Des Moines, Iowa. Now, Des Moines supposedly was adopted from the early French name the Riviere Des Moines, meaning River of Monks. What kind of monks? We don't know. So it ranks 83rd in population in the U.S. Not that popular. Might have been even lower back then. Okay. Regarding the etymology here, in 2015, Michael McCafferty of Indiana University, while studying the Miami, Illinois language, concluded that the name was actually a derisive term coined by the Peoria tribe. McCafferty agrees that with other linguists that the Moine in Des Moines is a French derivation of Moingoana. What he discovered, however, was that it wasn't the actual name of the neighboring tribe. It was an insulting nickname they hurled at their rival. It translates essentially as the feces faces. And is it another coincidence that faces sounds like feces? <laughs> One interpretation of Des Moines ignores Vogel's research and concludes that it refers to a group of French Trappist monks who in the 17th century lived in huts built on top of what is now known as the Ancient Monk Mound at Cahokia, the major center of Mississippian culture, which developed into what is present-day Illinois east of the Mississippi and the city of St. Louis. This was some 200 miles from the Des Moines River. And there's a lot of ties to ancient Illuminati occult practices at Cahokia, which we won't get into for this, uh, for this podcast, but I will go the role that uh, Des Moines and the Iowa caucus has in politics. So this was posted on the Wikipedia before. Apparently it's been amended, but I'll go over it again anyway. Des Moines is an important city in presidential politics as the capital of Iowa, which is home to the Iowa caucus. The Iowa caucus has been the first major electoral event in nominating the president of the United States since 1972. Therefore, many presidential candidates set up headquarters in Des Moines. A 2007 article in the New York Times stated, quote, if you have any desire to witness presidential candidates in the most close-up and intimate of settings, there is arguably no better place to go than Des Moines. The article also added, I'm not sure I would go so far as to say that Des Moines has become a tourist destination, but it most certainly has become cool, end quote. So this is from a New York Times article. And is that another wink by the Illuminati? A more close-up and intimate setting? But here's the deal. If there is a widespread government conspiracy with top-ranking political officials and presidential candidates, a lot of them have headquarters in Des Moines. So for those that think that these conspiracy theorists are so outlandish, they kind of match up if the conspiracy is true. I'm not alleging it is true or untrue. But if it's true, it seems to all match up in Des Moines. So that sheds some light on why Des Moines, and if there are these uh, vast political rings, trafficking children and such, Des Moines could theoretically be uh, a pit stop 
since there's so much uh, headquartered there, not to mention, of course, everything going on with the Franklin scandal. And uh, Des Moines is also big for insurance companies. A lot of fraud goes on through there. So a lot of these uh, rich elites, so to speak, with ties to political candidates, possibly donating to their campaigns. And they're all involved with these shady individuals, not that far from Omaha, and all of their convicted politicians and law enforcement involved in corruption, trafficking, and exploitation of children. I mean, it kind of all adds up. So, I mean, coincidence theorists would love to just write it all off, but, I mean, it kind of adds up. So, if it's true, it kind of makes sense that that could be one of the areas where it is popular. So, hope everybody found another edition of the Mind Shock podcast interesting and informative. And to keep up awareness, you can help support Mind Shock. Just donate to our PayPal. Check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patreons do get a priority for case topic, logical analysis, called podcast to request. You can also be a guest in the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. In the next episode, we're going to be taking a look at a slew of attempted abduction of paper boys in the Des Moines area around that time period. There's definitely something strange going on with the with the register and the des moines area this is bruce mcguire signing off catch you guys next time
you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire, and you are listening to the Johnny Gosh series, the most extensive and comprehensive true crime podcast on the Johnny Gosh case, one of the most high profile disappearances in history, one that has possibly been responsible for bringing to light, however late, the vast government corruption going on in upper political circles, trickling down through police departments, etc. I mean, this case truly is the precursor to all of the Epstein, Jolzane, Maxwell insanity that's uh, under the microscope now. But this, this back in the 80s, a lot of people were hardcore coincidence theorists back then and could never imagine that uh, police were incompetent, let alone completely corrupt and complicit in active cover-ups. This is episode six, The Attempted Abductions. A lot of people don't know that Johnny Gosh was not the only one that criminals went after. There was a slew of attempted abductions in the Des Moines area around this time. And then, of course, we do have the other two abductions, one of which was Eugene Martin, another paper boy. So what is going on in this area here? And why has all of this been suppressed? Nobody's talking about this, these other attempted abductions and what it means for the case as a whole. I mean, this is truly, truly mind-shocking stuff. As always, if you want to help support the Mind Shock podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure you allow those notifications to come through. If you're still not getting them, just like and comment a lot more video on a lot more videos. That seems to be the way the YouTube algorithm works. You could also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind. Leave them in the comment section. So let's start this off with a very, very interesting post on the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit by West Kendall Jenner six years ago. A second look at Johnny Gosh and the mysterious failed abductions. So this is an update to this post about a string of failed abduction attempts that occurred in the Des Moines area between July 86 and September 89 and their potential to be connected to the disappearances of Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin. Please read that one first if you haven't already, as this post is updating and building on info in the first one and won't make sense otherwise. So let's go to the first one here. Quite extensive stuff. Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin cases possibly linked to a string of unsolved attempted abductions of newspaper carriers in 1980s Des Moines. Buckle up, this is going to be a long post. I'm working on a project about the presumed kidnapping of paperboys Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin from Des Moines, Iowa in the early 80s, not giving much more details beyond that just yet. Going through newspaper archives, I uncovered some information that seemed to hint at a serial child predator stalking the Des Moines area and that he may have been responsible for both abductions. I have never seen any of this info brought up on any discussion boards, documentaries, etc., I only found it under a virtual ton of newspaper articles. This surprised me because according to one article, police at the time suspected a connection between the two disappearances and some of the attempted kidnappings. I'm really curious to know what you guys think. And and obviously not 100% of police officers in 100% of departments are going to be corrupt and or complicit in uh, all of these cover-ups. There are good officers out there. So every now and then things slip through the crack. So when you're looking at cases, you have to keep that in mind. Note, this post is approaching the case from an angle completely separate from the Franklin scandal. Although not nece- it might not necessarily be separate on the surface. Who knows what lies beneath in this tangled web that is the Johnny Gosh case that stretches all the way to Washington, D.C. on one side and Bohemian Grove on the other. If you haven't checked out the previous episodes in the series, make sure to check those out. 
Brief background. 12-year-old Johnny Gosh went missing in the early morning hours, September 5th, 1982, while delivering newspapers in his neighborhood in West Des Moines, Iowa. His parents didn't know he was missing until 7 a.m. when customers began calling to ask where their newspapers were. Johnny's wagon, full of undelivered papers, was later found abandoned at the corner of 42nd Street and Marcourt Lane, about 320 meters from his home. On August 12th, 84, less than two years after Johnny disappeared, 13-year-old newspaper carrier Eugene Martin vanished while preparing for his delivery route sometime between 5.30 a.m. and 6 a.m. At about 7 a.m., a woman called his route manager saying she hadn't received her newspaper and asking if it was okay if she picked one up from the pile on the corner of 14th and Highview Street. The route manager alerted Gene's father 15 minutes later, and when the boy still hadn't returned home by 8.40, his father called the police. Police have never been able to conclusively link the two disappearances, but they believe that both boys were abducted. This was a very short summary, but I'm assuming most posters here are familiar with the case. For a more detailed refresher, you can read Johnny and Eugene's Charlie Project pages. Connected question mark. I believe that Johnny and Eugene were abducted by the same predator. Although there are discrepancies in the car and suspect descriptions, the circumstances seem to match almost perfectly. Here's a list of similarities I've identified. One, they were about a year apart in age at the time of the disappearances. Two, they were both paper boys for the Des Moines Register. Three, they vanished on an early Sunday morning. Four, they went missing around the same time of year, August, September. In fact, Jean vanished only three weeks shy of the two-year anniversary of Johnny's disappearance. Five, the abductions took place roughly eight miles apart. Six, they occurred in quiet, suburban, low-crime neighborhoods. Seven, Johnny's wagon and Jean's bag, both filled with undelivered papers, were found abandoned on street corners. Eight. There were no signs of a struggle at either scene. Nine, their disappearances went unnoticed until around 7 a.m. when customers began calling to ask where their newspaper was. Ten, there is nothing to indicate that either boy ran away from home. Gene was going to turn 14 in less than a week and had plans to pick out a new bicycle with his dad. Johnny was described as a happy, responsible, well-adjusted boy who took his newspaper route very seriously. It is very unusual for a runaway, especially one that young, to run away and successfully stay hidden for such a long period of time. There have been no verified signs of life since the day they vanished, although that is highly disputed. Again, check out the previous episode. Episodes. No activity on their social security numbers, no indication that they ever tried to get a job or buy a car, nothing. 11. Neither boy has been found. The attacks. Johnny and Eugene were not the only paper boys who were attacked back then. In fact, there was a string of attempted abductions of newspaper carriers in the Des Moines area in the 80s, which investigators at the time suspected were connected to Gosh and Martin. I've plotted all seven events, the two disappearances, and five attempted abductions on a map. You can check it out here. There's also been some comments, again, I don't know if this is verified in any way, but there have been some commentators on YouTube videos and podcasts that also claim they were either attempted to be abducted or that they just saw a strange guy in a car following them and look at, looking at them strangely and then just ran. Not that necessarily that an exact abduction was attempted, but all very, very suspicious. So the number of times that occurred could be a lot higher. But yes, on this map here, you can see that, uh, yeah, they are all relatively within... Uh, a small area. Very, very weird. So mostly Des Moines, West Des Moines, and in between, and also in Indianola? Huh. I must stress that none of these were officially tied to the two missing boys. It is also not known if the five attempted kidnappings were committed by the same person. Incident 1, July 10th, 86. 15-year-old Jim Polak, a carrier for the Des Moines Register, was out delivering papers on the morning of July 10th, 86, when he was grabbed by a man in a camouflage poncho. Jim managed to wrestle away from his assailant and then ran home and called the police. 
This occurred in the 500 block of 45th Street, only half a mile from where Johnny's wagon was found abandoned three and a half years earlier. Jim told police he had been chased six weeks prior in a separate incident, but it is not, it is unknown if it was the same man who chased him on July 10th. So, this is all really weird. Again, if you haven't checked out the previous episodes, make sure you check them out. There was clearly some funny business regarding the Des Moines Register. There were actual uh, individuals arrested for crimes with uh, underage uh, children, and it seems that it's a very real possibility that there were one or more individuals at the Des Moines Register who was specifically targeting paper boys. And in the case of Johnny, if you've looked at, uh, if you're familiar with the case, if you checked out the previous episodes, Paul Bonacci also claims uh, that he helped abduct Johnny, but also claimed that photographs were taken of Johnny and shown around to potential buyers, so these were targets. So this guy, Jim Polak, is saying, this kid, this 15-year-old, I mean, 15 year olds not quite a young kid. I mean, there's some big 15-year-olds. I mean, unfortunately, these guys aren't trying to uh, abduct some uh, Mike Tyson-type 15-year-olds. Uh, they would have gotten what they deserved uh, in that situation. But, yeah, so if he was targeted, so there were two attempts on him, possibly by the same guy, possibly not. I mean, this is freaky stuff here. I mean, this is just so mind-shocking, though, because is this happening in other cities? I mean, this is the Des Moines area, Des Moines, West Des Moines. Are other cities and other states, are, are there paper boys being targeted for abductions? I mean, what is this? Incident 2, September 88. I do not have an approximate address for this particular event. The location on the map is not accurate. I have very limited information about this one. From what I've gathered, a boy between the ages of 10 and 13 was chased by a man while delivering papers in Indianola, less than 20 miles from Des Moines. The perpetrator in this case was driving a white van. This occurred six weeks prior to Incident 3, which would put the date as sometime in mid to late September. So these are all occurring around the fall. I mean, this is crazy. Incident 3, November 1st, 1988. At around 5 a.m., November 1st, 88, 10-year-old Mike Fackler was delivering newspapers for the Des Moines Register when a heavyset man wearing a white jogging suit jumped out of his car and began to chase him. Mike ditched his bag and ran screaming to a neighbor's home where the owner pulled Mike inside the house and called the police. Police arrived at the home at 5.15 a.m. According to Des Moines Register, the man who tried to kidnap Mike matched the same physical description as the man in Incident 2. In both cases, the abductor drove a white vehicle, although it's called a car in Mike's case, and a van in the Indianola case. Which doesn't seem like a significant discrepancy considering this came from a 10-year-old boy who had just had a traumatic experience. I mean, you'd think that'd be clarified, however. Mike lived, you know, he could be, the 10-year-old boy could be shown photos of a white van and a white car and, and kind of explain what he saw, but I guess there's no follow-up here. They, the police weren't interested in any kind of uh, solving any of these. Mike lived roughly two miles from Johnny's home and less than eight miles from Jean's. For what it's worth, Noreen Gosh believed the attempted abduction was connected to her son's disappearance, but Fackler's father doubted it. You know what's weird, though? Like, on, on what credence is he doubting it? I mean, I can understand not knowing either way, but specifically doubting? Doubting would mean you're leaning in the direction of not related. How would he know? Incident 4, July 15th, 1989. Note, I am unable to find an approximate address for this event. The location plotted on the map is not accurate. On July 15th, 1989, yet... Another carrier for the Des Moines Register was almost abducted while delivering the morning paper. At 5.15 a.m., an unnamed 11-year-old noticed a white vehicle following him going the wrong way on a one-way street. The man got out of the car and began chasing him, screaming profanities and threatening to stab him if he didn't get in the car. He caught up to the boy and grabbed him by his sweatshirt, but the boy managed to wriggle out of the shirt and flee to a neighbor's home. The carrier told police his would-be kidnapper was in his 40s, about 6'2", had salt and pepper hair. He described the vehicle as a large white car with a red vinyl top. Now, that's a, that's a terrifying account. And it's an 11-year-old, too. I mean, obviously uh, not quite the same thing as a 13, 14, or 15-year-old, but 
Yeah, the 11 year old luckily was able to get away. Man, th these are terrifying accounts if you really think about them, whether they're related to other accounts or not. I mean, it's just, it's just terrifying. Incident five, September 14th, 89. 11 year old Melissa Gale was another carrier for the Des Moines Register. While delivering newspapers at about 6.20 a.m. on September 14th, 89. Yeah, these are all occurring around the fall. An unknown man in a blue car pulled up to her and ordered her to get in the car. Melissa turned around and ran to her father, who was helping deliver papers only a short distance away. And how lucky that is. Melissa said the man as a just said the man was white, late twenties, early thirties, large eyes and a large nose. He had a mole underneath his right eye. He drove a small dark blue car, possibly a Chevrolet Chevette, with a beige colored blanket in the back seat. The site of the attempted abduction is the thirty five hundred block of Floor Drive, less than two miles from Jean's home. I mean, that's also scary. And again, we do have this uh, anomaly that this was the first time Johnny Gosh was going to deliver papers alone without his father. Now, obviously, Leonard Gosh, some people believe he had something to do with Johnny Gosh's disappearance, possibly that he sold him. I mean, there's all this strange information about him being taken to some kind of Air Force base in the weeks prior and the strange phone calls Noreen Gosh describes overnight. And then, of course, that was supposedly the first time he was to go without his father. And he is kidnapped that time. <sighs> wow. Yeah, this is just completely terrifying that some scumbags here, they're just going after specifically mail carriers. I mean, Mark Allen, I believe, is the only one in the area connect that's possibly connected to all this who was not a mail carrier. Although maybe they thought he was. It's possible they thought he was. Or possibly if this is all, if they're all targeted and there's photographs, maybe he was mistaken for another one who was and they were targeting him and he looked close to him. A serial child predator. The possibility of a serial predator targeting children in the Des Moines area is not a new theory. The Des Moines Register reported on July 17th, 1989, that the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, the DCI, suspected a connection between the recent Indianola cases and both... Johnny and Eugene's disappearances. Wow. So this, is a, this was officially referenced that they're all connected. The DCI, which normally wouldn't get involved in a seemingly routine local crime, was so suspicious of a link that they began investigating the July 15th, 1989 attack themselves. And who knows what other information they have, particularly about some kind of corruption within the Des Moines Register and police departments. Mike Fackler and the two Indianola Paperboys encounters all took place within a 10-month period, between September 88 and July 89. In all three, the perpetrator drove a large white vehicle. Mike's attacker reportedly matched the physical description of the perpetrator in the, in the September 1988 event. And what are the chances that Indianola, a city with less than 11,000 residents, residents in the 80s, would suddenly have a two cases of a man with a white car chasing paper boys within the space of a year. The only difference between Mike's case and the other two has to do with the date. Mike's occurred on a weekday in November as opposed to a weekend in the summer or early fall. Unfortunately, because the physical description isn't publicly available in these two incidents, I am unable to say if it's consistent with the description provided in the July 89 attack. That being a 6'2 man in his 40s with graying hair. But even if the connection isn't as clear, it's not a far reach to suggest that whoever chased the paper boy in Indianola in September 88 is probably the same one who struck in July 89. The circumstances, timing, similar car, and the fact that they both occurred in the same small city all point to that. Let's look at this Indianola predator. How similar are his crimes to the abductions of Johnny and Eugene? 1. All incidents involved boys between the ages of 10 and 13. Two, four delivered papers for the Des Moines Register. It is unclear who the fifth the boy chased in the September 88 attack worked for. Is it possible he also did and they just didn't state that? Or a paper boy for somebody else? Three, with the exception of Mike Fackler, all were attacked in the summer months. Four, with the exception of Mike Fackler, all occurred on weekends. Five, 
I mean, isn't that real? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Five, all occurred in the early morning hours. Six, this is, the suspects in the Gosh and Martin cases were in their mid-30s to early 40s. This would be consistent with the Indianola predator described as 40 to 45 in 88-89. This leads us to a disturbing realization. If the two disappearances and the Indianola incidents are not related, this means that there was not one but two serial child predators in Des Moines back then, or simply a big ring, so it was the same ring with multiple people involved. That could also be a possibility. And that, I think, is even more terrifying than the idea of one single predator. Yes, it is. As for Jim and Melissa, I'm really not sure what to make of their encounters. Jim was the oldest victim at 15 and is the only case where the suspect tried to conceal their identity and apparently didn't have a car. What? However, the fact that Jim was accosted only half a mile from Johnny's home is a coincidence I can... I find really hard to ignore. I really wish I had more details on this one. I am inclined to think Melissa's case is separate from the others. She's the only female victim, and the perpetrator appeared significantly younger. Late 20s or early 30s, as opposed to 40 to 45. I included her in the list primarily because of how close she was to the site of Eugene's abduction. And again, if this is a ring and then they're selling people, I mean, obviously they could be selling girls as well as boys, so... Yeah, it's... It's weird. I was unable to find any articles about the cluster of attacks after the final one in September 89. Police have more or less stuck to the theory that Johnny and Eugene were abducted by a lone predator. They investigated a multitude of child predators, including serial murderers Bob Berdella and John Jubert, but eventually ruled them out. And I will be doing a Bob Berdella podcast that was, re that was requested that's coming up as well. So yeah, what do you guys think? I worry that I'm finding connections where there aren't any and would love some outside perspectives. Colonel Dredd posted this in response. The idea of two men working in tandem for the abduction of underage victims is far from fiction. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, a few years back, there was a case where two men abducted a boy off the streets, took him out to a cabin outside of town, forcefully confined him and were assaulting him for weeks. The boy later escaped and alerted the authorities. It was discovered in the following legal proceedings. The pair were on the run and were found in the northern part of Ontario hiding out. One of them had passed away because of health complications. That a third man had been contacted after the child had been abducted. That man traveled down to the cabin and met with the other two for the evening. The details of which weren't disclosed, but fairly easy to surmise. It's far from outrageous to assume that there could have been two offenders operating in the area at the same time of these disappearances. Fox Fire posted this. Also consider a Kenneth Parnell, Irvin Murphy type situation where the pedophile enlists an accomplice to help with the abduction but who is not involved in anything after that point. Another post here, which is really interesting. Both the Des Moines Register and law enforcement checked employees who quit shortly before or after Johnny disappeared. The employees would have been the first people police checked besides the family because they would have been familiar with the roots and how they worked. Johnny's mother, Noreen, actually had a specific Des Moines Register employee in mind, saying he resembled the composite sketch of a suspect in Johnny's case, and that he suddenly quit without picking up his paycheck. However, one of the Des Moines Register's lawyers said that the man actually left the newspaper about one and a half months before Johnny disappeared, and that the FBI interviewed him and eventually cleared him. Noreen conceded that the man had an alibi from his wife or girlfriend, but said she was not satisfied that this man had nothing to do with it. I'm assuming she doesn't think that anymore, though. So a few weird things here. So if there is some, some cover-up, obviously the Des Moines Register's lawyers would say that, or spin it, or alter paperwork, or whatever, if they were paid handsomely to do so, if there is uh, some kind of complicity or corruption here. And also... A lot of goofs out there, even so-called true crime aficionados, hallucinate that just because someone was cleared or stated that they were cleared, a lot of times uh, law enforcement, be it FBI or otherwise, they'll say someone is cleared to either get them to relax or see what they're going to do after the fact. So, yeah, there's a lot of different tactics involved there. So the goofs that hallucinate that just because someone was supposedly officially cleared, that means they had nothing to do with it. I mean, that's weird, especially when uh, so many cases are unsolved. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a weird one. 
A follow-up here, very astute by user since deleted. Unfortunately, women give their husbands false alibis all too often. Seems to be murderers and rapists sometimes have dysfunctional marriages in which the female is completely under their control. So sometimes alibis partners, alibis by partners are not that great. I actually cringe when I hear some of these alibis. Quote, he hadn't moved to that state yet, end quote. So people can travel. He was working. So, people get lunch breaks and plenty of other reasons to leave work for a while. He was with his wife. So, partners are the most likely to lie. A very, very astute post there. A lot of goofs out there. They can't fathom that, uh, yeah, not all alibis are equal. M. Galinsky responded with this, Our film, Who Took Johnny, definitely comes from the Franklin angle, but it does include information about Eugene Martin and Mark Allen. In the list above of similarities, one thing that you left out was that both of the fathers were in the military. That's actually curious because not only that, but uh, Leonard Gosh took Johnny Gosh to an Air Force base, supposedly. In uh, in weeks weeks before. I mean, it's kind of weird. In the film, when we interviewed the police, they stated that the crimes were not connected and that the only connection was their gender. It took a while for us to find distribution for it, but it is now on iTunes and Amazon. The film is largely structured from the point of view of Noreen Gosh. We understand that many people are skeptical. The film is not meant to be an argument about what happened, but instead to present a lot of what did, not all by any means, and what was discussed in a narrative format with Noreen as the main character. One of the things that has often been described as debunked is the idea that the pictures that Noreen received were declared to be a different set of boys from Florida. We spoke with Detective Zalvis, and he only knew one of the photos. It's one that doesn't look like the others, and he had not seen any of the others. There was a recent article on Medium that took issue with the inclusion of this information, stating that Zalvo recalled it as innocent child's play. However, in the film, which the article was based on, Zalva states very clearly that as soon as he saw the pictures, he knew it was a pedophile, but that none of the kids would admit that anything had happened. More info about the film at whotookjohnny.com. Uh, and we also actually went into that, and supposedly Zalva did apologize for all of this. Uh, and so, yeah, because a lot of goofs hallucinate that that was all debunked. I mean, that's like the favorite word of coincidence there is debunked, <laughs> when obviously it was not. So Experience posted this. You have done a truly remarkable job in researching these incidences. However, by ruling out any connections to the Franklin scandal in nearby Omaha, you are ignoring a few important points. Although it's been some time since I studied Franklin and the Johnny Gosh abduction, I'll try to go by what I remember. One, Paul Bonacci, a key figure in Franklin, was actually in the car driven by the abductors of Johnny Gosh. Paul was only a little boy at the time, but remembered enough details about Gosh's appearance when he was abducted, details that had never been released to the public, that his story made believers of Gosh's parents when Paul first spoke with them years later. Two, as I remember, the abductors of Gosh were much more organized than the perp in the later attempted abductions you cite. The way that Banashi described Gosh's abduction, there was no way that he could have escaped, as did the later ones. Banashi said that the abductors lured Gosh so close to their vehicle that they literally snatched him into the car. They were too calculating to get into a situation where they would need to chase after or struggle with the victim, as you described happened in later attempted abductions. Three, the fact that the first two incidents were successful abductions while all the later ones were failed attempts suggests that there was at least two abductors at work here. Criminals, like everyone else, generally get better at their job over time, not worse. That the first two incidents occurred successfully and without a hitch means that in these two cases, the perp knew what he was doing, possibly from past experience. The perp in the later attempts was clearly disorganized. This clearly shows a regression in criminal ability over time. The world, the criminal world or otherwise, doesn't generally work that way. Well, unless, of course, if there is a ring and they have multiple people working for them, they might have outsourced some of these because it's getting too risky or they're, they're becoming elevated because if they committed these earlier abductions, they got big payouts. So now they're hiring underneath them other people to do abductions for them where they don't care if they fail because if those people, if those abductors get caught, oh well. But if they succeed and deliver the children, they can sell them and, and share the profit. So that's a possibility. Also, if some of these were drug users, again, depending on how high they were, that could also influence success. 
Four, there seems to be at least two perps at work here. Doesn't rule out that all of these incidents were connected. According to the Franklin scheme, both perps could have been working for the same gang of child abductors. Yes, good point there. Five, you neglect to consider that the series of assaults on news carriers in Des Moines ended almost exactly at the same time that the Franklin Credit Union was exposed in nearby Omaha, Nebraska. Coincidence? I doubt it. That's an interesting point, the timeline with uh, Franklin blowing up, blowing wide open. That is curious. All of a sudden, no more abductions, huh, or attempts. That's interesting. So... Let's uh, circle back to the original post here. There's been some progress in the rabbit hole since the first post in June, which is the one we just went over, which I wanted to share with you guys. Newspapers.com recently posted two new articles from Iowa City Press Citizen, which provide more details on some of the attempted abductions. And the interactive map of the case, which I highly recommend using, has been updated. Sources and footnotes are here. Most of this post is updates on previous information or things I didn't catch the first time around, but there's one clue in particular that really jumped out and which I believe deserves more attention. The fact that a second newspaper carrier was attacked on the same street Johnny Gosh was abducted from four years earlier. September 5th, 82, 12-year-old Johnny Gosh disappeared while preparing for his delivery route in the early morning hours of September 5th, 82. Accompanied by his dashund puppy, Gretchen, he left his home just after 5.45 a.m., cut through the neighbor's yard and walked the two blocks east to pick up his newspapers at the corner of 42nd and Ashworth. When he got to the corner, he was stopped by a man wearing a baseball cap and sitting in a late model blue car next to the newspaper drop who wanted to know how to get to 86th Street, 20 blocks away. Johnny gave him directions and the man made a U-turn onto Ashworth Road and drove off. A few minutes later, as Johnny chatted with his teenage friend Mike at the paper drop, the man passed by and parked at the corner again. This time, he leaned out the passenger side window and asked the kids collectively how to get to 86th Street. After trying and failing again to give him directions, Johnny approached John Rossi, an adult neighbor who had been picking up newspaper bundles for his three sons. Can you help? He wants to know where 86th Street is, he asked. Rossi went to go help the driver, and Johnny returned to his friend Mike and said something to the effect of, that man is really weird. We're actually getting some new information here. I don't remember going over these details before. In fact, his behavior was so odd that John Rossi believed he was on drugs. This guy was high, he told the Des Moines Register in 83. When you're drunk, you're drowsy. He was wide awake, and I could see his beady eyes staring into the horizon. This is where things start to get really murky. As Rossi talked to the driver, Johnny loaded the papers into his wagon and began walking up 42nd Street. Rossi concluded his conversation with the man, who now seemed agitated, and slid back into the driver's seat to leave. Inexplicably, he flicked his dome lights on and off three times before turning around the corner and tearing off like a bat out of hell eastbound on Ashworth. He drove three blocks before turning onto 39th Street and bolting north. Very shortly after this, a 15-year-old newspaper carrier saw a tall man walk out from the shadows between two houses and towards Johnny from behind as the boy approached the corner at Marcourt Lane. Johnny reached the end of the block and crossed the street to park his wagon at 42nd and Marcourt, where he usually left it while delivering to Frank Crest Circle. A neighbor looking out from his upstairs windows watched as a silver Ford Fairmont with a black stripe rolled up to the corner. But due to where his house was situated, the car blocked Johnny from view. It is unclear whether Johnny was just approaching the corner or sitting in his wagon when the car pulled up. According to some sources, the witness later turned away but heard a car door slam, looked out his window to see what it was, and saw the car drive off. When the car left the corner, Johnny was gone. Nobody knows exactly when Johnny disappeared, but the alarm wasn't raised until about 7.45 a.m. when a neighbor called Johnny's father, John Gosh, to ask where the paper was. This immediately struck Gosh as odd. Johnny had a reputation as a responsible punctual carrier and had never skipped work once in the year he had been delivering for the Des Moines Register. Thinking he overslept, Gosh went 
to check his room only to find it empty and then noticed that the family dog Gretchen had returned home alone. He began to search the neighborhood for Johnny and quickly found his wagon abandoned at the corner of 42nd and Marcourt with his newspaper bundle inside. Not one of the 37 papers had been delivered. Concerned, but not yet alarmed enough to call the police, Gosh picked up the papers and delivered them himself before going to search the neighborhood more thoroughly. At 8.30 a.m., after being unable to find him for 45 minutes after receiving the call from the neighbor, Gosh called the police to report his son missing. I don't know. Does anybody find that strange if Leonard John Gosh is not connected to his son's disappearance in any way? Knowing that, the, knowing that his son was that responsible, why would he not be alarmed? I mean, if there was a tendency for him to be late, not deliver papers, you know, all these things, then maybe. But if he was that punctual and responsible, how is he not alarmed that the, that the wagon with the papers is there, not a single paper delivered, and no Johnny, and the dog came home alone? I mean, is that not a call for alarm? Between July 10th, 86 and September 14th, 89, five newspaper carriers in the Des Moines area reported being chased by strange men on their early morning delivery routes. Some of the earlier articles about Johnny's disappearance include an unnamed mother whose 10-year-old son was bothered by a man before September 5th, 82. According to this woman, her son was delivering papers in the early morning near Johnny's home when the guy drove up and began saying things to him. The nature of these comments is unknown, but they disturbed the boy enough that he ran several y across several yards to get away from the man. There are so few details that it can't even be classified as an attempted abduction, which is why it hasn't been added to the list. Although, obviously, we don't know what would have happened if the boy didn't run away. Also, there are two things to add to the list of similarities between Johnny and Eugene's disappearance. Both boys were kidnapped the first time they went out to deliver papers alone, and both their fathers were in the military. Whoa, hold on a second. Did, I, don't, I don't remember going over that in Eugene Martin's disappearance. Was that, was that known? Was that in the articles in the previous episodes? That was also Eugene's first time alone? Huh. That's kind of weird. That's really weird. And of course, the military connections. The Indianola attacks. Two of these incidents occurred in Indianola, less than 20 miles from Des Moines. In each case, which took place 10 months apart in September 88 and July 89, a male Des Moines register carrier between the ages of 10 and 13 was chased by a man driving a white van with a dark vinyl top. There is very little information about the first one, but the second one bore enough similarities to the disappearances of Johnny and Eugene that police requested the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation to step in to see if they could be related. In an unusual move, the DCI agreed to get involved in the apparently routine local case, but the results of this inquiry is unknown. What a coincidence. According to a recently posted 89 article from the Iowa City Press Citizen, Two other register carriers were chased last year by men who have never been identified. This almost certainly refers to incidents two and three from the first post, which occurred in September and November 88, respectively, and seems to confirm that the boy in the September Indianola incident delivered for the Des Moines Register. This means all seven kids worked for the same paper. Of course, this is the Des Moines area, so it's not super weird, but still really interesting nonetheless. Well, of course, there, there were, I mean, it's not like it's the only newspaper. Obviously, there's other newspapers as well. The blue car implicated in Johnny's case bore Warren County license plates. Indianola, the city 20 miles from Des Moines, that saw the attempted kidnappings of two male newspaper carriers, which the assistant director of the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation said bore curious similarities to the disappearances of Johnny and Eugene, is in Warren County. Mike Fackler, there is now more information available on the third incident, the attempted abduction of 10-year-old Mike Fackler. According to Mike's father, Steve, Mike was walking past the apartment buildings on Alice Avenue at 5 a.m. November 1st, 88, when a white car pulled up in the nearby parking lot close to him. A heavy set man, wearing a white jogging suit, got out of the vehicle and began to chase after Mike, who dropped his newspaper bag to the ground and bolted to his neighbor's home. However, a recently posted article published November 4th, 88, quotes a police official who said the following, quote, there was no indication in our interview that he was actually chased. Clive Police Detective Jerry Miller said, He was walking by the apartment building when a car pulls into the first stall. A guy got out and jogged to the sign. The boy stopped and he panicked. 
He said it didn't seem similar to the case of Johnny Gosh and the West Des Moines paperboy who was 12 when he disappeared in 82 while delivering newspapers. So that obviously throws the events of November 1st, 88 into question. For what it's worth, Noreen Gosh believed Mike's case was related to Johnny's and said police should take it more seriously, although Mike's own father and two Clive police detectives believed the two were unrelated. All four of the articles about the attempted abductions published after November 4th continued to cite this as an actual attempt and not an overreacting paperboy. This one will probably remain a mystery unless more information resurfaces or by some miracle Mike finds himself this post... Mike himself finds this post and decides to reach out. There's one coincidence that deserves a quick mention. The driver of the blue car had asked Johnny and the other carriers how to get to 86th Street. 86th Street is in Clive, and Mike was attacked in a neighborhood that's along 86th Street. In fact, the approximate spot is less than 1,000 feet from the road. Okay, this is all kind of weird. If the police are trying to sweep this under the rug, obviously they would set, they would try to downplay any event of a chase. Oh, he wasn't actually chasing the kid. He just happened to be jogging in his exact direction. I mean, here's the part where intuition comes into play. Yes, obviously the kid could be mistaken. But what instinct, what natural instinct caused that kid to flee? And why would a, a an adult just start randomly jogging directly towards a kid? You would think they would have, they would either smile or go off to this. I mean, how often does someone park a car and make a beeline towards a, a young child delivering newspapers? I mean, it's kind of weird. The police explanation doesn't really hold a lot of weight. I mean, obviously, Mike himself should clarify on this. I mean, there's just so many coincidences here. And the insistence that it's not related, even by Mike's own father. I mean, okay, if this kid routinely thinks adults are trying to abduct him and run towards him when they're not, then okay. If this kid has done this a bunch of times with random adults all over the place, then his fa then that would be good reason for the father to say, oh, it's probably not related because he does this all the time. We were just at the mall and somebody was just jogging in our direction and he thought he was trying to abduct him and he just ran away. So if this is something this kid does all the time, okay then. But if this is the only time it's ever happened, then that's weird. And did the police uh, kind of let the father know that he should make comments that it's not related? Obviously, we have no way of knowing that. Okay, continuing on here, the most important finding, Jim Polak. Remember Jim, the 15-year-old register carrier who was ambushed by a man in a camo poncho while delivering papers half a mile from Johnny's home? While reading the account of his attack again, I realized there was a mistake. In the first post, I'd written that the incident occurred in the 500 block of 45th Street, but it actually happened in the 500 block of 42nd Street. I clicked over to the map to fix the location, dragged Jim's marker over to 42nd Street, and noticed that the spot lined up near perfectly with the cluster of marks just above it. And that's when it hit me. That's the same street that Johnny was abducted from. Did Johnny's kidnapper strike twice on the same street nearly four years apart? There are certainly several similarities between the two crimes. Both victims were attacked on their early morning delivery route while working for the Des Moines Register. Jim's encounter came just three years, ten months after Johnny's kidnapping. Although Jim was attacked on a Thursday and Johnny on a Sunday, it was roughly the same time of day. They're pretty close in age. Jim was 15. Johnny was just two months from turning 13. They happened half a mile away on the same street. Because the details of Johnny's disappearance are so convoluted and there are three different strangers to consider... There isn't really a way to compare the perpetrator's M.O.s. Jim being attacked from behind would be consistent with the eyewitness's account of a tall man walking out of the shadows and towards Johnny from behind. But that's not good evidence when you have two other suspects to consider. It's also not unprecedented for a serial offender to strike more than once in the same small area. For example, the original Night Stalker repeatedly targeted the same neighborhoods, often assaulting women only doors down from previous victims. Having successfully abducted a child in the neighborhood previously, whoever took Johnny may have felt comfortable enough to try it again a second time in the same area, especially four years later when people's guards are down. You know what's crazy, too? I don't know if I mentioned this. How many other attempted abductions were not reported? Like, again, let's just say it was somebody cruising, eyeing someone strangely, and the person felt un the kid felt uncomfortable and maybe darted away or ran away and never reported it. I mean, it's kind of chilling just to even think about how many more times something like that could have happened. 
my opinion. I want to be very clear. My intent is not to set out and prove that any or all of these are connected, but to bring attention to another avenue of exploration that warrants a second look. The fact that another boy was apparently grabbed on the same street just under four years after Johnny is highly suspect and deserves to be revisited. If Johnny and Eugene were snatched by the same predator, or predators, which I believe to be the case, then it makes sense that they wouldn't be the only two victims. Part of me wonders if this may even be a Danny James Heinrich type situation where you have a serial predator who assaults multiple victims but only kills once or twice due to extreme circumstances. Based on the information that's available, I think Melissa Gale is probably unrelated to the others. She is the lone female victim, and the suspect in her encounter appeared much younger than the men in the other cases. Well, I mean, how many men were there, though? If there were three or four, one of them could be younger. As for Mike, it looks like his encounter was probably a standalone incident as well, although I'm hesitant to rule him out just yet. There's a decent chance that Jim Polak and or the other two boys who were chased in Indianola are connected to Johnny and Eugene. I waffle back and forth between thinking Johnny was abducted by a single predator and thinking there was more than one person involved. When you analyze the events of that morning, some of them sound a little too perfectly timed for it to happen organically, such as the man on foot showing up about the same time as the silver Ford Fairmont pulled up on the corner of 42nd and Marquardt. Was the man in the blue car signaling to someone else when he flicked his dome lights on and off? Is he the proverbial red herring and it was the guy on foot who grabbed Johnny from behind and forced him into the silver Ford Fairmont that had just pulled up to the corner? The presence of an accomplice would make sense of some of the odder details. How often does a random guy ask for directions not once but twice and be really weird about it and then someone gets abducted right after? I mean... Again, theoretically, it is possible it's not related, but that's just weird. If you made it this far, thanks so much for reading. I really look forward to hearing your guys' thoughts. What do you think? One of the articles from the uh, Des Moines Register, September 7th, 82, is actually titled, Nothing is Ruled Out So Far in Hunt for Missing Boy 12. Another coincidence here, Johnny was taken September 5th, 82. Eugene was snatched August 12th, 84, one year, 11 months after Johnny. Jim Polak was attacked on July 10th, 86, which is also about one year, 11 months after Eugene. Just another creepy coincidence. An interesting post here by Kangaroo1974. One question regarding Melissa, the female newspaper carrier who reported an abduction attempt when she was 11 years old. Any chance she had short hair and could have been mistaken for a male? If a car pulled up next to her and the driver saw her only from behind, maybe he thought she was a boy and is related to the other abduction attempts. I had short hair around the same age and was often mistaken for a boy by strangers. Interesting point also. So this brings us all back to Yellow Bag and the alleged attempted abduction before that of Johnny Gosh. Now, we did go over the Millhouse allegations and, of course, the Faded Out podcast, rather inaccurate. From uh, Cav Def, I went over this before, but just really quick. Information was shared by Yellowbag on the Iowa Cold Case page for Johnny Gosh beginning September 5th, 2016, the 31st anniversary of the abduction. Faded out interviews with Yellowbag as well as a former Des Moines Register circulation manager and Yellowbag's purported mother. Events that morning, several major controversies have arisen over the events of the morning that Johnny was abducted. Was Johnny at Ashworth that morning, or did witnesses mistake another paper boy for him? Did a tall man follow Johnny, or whoever the boy was, after he picked up his papers on Ashworth? Were there two separate cars, blue car at Ashworth, silver Ford Fairmont at Marcourt, or just one blue car? Did the Bozen brothers, Kevin and Mark, see Johnny slumped over his wagon as they passed by him on Marcourt? Is it true that P.J. Smith saw Johnny being forced into the car and was forced by Orville Cooney to suppress his witness account? Was there a van parked several blocks away that a witness saw an object wrapped in a blanket get transferred into from another car? So, Mike Seskis and John Rossi were both at 42nd and Ashworth that morning and both were adamant they saw Johnny. 
Chris Beers asserting that Johnny really picked up his papers at Markhart, not Ashworth. This was entirely uncorroborated until the non-credible letter John Gosh endorsed Chris's story despite never having challenged it in the past. Even then, Leonard admitted that Johnny did normally get his papers on Ashworth. Neighbor Lawrence Hedlund heard someone pulling a wagon through his backyard on the morning of the kidnapping just as Leonard John Gosh admitted Johnny usually did. Seskis was a friend and, jo- and Rossi saw the boy had a wagon and dog with him, which no other paper worries besides Johnny did. Insinuation, which first suggested that uh, Chris first suggested and Sarah tried leading Matt Seskis into that Mike Seskis was fed a false story about the tall man coming out to follow Johnny. Numerous press accounts describing two separate cars. By 88, Noreen in popular magazine People, not the mainstream press that some like Leonard have claimed Bonacci read while in prison, mentioned only a single blue car at both places. In the 85 Senate hearing where the Goshes shared the map of the immediate neighborhood containing the summaries of witness accounts. Rather implausibly, Sarah repeatedly dismissed the idea that the same car could have driven around the block to meet Johnny on Marquardt. Bozins retracted their account of seeing Johnny slump on his wagon to Chris. March 6, 83, news article, Leonard John Gosh in 84, the above neighborhood sketch and Noreen in 92 all mentioned two paper boys seeing Johnny slumped over his wagon before Noreen finally named them in her book as the Bozen brothers by their own admissions. The Bozens were in the right place at the right time. PJ Smith also denied to Chris his alleged disclosures to Noreen about witnessing the abductions. Based on the geographical details that Noreen mentioned, the van was near the intersection 42nd and Woodland. Coincidentally or not, this is where Chris Beers picked up his papers, raising the question of whether he saw something he shouldn't have and got similar treatment to what P.J. Smith allegedly faced. So yeah, there's a lot of problems with the Faded Out podcast. But just a summary of Yellow of uh, Yellowbag's comments. Trumplet77 posted this on Reddit. He says he was also approached while working as a paperboy for the same paper as Johnny. He reported it to the police when he heard about the Johnny Gosh case, but the police never followed it up. Even more interestingly, he said that a guy named Wilbur Milhouse, who became his duty manager at the paper, liked to give the paper boys beer and money. He said that one time at a party Milhouse had organized for the paper boys, he saw him talking to the very guy who'd approached him in his car. It turns out that Milhouse was convicted of abusing young boys in 87. Surely this is too much of a coincidence. A pedophile who happened to be working at the paper at the time who had contact with paper boys? I mean, he could be talking nonsense, but it seems legit. Wilbur uh, Wilbur Milhouse had 2,200 people's names in a book and said he was trying to recruit paper boys. Was Johnny and Eugene's name in this book? That's actually curious. Yellow Bag posted this September 26th, 2022. The man who tried to abduct me in 82 was driving a Ford Fairmont, not a Chevy Nova. I remember the two rectangular headlights, which was, I see online, was standard for the Fairmont Futura that came out in, in 78. The car was covered with snow, but I remember it as white or maybe two-tone white and gray. Funny thing, I went out east for college in 86 and had a girlfriend who drove an old Fairmont. It creeped me out every time I saw her car coming because I remembered the evil dude who tried to get me into the same kind of car four years earlier. It's hard to remember a lot of details 40 years after the fact, but I don't think Jubert would have been old enough to be the man who tried to abduct me. I'm guessing the abductor was at least 25 years old. The thing I remember the most is his orange and blue reflective jacket and the way he kept looking in his rearview mirror to see if anyone saw him talking to me. He did not look like the photo of Wince at all or John Rossi's sketch of the guy at 42nd and Ashworth the morning Johnny was kidnapped. Dark hair, angry dark eyes, well-trimmed mustache, Caucasian and accent like he was from somewhere out east. I actually met Sam Soda through the Faded Out podcast and had lunch with him. Anyone who thinks Sam was involved is barking up the wrong tree. Yes, Sam could brag and tell some stories, but he came across to me as a guy with a big heart. Sam thought the kidnapper was a total lone wolf. If he partnered with anyone, someone would have ratted him out for reward. And that's interesting. If this is all a setup by Yellowbag, or possibly just Yellowbag being deceived by Sam Soda and some of these other scumbags to tout a certain narrative, is that how they would do it? 
Yellow Bag followed up. Sam talked to criminals, pedophiles, and even mafia types. He came up with exactly nothing. His final thoughts were that only one man kidnapped Johnny, not a group of men. If it were a group, someone would have talked by now. Like Bonacci. <laughs> Sam also believed the man was probably connected with the Des Moines Register. I do not know if Milhouse was physically present. He was, though, repeatedly claiming to know who took Johnny and why from the day Johnny was kidnapped. Milhouse became angry and visibly agitated every time he talked about Johnny. I have no doubt he was involved, but I have never figured out to what extent. Milhouse probably had dozens of victims. He received a 30-year sentence for sexually abusing six teens. And I still think the key to solving Johnny's disappearance is for one of those victims to reveal the identity of the Fairmont man. Someone who knew Milhouse knows who that man is. Someone asked if uh, Yellowbag had a photo of the man who tried to get into his Fairmont. He did not respond to that. Some posts here. This is all from iowacoldcases.org uh, under case summaries in the comment section. Tri-State Girl posted this. Local pedophiles who could have come in contact with Johnny Milhouse specifically and faded out and on this site... Yellow Bag talks about how Milhouse said Johnny was taken because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. The paper really messed up, letting two pedophiles work with kids. Milhouse had already been charged while working at the paper in the 70s. Sakura had been in the same home his brother molested kids in during the 70s as well. Then Sakura was busted in the 80s as a pedophile himself. There was also a pedophile ring in Des Moines that was busted in the 80s. Other men that, as far as I know, weren't attached to the register, but maybe they knew Kenneth. There were also attempted kidnappings from 86 to 89. I don't know what to make of those because Milhouse, a prime suspect, was already in jail. Maybe Kenneth was having his go at it. A lot of this was lost in time since all of these men are dead now. Another uh, interesting post by Tri-State Girl here. Yellowbag hadn't made his comments on here yet. However, there were articles from the 80s about Milhouse, Sakura, the guy at the mall, and the pedophile ring in Des Moines that was busted. Hmm. Another post by Yellowbag here. Wilbur Milhouse and Frank Sakura, two former Des Moines Register employees, were both convicted of sexually abusing teen boys in the 80s. Milhouse told me several times that he knew who took Johnny and why. Last fall, I found a photo of the man who approached me in a Ford Fairmont in 82. And guess what? He was a Des Moines Register employee. I think the key is solving Johnny's disappearance is to find former victims of Register employees and ask them exactly what they remember hearing around the time of Johnny's disappearance. I know the odds are against it, but I'm wondering if any former victims read this website and be willing to speak out. Milhouse and Sakura had at least seven victims that they were charged with abusing, but they may have had dozens more who never said a word about what happened to them. Here's another interesting post about, uh, wow, this is really creepy, by Bob. I was 17 in 82. Not much contact with Wilbur except softball team. I was more late 70s, early 80s. The phone calls, the $100 bills, the creepy kids, all too familiar. Are you a TRHS area? I'm not a victim. I was approached by a large man on foot while delivering, asking where the, where the party was at. Where can a guy get some action and that sort of stuff? I can remember saying something like, how would I know I'm only 13? I kept my distance as he followed on foot for about a block, at which point I dropped everything and ran like hell two blocks home. Today, I still say I could have been Johnny. True story. Wow. So he doesn't say the year here, but presumably this is before Johnny. So this is, I mean, how many of these unreported cases are there or cases they're only reported after the fact? Yellowbag responded, I was an East High student when I met Milhouse in 82. When my family moved, I applied for a paper route in the Four Mile area. I got a creepy phone call from someone who knew the schools I had attended and described where items were located in my bedroom. There was a wooded vacant lot next to my house and he apparently had watched me there with binoculars. I am sure now that it was Milhouse. Did Milhouse ever say anything to you about Johnny Gosh? Do you know anyone that Milhouse hung out with? Do you know anyone Milhouse sexually abused? The DM register rehired Wilbur Milhouse in 1978 after 
He had been arrested for sexual abuse in 75. As someone said, quote, they had to have known about Milhouse because his arrest was in their own damn paper, end quote. Wow. I mean, that's insane. Anybody who thinks the Des Moines Register is innocent in all of this, I mean, this is crazy stuff. Jeeb Z1 posted this. The Fred that Chris referred to in the Faded Out podcast is Fred Freeland Sayer. He was a known Chester in the Des Moines area that worked at the piano store at the mall and died in 1994 from a gunshot wound once he relocated to Missouri. Not saying that this guy was the Emilio, just saying that he's one of many people that could have been a potential suspect, and I'm sure at some point he was on the police's radar. Just think of how many hundreds of people it could have been that are known Chesters. Then think of the many Chesters that are unknown or were unknown and have died since then. It's literally impossible to tie anyone to Donny Goss' kidnapping or Eugene Martin's kidnapping without evidence and witness accounts that could put positively ID a plate, a license plate, or someone for a certain or someone to lead them to the remains and then do DNA testing. Yes, Johnny and Eugene were both paper boys and they were both kidnapped. But then think of all the attempted kidnappings that almost happened but didn't. For years, I thought the cases were tied together, and they very well could still be because there are many similarities. Both on a Sunday, both paper boys, both around the same age, etc. But the more years go by in this case, the more I'm beginning to understand why law enforcement couldn't tie the cases together. The only one saying Johnny and Eugene and then Mark Allen's cases were tied together was Noreen in her book. The whole, Sa well, not just her, the whole Sam Soda alerting Noreen that there was going to be another abduction in 84, then Eugene Martin was kidnapped, that whole thing was from Noreen. Noreen said in the book that Soda told her. Sam has denied it, and there is absolutely no proof, no recorded call, nothing concrete that shows that Sam did alert Noreen before Eugene Martin's kidnapping. If she could put a WAV file or MP3 of that convo on her website, I'd believe it all day long, and it could be true, but I'm just saying there's no proof. There was supposedly uh, a police—I went over this in previous episodes. There was a police detective that supposedly corroborated that, but again, who knows how the tape went missing, etc. Is there a copy of the tape? I mean, these are all curiosities. But it is curious that in the years since, Noreen seems to be substantiated by many different police officers and detectives over the years. So that is curious, because years ago, when it was impossible to know or corroborate, like, Noreen keeps getting vindicated as time goes by. I mean, if you haven't checked out the first couple episodes in the Johnny Gosh podcast here on Mindshock, check them out, because I actually go point by point where I didn't automatically, obviously, assume Noreen was correct about anything, but just going over information, obviously, there's still much that's uncorroborated, but many pieces have been corroborated as time went on. Linking the two cases together was probably done to keep the Johnny Gosh case in the spotlight and keep the leads coming in. Hell, I probably would have done the same thing if it was one of my sons. A good way to keep your case alive is to tie it to other similar cases as the years go by. I mean, I don't see that, though. Noreen Gosh is basically looking out for other kids as well and bringing awareness to it. I mean, obviously that also overlaps with Johnny Gosh, but not necessarily. Notice that Patty Wedeling didn't tie her son's disappearance to anyone else's kidnapping or to Franklin or MK Ultra or DeCamp or Gunderson or anyone else, and neither did the Martin family. Well, the Martin family was completely, uh, well, I mean, Wetterling was a bit of a distance away, and did Patty, was Patty Wetterling threatened by police? Was there an active police cover-up in that situation like there was with Noreen? Gosh. Again, apples and oranges here by this uh, individual. Clearly a very illogical post, but I will finish it anyway. Think about that just for one minute. Just saying this case cannot be solved by looking at all these far-out conspiracy theories. Or is that the only way to solve it because nothing else has solved it? This case cannot be solved by looking at all these far-out conspiracy theories. The whole Franklin thing was a tragedy. I'm sure it really happened. I'm sure Larry King has skeletons in his closet, but most politicians do, and that doesn't mean it's tied to Johnny Gosh. It doesn't mean it's, it, it isn't either. This case can only be solved by looking at who the Chester and the molesters were at the time and what witnesses saw. A lot of the folks that could have been potentially been perps are long dead, and there are only a few living people today that probably know what happened to them. Not saying they were the perps, but I bet Sakura has a pretty good idea even if he has just heard through the grapevine. And I bet even more so Soda, because of his involvement with the program he put on, scared stolen children are reported every day. And he has a pretty good idea of what happened also. Wilbur Milhouse probably knew for sure as well, but he's dead now, and I doubt he was ever polygraphed at the time anyway.
I'm saying we have no real idea who the perps were. I know the general consensus among many is to view the police as lazy and uncooperative in this case, according to the many watered-down documentaries. Just remember the police really have no proof of what happened to them, unless they were, of course, involved. These are good. There are good cops and bad cops. Most cops are pretty good. Some cops, some good cops have a bad leader, and they are stuck. The police, all well, and also plenty of police are involved in conspiracies, as we keep seeing time and time again in a lot of these wrongful convictions. The police also have limited resources and can't stop everything they are doing to dump their manpower and money into solving one case. The only thing that was tragic is that the police had to wait 72 hours before they started investigating it as a missing persons case, but that was the law at the time, and thankfully Noreen did a wonderful thing to change that. Well, first of all, it actually wasn't technically the law, and also there's a difference between not pursuing actively and silencing wit witnesses <laughs> like Orville Cooney. Did. I mean, this is just insanity that this, I mean, this guy seems not to be familiar with the case that much. That's probably why they weren't in a big hurry to get to her house that morning. If it was a murder, they would have been there faster, but they had 72 hours to get there. That's why it took them 45 minutes. I'm taking a wild guess that the police worked harder than anyone who wasn't a member of the West Des Moines Police Department at the time could ever know on this case. I mean, why would he guess that? It's pretty wild indeed. Seems completely false based on Noreen Gosh doing far more than the police ever did. All the facts from this case can be found from the early days. Everything else is just a story. I urge everyone to use common sense when investigating this case and don't get sucked into all of the Gannon MK Ultra conspiracy stuff. A appeal to incredulity. This is why so many cases go unsolved and all, a lot of these uh, vast conspiracies, it's so easy for them to, to be ongoing because all these gullible goofs think they're completely implausible. Okay. Yellowbag responded here, at least nine pedophiles were arrested in the Des Moines area after Johnny's kidnapping. I found newspaper photographs of all but one of the men. None looked like the man who approached me in the Ford Fairmont when I was delivering newspapers in 82. I agree with you that Johnny and Eugene were probably dead within 72 hours of their kidnappings. If Johnny was kidnapped to make pornography, how come no one has ever reported seeing him in pornography? Well, supposedly people have, but... And then f various photos with it, videos on websites. There are some real problems with the story of Johnny's 2 a.m. homecoming. Listen to the Faded Out podcast 6 to 8. Take careful note of Noreen's account of that event in two separate interviews. One right after the Bonacci trial, the other done later by Ted Gunderson. See if you noticed what I noticed. And again, an emotionally, like the words of an emotionally distraught person, like, again, can she possibly make some uh, inconsistencies? Maybe. Maybe her memory is not perfect after all these years. But anyway, regardless of whether or not she made up that account, what does that have to do with anything else? <laughs> I mean, Yellowback is clearly have, has an agenda to steer here just by all of this uh, intentional obfuscation. One thing what I've thought about lately, wouldn't it be counterintuitive for a pedophile to kill his victims? These nine men apparently liked having sex with teen boys. Wouldn't kidnapping and killing a boy put an end to what they enjoyed? Well, again, if things go wrong, etc., etc. I mean, there's so many different scenarios. So this kidna kidnapper either took pleasure in killing or Johnny was kidnapped, as Wilbur Milhouse told me, to shut him up. When the man in the Ford Fairmont insisted I get into his car on a snowy morning, I sensed rage, not sexual desire. I could see that man killing for pleasure. If Johnny was kidnapped to shut him up, that makes sense too. Milhouse was arrested for trying to sexually entice a teen boy in 1975. Milhouse spent 30 days in jail for that, but then the Des Moines Register rehired him three years later to work with children. They had to have known about Milhouse's arrest because the arrest was printed in the register in 75. Maybe Milhouse was calling Johnny and Johnny threatened to tell on him. With a second offense, Milhouse would have known he faced prison, getting his ass kicked again by fellow inmates, and the loss of his dream job working with and victimizing boys. I still don't know what the connection was between Milhouse and the Fairmont guy. Someone out there does. When that person speaks up, there is hope this case will finally be solved. Okay, this is actually one of the first posts from Yellowbag that it seems very clearly this individual has an agenda. And might possibly, I mean, I don't want to, I, I never accuse anybody of making up a story because he seems relatively credible in the other posts. In this post, especially saying that he sensed rage, he could see this guy killing it. Just the phrasing of it. Not, of course, he could have his sense of what happened. But the way that it was phrased, I find that a little suspect. Wow. So here is, uh, whoa, Wow. Okay, Yellowbag did some homework here. I spent some time looking at all the sex abuse arrests reported in the Des Moines Register from 1980 to 1987. My hope is still to identify the Fairmont guy who tried to get me into his car when I was a 15-year-old newspaper carrier in 82. I know the Fairmont guy and Wilbur Milhouse, a Des Moines Register employee, were acquainted. 
It appears that the Des Moines police were very aggressive in going after local pedophiles after Eugene Martin was kidnapped in 1984. There were multiple home searches and arrests, and it was alleged that there were three child sex abuse rings targeting teen boys in the Des Moines area. Okay, this is insane. For all the goofs out there hallucinating that there are no rings out there and all of this is nonsense and it was just a sole perpetrator... I mean, three, not one, not two, but three different rings, if that's true. I mean, obviously, there were plenty of reports circulating of at least one, but it was alleged there were three just by the sheer amount of individuals. This is insane. The arrested men all denied being part of a ring, but nearly all either pleaded guilty or were convicted of sexually abusing teen boys. Sam Soda's investigation alleged three Des Moines Register employees, one, Frank Sikora, registered adult carrier pled guilty Two, unnamed presumably wilbur millhouse register circulation manager pled guilty and three an unknown individual the des moines police raided three homes in february 86 one steve crawford a school volunteer of the year pled guilty two wilbur millhouse arrested six months later three robert robbins young man apparently not charged died of aids in 2001 the Des Moines police alleged a child sex ring centered around a local witch's coven. What? Okay, so there, there are a lot of coincidence theorists out there that hallucinate that there are no such thing as satanic cults or any of this. When there's clearly people getting arrested for this, rings getting busted, countless newspaper accounts of all of this. I mean, it's like these goofs are so mentally weak, they can't, they don't, they just don't want to live in a world where there are cults and all this evil, so they have to pretend it's just sole individuals acting alone. I mean, coincidence theorists are a curious bunch that way. But continuing on here, one Davis Graham, a school teacher the leader of the coven pled guilty Two, jerry wince income tax preparer pled guilty three patrick baird insurance clerk partially deaf pled guilty stephen woodcock school teacher convicted five larry hoffman declared mentally incompetent millhouse told me on several occasions that johnny was kidnapped because he couldn't keep his mouth shut i think the key to finding out what happened to johnny is to find that person Maybe a cop, school teacher, childhood friend, Des Moines Register employee who remembers what Johnny was saying back then and who he was accusing. You know, it's weird because there is that report of Johnny speaking to a policeman the day before at a sports game. And that policeman, for whatever reason, they uh, they really put up roadblocks in uh, for Noreen and the Gotches and PIs to find out who the poli- who that cop was that Johnny was speaking to. Was Johnny Gosh blowing the whistle on somebody? Also, I found in my research that Des Moines Register rehired Wilbur Millhouse in 78. He previously worked for them in 69 and 70. That was three years after he was convicted of sexually harassing a teen boy by telephone. Millhouse was sentenced to jail time, forced to undergo a psych eval at Broadlawns, and the Register still hired him to work with children. Hmm. Yellowbag also stated, The Emilio sketch does not resemble the man I saw in the Fairmont. The man I saw in the Fairmont was only around 25 years old, not Hispanic. Black hair, brown eyes, well-trimmed mustache. He was medium build, had a very angry look in his eyes, and he spoke with a slight accent, not a foreign accent, maybe East Coast. The thing that stood out the most to me was his bright blue and orange jacket. When I called the West Des Moines police after Johnny's kidnapping, I told them I believed it was a paramedic jacket. If the Emilio sketch looks like anyone, it was Milhouse himself. Huh. But then again, Sarah DeMeo with the Faded Out podcast found an eyewitness who was telling her that Johnny did not walk to Ashworth Road on the day of his kidnapping. That makes the Emilio sketch dubious. And here he is again trying to steer the narrative and obfuscate. It's not dubious at all. You have one unreliable witness who's giving a different report than people who specifically knew Johnny Gosh who said he was uh, at Ashworth. Okay. Yellowbag also posted this. I saw a photo of Jerry Wintz, but he does not look like the guy who approached me in the Ford Fairmont. The guy who approached me was not heavy like Wintz. I have seen photos of Frank Sikora, but not his brother. It looks like the Sikoras lived in the 1600 block of East Capitol. That is really close to where I was approached, around East 23rd and Grand. I would sure like to see a photo of James Sikora. The man who approached me in February 
or March of 82, seemed very alert, angry, and agitated for someone out and awake at 6 a.m. It was also snowing very heavily at the time. After he asked me for directions, he told me I should sit in his car to get out of the snow. My thought was that the man was coming home from work, not going to work. He did not look like someone who just woke up in the morning. I guess it's possible, too, that he was wound up because he was out hunting for a victim. I got nervous because he kept looking in his rearview mirror like he was worried about someone seeing him talk to me. I still think the blue and orange paramedic jacket and East Coast accent are the keys to the man's identity. If I remember right, it was Labor Day 82 when I called the West Des Moines police after hearing they were looking for a suspect in a Ford Fairmont. What are the chances there are two men trying to abduct paper boys who just happen to drive the same model and color car? I have not posted in a while, mostly because I have nothing to add. The only new link is that I was able to get into Milhouse's house. <laughs> wow, that's weird. I was able to get into Milhouse's house when it was for sale this spring. There was nothing in the crawl space from Milhouse's day except from, for old paint cans. There was an old fireworks box in the attic. This is kind of interesting because I heard from a reliable source that Milhouse sold or gave away fireworks to try to get boys to come to his house so he could molest them. I still think the truth about what happened to Johnny Gosh will come out. The Fairmont man, if he is still alive, would only be in his 60s or 70s. Someone out there is the missing piece of the puzzle. I mean, if this is all true, I mean, it seems like he really did his homework and he's actually going into Milhouse's house to see if he left anything there. That's crazy. Someone asked him about if the paramedic jacket was simply some kind of reflective vest worn by various workers. He responded, I suppose it's possible it was snowing like crazy that morning, so he could have had any job that required a reflective jacket. Since I saw the man later with Wilbur Milhouse a Des Moines Register Circulation Manager, I wonder now if any Register employees had jobs that required wearing blue and orange reflective vests. One other thing that puzzles me, the man had dark hair, brown eyes, a mustache, and an average build, just like the Emilio sketch with the article above. However, the man who tried to get me into his Ford Fairmont was only 25 to 30 years old. I don't remember thinking the man was Hispanic, just a Caucasian guy with dark hair and a very angry countenance. I distinctly recall that the man had an accent, not a foreign accent, but I got the impression he was not originally from Iowa. Maybe from New York, New Jersey, Boston, or somewhere else on the East Coast. He stopped and watched me for a while, then rolled down his window and motioned for me to come to his car. He asked me for directions to Ankeny, but then insisted I get into his car so I could get warm and he could help me finish my paper route. Six months later, when I heard Johnny was kidnapped by a guy in a Ford Fairmont, I had no doubt it was the same man. I mean, also, it's possible he's biased here because he's had a traumatic experience that closely resembles Johnny Gosh, but... Don actually asked a question here. Maybe Sakura took over while Milhouse recovered from the heart attack. The key to this case is motive, and you have presented a compelling motive for Johnny's disappearance and most likely murder. However, that begs the question, why was Martin killed? Did he or was he about to expose some of the same illicit behavior Johnny mentioned? Johnny had to talk about what he knew to at least one of his parents or maybe law enforcement. Noreen's book has an interesting story at the start talking about the events leading up to the disappearance. She discusses how Johnny left his seat at a Friday night Valley High football game two times. And both times Leonard Gosh found Johnny talking to a West Des Moines cop under the bleachers. There are so many things that make no sense in this case, I could go on for hours. One of the strangest is Johnny's step-siblings have never been interviewed by the media, and frankly, I have no idea where they live. According to Noreen, both step-siblings were present at what she refers to as the Last Supper. The fact that both boys went along to deliver newspapers for the first time the day they disappeared speaks volumes about what happened. Okay, lot to unpack there. You know what's really tragic? If Johnny did tell his father what was going on and his father possibly knew about it, if he was involved in, in Franklin or, or some other circles possibly overlapping Franklin. I mean, this is dark stuff. Did Leonard try to dissuade Johnny Gosh from talking to the police or blowing the whistle saying it was too dangerous and, and Johnny didn't listen? I mean, there's just so many possibilities here and these stories that just don't go away. And it's very hard to make heads or tails out of them because there does seem to be overlapping angles here. Yellowbag responded, Unfortunately, I do not have any firsthand information on the Martin kidnapping. In the summer of 83, I started to get creeped out by Milhouse calling me every night trying to talk me into coming to his home. When I refused, I heard an anger and an evil in his voice I had never heard before. 
I mean, is this normal too? I mean, this teenager is getting called by this older guy every single day. I mean, is his, do you think, does anybody think Yellowbag maybe embellished some of this story? Or maybe he's saying what he believes to be true, but from the trauma, possibly it exaggerated. I don't know. Again, I mean, all of these uh, emotional aspects, it's difficult to obviously make any kind of conclusions here. Also, as I posted before, three teen boys who were visiting a girl across the street saw Milhouse dropping me off at my house after buying me a beer. The boys lived in West Des Moines and had delivered newspapers there. When Milhouse was gone, the boys warned me that Milhouse was a f and that I ought to stay away from him. I stopped answering my teen line phone and I told my mother to tell Milhouse I was not home every time Milhouse called our home phone. Around that time, I also had a vivid nightmare that Milhouse tried to drag me into his car. I took that as a warning from God or my subconscious that I ought to stay away from Milhouse. See, I don't know. Posts like this seem very credible, and yet some of his other posts seem like he's intentionally steering a narrative. I don't know. It's kind of... I mean, is, is this even the same person posting under yellow bag here? I mean, that's... Again, I don't know. I do not know this until recently, but I spoke with my mother about Milhouse, and she actually remembers him showing up at our house one night when I was not home, shedding crocodile tears because I quit talking to him. Around that time, Milhouse had his heart attack. I turned 16 and had a car, so that fall I was able to find a better job and leave the Des Moines Register. This is kind of weird. So his Des Moines Register boss shows up at his house crying, and the mother didn't think that was that strange? What? Last night I was able to confirm through online research that Milhouse died in 2015. He is bur buried in the Leavenworth National Cemetery with a military headstone that mentions his Vietnam service. In some ways I am disappointed Milhouse is dead. I had hoped an investigator would get a chance to question Milhouse about what happened to the missing paper boys. It also steams me that Milhouse was buried with military honors. I am a combat vet myself. I don't care if Milhouse killed a hundred enemy soldiers or saved his army platoon. After the war, Milhouse was a convicted pedophile and admitted accessory to kidnapping at best and possibly a serial killer at worst. That ought to negate any military service he had. His body should have been disposed of in a trash dumpster. My best guess is that Milhouse was the brains of the register's pedophile ring and that the Ford Fairmont guy was the muscle. There were several other register employees who hung around with Milhouse, one in particular I will just call Slimy Doofus Guy. I cannot remember his name. Since Johnny's kidnapping happened 35 years ago, Fairmont guy should only be around 60, slimy doofus guy 55. There must be multiple people out there who know exactly who Milhouse hung out with and what happened to Johnny and Eugene. Hopefully one of them will read these posts and speak up. Don responded here, Lou Cook took Johnny for an airplane ride over the Des Moines area as the reward for winning a sales contest. Did you ever deal with Cook or Charles Edwards Jr., who was the circulation director at the Register during the time Johnny disappeared? See, again, all these little details. So not only was Johnny just, he wasn't just one of the paper boys. He won a sales contest. So, so the older executives were specifically familiar with Johnny. They even took him on an airplane ride over Des Moines. Wow. I mean, that leads more cre credence to this possibly being some kind of Des Moines cover, uh, Des Moines register cover up because Johnny Gosh is specifically known to uh, upper management and all these older executives. Another interesting post by Don here. Milhouse was about as tall as Johnny, but weighed 10 pounds less than Johnny. I remember driving back to Des Moines from St. Louis several times, and there was no development around Four Mile Creek. You are correct, the perp had little time, but he did have 45 minutes before sunrise. On September 5th, 82, the sun rose, of course, but thick clouds darkened the sun's entrance into the day. I'm thinking more along the lines of a remote area back then that no one would walk through, such as what is now Four Mile Creek Park near Easton Boulevard or Strasser Woods State Preserve. The Bottoms works as well, since it is near the Des Moines River. The fact that both Johnny and Eugene Martin did not leave any evidence of a struggle tells me both boys got into a car driven by someone they knew. I have read about the Morris murder and read Milhouse's register quote. Wait a second, though. If they were, I mean, what kind of sign of a struggle would there be if they were tased or possibly just grabbed and thrown into a car by one or two grown men? I mean, how much of a struggle would there be? 
Yellowbag responded, The reason I suspect the bottoms is that Milhouse tried to get me to drive out there at night and meet him behind his house. I see now that there are some houses behind his house, but that may not have been the case back in the early 80s. There has been a little bit of development in that area. I may drive out there sometimes and take a look. One other thing that puzzles me is why Johnny and Eugene were both kidnapped on Sunday mornings. The Sunday morning newspaper routes were completely separate from the register weekday routes. When I started delivering newspapers, the Des Moines Tribune came out in the afternoon, so there were actually three separate newspaper routes in each neighborhood. The Tribune, the Weekday Register, and the Sunday Register. One carrier could take all three routes if he were ambitious, or it could have been three different carriers. I can only speculate, but the Sunday newspapers were very heavy. It was impossible to carry a full route of Sunday newspapers in our yellow bags. Unlike the weekday newspapers, the Sunday papers were dropped off in front of the carriers' houses. We had to take them indoors and actually assemble the newspapers. Since the Sunday newspapers were so heavy, it was best to stage them along the route, then go back and deliver them. If the kidnappers were registered employees, which is what I believe, then they may have offered the carriers rides to help stage bundles of newspapers along the route. During weekday routes, there would be no reason to offer or accept a ride. Wow. That's an interesting uh, thought there. Also, I wouldn't rule out Mark Allen's abduction just because he was not a newspaper carrier. Milhouse had a heart attack in 83 and stopped working for the register at that time. When Milhouse was arrested in 86, he apparently was using some kind of telephone chat line to meet teenage boys. Losing his job with the register changed Milhouse's approach to his sexual crimes. I took the time this morning to read Eugene's page on this website. The detective in the case questioned why no newspaper carriers were kidnapped between Johnny in 82 and Eugene in 84. Remember, Milhouse almost died from a heart attack in 83. It took him a year to get back on his feet. Another pretty startling coincidence. Don responded, A poster in another forum spent considerable time researching a timeline to the attempted abductions of Des Moines Register paperboys after Gosh and Martin. Milhouse went to prison and shortly thereafter the attempted abduction stopped. Research I have performed indicates Noreen at one time believed the register was protecting an employee who was considered a pedophile. I wonder if the employee was Milhouse. Yellowbag responded, From what I remember, Wilbur Milhouse was very angry about being transferred from West Des Moines to the Four Mile area of East Des Moines shortly before Johnny was kidnapped in 82. Milhouse did not tell me why he was transferred, but he did tell me he had fallen out of favor with register management and that his job was in jeopardy. Milhouse asked me to help him with a little scam in which Milhouse would pay me to gather names and addresses of register non-customers, offer them as a newspaper at no charge, record them as new customers to temporarily inflate Milhouse's circulation numbers, then gradually cancel the new customers later. Milhouse paid for these newspapers out of his own pocket so he could keep his job. Milhouse told me that he was not Johnny's direct supervisor, but that he knew Johnny because Johnny delivered newspapers in an adjacent district in West Des Moines. Milhouse told me on more than one occasion that Johnny was kidnapped because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Milhouse became visibly agitated and angry when talking about Johnny Gosh. This is pure speculation on my part, but I wonder now if Milhouse's transfer had something to do with the register finding out that Milhouse was a pedophile. The register may have been shuffling circulation managers in the 80s the same way the Catholic Church shuffled abusive priests. Milhouse was a big moneymaker for the register. I googled Milhouse's name and found an old register page from, I believe, 79 or 80, reporting that Milhouse was circulation manager of the year. It has never been publicized, but I now suspect that Johnny either told someone or planned to tell someone about Milhouse or one of Milhouse's register associates grooming or trying to sexually abuse him. Milhouse's anger toward Johnny may have been due to the fact that Johnny got Milhouse transferred and nearly cost Milhouse his job. I was just a teenager then, but I would imagine that many of these register employees from the 80s are still alive and would be able to provide more information about Milhouse and the pedophile ring that existed within the Des Moines Register. Another post by Yellowbag, pretty creepy here. Just for clarification, nearly all the circulation managers I worked with as a Des Moines Register paperboy were good people. Milhouse, though, was a sexual predator who hung out with a very small group of creepy men. After 35 years, I can remember a couple of faces but no names. I distinctly remember that Milhouse brought a couple of young men, approximately 18 to 20, with him to register functions. Milhouse introduced them as former paperboys of his. I suspect now that they were involved with helping Milhouse in his evil deeds. Another post here from Yellowbag, I am certain Milhouse was involved in Johnny's disappearance. Heck was going around back then telling everyone why Johnny had to disappear. My mother is still alive and she remembers Milhouse saying something strange about Johnny to her. 
What I don't know is if Milhouse was a ringleader of the Register's pedophile club or if he was just the guy who rounded up the boys for other men to abuse. I am optimistic, though, that someday the truth will be revealed and the huge mystery will be solved. Another post by Yellowbag here. This references the uh, Morris murder from earlier. I think that if Johnny was dumped along the creek, his body would have been found long ago. Those urban streams may look desolate in places, but there are mushroom hunters, hikers, kids catching tadpoles, walnut collectors, and even homeless people frequenting those creek beds. Millhouse lived on Maury Street, right next to Dean Lake, in the area people call the Bottoms. There was not much there in the 80s other than swampy places, trees, junkyards, and slaughterhouses. In 73, David Morris, a Jewish grocer who had a store directly across from the street from Millhouse, was robbed and murdered. Morris was shot in the back of the head with a 32 caliber pistol. A neighbor named Robert Brather said that Morris was killed in the store two hours after it closed and that Morris would have only unlocked that store door for someone in the neighborhood he knew quite well. Interestingly, the Des Moines Register also interviewed Milhouse, who would have been working for them at the time. Milhouse talked about how well liked Morris was and said of Morris, when I was little, he used to give me candy. Milhouse also revealed that he had lived in that neighborhood since 1955. I have speculated enough about Milhouse on this website, so I'm not going to type it, but you know exactly what I am thinking. If Johnny was killed to shut him up, which is what Milhouse was blabbing about right after Johnny disappeared, then it is likely the kidnapper already had a plan to dispose of Johnny's body. The sun would have come up soon after Johnny's disappearance, so the perp would have been in a big hurry to get Johnny out of West Des Moines and into a remote area like the bottoms before daylight. Milhouse had a sexual interest in teen boys, not in younger ones. Milhouse's last sex offender mugshot showed him at 5'7 and 130 pounds. Johnny was actually bigger than Milhouse. Milhouse, though, was a part of a small group of pedophiles, some of whom worked for the Des Moines Register. If Milhouse had help, possibly a gun, and maybe some previous experience with killing, well, you may find yourself writing a very interesting book. Okay, so here's the thing, though. If Milhouse really was involved, would he be blabbing about why Johnny had to disappear, unless it was like some kind of warning to the other paper boys. Perhaps in that capacity, maybe it would. Or was he just a mentally unstable individual that suspected that other people in that maybe even he knew had something to do with it, even if he didn't know for sure if he wasn't involved? Robert posted this, I met Wilbur Milhouse around 71 or 72, and he was then an employee of the Des Moines Register. Rocky Bird posted this in response to Yellowbag. I found a link on Google from the Des Moines Register stating that Wilbur Milhouse was arrested for sexual abuse of 16 boys in 1987. The article states he was 44, not 25, like you remember. But you were just a kid then, and 25 and 44 might have been the same to you. That's not the same, even to a kid. I mean, a 25-year-old's like a regular man. 44 is clearly an older man. If you search Wilbur Milhouse sexual abuse on Google, you will find the article. I cannot access it as I don't have a subscription. Yellowbag responded, I had a lengthy conversation with a detective investigating this case. He promised to follow up on that information, and I trust he will. At this point, I think I have done all I can do. My information about a local pedophile who knew Johnny and talked about why Johnny was kidnapped apparently does not interest some of the international conspiracy theory buffs. So be it, I told what I saw and heard. As for Milhouse, he was not the man in the Ford Fairmont, but I saw Milhouse with that man at a register function. Milhouse was not a big man. He was really kind of a sissy with a childlike personality. I doubt if he could have personally kidnapped a healthy teenager. Milhouse's younger buddy, however, was tough and had a look of pure evil in his eyes when he demanded that I get into his car. I still remember carrying a big hunting knife in my yellow bag newspaper, in my yellow newspaper bag from that point on, just in case the guy came back for me. For weeks, I would duck between houses any time I saw a Ford Fairmont coming down the street. The Register held frequent circulation drives, contests, and social events for the newspaper carriers in the early 80s. I often saw Milhouse hanging out with a small group of creepy men at those functions. I never knew who they were, I just assumed they were Register employees. The other district managers tended to avoid Milhouse and his buddies. I wonder now if they suspected the guys were pedophiles. I believe Milhouse was employed by the Register from around 80 to 83, but not arrested until the fall of 86. Johnny Gosh was kidnapped in 82, Eugene Martin in 84, and Mark Allen in the spring of 86. After Milhouse was arrested and sent to prison, the kidnapping stopped. Quite a coincidence, isn't it? Or did they stop? Again, with those uh, other cases, but... Okay. 
Another follow-up here by Yellow Bag with some more details. A quick correction and a little bit more info about what I saw and heard in the early 80s. Thinking back, 34 years ago was a long time. When the man in the Ford Fairmont tried to get me into his car, it might have been before, not after, Johnny was kidnapped. It was snowing that so he doesn't remember the exact day. It was snowing that morning, so I'm guessing it was February or March of 82. The man stopped me and asked directions. He then suggested I get in his car because it was cold and snowing outside. I started to feel uncomfortable as he insisted I get into his car. I finally asked, where do you want directions to? He answered, Ankeny. As I started to give directions, the man stopped me and said, I really don't need directions. I just want to mess around with you. Back in the 80s, mess around meant have sex. I said no and started running away. I looked to see if I could get the license number on the Fairmont, but the plate was completely covered with snow. That September, when I heard Johnny was kidnapped and the police were looking for a man in a Ford Fairmont, I suspected it was the same person. I called the West Des Moines police, and they told me an officer would come to my house to speak with me. No one ever showed up. Really shows how, how seriously the police were taking the case. Or whether or not there was, of course, a conspiracy afoot. I could have identified the man by photo or provided a good description to a sketch artist. Anyway, my family had moved around that time, and Wilbur Millhouse became my new district manager for the register. Millhouse had just transferred from West Des Moines to the east side of Des Moines. He admitted he knew Johnny, and he talked about him a lot. I thought Millhouse was a cool guy because he brought, bought us Paperboy's beer and gave us money. One day, the register had a party for its carriers at the old Skate East. It was there that I saw Milhouse with the guy who tried to get me into his car. I later discovered Milhouse was a pedophile. I will post more on that when I have time. Shortly after Johnny turned up missing, Milhouse said some strange things to me that he convinced me he knew who took Johnny and why. I see on the internet that Milhouse was convicted in 87 of sexually abusing boys, with the police not seeming too interested, and the register probably wanting to hide the fact that a pedophile ring existed within its employ in the 80s. It's no wonder this case has never been solved. Someone asked him why he waited so long to bring this information forward. He responded, I really don't know how to answer your question about why I waited. I didn't want to think about it after it happened. I was afraid of Milhouse and his buddies back then. The police didn't seem to want to listen when I tried to talk to them. I figured, how can the police not know about Milhouse, especially if he was convicted of sexually abusing boys in the 80s? They must have known Milhouse worked for the Des Moines Register the same time Johnny came up missing. I left Iowa after high school and blocked the whole thing out of my mind. I recently saw news articles about the anniversary of this crime, and I guess it's finally dawned on me that I might have information worth sharing. Someone asked him why he didn't go to the police, etc., and Yellowbag responded, You are right about no excuse. I have asked Jody to forward my information to the appropriate authorities. I guess the worst thing that can happen is finding out Milhouse was just a perv who made up what he said about Johnny to further scare me into silence. I mean, yeah, that's a possibility as well. So here's an interesting post on the Johnny Gosh subreddit by Truly Woke 111 This is what I'll call the Yellowbag Franklin Theory. So I was researching this case and saw that there are two main theories, those being the Franklin cover-up and the DMR Wilhouse theory. So I came up with this bigger theory that incorporates both of them along with some minor theories that actually makes sense once putting them all together. According to Yellowbag, it's been said that Milhouse kidnapped Johnny because he was speaking too much. But Paul Bonacci said that John had made arrangements with him to kidnap sell Johnny in order to pay off debts. So what if the Franklin cover-up could have been a larger network of different pedophilia child trafficking groups that were scattered across the country or even the globe and maybe one of these groups were local to Des Moines? Wilbur Milhouse could have been part of a group along with Frank Sikora, Sam Soda, Paul Bonacci, and Mil Emilio and more unknown pedophiles or POIs that we're unaware of, but Milhouse, Sakura, Soda, Bonacci, and Emilio being the only ones important to this case. So it's possible that Johnny could have withheld information that could have cost Milhouse his job and even planned on or already did tell someone. We even see that Yellowbag mentioned this on iowacoldcases.com website. This information that Johnny could have had more to do with him being a pedophile and him sexually harassing these young boys. Yellowbag also mentions that Milhouse said he kidnapped Johnny because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. This leads me to believe that Milhouse and the other group members could have orchestrated a plan to kidnap Johnny, but in order for that to happen to John, who went with him on all of his routes, could not be present. 
So that's when they called the Gosh residence and would only reply if John answered and could have forced John into a deal where he would have had to give up Johnny promising him an undisclosed amount of money to help pay debts if he were to remain silent and could have threatened to harm him or his family if he didn't comply. This would explain the frequent phone calls the Gosh residence was receiving and John would answer these calls and claim that they were prank calls and that the person on the other line would remain silent. I think they could have been speaking the whole time and John refused to say anything to anyone knowing the consequences he could face by doing so. And he knew that it would send Noreen, Johnny, and the rest of their family and friends into a panic. That's when they called him the night before and told him how everything would go down, to stay in bed, and to act surprised, shocked after the kidnapping. Milhouse and Sakura, who we now know works for the Des Moines Register, could have known the route Johnny was taking and could have transferred that info over to Emilio, Paul Bonacci, Sam Soda, and possibly others. That's when Paul and Emilio, who Paul claims is the ringleader, could have used the pheromone to kidnap Johnny. The transfer then they transfer him into another vehicle with Sam Soda and, and Emilio, where he is then taken to a farmhouse, then sold to a man known as the Colonel, but is really Colonel Michael Aquino. Aquino specialized in psychological warfare and started a satanic church known as the Church of Set. You know what's crazy, too? Like, all the coincidence theorists, the authority-worshipping cultists, all these gullible goofs who think that cults don't exist and none of this satanic occult stuff exists. I mean, Michael Aquino actually went on talk shows on mainstream television. Like, this wasn't... It's not like this is some kind of weird allegation. Like, it's open. he openly admitted it on live TV. I mean, it's insane. And the gullible goofs just, I guess, pretend Michael Aquino doesn't exist. They got away with this simply because they were working alongside the government and law enforcement to allow them to get away with this. I personally don't think that the Des Moines Register was an underground pedophilia cult, but rather was a place where pedophiles worked so then they could gain access to young teenagers. This can explain why Eugene Martin's kidnapping was so similar to Johnny's. As for Mark Allen, although I think he was also something done by people connected to the Franklin cover-up and was more, probably more random due to the fact that he wasn't a paper boy and was just probably at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yellowbag even mentions that the creepy group Millhouse would hang around were former paperboys of his. Maybe those were also paperboys who were also kidnapped by him and the pedophilia group local to that area. Paul even mentioned how he lived in Iowa at one point, so you never know. There were even some failed kidnapping attempts done on paperboys in the area as well. Maybe these were planned by Millhouse and the group, but just didn't work out. Them being alive is possible in this scenario, but they would probably be in, high, in hiding, considering that elite and high-profile individuals were involved in this case. Therefore, they more than likely wanted individuals under a different alias or identity than either they've taken themselves or that the government gave them to hide the truth. There's also a Twitter account that goes by the name of Johnny Gosh and claims that he has undergone experimentation by the CIA and was put into a section of MKUltra known as Project Monarch, which he claims gave him DID. Paul Bonacci mentions this in an interview. Everyone has many different theories, but I personally believe in this one because it makes sense. I recommend that you guys watch the Johnny Gosh YouTube channel and go under the favorites playlist and you will find some useful information on this case. Please let's spread awareness on this case. Mary on number one responded, I agree with your analysis and have maintained for a while that having to choose between local pedophiles and the Franklin Connection is a false dichotomy. Bonus points! That is indeed a false dichotomy. From the very beginning, Paul Bonacci indicated that the kidnappers, Emilio and Tony, had a Des Moines contact named Sam, who gave them information on the particular victim, Johnny, who they would be taking. That included a photograph of Johnny, which was picked out of a larger collection of photos of DMR paperboys, strongly indicating that Sam had a connection with local predators who were keeping tabs on Des Moines paper boys to target. Knowing exactly where to go to find Johnny that morning, it also suggests that knowledge of his paper route was provided to the kidnappers, like you say. And Sam has, of course, been identified as Sam Soda, a highly suspicious local man who was on the Gosh family's radar as a suspect even before Bonacci came forward. Among other things, Sam lied about the Goshes hiring him to investigate Johnny's abduction when, in fact, he inserted himself into the case. Lied about Mary Bach being in the room with him during the interrogation of Frank Sakura when Bach herself told Sarah DeMeo who was too incompetent and or agenda-driven to realize this contradicted a key claim by her star witness, Sam. Enjoyed law enforcement protection for showing child pornography at public conferences that were attended by Des Moines cops. The first assistant county attorney responsible for that, Ron Wheeler, later went on to defend Sam in private practice when Sam beat his teenage stepson. Wow, that's insane. Was supposedly pursuing a ring of multiple DMR pedophiles who Frank Sikora collaborated with, but unceremoniously dropped that aspect of his investigation. Very curious. Tried to convince Sarah DeMeo that Johnny was not targeted in advance and that Eugene Martin's kidnapping, which coincidentally he is alleged to have predicted in advance, according to Noreen Gosh, had no connection with Johnny. Well, how would he even know whether it did or it didn't if the cases are unsolved? I mean, this is weird. 
I'm going to go over another account here. This was left as a comment uh, on uh, on Mindshock on YouTube here by Rico. At the gotch time, my friend's little brother had a guy following him on his paper route 20 miles from the gosh abduction. We had mopeds at the time and actually chased the creep, accused him of the kidnapping, and hit his car with baseball bats. He never came around again. Who knows if we were right or not? Wow. And I mean, I couldn't find a report of any of this. I don't know, maybe it didn't make it to the paper or was reported, but I mean, that's insane. And so that just goes to show like how many, if that's true, how many of these other accounts are there that were never officially reported? I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So there you have it. I mean, something that just does not get enough attention in the Johnny Gosh case or just this plethora of other attempted abductions. Hope everybody found another edition of Mind Shock True Crime interesting and informative. If you want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Help support the channel that way. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.